My family has always had weird run-ins with the supernatural. I can't tell you how far back it runs for sure, but I could start with my grandfather, who sadly passed away in 2018. There are so many great stories I would love to share with people that don't necessarily relate to the supernatural, but let me put the man into perspective with a short one. Well, as short as my Gabby self can make it. He loved to watch me play and frequently had me sit outside near his workshop so he could watch me. I was a definite tomboy, so watching the confusing mess of Transformers having a tea party or Barbies beating the hell out of each other was probably very amusing. In the 80s, I was a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle fanatic, as many young boys and girls were. I don't think he really understood it, because he was asked things like, so what is Character X's superpowers? Like they were Superman or Spider-Man or something. I guess they did have superpowers, but it was mostly just martial arts and stuff. I recall him specifically asking about my favourite villain on the show, Rocksteady. I didn't know. I just liked his design and never understood how Bebop surpassed him in popularity, to the point of being considered a much more formidable fighter. A rhino would destroy a warthog if they fought. I was at a bit of a loss, so my preschool brain just started listing things he might have or might have been capable of. I know Big Machine Gun was one of the superpowers I gave him, really one of the best superpowers when you think about it, but I also said he could pick up a car. My grandfather laughed and finished wiping off a wrench, then walked over to his pickup and just effortlessly picked one end of it up off the ground. That was cool, because in my young mind, that meant my grandfather had superpowers. In hindsight, I realise I'm probably misremembering it. It probably wasn't effortless, and while I remember it being the front end with the engine, it was probably the back end with an empty pickup bed. He was a big guy, but no one is that strong. He was always a sort of superhero to me and the rest of the family, and even three years later, I miss him so much. When it came to the supernatural, it was like whenever he showed up, whatever ghost or demon or monster would just run in terror. It's like how you can scare away coyotes with the urine of larger predators like cougars, wolves or bears. Comparing him to cat piss might not be the most flattering thing, but it was like his presence always filled the room. And if he scowled everyone, cowered if, and if he smiled, everyone was filled with mirth. And if he cried, well, he never cried, but a few times. And it was always one of us going through trauma that made him cry. Story 1. The Haunted House Like the time my mother apparently almost died. It was very early in her life. She, my aunts and my grandparents moved to a small cheap house in the country. Their first real home after living in a trailer up to that point. This would have been 1967. Mom was three. An old Chickasaw woman had lived there previously. We are part Cherokee, allegedly. I don't want to go full Elizabeth Warren here, but mostly Irish and my family is definitely Christian. Southern Baptists. This woman held on to tribal beliefs. I sadly don't have much of a story to narrate here. I wasn't there and all my information is second-hand from those four family members. But I wanted to share it, as any time ghost stories came up, this was one that was told, and I've heard it many times. The house was in a state of disrepair, but one of the things that really stuck out to my grandmother was that she had driven nails halfway into the floor in a circle around her bed, and wrapped sands of her hair around them, connecting them and making a sort of tripwire. It was an odd thing to do to say the least, and my grandmother just sort of shrugged and pulled it all up. The previous owner had her reasons apparently. Yes, this house was very haunted. I think mostly by tricksters, given the majority of the paranormal activity was mostly harmless. But as someone who has only been told about it, I can't really say how harmless these sorts of things were. Lights would flicker. Things would never be where you left them. Sometimes they'd disappear. Sometimes big things would disappear. Like my aunt and mother had hula hoops that they put under their beds that vanished the next morning, never to be seen again. Doors and windows would open and shut randomly. Pictures would fall off the wall. Animals from dogs to chickens to cats to cows were spooked all the time. I was told that whenever they prayed, these paranormal activities would stop for the rest of the night. But allegedly, 
If my grandfather got mad and yelled at them, they'd stop for days. Most often a door would start opening and he'd turn around in a fury, by all means, come on in, and it would stop halfway. Once it even went so far as to shut itself back, as though to apologise. My mother has never dared say this to either of my very religious grandparents, as they would have spanked her then and been quite upset now. But she thought that whatever these entities were, were more afraid of my grandfather than they were of God. But the house wasn't the most haunted part of the property. There was a barn and an old shed. My grandmother put my aunt's and mother's toys in the shed and redecorated it as a sort of playhouse. It burned down the next day. There was no electricity or gas in the shed and her girls were fortunately not in it. So how and why was highly suspicious to say the least, but it was next to that barn. The barn apparently was especially bad. Grandfather allegedly heard voices inside of it and would have to tell them to shut up, which apparently worked. But he didn't like the voices. According to him, they sounded very malevolent. They had a pair of great Pyrenees named Siberia and Alaska, or some large breeding pairs I have heard multiple breeds sighted and I'm a little uncertain. The only thing that is agreed on is that they were good dogs, big dogs and white dogs. They would come into the house cautiously and if anything paranormal happened, would stand up and bark or flee. But they refused to enter that barn. They'd stand at the edge and growl and bark. This came to a head when my aunt and mother were pressured into the barn by a few of their cousins who were visiting. Nothing had happened after they were in there for a bit, though Siberia and Alaska were visibly stressed about these children being in there. After a while of nothing spooking happening, other than two giant whimpering dogs, they decided to climb to the hayloft. I'm not sure if it was Easter, but they had some toy eggs and the four older children decided to pretend to be chickens and let my mum get the eggs out from under them. Eventually, one of the male cousins thought it would be funny to act like an angry hen, flapping his arms and approaching her like a chicken might when ready to flog someone. My mother backed up on the edge of the hay loft and fell. My aunt and all three cousins swear she was several feet from the edge, then the next moment she was over. But there was a lot of guilt there for some, for some six to seven year olds to bear. All four with the two dogs in a row ran to get my grandparents and my grandmother grabbed up my unconscious mother and started wailing and praying. My grandfather drove through a fence in his truck to meet her halfway as quickly as possible. But halfway there, she woke up. Apparently she asked why my grandmother was crying. Grandma thanked God and still ran with her to the truck. Once in the truck and preparing to leave, my grandfather asked her what happened. He was obviously more panicked than angry, but he suspected one of the other children might have pushed her out of the loft, even by accident. My aunt said the cousin who had scared her had been freaking out, screaming and crying out that he never touched her, which while an understandable response is a little sus. She smiled and said, I fell and Jesus caught me. That was enough for them and they got her to the hospital. Her head was and still is concave from this. Her soft toddler skull might have actually saved her, but she suffers from chronic migraines to this day, pressure from her brain against her lightly dented skull. After being released that day with a mild concussion, my grandfather questioned her again, what happened? My mother doesn't remember saying this or the last thing. Severe head trauma does that I suppose, but my grandparents say this is what she said. Jesus caught me, but the devil pushed me. When they returned, Siberia had been run over and Alaska was nowhere to be found. Alaska was apparently never recovered. You won't find this house. My grandfather moved his family out and tried to sell it with warnings to the buyers. Sadly, his honesty scared away many prospective buyers, even at a discounted price. Though the issue solved itself, Allegedly, a bear went into both barn and house and in a panicking frenzy, started clawing up and biting everything in there, eventually knocking both of them down and after it left presumably, a fire started from a ruptured line leading to the propane tank. My grandfather fortunately had it insured, but only took what he had been trying to sell it for. 
He was honest to a fault like that. Story two, the witch. I won't go into detail about my father, but he wasn't a supernatural horror. We can leave it at this. He paid child support and visited me for only a few months after my mother divorced him. Later, when my mother considered suing him for back payments, my grandfather took her aside and told her he'd made a deal with him. He stops being around me and he doesn't have to pay her monthly stipend and gets to keep functioning legs. My mother wasn't mad when she learned this because he's just that bad. Grandpa basically paid everything she needed for the vast majority of my youth, except when she remarried. My first stepfather was an interesting man. I don't hold any grudges against him, but he liked scaring his daughter and me. A lot of it is stuff I can't remember. I was about three or four at the time and my stepsister a year younger than me. But allegedly there was an incident with a trampoline where the two of us were having trouble getting up. Despite what other people were saying, he wouldn't stop bouncing on it and thought our predicament was funny. Bullyish, but not something that calls for someone jumping onto the trampoline, tackling him off it and onto the ground and punching him in the face over and over. But my mother did that. I just don't recall it. It seems far-fetched too. I've met the man in my teen years and he's a good 6'4 and built like a brick shithouse. My mum was big, 5'10", but nowhere near that bulky. I suspect for the longest time, the story was exaggerated. I know it happened because when I was a teen, I ran into him. He admitted to me during that meeting it did in fact happen, apologised and asked if my mum was mad. No, we really didn't have any animosity towards him. It was his ex-wife that was the issue. I want you to think about this. A man who does that kind of thing got custody of daughter over his wife. This was the mid to late 80s too. That sort of thing is rare. The mother almost always gets custody and the reason he did was really obvious. The ex-wife was a sociopath, even if you don't believe in supernatural things. I never heard them talk about this at the time. They were probably afraid of scaring me. But before even remarrying the stepfather, warned her about his ex-wife that she believed she was a witch. Not some new age hippie Wiccan bullshit or neo-Nazi twerp getting in touch with their pagan ancestors, like a Satan worshipping witch. Nor was she some edgy atheist saying that to get the goat of their Christian contemporaries either. She went all in. I do remember a lot of it. My stepsister was a bit mean. We had fun playing and all, but she would randomly flip out and bite me. It didn't hurt really. I just kind of shoved her off, but there was something wrong with her. The nightlight in our shared bedroom burst one night, and she claimed to have done it by staring at it. That horrified my mother, but kind of amazed me. I liked superhero stuff, so I asked her if she was a psychic, and that made her laugh. She said she had animals like crows, rats and snakes come to her in the night with glowing red eyes, who would tell her to kill my mother and I with a butcher knife right down to how to do it, slit our throats. My mother and grandmother insisted we pray that away and she would claim that won't work. And when asked why, my heart doesn't belong to Jesus, it belongs to Satan. Firstly, I remember my grandmother was very religious, right? This caused a major freak out from her. Grab the child in a hug and start praying for our sort of freak outs, regardless of how much she struggled. Secondly, I bet you're assuming that this was put into her head by a mother, right? This is a, my six-year-old said something really woke, red-pilled about Politician X yesterday, Tia nonsense. Something a child would not only ever say, if it was put there, and encouraged by an adult. Her mom didn't have any visitation rates. She was that bad. He divorced her when my then stepsister was a year old. Our trailer? Haha, <laughs> yes, trailer trash. My family not having a lot of money when I was a child is so funny. When at least three bedrooms, and I have to say, in the guest bedroom, I had all my things moved into it. She hid all the knives in the pantries instead of drawers. Out of reach and of sight as an extra precaution. I tried to get my then stepfather to take her to a therapist. He didn't believe in that kind of stuff, so it was more church and more Sunday school 
but more of my grandmother working with her. The situation boiled over, and when she broke one of my toys, well, broke being a nice way of putting it, in the case one of those silly Pizza Hut puppets from the Land Before Time movie, Triceratops was my favourite dinosaur. Sarah was her favourite character from the movie. There was only one, and we fought over it prolifically, to the point that we'd raid each other's rooms for it. Finally, she did manage to get that knife she was threatening us with, and out of spite, hacked Sarah's head off. I remember starting to cry, then getting angry. I was so mad, madder than I think I've ever been at any point. I know, it was just some dumb fast food toy, but you have to remember I was just a little girl. I didn't even consider that she had a knife. I just slapped her onto the floor. She ran crying and I'll admit some guilt. I expected a punishment, but you know, a child who said she was having visions and dreams of demonic animals, telling her to kill the two of us with a knife, just like the one she had when I knocked her down, probably stayed my mother's hand from being too harsh. She told me it was very important. I learned to control my temper though and said she was proud of me for not acting until there was a physical threat. Except I never perceived her as a physical threat. I'd acted entirely out of being upset about the toy. I never thought she would stab me with the knife and it was only later that I would find out the full extent of this. The stepfather was slightly more angry about it, but he had never disciplined her for biting me so considered it par for the course. Parenting is hard, am I right? Again, this man gets sole custody without visitation rights, and that says more about her than it does him. That should be the end of it, right? Oh, poor naive reader. All of this was just a gathering storm. It started with calls to my grandparents, asking where my mother lived. It was a weird question. They didn't answer and wanted to know who was calling and why. The other person got progressively more frustrated as my grandmother tore apart the inconsistencies and factual impossibilities of what this woman was claiming before she started blabbering in tongues, hissing and growling into the phone, and then said she put a curse on her. My grandmother told her plainly, my God protects me. Your curse is useless. Who is this? She hung up. My aunt got a similar call. It ended in a similar way. This, like many parts of the story, were things I would find out about later. Some of this, like the phone call, I only knew partially about until recently when I was making sure I had my facts straight on these stories. I knew about the ending, but I didn't know she was pumping them for info. The stepfather had insisted on an unlisted number. This was why. A month later, someone apparently spilled the beans. No idea who, but they probably didn't even realise what they'd done. Harassing calls, day in, day out, saying horrible things on the other end. Claims of curses, threats of death. I recall when that huge six foot four man found out. Both he and my mother were, shall we say, carnal Christians. Not serious about the faith, but the second he realised what was going on, he fell to his knees and stared at the ceiling with tears in her eyes, grabbed up his daughter and started begging whatever powers that it could be stopped. That she wouldn't find them. He did this just as long as my grandmother the religious fanatic had when she prayed with that same little girl over the Satan comment. I remember that. I remember that vividly. And frankly, it scared me that he was afraid. Not to mention it scared my mother and her stepsister. We were all right to be afraid. The police were called, but apparently the psycho was using a payphone. My mother just eventually left the phone off the hook. But when she unhooked the phone, the calls just got redirected to my grandparents. My grandfather almost opened every phone call with a snarl. I recall him completely lose it on this woman and then threatened to eat her alive, promised to eat her alive. Went into details about it while he gripped a metal framed chair so hard he bent it. My grandmother grabbed me and ran into the other room with me to spare me having to hear too much of this heated conversation. I'd say it was no longer safe for my grandparents, but that would be a lie. It was the safest place I could have been. 
A couple of weeks later, after my mother just unhooked the phone, it stopped. That Saturday, a woman came while it was still dark out, just barely lit by the rising sun. Our dog started barking. That is normal. Someone pulls into the driveway, they bark. They see a skunk or raccoon, they bark. But this bark was threatening. This bark was full of anger and fear and malice. It made the hairs on my neck stand up. They were really worked up about this. My mother came out to see what she wanted with a shotgun in hand. As I was now awake, I went to the window to watch, peeking from the safety of the curtain. My mother didn't like her. I could tell from facial features alone. Neither did a single one of our dogs. She was fun, pretty I suppose, but I don't think a four-year-old is the best judge of what is and is not beautiful. She had blonde hair and blue eyes and wore a red shirt and black pants and a dark colored car. I couldn't tell you much more than that, other than after a moment of appraising her, I didn't like her either. It's hard to describe. Have you ever just looked at someone and immediately disliked them? You have no idea why. You don't normally judge books by the covers. On the cover, their outer appearance can't even be pleasing. But something is just off. Something that makes you angry or afraid. The conversation started getting tense. The woman kept asking my mother to put the dogs away so she could come into the yard and talk. My mum might have noticed a massive head injury but was and is no fool. She refused and demanded to know who she was. Immediate hostility. She started screaming at my mom to give her daughter and how she knew she was alone. I'm not sure what my stepsister was doing at the time. Surely she was awake from all this noise? Was she watching this from a window too? To this day, I have no idea. The dogs went berserk with fury as she screamed at my ma. The crazy person turned to look down and hiss at them, spit on them. She raised her hand like she was going to slap them. All of these were mistakes. They were not little dogs and that had only made them angrier. My mother told us to leave. She started saying she'd call on all the dark powers to put a hex on my mom and her family. I couldn't tell you exactly what was said, but even in my relatively innocent child mind, I wanted my mom to just shoot her. Unfortunately, there are laws even in a red state that ensure doing that to someone who wasn't so much as entered your fence perimeter is highly illegal. Even if that person exudes contempt. My mother fired the shotgun to the ground. The dogs didn't start barking. Not even for a second. That was unusual. Usually gunshots and fireworks scared them. But they were so furiously angry at this woman's very presence that it only seemed to agitate them more. Like they were all snarling and barking and howling in a chorus to cheer my mom on to murder. I guess Boomstick trumps black magic. At least in the more immediate and face-to-face -face sense. Because after my mother's warning shot, she got into her car and peeled out. My mother immediately re reconnected the phone and called my grandmother. As she did, I snuck out to ask questions, but she shooed me. So I went to the living room to start watching cartoons. I could listen to what they were saying in the kitchen anyway. The stepfather was out camping and fishing with my grandfather and some other men to try to wind down after the harrying ordeal that we thought was over. Nana said she would go get them. My mom called the police next. But as she did, the dog started barking again. The same malicious barking. I heard my mother profane and suspect that she was looking out a window in the other room. But little four-year-old me was used to seeing my mum's just stick her head out. I wanted to see what was going on. I moved over to the door and gently unlocked then opened it. Just enough to see my head out and peek inside. Not smart. Kids are dumb. And the younger the kid, the dumber they are. I saw a car tossing gravel as it left the driveway again. The same one from earlier. Our dogs were at the chain link nearest the vehicle was last. Baiting the metal, rearing up on their hind legs and baying like hounds. They went outside, but I've never seen a dog angry at someone for just being there. The biggest one was Rusty. A child mixed with some other massive breed. 
just enough to make out his wrinkles. He was a good dog and he loved me especially. He looked back to see me and it was like panic in his eyes. Like, no, don't come out here, little one. I came out there. The sun was just a little more up. I was, it was more light than dark now. I started walking over to them to see what was going on and he got in the front of mine. I moved past him and he did it again and again. A big red furry handle. He stored me long enough for my mother to come out and she probably still had the gun. She demanded I come back inside but I could see something on the hood of her car. I disobeyed, dashed past my overprotective dod before my overprotective mother could catch me and immediately regretted everything. Something had gutted our cats. One was Braveheart and the other Lion from Care Bears, as this was about a decade before the Mel Gibson movie. She was a feisty barn cat, not the kind of animal that would let you catch her easily and the sort that you didn't want to be touched. The other was Tigger. He was easily one of the most affectionate cats I've ever known. So lovable that my stepsister, my cousin and I would wag him around like a rag doll and even dress him in doll clothes and he wouldn't even try to get that way. There was no way she didn't kill him before confronting my mother. It might not have clicked for me at the time, but looking back on it, they were already dead when my mother confronted her. There's no way Braveheart would let her catch him that quickly. Tigger, I could just be... I could believe just strolling right up to her. If it weren't for the sheer unnerved fury she caused on the dogs. She split both of them from anus to cheek and splayed their organs across the front and back of my mother's car. The hood, the trunk, the windshields. She'd stretch out their legs to mimic Christ on the cross. The next thing I knew, I was being lifted up off the ground. It was then I snapped back to reality. I started wailing. I'm not so sure for how long I did it, but it was understandably inconsolable. My stepsister was confused and I was dragged back inside, finally making her appearance. But when I blubbered out that Tiger was dead, soon she joined me in natural hysterics. My mom joined her call with the police explaining what happened in a much less calm tone, then locked all the doors and windows before taking the children to console as best she could, gun in the grabbing distance. She only left to check when the dogs barked at something or when they were quiet for too long. My grandfather and stepfather were the first. My grandma apparently drove to the fishing hole to tell them what happened. They cleaned up the animals, buried them, wiped the blood off my mom's car. Grandpa then cleaned up and came in to hold me, specifically, and stay with my mom until the police arrived. But my stepfather? He grabbed his daughter and left, without a word. That would be the last I would see either of them for some time. I suspect this is what he wanted to apologise for, more than the trampoline, though I had mentioned that first as a joke. My mother followed him asking questions, but he was frank. She was after them, not her. If only. The police took down her description. They pretty much knew who she was, and as I understand it, arrested her before that day was over. I was too young to be privy to the exact charges, but yeah, it turns out going on other people's property, threatening them, murdering their pets and vandalising their car, is something that is against the law, and she has a repeated offender. Somehow it got worse. Those hexes and curses she was throwing around this entire time, became manifest. Demonic forms began taking shape in our mobile home. It's all a blur. I know at one point my mother threw a plate at one that was haunt taunting them from a door. I could hear a scream in the middle of the night. I recall humanoid shapes with jagged sharp teeth, some with shark teeth, some with fangs like a snake, red or black or pallid skin, all manner of eyes, all of them glowing, still pupils for some, Growth eyes for others. Just a mangarine of parts jumbled together. Some recognisable, some not. The dogs became afraid to go inside the house where normally it was a chore to keep them out. 
But the only thing that will always stand out is one that chooses to torment me specifically. All the others were a glimpse and it was gone sort of affair. This one though, this one made itself very well known to me. The first time was in the bath. I sat in with some toys and began washing up. The faucet in that bathroom always dripped. But the dripping started getting faster, more erratic, then more a steady thin stream. I tried to turn it off thinking I had accidentally nudged the knobs, but they were turned tight. The colour of the water turned purple and it started to take shape, a dragon, but it was unlike any dragon I'd ever seen. Lips curled up showing entirely too much of its gums, where rows and rows of conical dagger teeth like rested. Covered in dully smoky purple scales, red glowing eyes with reptilian pupils like that of a snake and black goat horns growing out the back of its head. Muzzle was sticky, somewhat circular. I recall screaming and thrashing and running out of the bathroom as it opened its maw. How it managed to be so big I can't say, but its head and neck seemed to fill the entire tub, yet it came from such a small hole. Naturally, it was gone as though it was never there when my mother came. Though she recognised the danger, and believed every word I had to say. She was in tears, and I remember her just hugging me and having me sleep with her. This was the final straw before I was sent to my grandparents. Though my mother would alternate between there and the house, she didn't want to abandon it entirely in case there were accomplices of the sociopath. Also, to take care of our dogs who did stay. I was terrified to take a bath after that. I had to have her presence again, like I had devolved as a person two years. She didn't help me. I just wanted her there at all times. And if not her, then my grandmother. It didn't matter that I was out of the haunted house, though mostly because I kept having nightmares of the thing. While staying at our home, my mother remembers having an angelic figure shake her and yell at her to wake up. When she did, she saw a gremlin-like creature toying with a box fan and then lit it on fire as it vanished into thin air. She managed to put out the fire, and that was it. She and my grandparents went through the home chanting scripture, drawing crosses on all the windows and doors with chalk, and more or less performing an exorcism. It seemed to work, and eventually we went back. This was the point my mother went to testify, and all that lunacy happened. For her, this was about where things returned to normal. Not so for me, but that's part three. When my mother went to testify with the rest of my family for emotional support, the witch would have psychotic outbursts. I fortunately wasn't there, nor was my now ex-stepfather or ex-stepsister. The witch would still scream and demand to know where they were. My mother didn't answer, obviously, but eventually did turn and snarl, even if I knew I would never tell you. This just made her behave more erratically, chant praises to the devil and do other absolutely off your rocker type stuff. Let me be clear, I hate witch hunts. It's disgusting and barbaric and many people died because some liar didn't like them. But witch burnings? If they were acting like this? Not saying I agree, but I understand. She'd apparently behaved a little less loony in the divorce hearings with ex-stepfather, but was still erratic there and had a criminal record. But that, combined with this, was enough for her to get put in an asylum. The next best thing to burning, I suppose. But if even half of what I have heard about her is true, there was no curing that woman, and to be frank, yes, I believe she did consort with demonic entities. If it makes you feel any better, my stepsister went on to apparently lead a pretty normal life, and is happily married with children of her own now. Her mother never entered her life to my knowledge. I can't sympathise. Went from about two to about twenty something without seeing my father. My mother became more faithful and even if I'm not some hardcore Christian after this experience, it's hard for me to not at least believe in the supernatural. That and I would have more experience with the supernatural entities sealed it. And there was one from the saga I couldn't shake. Story 3. 
the hell dragon. The dragon stayed with me. It would haunt my dreams. In my dreams, I got to see its entire body. Kind of built like a horse, huge bat-like wings, a long tail that ended in a morning star style mace, and webbed eagle-like talons and front and back feet. It was huge, big enough to swallow an adult man whole, and it did. The closest thing I can think of to the way its mouth operated is the goblin shark, only it had no protrusion or big nose, just a stubby snout like a cat's or a mastiff that got wider at the end to accommodate those massive extendable jaws. It was also not bestial at all. Sadistic and clearly intelligent, it took great pleasure in tormenting the people in my dreams in front of me. It took great pleasure in tormenting me, laughing, cackling with a low, rumbling voice like thunder, while it toyed with someone like a cat might a mouse. It only appeared near water. So a family member, friend, pet, or even fictional character I liked would venture too close to a lake, pond, puddle, swimming pool, sink, bird bath, even a glass of water. And it would lunge out of it and eat them and then disappear again. Or maim them, then wait for them to stumble to another water source so it could do it again. No matter how much I warned people in the dreams, they'd always end up wandering too close to the water, then get snatched up. It didn't always swallow people whole either. It was always worse when it chewed. Those teeth were the size of butcher knives. Its victims, I don't even know where to begin. Naturally, they included my mother, grandparents, aunt, uncle, cousin, and family in general. Pets, of course, my Sunday school teacher, the local pastor, his wife. Friends, sure. But then some of the people were just random and bizarre. A few local news anchors, sitcom characters or their actors. Several people I just met in passing or saw on TV briefly. Sometimes people I didn't even know or stray animals. Then there was the really bizarre ones. Sometimes I would pray for help and it would arrive. Or else all these people were just minding their own business when this hell dragon would show up. Bruce Lee, Chuck Norris, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone. Dead, 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 dead. Even with guns. It might all sound very silly, but this was a monster putting things in terms that a young child would understand. Anything I could think of that might protect me. Anything I could think of that could fight it. Anything that might make me feel safe. Sure, it brought them into being in my dream just to massacre them. Ninja Turtles tried to flee to the sewer. I warned them. They did it anyway and all died. I could just hear them screaming. Then it would peer out of a storm drain at me and grin. Disappear, stick its head out of a manhole covering and spit their weapons at my feet. Ronald Reagan. My family were Reagan Democrats, but they still had a lot of nasty things to say about him and did so in front of me with impunity. But the consensus was still he was a good Christian man. That good Christian man tried to get me into a helicopter, but from a nearby fountain, it just materialised a single massive clawed foot. For his efforts, Ronnie got stepped on and turned into a smear. The rest of it came out and grinned at me, leered at me, pressed its face up against me as I cried and curled into a ball in the corner. But the military was already on the way. A bunch of planes, tanks and soldiers started to show up. They just got destroyed. No weapon phased it. No armour could withstand it. The thing just piled their corpses up in front of me, and while it never spoke, it felt like a more it less told me to count them. It just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. More than I as a child who hadn't even attended school yet could count. And I kept feeling this existential terror, especially when I saw some of the tanks had a hammer and a sickle. I was young and didn't understand geopolitics, but I understood that meant Soviet. When I finally woke up, it was taller than any mountain, just of wrecked vehicles and dead bodies, like it had killed every soldier in the world and very politely kept them as intact as possible, just to flaunt them in front of me. It seemed especially fond of killing other dragons, especially more heroic ones, like those were an affront to it. It killed Godzilla. 
It grew to the size and just started biting and scratching him. It took off one of his arms, then flew him into the air and dropped him. Godzilla breathed his thermonuclear death breath, but it just dodged the beam. Godzilla tried crawling off the water and I screamed for him not to. The dragon disappeared and reappeared in the water, dragged him in and started gouging out his eyes. I don't think it actually killed him. I think it just wanted to make the good dragon suffer. Superman, the Christopher Reeve Superman, yes, that Superman, punched it through a building and then kicked it into the clouds. I immediately started looking around for water it could jump out of, but instead it just do dove back down like a falcon and rammed him into the ground, then picked him up and started slamming him into the ground over and over, sinking its claws in deeper and deeper. It let go to start smashing him with its tail into a deeper and deeper hole. He kept trying to get up, but every time he did, the tail would just come down again. It waited for him to try before it hit again. Then, when he stopped moving, sunk a claw into him, bit down on his head and decapitated him. Opened its mouth to show me his head stuck in its teeth. I could have sworn at one point there was a nuclear explosion. It just walked out of the mushroom cloud like nothing happened. I had never seen a single nightmare on Elm Street before. Even as an adult, that carries hard disapproval from my grandparents. But all children in the 80s knew who Freddy Krueger was. He was kind of ever-present, referenced in children's cartoons. There were cardboard cutouts in rental stores. Apparently when I was two, there was one cutout that scared me enough that I wouldn't even go to that side of the store. Freddy showed up and came after me. Then the dragon showed up, grabbed his legs with one talon, and started using him as a scratching post with the other. He was killing other monsters that were trying to get me, actively torturing me and hurting other nightmares for daring to think that they had the right to terrorize me. I was for it, and it alone to torment. Some of it was just senseless. Those were people that could fight back, but then you could get into eating Disney characters, Looney Tunes, it was devouring fucking Sesame Street characters and Mr. Rogers in front of me, just to horrify me. It tore up stuffed animals I had emotional attachments to, anything I loved in life or even had a passing fondness of. Of course, it still vastly preferred those closest to me. I don't know how many times or how many ways I saw it kill my mother. Jesus Christ, stepfather and stepfist sister were three things it never attacked, which I find very curious now in hindsight. But Jesus never showed up, let alone God. I think that might have been the hardest thing. I was very religious at the time. My family were. Whatever doubts my mother had had been washed away by this whole experience. If hell is the absence of God, then these dreams were hell. It didn't matter where I slept. This thing would come almost nightly and for the next few months of my life made my nights a living hell. We tried to pray it away. We did it every night. Maybe it helped for a little while, but it would always come back. There wasn't a week that passed without a dragon dream for about a third of a year. Sometimes they would calm down and I would go a month without one. But from late age four to about six, this thing terrorized me over a year. I would always be skittish around water as a, as a result, even if I knew it never came outside of dreams. Well, it didn't now. It was very real when it first attacked me, and the story of me flying out of the bathtub screaming is corroborated by my mother saying it happened. That was no dream, even if it was just an apparition. I was wide awake the first time it attacked me. When I saw a person or character or animal it had eaten recently, I might just break down and sob on the spot. It was tearing me down even outside my dreams. It made sure I couldn't do anything without being reminded of it. Though that would come to an end. Not by growing out of it, no. By inundation, I started to grow more and more bold. It didn't like that. It didn't like it when I threw rocks at it or when I stopped screaming in terror and started screaming in rage. So it stopped attacking my family and started attacking me. It felt so real, tearing my flesh with its teeth, skewering my abdomen with talons, breaking limbs with that tail. Constant agony. It hurts even after I woke up. My mother was a little less supportive here, 
suggesting it was just growing pains and bad dreams, but this wasn't any normal nightmare. Talking to her now, she admits to saying that mostly just to make me feel better. In truth, she thought I had suffered a sort of demonic possession. More praying, more chanting scripture. The pastor got involved. That was when he and his wife became a major target. I know at one point she took me to see a therapist and this was probably around that time, but it wasn't especially helpful. Regardless, the dragon was sure to kill him too, just to remind me no one could help me. I suspect the therapist didn't believe we were actually living in a haunted house, let alone that this was my mother's second time. Not that I blame anyone for skepticism. If you haven't experienced such a thing for yourself, I could hardly get angry at you for seeing this as some trauma brought on by what that witch had done. Either way, she's responsible. But I assure you, this was all very real for me. I think the goal was to destroy my spirit, wear me down, to leave me as nihilistic of a husk of a person as it could as a young age is. It wanted to crush my hope. She wanted to, to hurt my mother through me. But it wasn't through prayer or through psychology that I healed myself. I did that myself. It had gotten me scared to confront it again when I was the target. But that can only happen so many times before you start getting feisty again. Before you start fighting back. I was starting to do that again. It really didn't like that. Any time I fought back too hard, I would wake up. A few times I felt like I was turning the tables on it. I recall specifically putting out its eye in one dream with a knife as it bit me. A frantic last ditch spiteful attack, like a seal biting at a great white or Captain Ahab's last words, from the pit of hell I stab at thee. In every subsequent dream, it didn't have that eye. Now I was getting even more brazen. I was still scared of it, but when it showed up, well, funny thing nihilism. Even if I didn't understand it as a concept at that age, I do now. And you just don't care. I would actually lunge at it and attack it whenever it would show itself. Sure, I would get pulverized for it, ripped to pieces. I wanted to fight it though. But then something very different happened. It was just before starting school. I was reunited with Tigger in a dream. That happy, passive, orange tabby in a nice open field. I pulled him into my lap and rubbed his belly as he peered for me as though to say he was okay and everything was alright now. It was the first dream I had with him since, well, since he died. Then the clouds came, with them, rain. I don't think I need to say where this is going, but it had never come out of the rain before. This was the first time. Like some phantom, it just materialised out of the pouring rain. I was up and running immediately. The ground was soaked by the sudden deluge though. The mud sucked off my shoes, my socks. Even as I ran through the bog and sank to my knees, I knew that the demon dragon was actually after. I threw Tigger to give him as much of a head start as I could. He tried to run. That demon leaned over me and snatched him up in those jaws, flayed him open and threw him in my face. I laid face down in the mud, covered in cat guts and blood. I turned to look up at it and the bastard was smiling at me. A wide grin showing off all those dagger teeth in its distended maw. No real nostrils to speak of. Just a slight protrusion from the rest of its head. A stubby little snout full of knives and malevolence and sadistic glee. Before I could respond, I woke up. I just stared at the ceiling for a moment before I forehead my brow and ground my teeth together. I wasn't sad, I wasn't scared. I was just angry. Maybe it was a silly thing to be a final straw. Wouldn't killing me or my family members be much worse? All that time it literally slew the armies of the world. But for me at the time, that was just it. Of all the shitty things this night terror had done to me, that was by far the shittiest in my mind at the time. Letting me reunite just to take that brief moment of happiness and closure away from me. I closed my eyes shut again. I relaxed, I calmed down, and I forced myself to go back to sleep. That in of itself is hard, especially when you just got so worked up. I don't know if I could do it now as an adult all that easily. To start back up again in the dream you were just having, 
must be even harder. That's never happened to me before or after. This was the first, last and only time. The dragon was walking away in the rain when I got up. It stopped and turned around dumbstruck. Then I started to run to it, slugging through the mud with purpose. That made it a little unnerved. I had seen it grimace or scowl in irritation before, but had never seen it even a little frightened. It was that I came back. It was that it had dismissed me from the realm of dreams and I came back. That intimidated it. I never talked to it before outside of screaming or making emphatic pleas for mercy or yelling for it to leave me alone. Here, I spoke one sentence to it. How dare you? The sheer audacity that it would do that. Do that to him after what happened to him in real life. That I said actually startled it, scared it. It looked me over, noticing how the mud wasn't bogging me down anymore. How I was almost skimming across it as I broke into a run. It began to backpedal. Some massive dragon bigger than a Tyrannosaurus stepping back from an angry six-year-old. It would be amusing if I wasn't so blindingly pissed. If now, some 30 years later, I wasn't still so blindingly pissed. It was too late to run. I vaulted myself at its face, clearing the 20 or so feet this beast had from the ground and latched on, biting and scratching and tearing out gouts of its face. It threw me off and slashed at me with its claws. I didn't care. I didn't care how much the wound hurt or how deep it was, or if my guts were hanging out or anything else. I jumped back on it and started biting and scratching again, ripping out chunks of scaled flesh and leaving black blood to ooze out and foam. It threw me again and brought its tail down like a hammer. I grabbed it even as I was mashed into the ground and started biting and scratching it. It flung me from its tail. I landed on my feet and ran back at it, even as it started to turn to rout completely. There would be no escape. As this happened, the rain poured harder. The ground turned to quicksand. Hail fell from the sky and bolts of lightning filled the air. It was using everything at its disposal to slow me down, to get me off, to beat me down, but I wouldn't quit. I wouldn't accept anything less than the beast's demise. I leapt back into its face and rammed an open palm into its one remaining good eye, made a fist and pulled it out. I was rewarded with a deafening scream, the most shrill roar you could imagine. Something that was once a bass, deep and guttural, was now a squealing soprano. I wasn't done, but even as I started biting and scratching again, it pulled me down into its jaws. Did it think I cared? Did it think I gave in the remotest of dams? Even as the wind and hail and rain and thunder beat at my body, even as it brought tornadoes down from the sky, I started biting and scratching its tongue, those disgusting protruding goblin shark gums, the inside of its mouth. It tried to spit me out. No, I refused. It tried to swallow. I found this acceptable. Its throat would pay the price as I lashed out with my fangs slashed with clawed fingertips, biting and scratching, all the way down. I could hear its bellowing even over the relentless pounding of hailstones, even over the beating of its wings as it took flight, even over the sound of the whirlwinds it summoned to try to pull me off it, even over the sound of my own angry screaming, given to some feral rage. I did so much biting and scratching, I tore my way through its stomach and outside of it, even as I tumbled to the ground, I landed on my feet and started chasing it again, just snarling and growling and carrying on. Through hail, through lightning striking me, even when twisters whipped around me, I kept coming as it tried to fly away. I was gaining. It was going to die. I could still taste its blood and I wanted more. I could feel its impending doom and so could it. That's when my mom woke me up. It was understandable once I realised the state I was in. I'd grabbed one of my stuffed animals, a large hippo bigger than I was, and I had, well, I'm sorry, Mr. Hippo. I didn't mean to bite your face off and rip your limbs from your body. 
I started crying. Mom pulled me out of bed and got all the cotton or whatever that poor hippo was stuffed with off me. All the little tatters of his grey skin. Made sure I hadn't swallowed too much of him. I blubbered out what had happened. She was happy? Maybe this, is, this will be the end of it. Of course, I wasn't happy. She could see that, especially given the cat. I think hearing about him made her tear up too. As any good mother should, she did her best to soothe and assuage my misery. But I was melancholy for the first and rest of the week. Just bitter. I wouldn't dream about the dragon again. That is actually the source of my bitterness. Maybe I am too vengeful, but writing this now, 30 years later, I'm still upset. I didn't intend for this part of the story to be so long. I actually had another story I wanted to tell in the same post, and now this one is so long it needs its own post. But it was like the floodgates opened. The more I remembered, the more I wrote. The more I wrote, the angrier I got. The angrier I got, the more I remembered. Everything about this early time of my life is hazy, but this is a laser focus. I feel emotionally drained. I wanted to tell more stories, but it's going to have to be these three. I've always been a jaded, pessimistic person to some degree, and I think it started here. I never realised the impact this had on me. I just wanted to tell a spooky true story that could also work as a creepy pasta. And this just ate my entire night and came back for seconds. While writing this, I got so mad. Mad to the verge of tears. And not over my mom being pushed out of a hayloft by a malevolent spirit or some eclectic lunatic with delusions of grandeur murdering cats. I was wrong. I didn't hear myself. The scar is still there and it's ugly and pulsating. I traded one kind of wound for another. I still can't get over that I didn't manage to kill it. That it had escaped maybe to terrorise someone else. Maybe I did, but I didn't see a corpse. I had my victory taken from me. It isn't, it isn't about competitiveness. It was about paying that bastard back for everything it did to me. It didn't suffer enough. I want to terrorise it like it did me. I wanted to see the fruits of its labour. To see how it helped me into this spiteful, angry person I am today. I want to see the look of horror on its face when it realises I'm even worse now than when I was six. No blind rage. Take my time. Work him over slowly like it did in so many of my nightmares. I still can't deal with the fact that it got away. So this is a story from 2008. There was a guy, let's call him Ollie. It was late August and he was done nothing in summer. He then decides that he should take a camping trip over the tundra. He packs with the tent and gets his brother to drive him to the place that he's going to start at. He reaches the spot and starts walking. He has to walk through a forest before reaching the tundra. When he reaches the tundra, he decides to take a lunch break. Then he sees an ATV coming towards him. It's an old man, one of the local reindeer herders that are here. They start talking, with the old man telling Ollie a good route to walk, and where the best fishing lakes are. Before driving off, he says one last thing to Ollie. Remember not to set up camp on what looks like an old trail, and remember to ask permission before setting up the camp. He then drives off. Ollie continues walking and he just laughs at the old man. Ask permission, what nonsense. He then arrives at a lake and decides to stay there for the night. He sets up his tent and goes inside. Since it's late August, the midnight sun doesn't shine anymore, but the moon is so bright that he can even see his own shadow. He goes inside his tent and reads a book before going to sleep. After 20 minutes, he hears footsteps and some grunting coming towards him. He grabs his flashlight and goes to check outside. He then sees a small group of reindeer running away. He laughs at himself. That old man really messed with my head. Now I got spooked by some reindeer. 
He goes back inside and lays down again, but he doesn't fall asleep. He has an eerie feeling. Then out of nowhere, he hears something. It's a person talking. The sound is faint, but he hears there's someone there. He goes back outside, but there's no one there. He just thinks to himself that he's probably just going crazy, since he is quite tired. He goes back inside, and this time, he does fall asleep. He then wakes up to a cold wind blowing against him. The door is open, and he's pretty sure he closed it. Then he looks to his left, and his eyes turn wide open. There's a human shadow outside his tent. He grabs his flashlight and goes out, but there's no one there. He just sees a fox running away from there. He goes back in, but he doesn't fall asleep. Hours pass by, and he finally falls asleep. Then suddenly, he feels the cold air coming in again. He wakes up, and he sees something that makes coldness go through his body. Two white hands are in front of him, reaching for his legs. He screams, and just as he does that, the hand grabs his legs. He's dragged outside. He screams and flails around, but the hands keep on dragging him. Then finally, they let go. He's been dragged 18 meters from his tent. He runs back again and grabs his flashlight. He tries to look around, but there's nothing there. Then all of a sudden, the flashlight turns off. He then looks towards a hilltop, and there he sees something. It's a human silhouette and a reindeer silhouette. He blinks and they're gone. The flashlight's also turned on again. He goes back to his tent and this time he doesn't fall asleep. Morning comes and he's finally fallen asleep. He wakes up to the sound of an ATV coming towards him. It's the old man again. He goes outside and the first thing the man says to Ollie is, looks like someone hasn't slept this night. Didn't you do as I said? He then laughs it off. He helps Ollie pack up his camp and tells him to pick up some shrubs so they can make a campfire. Ollie picks up some shrub and then the old man makes the fire. He then gives Ollie some reindeer meat that he can grill on the fire. While they're eating, the old man stands up and looks towards the hilltop. He then starts talking in the Sami language, something that Ollie doesn't understand. He then sits down again and tells Ollie a story. This lakeside is the old migration route of the Bavtos Elu. Halo of the mountains. He used to camp here when he was alive, when his herd grazed on that hilltop. He then follows up with, I know he disturbed you this night, and I can see he dragged you along the ground. I asked him for forgiveness, and said that you didn't know that he used to live here. Bavtos Elu said to me this was just a warning, so that you might learn something. Ollie turned white. He hasn't told anything to the old man about his night. They pack up, and the old man gives Ollie a ride over some rivers to his ATV. Ollie continues his trip to the tundra and remembers to ask for permission on each place he sets up camp. He sleeps undisturbed each night. Then one day, he meets a man about 30 years old. Name is Nihilus. They stop and talk. Ollie asks Nihilus if he knows the old man. Nihilus tells him that the old man is Rosovaki Mate. Mati of the Cross Valley. Ollie also tells Nihilus about the night he experienced. Nihilus just laughs at him and says, you made the same mistake I did when I was younger. I also set up camp and didn't ask for permission. You could bet that I didn't sleep for the whole night. He then continues by saying that Mata is not a normal person. He's said to speak with the dead and he sees things that other people can't see. He knows everything of these mountains in his tundra and all of its story. He's also been said to heal people. There was once a child that had accidentally cut himself with a knife. Luckily, Marta was there. He stopped the blood and held the wound with his hands. The child stopped crying, and when the ambulance arrived, the child said that it didn't hurt anymore. The cut was also quite deep, as you could almost see the bone. The child recovered really fast too. Ollie continued his trip, until he finally arrived to the town he was walking to. There he took a bus to his hometown and was quite tired of his trip. So this story is about my great-great-grandpa, named Marty. 
He was on his way to his herd after being on a trip in town. He was with his trusty reindeer that is pulling his sleigh. The reindeer is really calm and isn't spooked easily, so he really likes to take him into town to trade and buy stuff. They were walking along a forest on their way to the tundra and his family. It's really dark, with only the moon that gives out a bit of light. He isn't bothered by that. He's walked through this path hundreds of times without any problems. He does a little yoik, yoinking his trusty reindeer. Then out of nowhere, the reindeer stops. Marte tries to make the reindeer move, but it doesn't even budge. The reindeer is looking at their left side, looking at a thicket. Marte decides to look in the same direction as the reindeer, but the darkness makes it so he doesn't see very well. Then suddenly, out of nowhere, a bone-freezing cry comes from the trees. The reindeer gets spooked and starts running. Marte is fast enough to jump on the sleigh before he gets left behind. The reindeer is sprinting away and isn't even thinking of stopping. Marte looks behind him and in horror, he sees a small shadow following them and shrieking. He can barely see it, but he does see it has a human shape. Then he whispers himself to himself, God damn it, it's an Aparis. The reindeer is running at 60 kilometers an hour and the shadow is right behind them. Marte thinks to himself what to do because if that thing manages to run three circles around him, he'll go insane. He yells back, child of the forest, if you let me calm down my reindeer, I can help you. It works, the shadow stops. The reindeer has calmed down enough. He jumps off the sleigh, takes the sleigh off the reindeer and ties the animal to a tree. But he doesn't tie it properly so that the reindeer can break free if things go south. He pulls out a candle and lights it. He draws a cross on the snow and sits down. He then says, come out, I'll help you. Sure enough, behind a rock, a small child appears. Probably four years old, skin pale as snow, missing an eye and a foot. It only has a small leather dress on it. Marte then tells it that he's going to baptize it. He starts by drawing a cross on its forehead. Then he starts to pray. He does the Lord's Prayer, but he starts at the end and reads it backwards. He then gives the child a name, and since it's a girl, she gets the name Needle. The child now looks at Marte and whispers the words thank you to him. It then runs back into the woods. Marte takes the reindeer and escapes the place as fast as possible. He returns to his family but decides not to tell anyone in case they become scared. But after that, the crying wasn't heard again. So a short explanation of the Eparas. Back in the old days, the Sami people had hard access of getting medical help since they lived so far away. So if a child was born with a disease or was injured, they couldn't afford to treat the child. They had limited resources. So taking care of a sick child was a risk to themselves so they would have to leave the child to die in the forest. The child would then die and become any paras. It would then haunt the area, crying for its parents. The cry is said to freeze bones and make the bravest of people piss themselves. They're really fast and will try to run circles around you. If it manages to do three laps, you would become insane. Some are said a turn into a termegan a type of Bruce bird, and the only difference is that it has red legs. There is a way to escape any paras. Speak calmly to it, just like with a child. Then you're going to baptize it. By reading the Lord's Prayer backwards from end to beginning and giving it a name, but do not give it a human or animal name. Common ones for boys are hammer, knife, axe, etc. And for girls, needle, gold, spoon. Then the child will leave and is never heard again after it has found peace. The story is about a guy named Antti. He had checked on his reindeer and was walking home. It was the midsummer day and the midnight sun was shining bright. He then notices a smoke in the distance. He decides to check it out in case it's someone who's lost. 
He appears at the smoke, but there's no one there. He walks closer and there isn't even a fire. He thinks about it and decides to sit down beside it. He sits completely still and doesn't move a muscle. After a bit, a thick fog comes towards him. He's surrounded by the fog, but decides not to move. He sits completely still. He's heard about the Ard Nahavdi and remembers what his grandma has told about it. After a while of sitting in the fog, he hears something. It's a dog barking and the sound is moving towards him. He then sees a dog running towards him. But he recognises the dog. It's his brother's dog that bit him when he was a child. The dog is springing towards him, but he doesn't move. The dog lunges. The dog is mere centimetres from biting Auntie's throat, but it stops. Auntie just says, shoo, go away. You don't scare me. The dog looks him in the eyes and runs back and disappears into the fog. Auntie keeps on sitting still. He's been sitting still when he sees a big figure in the fog. The figure is walking towards him, but he doesn't move. He then sees what it is. It's a giant moose. And he has always been afraid of moose after one was killed his uncle when they were getting a wood. He will always remember the sight. His uncle getting kicked in the chest before the moose stomps his head, killing him. The moose is only a meter away from him. It keeps on walking and disappears back into the fog. And he is still sitting still and he has been the whole night. He then hears something. It's a yoik. But it's not any kind of yoik. It's the same yoik his uncle made him when he was a child. The yoik is getting closer and closer. Then a human figure is standing in front of him. He doesn't recognize the person. It then moves closer and now he can see it. A wound on the chest and face. It's his uncle. They look at each other in silence. Then his uncle opens his mouth and says, you are the reason I'm dead. You should have been the one getting killed by the moose. You should be the one walking this endless tundra by yourself. Auntie doesn't answer. His uncle then pulls out a knife and is walking towards Auntie. He just closes his eyes and says, you are not real. He opens his eyes and sure enough, his uncle is gone. Auntie has been sitting the whole night. Then the fog disappears and the ground stops smoking. He then stands up and walks towards the spot. He starts to dig and sure enough, there's a small wooden chest there. He opens it and there are a bunch of gold and silver coins there. He picks up the chest as it's about to leave. Before he does that, he picks up a bunch of small stones and makes a cross on the ground. He does a prayer and walks home. So a short summary of the Ard Nahavdi. No one knows who the grave belongs to, but many think it belongs to older or people of the underground. The basic premise is that on Midsummer's Day, if you spot a smoke in the distance and there's nothing there, then it's an Ard Nahavdi. You are then supposed to sit there the whole night and wait. You are not allowed to move or else you will go insane or get killed. Then you will encounter three of your fears. They could be fears, childhood fears, or past trauma that haunts you. If you manage to sit the whole night without moving, you will be rewarded with a bunch of silver and gold. Okay, this happened back in September and I finally got the nerve and enough clarity and reflection on it to start writing this post about a month ago. I keep writing and deleting and rewriting because the events itself was so difficult to put into words, but also because there are also so many other facets and surrounding events that seem to be involved. It shook me to the core in a way that very few events in my life have, and I honestly kept shaking too much to type for the first few attempts. Also, I keep getting really frustrated that my words are coming off like a fucking creepy paster. No offence to anyone who wants to write one. I just feel like the more I say, no, really, this happened, the less it sounds like reality and more like fiction. Which, ironically, writing the previous sentence probably skews things towards fiction as well. I don't know. 
feel free to call it whatever you want. But I'm posting this because I honestly and truly could use some advice or shared experience or suggestions on reading material that could help me figure out what the hell happened to me and what I saw. I'm also not too familiar with this group, but it seemed to be the most appropriate. If there's another one that might fit better for serious inquiry into the paranormal or unknown, please let me know. Thank you for reading this far. I have a horrible ability to ramble in an attempt to provide enough detail. It's my firm belief through literal decades of self-run tests that there is, in fact, another realm of existence beyond the physical and that I, along with many others, have the ability to access those realms. When I was younger, I didn't think there was anything beyond and I just had bad wiring in a broken brain. But I went out to prove that, and I couldn't. There was too much evidence to indicate that yes, I was ill. But there was also so much beyond ordinary reality that we don't normally perceive. I'm only going into this much detail to make a point that, in my honest opinion, there's mental illness and a spirit realm. And whenever I have an experience that seems supernatural, it's first and foremost treated as a delusion, until proven otherwise. So back in September, I saw a creature. It looked like a Wendigo, but nothing seemed evil or emaciated about it, which was confusing. Also, in the past year, three close friends have seen something similar within the local region, if not the same creature. They never told me any of this, but when I told them of my experience, they went white as a sheet and then told me what happened to them. But their experience was opposite of mine, in terms of the intent and impression of the creature, which is also confusing. Also, this was not a physical being. I want to be very clear about that. I was drawn into the astral plane or spirit realm, like the energetic framework that provides the support and structure for every object and living creature that is in ordinary reality. In my opinion, it's like the energy plane is the lumber that builds the underlying structure for a house. The wooden framing is always there supporting and forming the house that we see, and we know it's there, and it's really responsible for the structure that we see, but we never see the framing. Doesn't mean it's not there. You'd get called crazy for denying a home has unseen framing, but mention the same idea with another level of reality? Definitely nuts. Anyway, here's the experience. I was at work, and a strange sensation took hold of me. I felt my attention drawn towards the shed outside, and as I turned to look, I was pulled from my body into the astral realm. It wasn't a slip that I initiated, it was more like I was wearing a full body safety harness, and a cable suddenly pulled me from my body with tons of force. It was as if I was launched from my physical body. I've got decades of experience with astral travel, but none where I'm the one who wasn't initiating it. I didn't have time to worry or even think about what just happened, as the being, whom I believed initiated the entire experience, became apparent. I think he pulled me out there to evaluate me or inspect me, or maybe it was just the same type of curiosity a human would have towards finding a dune bug or grasshopper, because the power imbalance felt about that great, like a bug looking up at a human. Anyways, I had somehow passed through the wall and was now roughly 15 feet outside the house, and the being was walking between me and the shed. He walked toward me, and then turned and walked away to my left. While walking, he slowed, turned and looked at me, the strange thing is, I was mostly in ordinary reality, but looking towards him, it was as though the power within, within him tore a fucking hole through reality. It was like I was looking through a living porthole torn through the fabric of reality, a waving undulating portal through the physical world and into the ethereal framework that holds up the illusion of matter and everyday reality. This portal through the veil was circular and ringed like liquid with fire without heat, and he seemed to generate the fuel with his flesh. 
like his skin was radiating and sweating energy so powerful it tore a hole through reality. He too was cloaked in a cloud of orange and blue fire, but unlike ordinary fire, like fire and electricity had somehow created a wet, pulsing offspring through some forbidden union. He was massive, between eight and ten feet tall, extremely muscular, and of human form until the lower legs, which were much more similar to a deer or moose. The human portion of his body was, well, ripped, <laughs> but like, as muscular as possible while still maintaining ultimate dexterity and speed. Not some puffed up gym rat that's lost the ability to tie his shoes or scratch his back from bulk, but a perfect balance of strength, speed, fluid flexibility, and a terrifying grace of movement. I'm making this point because seeing his form and movement for a brief moment made it clear he was god of the hunt, a dealer of death and a master of destruction. And yet, he never seemed evil or malicious or dark. It wasn't a sense of ugly doom and hatred he exuded, but pure beauty. I know, believe me when I say it was extremely confusing to see that juxtaposition. Words seem pitiful tools to describe the experience. Like trying to do brain surgery with a sledgehammer, but I'm trying here. But his head was the skull of a moose, maybe a deer or a horse. Pretty sure through research it was a moose, which we have here. But the antlers were more like a hybrid of an elk and maybe an Irish elk, absolutely massive. A much oversized skull with a simply physically impossible rack. The especially otherworldly part of his antlers wasn't their size though. It was certainly started at the skull looking like ordinary, albeit way oversized antlers. But they transformed into the same energy slash fire slash electricity that he was engulfed in and flowed out like lightning into the corona surrounding him that formed the tear in the veil. Like they were helping generate and maintain the portal between our realms of that sacred and the profane. By the way, I'm in Wendigo country. The tribes from this area of the Algonquin speaking origin. Oh yeah, forgot to mention that. I'm right where that tale originates. More on that later. This moment is what still has me so shook up, even months later. He seemed mildly interested and slightly amused that I was looking at him, that I didn't look away in terror at the power that was before me. I'm really not trying to boast. It was more shock that I kept looking at than bravery. However, I will say that through studies regarding shamanism and dealing with spirits in general, I've never forgotten that it's a crucial fact. You can't go into those situations and forget that you have to hold your ground. Even if you feel like an ant facing a steamroller, you stand strong and tall if you want to get us alive and sane. Never forget your power, the stronger the being, the stronger you have to stand. The best I can do to explain the experience is this. I felt sobbing with joy that whatever this thing was that was studying me had chosen to not obliterate me, to turn me to dust and ash with a single thought. I felt confused but eternally grateful that there was something in my being that made him look at me with mild curiosity, that whatever was within me and had granted me grace instead of annihilation Again, it was like being a bug, lost inside the house of someone who chooses to catch you with a cup and throw you outside, instead of crushing you and throwing you in the trash. He turned and walked away. The portal closed. I was thrown back into my body, and suddenly I was back inside and helping my co-worker install hardwood flooring. Yeah. So here's the thing. He looked like a Wendigo in the sense he was a man's form, mostly with a skull for a head with antlers, and the legs slash feet were moosage. Earlier I described them in that more detail, but honestly, the whole thing lasted 10 seconds tops, and studying his feet wasn't top priority. Pretty sure they faded into hooves though. Full disclosure, a lot to take in, huh? But here's the rub, he was not emaciated. He was not malicious in any way. Opposite of that in fact. And I felt blessed to be in his presence, not terrified for my life. Also, he wasn't a physical creature, but an ethereal one. 
So what the fuck? Please, if anybody has any experiences or ideas or references, I'd really appreciate it because I'm at a loss. Also, I didn't go looking for this guy for the record. In fact, I had been thinking a little before they happened that it seems most stories of Wendigo are wildly inaccurate and that it has recently become the new hit monster for Hollywood and the internet alike. And when actual folklore on it seems pretty different than from how it's being represented. Not to mention this variety of tribes with a variety of versions. Then this fucking happens. <laughs> Regarding my three friends, they've all seen a creature that more closely resembles the popular rendition of the Wee Wendigo. And it was most definitely malicious. One of my friends is convinced it's after him. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised. One friend's first thing he said to me when I described what I saw, I'm so sorry, my dude. That thing has ruined my life. Nothing has been the same since I first saw it. And I should add, I don't think I've ever seen him scared like that. Former Marine who served in Afghanistan, who's also having a shit time recently and is passively suicidal and struggling with addictions. Yeah, and he got scared. I should mention there's been a lot of death in our area in the past two years. Although not caused by whatever these creatures are. Car attacks, but mostly ODs. I've lost two brothers since 2020 and other friends. My marine buddy lost seven friends. Four of them in the main group. Just him left. I'm so fucking sick of all the death and suffering and isolation and fear lately. It makes me wonder if these creatures are attached to it. I don't know, just a thought. Here's that note on my mental health. Just putting it all out there before someone suggests it was all psychosis. And hey, who knows? Maybe I'm extremely skeptical in nature. I think it's healthy. But I really, really doubt it, and here's why. Long story short, I started hallucinating slash psychotic systems since I can remember. Been seeing shrinks and whatnot for my whole life. Diagnosed bipolar, PTSD, that shit didn't help the psychosis. Had to go through a dozen meds to get balanced. Been to grippy sock jail, rehab, etc. So am I crazy? Sure, that's a word for it. But here's the thing. I've hallucinated for six months non-stop. I know what that's like. And there's always a giveaway with the hallucination. You just have to use logic and hunt for it. Also, the chronic and extreme hallucinations were when I wasn't on medication. And often when I was strung out from trying to make it stop with heavy drug use. Which works great for a few hours, and then it's worse, so you do more. Then it's better and, huh, oh yeah, that's called addiction. When this experience happened, I was stable. I haven't had psychotic symptoms, without due cause, like extreme emotional distress, chronic insomnia, etc. And even then, they're mild. Traces, halos, etc. Think tiny amounts of psychedelics. I'm putting out this info that can be used to discount my story because this story sounds obviously kind of insane. The fact wasn't lost on me, huh? And I'll be the first to doubt my sanity. Having blind faith that I'm fine with my history is a recipe for disaster. So I'm including all my past history and diagnoses in an effort towards full transparency, but also to reach out to anyone who might be going through similar struggles with, am I crazy or is this spiritual? My desire to determine the existence of anything beyond the ordinary led me down some amazing paths. Shamanism, Wicca, entheogens, psychedelics, yoga, Buddhism, etc. And was the driving force behind my minor in religious studies for my BA. I decided when I was younger that I would have faith in nothing until I could prove it. And I would assume that there was nothing in the beyond until I could. No God, soul, etc. Nothing without evidence, derived through logic and obtained facts. I was in trying to prove to myself that there was nothing beyond what science provided, and that I was indeed just crazy, that I proved something more. So, so much more. I didn't go out seeking God. I wanted reassurance that I was just broken and that no one had a soul so that I could kill myself without guilt or fear of hell. I was 20 when I almost drowned in a lake. I was with my college buddies when it happened. 
Stupidly, we overloaded Joe's small fishing boat with supplies and the boat capsized. But something else happened on the lake that day which I've never spoken of. The monster living at the bottom of the lake tried to kill me. 25 years later, it's calling out to me again. We were up north when it happened. When I say up north, I'm talking 600 miles north of Toronto. So yeah, north. Me and Daniel were visiting our buddy Joe and his girlfriend Trina up in Kapu's casing that summer. We were looking to catch us some walleye on Lake Sturgeon and have ourselves a good time doing so. We spent the afternoon finishing along the Kapu's casing river with mild to adequate success. Joe knew of a secret camping spot out on a shiny lake where the fish were always biting. He convinced us to go. It's an hour drive further up north, he said, in the middle of Nowheresville. This was a new world for me and Daniel. You've never been this far north. And we were as green as the moss which seemed to be growing on everything we touched. We needed Joe's aluminium fishing boat to transport us to the small islet. Needless to say, we overpacked the boat. We had three tents, two acoustic to cars, two coolers full of food, four cases of beer, fold-up chairs and a plethora of fish, fishing paraphernalia, not to mention bug spray, strong weed and plenty of smokes. From all accounts, it started off a fun weekend. We partied and jammed on the guitars and sang drunkenly all night long, blanketed by the stars in the endless northern sky. When it was fully dark, we sat transfixed around the campfire while Joe regaled us of scary stories regarding the monster living at the bottom of the lake. These stories, it said, go back many generations. The monster, Joe told us, under the waning light of the crescent moon, has habituated at this lake for eons, long before any settlers dared to occupy this frigid northerly land. Sometimes the monster gets hungry. That's when people go missing. Every year, some poor fisherman goes missing at this lake and no body is ever found. This is why the locals rarely, if ever, fish here. The lake may be small, Joe said, but it's deep. I thought he was telling tall tales, you know? Little did I know. The following day, after enjoying a delicious dinner of smoked pickerel, fried potatoes and corn, Joe decided it was time to pack up the boat and head home before it gets dark. Once again, the boat was bogged down with our supplies. We all knew it was dangerous, but we did it anyway. To make matters worse, nobody knew where we were. This was the 90s before smartphones, so it wasn't uncommon for people to disappear on fishing trips. Just ask Bill Barilko. We'd only spotted one other boater on the lake that day, a fisherman, and that was early in the morning. As far as we knew, we had this body of water to ourselves. It was after 7pm by the time we set our sad little vessel back into the water. Soon, the sun would set and things would go wonky. I remember it clearly. Joe and Trina were situated at the back of the boat. Joe was struggling to guide the vessel across the bumpy lake. The boat wanted none of it. We were constantly being knocked back and forth as if on a wooden roller coaster. And I could tell Joe was nervous from something I'd never seen before. Daniel sat at the bow. His job was to monitor the water level getting into the boat. It was an important job. He was in full panic mode from the get-go. We should never have put so much stuff in the boat, he complained over and over, while spooning the water out on the boat. Of course, he was correct, but we were young, carefree and hopelessly naive. The lake was furious. White caps rolled angrily across the entire bowl of water. Water was seeping into the boat at an alarming rate. I was sitting in the middle of the boat, doing nothing of value, watching as the anxiety on Daniel's face intensified. We were now in the middle of the lake. The water was a foot deep inside the boat and the lake continued to pound us into submission. To make matters worse, only a speckle of sunlight remained. Time, as they say, was of the essence. Joe boated us laboriously across the water as best he could. And our vessel was teetering dangerously low due to our negligence and the white caps continued to submerge the boat. Daniel was having a panic attack. I'll never forget the look of pure, unadulterated terror on his long, pale face that final moment before we sank the boat. Joe, he said, Joe, help. Those were his final words. His eyes were big and round and full of fear. 
He was frantically scooping the water out of the boat using a discarded tin can, but his efforts were futile. One minute we were floating haphazardly across the drink, the next we were underwater. The boat capsized. Our belongings either sank to the bottom of the lake or floated away. First, we removed our footwear. I was sad to see my Doc Martens fall to the bottom of the lake. Then we scrounged up the life preservers and put them on nice and snug. We then spent a good 15 minutes trying to flip the boat over. Right side up, but failed. Instead, we wasted precious time and energy. Daniel, who was more scared than anyone I'd ever seen up to then, was quickly becoming unnerved. It was sad to see. Trina, on the other hand, swam Olympian style across the lake and reached to shore 20 minutes later. Joe trailed close behind her. Neither of them hesitated. They just went for it. It was now me and Daniel stuck out in the middle of the lake, the city slickers. Neither of us were sufficient swimmers. Daniel was going into shock. Just swim, I told him. I was trying to sound brave. Truth is, I can't swim to save my life. I never could. But with the life jacket on, I was willing to at least give it a shot. I could see Joe and Trina waving to us from the shore, but barely. The sun was sinking fast. In 20 minutes or so, we'll be covered in a shroud of darkness. Then what? I feared the worst. I swam. I swam like my life depended on it. If Trina and Joe can do it, I can too. Yeah, I'm a lousy swimmer, but I swam, goddammit, I swam. At some point, I looked behind me to check on Daniel, and to my horror, he was swimming backstroke, going the wrong way. Dan, I called out, you're going the wrong way. He didn't hear me. I was growing weak and weary. My arms and legs were dead tired. I was frightfully cold. My time was coming to an end. I realized this joylessly. I strained to see the speck of land off in the distance where Trina and Joe were waiting for us. Soon, the shore would disappear completely and they would too. Something nudged my foot. Must be a fish, I told myself, a big one. I shook my leg, hoping to shoo it away. Then it happened again, only more forcibly. I started kicking my legs, looking to scare off whatever it was. It didn't work. Suddenly, I was scared. Something was underneath me, something big. It latched onto my leg. It didn't let go. It forced me underwater. Frantically, I fought to free myself from whatever it was. I had no idea what was happening. Moments later, I come up coughing and wheezing, gasping for air. By this point, I was out of my mind, terrified. Dan, I shouted. My voice sank like a stone. Dan, you're going the wrong way. I swam to him which took all my strength to do so. He was crying. Something snatched my foot again. Something brittle like sandpaper. My leg was getting torn to shreds. The pain was uncompromising. What, what the hell is that? I asked through chattering teeth. The look stamped across Daniel's face said everything I needed to know. He'd felt it too. There's something down there, I said. We gotta keep moving. We swam. But unfortunately, the lake was non-compliant and our efforts were futile. There was no use. We were both incompetent swimmers. The lake had us all for itself. Us and the monster. Daniel straightened out and for a moment, I thought we had a fighting chance at reaching shore. Then he got pulled over. Dan! He was gone. I began splashing and making an abundance of noise. Dan! Something grabbed my leg and forced me under. For a moment I was dead, I'm sure of this. I saw the bright light tunneling toward me. I went toward the light and for a moment I was at peace. Then everything came rushing in. My lungs were filled with water and my body was thrashing about. I was being dragged down to the bottom of the lake. I opened my eyes. For a moment, all I could see was the murkiness of lake water. And then I saw it, the monster. It took a moment to comprehend what I was witnessing. It was huge. It looked like a giant otter, only uglier. It had beady eyes, elongated whiskers and long muscular arms with claws for hands and teeth. I remember its teeth, sharp, white, crooked and cruel. Beside me, netted in the monster's claws was Daniel, who was missing his left arm. Blood was pouring out of him like paint from a can. His eyes were open and lifeless. I fought back as best as I could. Unfortunately, 
my strength was at zero. I towed to the bottom of the lake. The monster, easily twice my size and weight, had me in a bear hug. I could feel my vertebra being crushed. Resistance seemed futile by this point. This is how I was going to die. Then I snapped out of it. I became alert. Just as my lungs were about to burst, I fought the monster with everything I had. I went ballistic. I jerked and lurched and scratched and flailed about. I had no shame. Without warning, it released me and I shot back up to the surface like a torpedo. The fresh air was better than sex. I took a moment to marvel in its wonder. Then I began searching for Daniel. I couldn't see him anywhere. By this point, I'm still struggling to catch my breath. Plus, I'm terrified at whatever is at the bottom of the lake. I was expecting to be hauled back down at any moment. My life jacket was torn to shreds, rendering it, rendering it impotent. And I was going to drown. Then I heard a noise and my heart almost explodes. I look up and see the thin speck of light from another boat. It's the fisherman from earlier this morning. I was saved. Within minutes I'm discovered and the fisherman hauled me into his boat. He offered me some hot coffee from his cooler. It tasted delicious. By this time, the darkness had arrived, along with the bugs which were ravenous. But I didn't care. I was alive. I told him about Daniel. The look on the fisherman's face wasn't encouraging. But to his credit, we combed the lake for over an hour, only to come up empty-handed. My mind was still grappling with what just happened. Should I tell this man about the monster at the bottom of the lake? Would he believe me? Would anyone believe me for that matter? Or would they think I'm crazy? Ultimately, I didn't mention the monster. I mean, who would? It's been many years since the summer on the lake, and I haven't spoken about this to a single soul. Although we did manage to fish my acoustic guitar from the lake, they never played the same since. Daniel's body was never found. He never did get the chance at finishing med school and becoming a family doctor, as was his plan. It was tragic. As you can imagine, his family was overwhelmed with grief. Recently, I received an email from Joe. He wants me to visit him and Gina up in Kappa's casing. It's been too long. Joe, who still loves the great outdoors, is as jaunty as ever. We should go camping at the lake, Joe said in his email. We'll take the kids and the guitars and the fishing rods and we'll have ourselves a blast. Catch us some dinner while we're at it. Reluctantly, I agreed. As I venture up the attic of Ontario, I'm reminded again of the monster at the bottom of the lake. I hadn't thought about that lake-bound beast in many years, except in my dreams. Only in my dreams I always end up as monster food. Now, I can't get the water ogre out of my mind. There's a monster living at the bottom of the lake, the locals say, but of course it can't be real. I'm a fully grown adult now. I don't believe in such folklore. This is my mantra. Apparently, the locals have since made t-shirts celebrating the monster at the bottom of the lake. We don't feed the monster. That's what city slickers do. Classy. I'll be sure to wear mine as we drop up Joe's dinghy into that frigid northern lake. Winter's fast approaching, so we'll need to dress extra warm. Legend has it, this monster gets extra hungry this time of year. Lucky me, I still can't swim. So when I first moved to my current house like 10 years ago, and I never really felt alone. Like there would always seem to be some feeling of someone being nearby. And the place just had an incredibly ominous feeling to the atmosphere. You could hear distinct footsteps upstairs when no one else was home and movement in the shadows. I know it sounds cliche, but that's truly how it began. The basement was always worse than the rest of the house. There was just an incredibly strong foreboding feeling whenever you passed the halfway mark of the stairs. It always felt like someone was right behind you. The door to the boiler room would always pop open and creak like an inch or two before just stopping. Didn't matter if you slammed the door or gently closed it. The door would always creak back open within the hour. Then there was the whispering that would happen if you ignored the door for too long. And as time passed, the whispering began to happen to me, even if I wasn't in the basement. 
The voice always changed depending on the circumstances. If I was home alone, then it was always the voice of my family members calling my name. But when I called back, the whisper would just keep repeating my name, beckoning me to come to the source of the sound until I went and investigated. Only then would the whispers stop. For extra info, my house is a decent size, so if someone isn't loud enough, then they can sound like a distant whisper, which is why I kept investigating it. If I wasn't home alone, the whispers would be an inaudible but masculine voice that always originated from right behind me. It didn't matter if I tried to play the TV really loud or if I wore headphones, the whispers were always audible. That was the extent of the activity for around a year, until one day, a tapping started in my closet. It was never random and always occurred in some type of pattern, like tap, 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 tap. And it would start up randomly and end randomly, but only when I would be home alone or between sunset and sundown. The tapping varied in length, lasting for a few minutes and restarted every few hours or Sometimes it would go for hours and then just stop for the remainder of the night. It was incredibly random. I thought it was maybe a leaky pipe or something of the sorts, but there were no pipes in that part of the wall. My room was on the top floor and there were no sinks or showers for 15 plus feet. And no mold or water stains ever appeared on the wall of the closet or the ceiling beneath my room. I was absolutely terrified to go to bed because of the sounds. But around that time, my blanket began coming off in the middle of the night. I know that sounds like the result of basic restless sleeping, but it would always be neatly folded into a square on the floor by the foot of my bed. It was absolutely horrific to have to attempt to pull the blanket off the floor and unfold it while trying to cover myself again, while knowing that whatever did that could still be in my room. I began sleeping with headphones on while playing natural white noise to make sleeping in that room easier, but it was still incredibly nerve wracking. After a few months of getting used to the closet tapping and learning to live with everything going on, whatever was in my house began to actively terrorize me during the daylight hours. The way my house is designed, there is one big living room that is separated by a wall divider to give the illusion of creating two rooms, but there's no door or anything to physically block things or sounds. The entity would start scratching the carpet like a dog does on the opposite side of the divider from me, and then slowly the scratching would come over to the right in front of where I was. Didn't matter if I was on the couch or in a chair, it would come right in front of me and scratch until I reacted. If I moved to a different seating spot, it would follow me, if I ignored it, then it wouldn't stop. But I admit that the longest I tried to ignore it was only 30 minutes. So maybe if I held out, then it would have stopped eventually. That would happen like every day until I learned that it would stop if I left the house. So I think it wanted to exercise its power over me or something. Like it was letting me know that it owned the house and I was simply being allowed to stay. But even if I left the house after the scratching, it would still happen again every three or four days like clockwork. I thought I was absolutely crazy because no one else was experiencing these things. Until one day when the scratching got too close to my dog and he began to bark at it before running over to join me on the couch and growling at whatever it was as it got closer. I complained to my mom and siblings told them that I didn't like the dogs and that I was scared to go home after school. But I used to have a very active imagination, so they would tell me to be quiet or stop talking crazy. My faith in my mom was absolutely shattered and has still never truly recovered after being dismissed so many times. All she would do was wave her hand and say, in the name of Jesus, you're safe and tell me to go away. After around three years of living in that house, around a year after the scratching began, around years after the closet tapping began, the tapping started happening in the closet at my father's house as well. So I'm like 87% sure whatever it was attached to me for some reason. I tried praying, I 
tried never being home alone. I even forced myself to get rid of my imagination to end the terror, but nothing changed. It wasn't until my brother told my mom he converted religions that my mother blessed the house with holy anointed oil. She dipped her finger in oil and put a cross on every doorway in the house to force out his evil spirits that made him doubt Christianity, that it finally stopped. The door opening, the shadows, the scratching, the whispers, they stopped that day. But the occasional ominous feelings and the footsteps both happen occasionally and I'm personally fine with that. So that's the background. But not too long ago, I feel like it's been picking up again. I had my college dorm mates come home with me since there were no flights back to his country due to them closing their borders. And he began investigating the occult while in my home. Not with Ouija boards or anything, just doing basic research and all that. Maybe he reawakened something. So while that roommate was still at my house, he began saying that he felt uncomfortable being alone in any room in the house and began walking around with headphones. After we left my house to stay elsewhere, the ominous feeling began to return more frequently than it has for the past six or seven years. And I began to see things dart around corners or move around in the dark really quick every now and then. But this time it's more physical as well. A little while after the activity began to pick up again, I was sleeping in my sister's old room alone and something cold grazed my back. So I woke up, looked around and laid back down. I had assumed it was the AC vent or something, but I was tired and forgot that the AC doesn't work in that room. Just as I was about to fall asleep again, it gently stroked my back again. That time there was no mistaking it. It felt like four small, petite fingers glided across the entirety of my back, from my shoulder to just a few inches above my butt. I immediately went under the blanket and it stopped but I was awake by that point. I eventually calmed myself down by thinking about it and I concluded that it was different from the haunting I had as a child. Whatever touched me seemed feminine and almost caring or gentle, like it hadn't meant to frighten me. A few nights later, I began to hear footsteps leading up to the second bed in the room. After my sister left, we put a second bed in there so that guests could stay over if they so desired. And then the footsteps would stop before I heard sounds similar to someone sitting on the bed and adjusting themselves. I saw nothing and didn't feel threatened. So I just sort of began talking about what I was doing and how I was feeling. And after a few minutes of that, I saw the bed spring up and heard the sound of the bed springs resetting before the sound of the footsteps went back towards the door and stopped. At that point, I got a little nervous because I couldn't chalk it up to me being a little crazy, but I wasn't truly frightened or anything. That exact thing ha began to happen every few days or so, typically when I was getting ready for bed, so I just made a routine of greeting it and talking aloud of my thoughts. After a few weeks of this, however, the activity changed and I didn't quite like it. I was minding my own business and relaxing, when the bedroom door began to shake, like someone was grabbing the handle and twisting it, but not opening the door. While shaking it violently, in the past, the door would shake occasionally if a semi-truck passed by in the neighborhood, but this was way more intense of a rattling, and I have exercise bands on the floor which have never rattled with the door before, but they did this time, which startled me because that never happens. I yelled at whatever was shaking the door to piss off you damn prankster and it stopped for a minute before the door started rattling again but softer this time. I yelled out enough I acknowledged that you're there and I walked over to the door grabbing the doorknob and started shaking it back. I stood there for a moment to see if there would be a response but the shaking ended. Since this event I had my mother pray in that room and bless it since she has become a much more devout person than I am, and all the activity in that room has ceased. At this point, I began to remember everything, and I decided to ask around since I was older now, and my words would be more respected. 
I talked to my mum about it and she said that something shook her bed once, but she told it to leave her alone in the name of Jesus and it stopped. But she also said that while I was complaining to her about the ghost stuff, that my sister had been telling her about a man in a fedora type hat who would stand in the corner and shadow figures in the dark before the house was blessed the first time, but claims that she never mentioned it after that. I have a theory that maybe she had paranormal experiences that never went away and that's what caused her to go off the deep end and start doing drugs and running around the streets at all hours. Due to her past actions, I'm pretty low contact with that sister, but in my pursuit of answers I am thinking about writing her a letter to ask her about experiences. My other sister, however, claims that when she lived in the basement that she hated being there alone because it felt like someone was always watching her, especially when she was in the shower or trying to sleep. She stayed out the house as often as possible or would have boys over just so that she wouldn't be home alone. After around six months to a year, before I began spending a lot of my time in the basement, she got pregnant and moved out. She said that she never mentioned it to anyone because she didn't want to sound crazy or scare us since my, sub my siblings and I were so much younger than her. My brother claims that he has experienced nothing and tries to logic everything away, which is a good thing, but if you confront him with undeniable proof of something happens when he was also present, we witnessed the carpet scratching once and ran upstairs before locking ourselves in our rooms. He will deny it ever happened and refuse to talk about it. He's always been the type to try and conceal and hide everything that happens to him, or what he feels, so I don't expect him to really answer my questions honestly anytime soon. I definitely want to find answers and to end this once and for all if I can. My nephews want to start spending the night with me, and I want to make sure they never experience the things that I did. So this is a story that happened in my hometown in the 1980s. There was a police officer, let's call him John. John was the police of this town. It was midsummer, and there was very little to do. One day, one of the local reindeer herders came to his office. He said that he saw a boat flip on a lake and he saw two people on the boat that fell over and they weren't able to reach the shore. The weather was windy, so the waves were quite big and he himself didn't have a boat to try and rescue them. So John decided he was going to at least try and retrieve the bodies. He asked one of the local herders if they had a boat in the neighboring lakes that he could borrow. There was one person that had a boat, so the police borrowed it. So a couple of days later, John went up to the tundra. This lake was at the border between the tundra and the forest. He got the boat and arrived at the lake. He had a scuba set that he had brought with him. He rowed right above the spots where the people had fallen over. He put on his scuba gear and dove down. The water was a bit murky, but you could still see quite well. He managed to locate the bodies. It was a 40 year old man and his 11 year old son. He swam closer and closer and decided he was going to lift the body on the boat. Just as he was about to grab the child, he saw something at the side of him. The father's arm was almost reaching for him. He dodged the arm and took the child. He swam with the body to the boat and put it on the boat. He didn't think much about it. Maybe it was just the water that moved the arm. He dove down again to retrieve the father. Just as he was about to grab the body, the arm rose again. The arm tries to grab John, but he manages to dodge it. But now he's getting a bit nervous. What happens if the arm grabs him? He tries again, and sure enough, the arm is moving towards him. He freaks out and swims a bit further. He must get the body, as he has promised to retrieve them. He decides to take an oar and try to flip the body. He swims to the boat, grabs an oar, and swims back down and manages to flip it. He swims with the oar to the boat and dives down again. Just as John is about to grab the man's leg, the body quickly turns around and tries to grab him. He dodges again and is freaking out. He then decides to get his lasso, 
to try and pull the body up to the boat. He swims back up, takes the lasso down. He quickly puts the lasso around the leg. Just as he gets his on, the arm is reaching for John. He swims back to the boat and starts to pull the body up. After a bit of struggling, he manages to get the father's body on the boat. He covers him in a tarpaulin and goes back to land. Then out of nowhere, a storm appears. It starts to hail and a giant downpour of rain. The weather in these parts can be unpredictable. He has no choice than to crawl under the tarpaulin and stay there until the storm goes away. He sits there for hours with the bodies. A couple of times, he could have sworn he saw the father's body move a little bit. The night goes by slowly, and in the morning, the weather starts to clear. He then hears the sound of an ATV. It's one of the herders. John crawls out to greet the man. The man decides to help him lift the body on John's ATV. John drives back to town, and the bodies are buried at the cemetery. John decided to never take those kinds of missions again. This is something that many people have experienced. So this is a town in northern Norway. People often travel to the nearest city to shop, visit the doctor, etc. Between the city and the town is a smaller town. Between the city and the small town is a canyon. So there was a man. Let's call him Baitar. Baitar was driving late home to his hometown from the city. It's late and a bit of snowy weather. He just drove through the canyon and is 20 minutes from the small town. He drives and suddenly he sees something on the road. It's a man with his thumbs up. Baitar drives past the person, thinking to himself why is there a person in the middle of the night standing there? He feels a chill inside his body, but he isn't bothered by that since it's cold outside. Then all of a sudden he looks in his mirror, and to his horror there's a person sitting in his back seat. Just as he's going to look behind, the person says don't look back, focus on driving instead. Baitar doesn't look back, but just focuses on the road. The person in the back seat starts talking. Drive me to the small town. I want to get off there and don't look back. Baitar keeps on driving, never looking behind himself. It's a long 20 minute drive, but at last they arrive in the small town. He's just about to stop the car to let the man out, but there's no one in the back seat. He looks behind himself and sure enough, there's no one there. He arrives home and tells his family about what he has experienced. His brother tells him that he met the hitchhiker. It's something that people have experienced between the canyon and the small town. They have encountered a person in the middle of the night with his thumbs up. If you don't pick him up, he'll appear in your car and tell you to stop at the small town where he wants to get off. Then after that, he was suddenly just vanished. So this is something that happened two years after World War II. So there's a reindeer herder, let's call him Mikkel. It was a beautiful morning. Mikkel woke up early, ate breakfast and was going to check on his reindeer. He takes his wooden skis and starts skiing. He skis over the tundra, returning three reindeer that has gone a bit too far. Hours go by and he's almost done with his round. He then notices 20 reindeer grazing a bit away from the herd. He doesn't move them as the grazing seems to be good there. He keeps on going and skis on top of a small mountain. He decides to sit there as he has a good vantage point and he can see his whole herd as well as the neighbouring herds. When he's just about to leave, he hears a faint sound. Ooh -hoo. He stops and starts thinking of what the sound was. Probably just my neighbours that have been drinking and are yelling. He sits a bit longer and again he hears it. Hoo hoo. Then he sees the 20 reindeer sprinting back to the herd. He looks around and on the other mountain he sees nothing. Until he sees something. It's something black. It's too far away to clearly see what it is. But it's spooked his reindeer. Mikhail decides to go and check it out. 
Just as he starts skiing, he hears it again. Hoo hoo. Getting annoyed, he starts moving faster. Now he sees the thing is also moving towards him. He decides to stop at a hilltop and wait for it. Now the thing is close enough that he can see it's a human. He wonders why the person is walking instead of skiing. The person disappears out of view, but Mikal keeps on waiting. Then suddenly, hoo hoo, the person comes to view. Mikal's eyes turn wide open and his hair stand up. This man doesn't have a head and is walking straight towards him. Mikal is in shock, but manages to snap back as the headless man and dodges just in time. Mikal starts skiing as fast as possible, not looking back no matter what. But he hears behind him, the thing is chasing him. He hears as the headless man is breaking snow as he runs behind Mikal. Even though Mikal is on skis and is moving quite fast, the headless man is keeping up with him. Then suddenly, the headless man stomps Mikal's skis, making him stuck in the snow. Mikal makes a cross with his fingers just in time. The headless man stops and just looks at him. While it's distracted, Mikal is able to break free. He then starts skiing again. He's skiing all he can, but he hears the footsteps closing in. He looks behind, seeing as the headless man is sprinting after him. It closes in on Mikal again, and sure enough, stomps the skis. Mikal makes a cross again with his fingers. The headless man stops and just looks at Mikal. He breaks free and starts skiing again. He thinks to himself, he can't continue like this. He's going to tire out soon. Then he remembers something. There's a small cabin at a small lake, belonging to a local farmer that uses it when hunting and fishing. He skis up a mountain with the headless man right behind him. When he reaches the top, he can hear the cabin. He starts getting quite a lot of speed when going downhill. He looks behind and sees the headless man can't keep up with him. He just hears hoo hoo behind him, but doesn't look back. He reaches the cabin and locks the door. Mikal makes a cross out of the logs inside and quickly makes a fire. He's heard from his grandma that ghosts don't like fire. He finds a Bible and starts reading it. It's quiet. The hours go by and all he hears is the wind and a faint fox screaming. Mikal sits there and reads the Bible, not letting the fire die. He starts to think to himself, what in the hell is that thing? He then notices the clothes that they seemed familiar to him. Then he remembers, his cousin used to have those clothes. His cousin got his head blown up by German soldiers during the war. He started get, to get tired and is half sleeping. Then suddenly, hoo hoo, and a loud knock on the door. It's the headless man, and he's trying to break in. Mikhail does the Lord's prayer as fast as he can. Knocking stops. The next day, the sun is shining bright. Mikhail has made a cross of small sticks and decides to make a run for it. There's a small town not too far away, his hometown. He puts on his skis and looks around before starting to ski. He reaches the edge of the tundra when he hears it, hoo hoo. He looks back and sure enough, it's the headless man walking towards Mikhail. Mikhail doesn't hesitate, but starts skiing as fast as possible. The way to the town is mostly downhill. So he goes quite fast. He only looks back once and sees the headless man standing there. He reaches the town and goes straight to one of the elders. No one knows what happened there, but Mikhail was never the same. This happy young man became scared and nervous, never going outside. He said to people that whoever wants could go and get this reindeer herd if they want to. So many people went and got Mikhail's reindeer and brought them to their own herd. The last someone ever saw of Mikhail was that he had bought a gun and was going hunting. Literally, as I'm writing this, I'm hearing footsteps on my front porch. It's 4 a.m. and no one should be out there. But you've got me bent if you think I'm going to check to see who or what it is. They're just pacing back and forth, 
from where the steps to get on the porch are, to right outside my window and even banging on the wall right beside my bed. My family and I have been experiencing paranormal things heavily for I think three days now, and we did before, but they stopped for around three months and have just started up again. So for the past few months, my boyfriend and I have started living alone together in a house we previously lived in, but with his grandmother. She moved out when we had our son, so now just us and our three-month-old. It started before she left though. We're surrounded by woods on every side, the backside being the thickest, and the two on either side of the house being thin, and you can actually see through them in the fall and winter. Neighbours on all sides, most being family, but to the back it's a long gravel driveway that leads to I think three different houses, so still probably half a mile or a mile of woods in that direction. Anyway, we heard a whistling sound in the woods, not like what you're thinking, but an actual human whistle, and it didn't really seem too scary at first. We assumed it was some crackhead or someone walking or something, but then it started bouncing from being heard on the left side of the woods to directly in front of the houses in the patch of woods, then back and forth and occasionally to the right of the house, moving inhumanly fast, never stopping. We heard that only at night and every night for at least two weeks, then on random nights scattered here and there. Boyfriend was actually convinced that it was someone messing around on our property. So one night, when the whistle was closer to the house than normal, he loaded a gun, got a flashlight and went to investigate while I stayed on the porch of the bigger of the two houses on the land, closer to where the whistle was at that moment. He walked to the tree line and said something to the effect of, whoever's out there needs to leave or I'll shoot, just in case it was some of his family that lives around us, messing around in the woods. He said he heard something rustle the leaves on the ground, too close for comfort, so he shot at the ground in front of him to try and scare it or them off, and immediately after the whistle stopped. We heard it on different nights down the line, but never that close after that, and started to notice that if it was silent outside and we talked about the whistle, it would appear. I started joking that it was a skinwalker trying to scare him, no clue what it actually was. Not sure how long after, boyfriend and I were in the bigger house on the land in the kitchen, about to walk to the front door and leave to come back to our house. There's a hallway connected to the kitchen as you walk out to the right and straight ahead is the living room and front door. I'm walking behind him and as we're walking out, I pass the hallway to the right and I'm facing the door back to the kitchen now. My face and right eye was sort of covered by hair, so my view was obstructed, but I saw someone beside me in the hallway. And it was normal for boyfriend's mom, who lives in that house, to wake up randomly and take her dogs out during the night, especially when we were over there making noise. So I figured it was his mom, although all I saw out of the corner of my eye was a dark figure about my height. It was too late for me to move out of the way since I was already halfway past the hallway midstep so I didn't have time to avoid bumping into her. I felt myself bump into her and brush against her shirt. After I passed, I turned to apologise to her, but when I turned around, there was no one there. The house was mostly dark and everyone was asleep. So naturally, I grabbed the back of my boyfriend's shirt and pushed him and said, go, now, and we ran back to our house. When I told him, he said he didn't see anything there, when he passed that spot. Then I had our son and his grandmother move out. Maybe on the second or third morning, being alone in the house, we wake up and he tells me how he woke up in the middle of the night to some almost dramatic laughter. He didn't say where the sound was coming from, but he said it was a man's voice. I can ask more about what he heard if needed. I didn't really believe him out of my own fear, but I told him it must have been scary and tried to comfort him. Two nights later, he was off work and was going to get up with the baby that night. So we had switched spots in bed so I could sleep on the side I like that's up against a wall. I don't know what time it was, 
but I woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of a man laughing hysterically. Sounded exactly like at the end of the Thriller music video when Vincent Price laughs creepily, but in a different voice and went on for much longer. So being half asleep, I turn over to tell my boyfriend to be quiet or he'll wake the baby. But boyfriend is dead asleep. Baby is dead asleep. I can still hear the laughing. So this jars me almost fully awake and I sit up and now realize the laughing sounds like it's coming from right outside the wall beside our bed, which means whatever it was had to be outside, either right at the wall or the window above our bed. But you got me bent if you think I'm checking to see who's laughing at probably three or four I am. So I just went back to sleep. Whistling and laughing have stopped since winter came, but have been replaced by creaking in the loft of our house that we stayed in while his grandma still lived here. As if someone is moving around up there. I can see into the loft from the bed and couch. It's a tiny house and I've never seen anything up there. But three days ago, I heard the creaking again and looked up there from the couch, but of course found nothing. Looked around the house because I was alone and freaked out. Still nothing. Go to the door and flip on the porch light and look out the curtain. Again, nothing. But just as I'm about to turn around to sit back down on the couch, something touches my arm. So I spin around, scared out of my mind, as to what or who I'll see when I do, and nothing. Later that night, I have to pick up boyfriend from work. So I'm driving along on this bumpy back road at 9 p.m because I refuse to take the interstate and I come up on this sharp curve in the road. The road is fairly new to me, so it surprises me as I hit my brakes and look in my rear view to see if there's any cars behind me about to rear end me or for just randomly slamming on my brakes. And I see a whole figure of a man in my back seat against the glow of my tail lights. I look at the road because I need to turn or I'm gonna wreck. And when I look back, he's gone. I rushed to my boyfriend's job, got out of the car and waited for him because fuck that. Next night, I'm home alone again while my boyfriend is at work and start to hear creaking in the loft. I'm scared, so I start recording to see if there's anything and hopefully show myself there's nothing to be afraid of. I record the whole house back and forth a few times and in the video, there's nothing in the loft for the first time. But when I come back, that's when I see a face. A white aura looking thing at least. I start praying and getting my things together to go to the other house to wait for my boyfriend. But my robe is in the bathroom, which is under the loft. But I rush to get it anyway. As I'm walking out, I'm looking up there and hear someone step onto one of the steps, but see nothing. These steps make a very distinct noise when stepped on because they're two by fours. I just ran. I tell them what happened, we go back home, and we're sitting in our living room talking about it. When I hear something upstairs, then our front door slowly creaks open on its own. We went and talked to his parents, and they said to ignore it, give it no power, etc. But his dad was a priest. So he goes over and blesses the house and says everything is okay now and that we can go back to sleep over there at their house if we're scared. We end up sleeping in our house and the only weird thing I can remember from that night is that as I was awake late, which is a normal thing because I have insomnia, like maybe around 2 or 3 a.m. while everyone else was asleep, and I heard a tapping on the wall right next to me on my left. My son sleeps in a thing that swings and it does make a rhythmic clicking. But this was much different and much louder, but very much in sync with the swing and directly by my head outside the wall. Swing would click, then a loud tap, back and forth for around three minutes and then stopped. This would have been the last night, I believe, but I was up again alone while everyone was sleeping. I was in bed next to my boyfriend and I was son in his swing by the stairs. All of a sudden, I hear what sounds like a broom falling onto another broom, like two pieces of thin, hollow metal clinking together, towards the kitchen area so loud that I jump and get scared and wake my boyfriend up to investigate, but there was nothing that had fallen at all. 
This morning, the door opened on its own again and we heard a few creaks upstairs, but nothing major. Now tonight, boyfriend was walking from his mom's to our house and swears he heard the breathing of someone running behind him, very close. No footsteps or leaves or anything, just breathing. I heard him scream when it happened, and a second later, he rushed in, locked the door, and told me what happened. We stayed inside most of the night. Now I'm rewriting all this, because when I started writing it, I was hearing footsteps on my porch pacing back and forth, then a loud bang on the same wall right beside me. At one point, it sounded like it was on the roof above me. Then I heard someone take a few deep breaths right beside me as if they're inside the wall or sitting right beside me on the bed. I tried to wake my boyfriend up, but he's exhausted today, so he doesn't want to wake up and I'm terrified. I don't know what's fucking with us, but I want it to stop. If anyone has any ideas about what's going on, I'd love to hear it. Any ideas on how to get this shit to go away? Also, I have the video of the face or whatever, but I didn't want to post it because the house is still being worked on and the walls are still just sheetrock with plaster all over them. But I guess I can if I need to. By the way, it's 5.30 a.m. as I'm finishing writing this and the footsteps have stopped for now. When I was in high school, there was a lot of local folklore about a man who allegedly shot and killed his wife and daughter before taking his own life in their family home. The incident occurred many years prior in a now abandoned two-story home located between two wheat fields. I grew up in the boonies, so it was quite common for old farmhouses to be built in such a manner. The year was 2001 and my senior year had just begun a couple months prior. I don't remember the exact month, but I'm assuming October because I remember the crisp, cool autumn air had just rolled upon us. One evening, a group of about eight or so friends and I decided we would visit the infamous home and scope it out for kicks. Before leaving my house, I had the idea I would play a prank on my pals, which involved a small bottle of red food colouring. I placed the food colouring in my pocket, locked my bedroom door, and left to meet up with the gang. We arrived at the location in two separate cars. One car was packed with the guys, the other car was driven by one of our female classmates and two of her girlfriends. The house was situated on a slight hill which met a gravel driveway. We parked our cars in the driveway in front of the home's garage and began our trek up the hill. The very first thing I noticed was a very sad, dead-looking tree in the middle of the yard. The grass felt very strange beneath my feet, quite spongy and soft, as though it was rotted with disease. This particular st stood out to me because I had never felt grass quite like this before, especially without any recent rain. The house was completely boarded up with plywood but there was a small opening in the front door, which appeared to be broken from a previous visitor. Equipped with our flashlights, we began scoping out the interior of the home, searching for any evidence a murder actually took place. The interior was decorated with dingy floral wallpaper. The floors were bare hardwood throughout. In the main entryway, we saw what appeared to be blood splatters where the wall met the ceiling and several apparent gunshot holes. I'm a skeptic by nature and thought it could have possibly been faked by previous visitors to feed into the lore. Whichever the case, the blood appeared a very dull brown colour, indicating it had been there for a very long time. We walked up a set of creaky steps to the upstairs, which featured two bedrooms. One room had an old metal bed frame and bare mattress, but was otherwise empty. I can't remember if I entered the second room or not. We all stood in one of the bedrooms, talking and expressing our predictions as to what we believed happened before making our way back down the stairs. 
We continued exploring the main level, living space and dining before reaching the kitchen. I noticed there was a door leading from the kitchen to a small breezeway behind the house. I was the first to check it out and knew this was the time to pull off my prank. As I entered the breezeway, I reached into my pocket, tilted my head back and filled my entire eye socket with the red food colouring. I banged my flashlight against the wall to create a loud thud, fell to the ground and screamed at the top of my lungs, Fuck! Something just hit me! Go, go, go! We all bolted from the house at top speed. One of the girls even stumbled down the hill and collided with her passenger door. I entered the back seat of her car holding my eye, screaming with my hands and face covered in fake blood. I remember the girl in the passenger seat yelling over and over, Get him to the ER! Get him to the ER! His eyes are gone! They frantically drove about 15 to 20 minutes to the nearest hospital as I writhed in pain in the back seat. The entire ride I was wailing. Something hit me. I don't know what it was. What the fuck just happened? We finally got to the hospital parking lot with the other car right behind us. Everyone got out and we began swiftly walking to the entrance before I let out a maniacal laugh to reveal it was all a prank. A couple of the girls were pretty pissed, but the guys completely lost it and couldn't stop laughing. After several minutes, the mood lightened and the other girls finally sought humour in the situation. Overall, it was a hit. I got home late that night and cleaned up for school the next morning. When I woke up, everything felt completely off. I kept hearing what sounded like incessant whispering ringing in my ears. It reminded me of the sound of people whispering in church or at a funeral, with the sound of the letter S resonating the most. I walked over to my closet to grab a t-shirt and noticed a freezing cold spot in my room, just in front of my closet door. Our house didn't have central air, only heating vents in the floor, so this frigid spot made absolutely zero sense. I opened my closet door and every single piece of clothing was laying in a ball on the floor. I was dumbfounded because I locked my door before I left and always hung up my clothes, even my t-shirts. My house was empty that morning because my mom worked the 12 hour night shifts and my little brother spent the night at our cousin's house because I knew I wouldn't get home until late the night before. As I walked downstairs to my living room, the whispering sounds intensified. Goosebumps covered my arm and my heart started to pound. I grew very alarmed as I realized this was more than just morning cobwebs or grogginess. I drove to school and the whispering sounds wouldn't stop. I thought I was completely losing my mind so I pulled one of my friends, who was a devout Christian, into the restroom and started crying. I told her my thoughts maybe I was haunted due to my antics from the night before. I tried my best to explain the situation, but I caught him off guard and I didn't feel like he was taking me seriously. As the school day went on, the whispering sounds persisted and my friends who were there for the shenanigans couldn't stop talking about my prank. I did my best to hold myself together and not reveal that anything was wrong. I didn't want that kind of attention and especially didn't want them to think I was crazy since the heart to heart with my Christian friend didn't go the way I anticipated. When the school day ended, I immediately checked my room and still felt the freezing cold spot in front of my closet. I truly believed at this point I was without a doubt being haunted. A few days went by and as I was having great difficulty sleeping, I kept seeing or envisioning a dark shadow in the corner of my room, about the height of a small child. I did my best to ignore it as the shadow man began to move from one spot to the other, eventually standing directly beside where I rested my head. The following day, I told my mom about my visit to the abandoned house and the prank I pulled on my friends. She was very disappointed I would disrespect the alleged murder victims, but she was also very supportive in me finding help. She's very spiritual 
and recommended I meet with a church member to get cleansed and also have my room cleansed. I didn't and still don't subscribe to religion the slightest. However, at this point, I was desperate. I went to the church and bared my soul to a priest, expressing sorrow for my actions, for fooling my friends, entering the abandoned house, and exploiting victims for my personal amusement. Later that evening, a member of the church came to my house, lit candles and said a prayer in my bedroom. The next day, no more cold spots, no more audible whispering. After a week of feeling absolutely insane, it seemed to be over. About a month later, I developed a very deep depression. I began feeling incredibly dark emotions I had never felt before. These feelings would continue to grow through the winter and into spring of 2002, when baseball season rolled around. I was a lifelong baseball player who was being recruited by a few schools in the area. I was so depressed, I opted not to play, forfeiting any possible chance at a scholarship and thus ending my baseball career. I strongly regret today. I had simply lost interest in everything other than sleeping. I shut out my friends, parents, pretty much everyone for the next couple months. By the time graduation rolled around, I ended up rekindling a friendship with one of my early childhood friends. He and I played baseball together back in the first grade and were best friends in grade school. We kind of drifted apart over the years, but something drew us back together and we hung out all summer. The stronger our friendship became, the less apparent my depression was. It ultimately fizzled out by fall and I ended up attending college out of state. 20 years later, the whispers haven't come back. No cold spots, no dark shadows, nothing. All put to rest. I haven't thought about my haunting in a very long time, but this past year it's crept up from time to time. No bad feelings, just memories. I've been wanting to tell this story for the past couple months to hopefully aid anyone who may be experiencing something similar. Whether it was a true supernatural experience or my own fears projected into reality, I needed help and I'm so very thankful I spoke up. Thanks especially to my mother, who pushed aside her disappointment to ensure her son was okay. If you're feeling off, please ask for help, no matter how silly your problems may sound. Peace. When I messed around with the Ouija board with my siblings, it would always say mysterious things like Anon is a poo-poo head. Very discouraging. But I didn't let the heckling of these mysterious spirits stop me. I started a journal of potentially paranormal happenings. Most of it's circumstantial and easily explained away. Odd noises, shadows that don't look quite right, animals acting strange, and shapes in the woods that seem to disappear before I got close. I'm sure some of you would lend more credence to a host of odd things happening over your childhood. But personally, I think the mind sometimes sees what it wants to see. And so I remained skeptical. And well, that's really how it stayed until I met my uncle Kevin. You see, my family is very, very, very Irish. A decent amount of us fought in the Civil War, and I have IRA relatives. But my uncle was unique even among all that. You see, he was a druid. I'm not talking about a hippie college druid who smokes way too much weed. I'm talking about a large man with a beard in his 60s, who meets with other old people to perform legitimate pagan rituals, mixed with a bit of the good old Irish Christianity. I'm not certain exactly how he reconciles the two, but I suppose through faith, anything is possible. Like me, he had a deep interest in the paranormal, Although with him, I suppose you could call it a more professional interest. He introduced me to some of our old ways, among them the Irish language and our old mythologies. The way he went on about traditions and our old practices made me feel comfortable talking to him about my own thoughts and experiences. I showed him my journal, told him about my forays into the dense Canadian forests, 
and the stories I had read online. To my surprise, he took it all in his stride. I was expecting him to laugh me off, or even get all serious and tell me to stop jerking around. Instead, he told me to keep it up, keep going hard at what I was passionate about. But he did give one serious warning. Be careful when interacting with the unknown. Kevin told me that he had met creatures from the fairy world several times, and it was his duty as a druid to keep the balance between our world and theirs. Just some context, we Irish seem to refer to absolutely everything paranormal as fairies. Ghosts, changelings, even the leprechaun are all fairies. Anyway, on the topic of fairies, Uncle Kevin told me that as a child, he was marked by the fairy world, and that's why he took up the mantle of a druid. Now to be warned, my uncle fully believes what I'm about to share, and while I do trust that he believes what he's saying, I think there could be other explanations. Apparently, as a child, fairy circles would appear around him if he stepped outside, basically a circle of mushrooms. He could often see odd figures in the distance that would disappear if pointed out. It was mundane things like that, until we got to the topic of his father, a cruel man from what I've heard. After a particularly hard beating, a sudden shriek exploded across the old Irish countryside, shattering all the glass objects in their poor old hut. The smell of old wrath and smoke penetrated through the old rotten doors, and my uncle was struck with an overwhelming urge to flee. Leaping from the hands of his now extremely distracted father, he burst out the door, running for the safety of the distant hills. Looking back, he saw the old bog behind their house had burst into a thousand tiny flames, dotting as far as he could see. Individually insignificant, but their combined power assaulted my uncle with an overwhelming stench and rush of smoke, making it hard for him to see or breathe. It's at this point of the story that he stops, looks at me, and makes me promise to take what he is about to say next very seriously. Of course, I'm ecstatic. This is what I've been looking for, so I eagerly nod, excited to hear what would happen next. When he peered into the hellscape that was engulfing his house, he thought he saw something along all the tiny flames. Well, more accurately, someone. A figure draped in tattered rags, with a hood pulled up around its head. When my uncle saw it, the thing leant back and let out an ear-piercing wail. Longer than the original, forcing my uncle to cover his ears to escape from the sudden pain. Not that it helped much, the scream apparently felt like it was drilling into his head. It's here that my uncle ends the story abruptly. He apparently didn't remember that much afterwards, only that his father was very angry with him, and no fire ever seemed to take place. What he saw was dismissed as hallucinations, introduced from the beatings or just lies. Even the broken glass might have just been his dad breaking the shit in their house. What is interesting is that soon afterwards, his father ended up dying of some sort of illness, which my uncle attributed to the fairy folk. Now obviously, there's plenty of room for doubt here. It may just be the invention of an abused mind. And like what I said before, the mind sees what it wants to see. After this, I had to give my uncle a day to recover. Telling the story had apparently brought back some bad memories, and he just spent the next few hours just sitting and reading through some old book about identifying plants. He's a big man with a big heart, and every day he tries his hardest not to be like his father. So I gave him some time, and it was a day later when I took him to the edge of the forest that started in my journal. We made a fire and sat by the woods for a bit, making some western style bannock, and just chatting generally about spooks and spirits. Like I said before, my uncle considered himself a keeper of the peace between the worlds, and especially keeping the peace sometimes involved evicting troublesome guests. For the most part, we apparently live alongside the fairy folk without even noticing them, but occasionally 
they act up and my uncle has to show them the metaphorical door. Something along the lines of an exorcism, but my uncle stressed the two practices were quite different. In his own words, he doesn't drive out demons or free souls from evil. He merely gently yet very firmly gets troublesome fairies to leave. And he only deals with the supernatural that he is familiar with. When I asked him if he could deal with a local creature, like maybe a Wendigo or a Skinwalker, he flatly said no. He had no real experience or idea of the habits, strengths, weaknesses or history of those creatures and attempting to apply what worked in Ireland might just be a shot in the dark. According to him, acting in these situations without prior preparation and knowledge would sometimes be fatal, especially considering the darker reputation of some cryptids. Nothing much happened while we were at the edge of the woods, as per usual. The bannock was good. If you haven't had a chance to try some campfire bannock, you should really make a point of doing so. Eventually, we decided to pack up. My uncle had to visit more relatives before he went back to Ireland, and I still had a bedtime at that point. Besides, the forest was getting real quiet. Dark clouds were gathering, and the wind was starting to pick up the snow. All sure signs that some sort of storm was coming. My uncle wasn't used to the big storms we got, and I remember him looking around rather concerned and insisting we go probably dreading walking back in heavy snowfall. You might think I'm trying to lead up to a spooky bit here about walking away and looking back to see an ominous tall man in the trees, but no, most we got was a lone deer walking out of the woods and keeping an eye on us. Nothing out of the ordinary in Western Canada. He departed the next day for BC and our extended family over there, but he left me an old bird identification book and one of his cross necklaces, which were very nice of him. I wish we had more time. I barely get to see him, and his stories really ignited my passion for cryptids and the supernatural. Since then, I've grown up quite a bit. No more bedtime, for example. I constantly go out looking for the supernatural, but perhaps I'm just not touched by the fairy folk in the same way my uncle is. I have some experiences that I cannot discredit, and I feel like I've had more of those ever since my uncle visited. But I'm still missing the big catch that I've been looking for. It's like when you see something just on the edge of your vision, and you turn to see nothing there. It feels like they're around me, but I'm just too stupid to notice or not fast enough to catch them. I came here looking for advice and maybe some stories on what best to do to interact and document any potential cryptids particularly the ones locals to the rocky area. And if I happen to piss off a particularly dangerous cryptid, perhaps some tips on how not to die. So lots of paranormal experiences happen at my house. My family used to get it blessed and have the energy cleansed, but it never worked. But now I'm starting to think maybe that's because it's not the house itself that haunted, but the whole neighborhood. My neighborhood is a little weird. It goes around a lake, and there's quite a distance between some houses. And my sisters and I used to love to take drives around the lake because it was beautiful. But we don't anymore, because of what happened last time. It was pretty late and dark outside, and we were only halfway around the lake when my sister, who was driving, Danny, suddenly stopped the car, and the energy around us changed. I thought I was the only one who felt it, so I ignored it and asked Danny why she'd stopped the car. She kept her eye on the road ahead of us and said, Do you guys see that lady too? We all looked around, but I personally didn't see anything at the time. But one of my other, M, asked, Is she blonde and wearing? And described what the lady looked like. Danny nodded and Em said, Yeah, I've seen her around the neighbourhood before. You shouldn't have stopped, because now she's going to follow us. Danny immediately started driving again, but a few minutes later, she started speeding up and said, I just saw her again. She kept seeing her over and over, and eventually she just turned off the road and headed towards a different lake. 
She never saw the lady while we went to this new lake. It's like, as soon as we left the neighborhood, she left us alone. The next day, I went to the post office with my at the time boyfriend. And while we were waiting in line, I noticed a missing poster hanging on the wall. I took a closer look and saw a lady. The same lady that was described perfectly by M. She went missing in my neighborhood and apparently has been missing for 11 years. This experience was in my house this time. I actually shared this one in a comment section before, but I'm going to share it again. My best friend was over for his sleepover. She's the same one from the experience with the lady around the lake. We had just settled down for bed and were laying on little mats on the floor. And after a few minutes of silence, I heard my friend start to mutter a prayer under her breath. My friend is not religious, so I immediately knew something was off. I heard a whisper, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to leave me alone. And as soon as she said that, I heard what sounded like hands and feet slapping against the floor and heading in my direction, like someone was crawling towards me. I froze in fear and felt it crawl onto the mattress I was on. I could feel the indents as it made its way up towards me. I was too scared to turn to see what it was, but soon... I could feel something leaning down into the side of my face, like it was staring at me. The energy of this thing felt awful. It was one of the worst feelings I've ever felt. After about a minute, I worked up the courage to turn around to face it. But as soon as I did, the presence and the indents disappeared along with the awful energy I was feeling. The next day, I mentioned it to my friend and she said, I'm sorry, I was trying to get it to leave me alone, not send it to you. Whatever it was came back a second time when my friend wasn't there and did the same thing. A little while after my family had someone who was very in tune with the spirit world stay with us for about a week and she told us that there were lots of spirits in the house but there's one in particular that's stronger than the others. I'm guessing that this is that one. I haven't had this happen a third time and I really hope it doesn't. So my family owns some property down at the lake for camping that's completely gated. The gate is old and very loud, so no person or animal could open it or climb it without being heard. There's also little rocks all around the tents, so no one can walk around the property without being heard, as there's always a loud crunch to their steps. My friend, same one from the other stories, I'm surprised she still came over a lot after everything. She doesn't anymore now we always hang at her house. And my little sister decided that they wanted to go camping down at the lake. I don't know why the hell we decided to do that after everything, but we did. The lake also has no Wi-Fi or phone service, so we downloaded a couple movies on my friend's phone to watch. We drove down to the lake and parked on the other side of the gate because vehicles can't really fit well on the actual property. While we were closing the gate behind us, we noticed someone walking across the street from us. It's not unusual for people to take walks around the lake. We actually see it a lot around here. But this person had a strange vibe. And I think my friend and sister noticed it too. Because they quickly shut the gate and asked if I had brought my protection crystals. I have a few and usually keep them under my pillow. But this time I laid them around the inside of the tent. Around midnight we were still watching movies. When there was a very loud sound right next to my head from outside the tent. It was a sound I had never really heard before and the best way I can describe it was a growl. My friend quickly paused the movie and everything went quiet and still. We had some lanterns on in the tent but everyone was too scared to move to grab them. We waited a moment and we heard the growl again. I slowly started to sit up as my friend and sister started to look at me. I could tell they wanted to start yelling and calling for help to our neighbours, who happened to be camping right next door. I shook my head at them and whispered them to be quiet and still, because I had no idea what was outside the tent. We get cougars around here, but only very rarely, 
but this didn't sound anything like a cougar. We heard whatever was outside start to circle around the tent, and my friend whispered to me to call for help. I told her no again, and that we needed to be quiet. So she grabbed my sister's hand, and they started quietly praying. Again, my friend is not religious, but she always ended up praying while she was with us. My sister took her phone out and slowly started to crawl around the tent in hopes of finding a spot that gave us some service. As she was doing this, whatever was outside started to press against the tent, as if to see how much strength it would take to get into it. My sister managed to get the tiniest bit of service on her phone and started texting our parents, friends and sister to get someone to come visit us, but no one replied. Eventually, one of her friends ended up responding and called our parents, but they didn't pick up, so they called our older sister, and she thankfully did pick up. My sister's friend texted us shortly after, and told us that our sister was on her way, to come get us. We heard whatever was outside find the entrance to the tent. Our tent actually had two zippers to get inside. One was into a netted screen, and the other was to get into the actual tent. It started fumbling around with the zipper as my older sister's car pulled up. The headlights shone through the tent, but there was no shadow on the other side. It was like whatever was there had disappeared. We heard my older sister open the gate, and we immediately exited the tent and ran to her in the car, and she drove away as quickly as she could. When we got home, we all started discussing what happened, and apparently... No one had heard anything open or climb the gate, nor had anyone heard anything walking towards the tent before the growling noise, and no one saw or heard it leave when my sister pulled up. We also talked about the person we had seen before we closed the gate, and it turns out we all saw something different. My friend had seen a short man with short hair. I had seen a tall woman with long hair. My sister said she couldn't make out what she had seen. This could have just been our minds remembering it wrong because of what had happened after that, but I personally don't think it was. The next day we went back to the lake to collect everything we had left behind in our hurry to get away. Our phones, crystals, etc. We decided to check around the tents for any footprints that might have been left. There were bare human footprints going all the way around the tents, but there were none heading towards or leading away from the tents. It was as if whatever it was, had just appeared and disappeared. We also had left a ton of snacks out on the table that was a good distance away from the tent. Any animal that managed to get inside the property would have gone for the food and tried to avoid the humans. But this thing went straight for the tent with people in it. The food was perfectly untouched the next day. My sister and I don't camp anymore and anytime my parents have friends with kids over to camp, My sister and I take the kids to the house to sleep because we're always worried whatever was outside our tent will come back. I'm one of those people who eats, sleeps and breathes horror. I love macabre ghost stories and especially historic locations known for their paranormal activity. I've only just begun my journey of staying at as many haunted hotels as possible, but this experience was different than the few I've had thus far. It wasn't my first, and although I have this deep sense of dread as I say it, it certainly won't be my last. My husband, who's on the rocks about most things paranormal and thinks I'm an absolute psychopath, respects and accepts my passion. To celebrate my 28th birthday, he let me know a week before the date that we would be traveling somewhere and staying there for two nights as a surprise. I had a feeling deep in my gut that we would be driving to Austin to stay at the Driscoll Hotel. With that in mind, I packed up my bags and made sure to include my camcorder and my tripod, just in case. The week slowly crawled by, but we finally found ourselves on the road headed down I-10. And once we hit Interstate 71, I knew we were headed to Austin. Once we made it to the city and we turned into Brazos Street, The rest was history. We had officially arrived to the infamous Driscoll Hotel. We entered into the Grand Lobby, and there, Colonel Jess Driscoll 
stood in darkness contained within an ornate golden frame. As we carried our suitcases past the lonely man, I could see the sadness in his eyes. We took the lift up to the eighth floor to find our room. The hallways were thoughtfully decorated with stunning artwork every three feet or so, and it was clear that the design throughout the structure would have delighted most, if not all, of their political and socialite guests. We stepped into our room, and to my surprise it was light and airy. Nothing about this room made me feel uneasy. We changed our clothes, unpacked our belongings, and planned to go out for a light meal to kick off the evening. Before leaving the room, I plugged in my camcorder to charge in preparation for our first night. After eating a small meal, we made our way to Joe's coffee shop and watched the soft rain fall into the pavement around us as we patiently waited for the tour to begin. We thought we might be the only ones on the tour considering the weather wasn't ideal. And of course, the reality of the pandemic being the backdrop of everywhere we went. But to our surprise, it was a full house. There was a handful of other couples, two families with small children, and a pair of friends. We first discussed the frost tower, and then the spaghetti warehouse, the speakeasy, and then a great story about the first heavily documented serial killer in America, who allegedly may have been Jack the Ripper, who may have resided in Austin, Texas as a butcher prior to moving to Europe. Just when I thought I couldn't wait any longer, we turned the corner, and there the Driscoll sat, waiting for her story to be told. Having done research on the hotel prior, I was expecting the guy to bring up the death of Samantha Houston and the creepy painting of her that's located in the building. However, I apparently hadn't done enough research because there were not one, but two additional stories that I found particularly sinister that I hadn't heard about before. The Suicide Brides, he began. Long story short, it's believed that two young women who were in the hotel for their honeymoons had both committed suicide by gruesomely shooting themselves in the stomach and bleeding out in the bathtub. The craziest part is that they had both stayed in room number 525 and had both taken their lives in the bathtub exactly 20 years apart. I have a habit of getting really excited to stay at haunted hotels and then after taking the ghost tour, I get pretty freaked out. It wouldn't stop me from staying the night, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't ready for a drink or six as a precaution to sleep peacefully through the night. We headed to the Driscoll bar and enjoyed the busy atmosphere, discussing all of the new things we just learned. After I finally felt all warm and fuzzy, it was time to go and find the famous painting of Samantha Houston on the fifth floor. The floor level we were staying on was a straight hallway and nothing more. When we exited the elevator onto the fifth and saw the straight hall in front of us, I thought it must be pretty similar and we would find the painting in no time. I looked to my right expecting to see a wall similar to the eighth level, but instead was met with yet another long hall. My curiosity pulled me down the mystery hall, so we veered right and began walking. About midway, I was met by another opening to the yet another long hallway. Wow. The fifth floor was like a maze. We wandered for a bit. I sang her name as we stepped quietly through. Samantha, I giggled drunkenly. Where are you? My eyes finally met with hers. She gazed at me as if she had heard me calling for her. Her eyes had no evil in them. She was pure innocence. Her eyes were big and beautiful, much like that of a deer. I filmed from afar and slowly walked up to the painting. We took a few photos that I've attached and then headed up to the room, completely forgetting about room 525, which I'm actually 100% okay with. We settled into our room and talked a bit about the night until we got too tired to stay up any longer. Before getting into bed, I pulled my camcorder off the charger, turned it on and confirmed it had 100% battery and placed it on the tripod and began filming the night. It had to have been roughly 2 a.m when I was awoken by a fly buzzing around my face. I watched him zoom back and forth, and then I finally slapped, snapped him down. I grabbed my phone and turned on the flashlight, where I then shined the light onto my hand and could see what was left of the fly in his blood. I don't remember a lot after that, but I must have fallen back to sleep. I must have been dreaming, because the next time I woke up, I was standing at the corner of my room, right about where my tripod was. I looked at the bed, and there I saw my husband and myself sleeping. 
I stood there frozen. My husband was sleeping in a normal position, but my head was halfway down the mattress and my feet hanging off the bottom. I couldn't believe what I was seeing and I can't even explain how. It didn't feel like a long time after that. I seemed to have woken up, now back in bed, and I began screaming and crying hysterically. My husband turned over and comforted me and I laid there awake for quite some time until I fell asleep again. Again, I'd find myself standing in the corner of the room in the same spot as before, but this time was different. I could see my husband in bed, and to be quite honest, I don't recall whether I was in the bed with him or not, because my attention was on the other side of the room. From the corner I was standing in, I had a clear shot of the entrance into the powder room and bathroom, where I saw a woman dressed in housekeeper clothes. I've attached a photo that I found online that looked like the outfit she was wearing. I could tell at that moment that her outfit was not from our time. She crossed the door frame from the power room with the vacuum and went into the bathroom where I could no longer see her. She then took a step back, backwards into the door frame as if she had perhaps seen something that caught her attention and looked right at me. She had dark hair that was pulled back and she stood there in silence. She was clearly there right in front of my eyes, but she had this washed out presence about her. She wasn't bright, just illuminating some form of dim bluish low light that looked like she was fading. The exchange of looks had me feeling as though I was the one who was watching her, and she then carried on with her duties out of my sight. Finally, it was daylight the next time I woke up. Despite feeling as though I was hit by a bus and got absolutely no rest, I had never been so excited for morning, and the first thing I did was turn over to my husband, exhausted. I started by explaining the weird fly that woke me, and then proceeded to ask if he remembered me waking him up, crying. He said that he was 100% sure that he had not been woken up, nor did he hear me crying or screaming. After that, I realised maybe I had been dreaming when I thought I was awake. I, compl I was completely lost in my own reality. I then remembered that I had been recording the whole night, and I rushed to the camcorder and pulled it off the tripod to review the footage. Upon powering on the camcorder, I was greeted with a message, corrupt file. I was in disbelief about the events that took place the night before, and now I would never know if I had potentially caught something on video. I saw no blood anywhere, or any remains of the fly, and no evidence of the events that took place. I was defeated, and terrified that I had to stay at this hotel for another night. The close of this story is this. I didn't record the second night, because I felt as though maybe that provoked whatever I experienced the night prior. After more drinking and lots of lights on, I managed to sleep on night two with no disturbances. When we returned home, I was having trouble sleeping for about four days because I kept having this feeling I was being watched. It finally shook off in time, and I'm recharged and ready to go and check out another haunted location. But this was definitely something that I didn't expect, I will never forget. It was already dark in the late afternoon when my brother and I arrived in the small town of Grand Rapids, Minnesota. It was December and bitterly cold. The reason for the visit was to spend Christmas with our grandma. She was well into her 90s. So it was reasonable to assume each holiday would be the last. As it happened, this one was. I'm the youngest of four brothers. At the time, I was living in Minneapolis. My parents also lived there, but they were splitting their time between Minnesota and Arizona. Currently, they were in Phoenix and hadn't planned to return to Minnesota for the holidays. Knowing our grandma would be alone, I had called my brother in Chicago and suggested he grab me so we could head up north together, where our grandma had been staying at an assisted living centre. The trip was uneventful and we had a pleasant Christmas Eve, doing puzzles and chatting with our grandma. As the night came to a close, we headed to our lodgings. My brother had made the accommodations beforehand. We'd be staying at the Rainbow Motel. The motel itself was unremarkable. It wasn't old and it didn't appear foreboding from outside. Our room was clean and furnished with what you would expect. 
beds, a desk, some chairs, a television on a cabinet and a small bathroom. I'd call it your standard cookie cutter roadside motel. The room was fairly small. Two beds lay side by side with the door at roughly the foot of one of the beds. This was the bed my brother selected. So mine was a little bit further away from the door, but only perhaps seven to eight feet. The motel was mostly empty, probably due to the holiday and it being the dead of winter. After checking in, we headed down to the bar, which only had a couple other people in it. At the time, I was partial to white Russians, and I had one that evening as a nightcap. We finished our drinks and headed back to the room. We knew we had a long drive the next day. I was tired, got undressed and flopped onto my bed. My brother decided to watch TV. I wasn't interested, so I rolled over and closed my eyes. I don't remember when it started, but I want to say it was only a few moments after I had lain down. It was only this. The door handle suddenly began to shake quite aggressively. I recall thinking this was strange because it didn't sound like someone had mistaken this room for theirs and simply tried to open the door. The handle was being deliberately violently shaken. I sat up and looked at the door and then my brother. After a couple seconds, it stopped. We looked at each other, gave a collective shrug and lay back down. Soon, the noise started up again. Now, I could understand someone, after a few glasses of eggnog, getting their room number wrong and trying the door to enter. But this was different. It was forceful. It was clear to me the intention was not to open the door, but instead to let the person inside know that someone was out there. I thought perhaps it was kids playing a prank. I hadn't seen anyone in the motel and it was well past 11 p.m. So it seemed odd that any children would be allowed to roam the halls. I got up and walked over to the door. We had heard no voices, no giggles, no closing doors or retreating footsteps. I looked out the door's peephole, which gave a decent view of the hallway, but saw no one. I opened the door and leaned out. Our room was near the center of the hall and I could see the exits on both ends. I recall there was a hallway that split off, perhaps 20 feet down to my left. I assumed this is where the prankers retreated to as there wouldn't be enough time for them to run down the entire hallway and out of one of the exits or enter another room without us hearing a door to another room close. I looked for some other explanation. Was the door itself somehow causing the sound? Was it loose and perhaps the wind or the pressure of the structure was making it shake? I closed the door and pushed it. It was very solid. I couldn't replicate the sounds except by grabbing the handle and vigorously shaking it. This was getting annoying. I was tired and just wanted to sleep. I climbed back into bed, but I lay there like a coiled spring, waiting for whoever was pranking us to return. I'd enjoy catching them in the act if they did. Sure enough, moments later the shaking started up again. I sprung up and was at the door in an instant and looked out the peephole again certain to see some kids running down the hallway, but I saw no one. From the time the noise stopped to the time I was at the door was a couple seconds at most. The only way I couldn't have seen or heard someone was if they were smart enough to crouch down, knowing I couldn't see anything directly under the peephole. I opened the door, no one was there. No one had been there. My brother and I are both skeptics. We were certain there was a reasonable explanation for this, but truth be told, I was beginning to get a little spooked. I had never experienced anything like this. It seemed to defy logic. Once again, I crawled into bed, but I was so unnerved, sleep seemed out of the question. I was upset I hadn't caught the pranksters, but was also dimly aware that there were none to be caught. Something was making this happen, something unseen. Someone with a purpose. It scared me. I recall making a conscious decision to will the noise to stop. I closed my eyes tightly and focused on the thought. I don't want this to happen anymore. Enough. You've made your point, whatever it might have been. Stop. Now. And it did. The door rattler didn't return. After a while, I relaxed a little. 
My brother shut off the TV and turned out the lights. The silence of the room was complete. However, as the night wore on, I found myself woken up by other noises. I could hear the door chain moving. I could hear other unidentifiable sounds at the door. I didn't hear the door handle noise again, but all through the night, I was subjected to the repeated sounds of the door being fiddled with in some manner. A pattern emerged. I'd hear a sound, become terrified, it would stop, and I would drift off to sleep again. In the morning, my brother and I discussed what might have happened. All he would say was that we had visitors, and in the bright light of day, it all seemed a bit silly. What it might have been seemed not very important. I just wanted to go home. We checked out the hotel and got on the road. Several hours later, we approached Minneapolis, the skyline looming in the distance. Not long after that, my brother dropped me at my apartment and he carried on to Chicago. As I shifted back into my life, I placed the incident behind me and, aside from telling a few close friends, I simply moved on. A few months passed and I went to visit my older brother who was living in Arizona. Years before, he'd lived in Grand Rapids and knew the Rainbow Motel, although he had never stayed there. I told him the story. All the while, he smiled at me as I related the story. It was a knowing smile that I at first mistook for disbelief. When I was done, he then told me our other brother, the one who had been in the motel with me, had recently visited and related the same story to him. I didn't know this. He said our stories were essentially identical. I would not spoken to him since he had dropped me off at my apartment. The next thing he said chilled me. As I've mentioned, he'd lived in Grand Rapids years before and naturally was very familiar with the town. He told me the Rainbow Motel, the place I found so plain and average, had a history of hauntings. I assume he had gotten this information from the locals he encountered while living there years ago. While my oldest brother likes to joke and tease, he is for the most part a stoic Midwesterner, not given to nonsense or deception. I believed him. Now, obviously, if I had been aware of this beforehand and the events of that night had played out as they had, I'd no doubt believe it was our imagination that were to blame. But the fact that this motel was so unassuming, the location so mundane, and the building so very unremarkable, leads me to believe that whatever happened that night was not something that had simply sprung from our imaginations. I'm still a skeptic. I like to think this could be explained without resorting to the supernatural. What I do know is this, it was real. I was terrifying and I will never forget this experience. My dad, being Irish and wanting to live somewhere close to his childish home, bought a house in a remote part of Northern Ireland in 2007. It's a pretty old farmhouse, 18th century I think, and back then was completely dilapidated. I'll never forget the first time he showed it to my brother and I. He had spent the long car journey hyping it up, telling us about how incredible the location it was, how spacious it was, and the amazing interior. And then we arrived at what was essentially a creepy old building site. The creepy vibe not helped by the torrential rain that was being released by the heavens that day. Still, over the years, post-renovation, I've grown to love spending time there. There's beautiful green rolling hills surrounding the property. There's a sea view and the beach is a stone's throw away with nobody around for miles. It's a hermit's paradise. I have always, however, felt unnerved and creeped out by it. During the first holiday I ever spent there, I think I was nine years old, we were cleaning out the attic and found an old photograph of a young woman, probably from around the Victorian times. My younger brother was absolutely terrified of it. I used to prank him by putting it in his bed before he went to sleep, or by wrapping my nipples against the bed frame, pretending that Bertha, as we nicknamed her, the ghost lady was coming from him. It was, granted, an unnerving photograph. There was a wild, vacant look in her eyes, and she was ghostly pale in complexion. A local from the neighbouring Glen, who knew about the history of the house, 
mentioned that there was a rumour that a young woman had been murdered by her jealous husband in the late 1850s in a house in the Lower Glen. So it could have been our house, but also could have been one of the other old houses in the area. That rumour though was enough to eventually make us return the picture to the attic, never to be retrieved again, even for pranks. At night, the house went being from creepy to being deeply unsettling. Bangs, footsteps, tappings, knocks sounded at all hours. My dad blamed the plumbing, the old pipes and our imaginations. And that was what we would all tell ourselves. Except that it would happen while the pipes were cold and when there was nobody else around. I remember one morning, my dad and I drove to our nearest village to pick up coffee in the newspaper. Half an hour later, we were back, to the immense relief of my brother, who was visibly shaking as he let us in. Apparently, the second he was alone and watching TV, he heard the distinct sound of heavy footsteps walking on the floor above him. Every time he paused the TV, it stopped, and when he resumed, they resumed. He vowed never to be left alone again, and basically stopped coming to the house after that. In more recent years, I've been spending a lot more time in the house, being a lover of solitude and nature. I can't go alone, for obvious reasons, so I go with my partner, who finds it equally spooky. We both hear the unexplained sounds, the tapping and knocking at the windows, the footsteps at night. My partner is somewhat sensitive and has had paranormal encounters before. She said that the minute she stepped into the house, she could feel a sinister dark energy emanating from inside. I got into the habit while we were staying there of going out on long walks in an attempt to prevent cabin fever. Whenever I returned, she would always report something eerie that had occurred while I was out. For example, once she had been hoovering the living room and had felt two hands grab her by the waist, only to spin around and find nothing there. She felt taps on her shoulder, heard my voice calling her name when I wasn't at home, and heard the sounds of people moving around the house while she was in the shower. Then, recently, things got even scarier. We decided to go visit the house on a Halloween mini-break, and the second we arrived, we both felt this hostile energy, as if we were trespassing in somebody else's house. It is worth noting that, shortly after my dad bought the house all those years ago, he ended up having to work full-time in London, so was unable to permanently live there. There was talk of renting it out, but nothing came of it, so the house just sits there, desolate, empty for most months of the year. But perhaps it does have a full-time residence after all. Anyway, we decided to try and shake off the feelings of unease and celebrate Halloween. We did the usual thing, got drunk on cheap wine, put scary makeup and costumes on, and watched stupid horror movies all evening. At around 11, my partner went to go and get another bottle of wine from the fridge while I stayed in the living room. I suddenly heard her say, oh my god, and I immediately stepped up and rushed over to her. She turned to me, looking frightened, and said that she'd seen a white, swirling mist outside in the garden against the pitch black darkness. It had vanished after a few seconds. That night, the noises and footsteps were louder than ever. A few days later, I was at the house by myself. My partner had gone away to see her family, who lived a few hours away, and would be returning later on that evening. I was sitting at the desk, working downstairs in the living room, trying to ignore the growing uneasiness I was feeling. Then, I started to hear, same as usual, footsteps sounding upstairs. But this time it was different. It was louder, as if a flurry of people were trampling around upstairs. I could hear the sound of bedsheets being moved, furniture being moved. It was coming from the upstairs room at the end of the house, where most of the unexplained noise originates from. The way I described it to those I related it to was that it sounded as if a few people were making preparations upstairs for a visitor, except I was all alone. I was petrified and immediately phoned my partner, telling her what was happening. It was so loud, she could hear her over FaceTime. So now for the most recent, and in my mind, most terrifying happening in the house. This happened less than a week ago, in the early hours of Monday morning. 
My partner and I had flown over for a weekend autumn break and had been due to fly home that morning. However, she suffers badly from endometriosis and had a flare-up, which meant that we ended up delaying our flight. Anyway, it was about 5.30 in the morning and we were both in bed. She was asleep, exhausted from feeling unwell, but I was wide awake and listening to upbeat music, just praying for tiredness. Suddenly, without warning, I became overcome with this intense, consuming feeling of dread. I went from feeling good to feeling completely freaked out in the space of about 10 seconds. I took my earphones out and turned the music off. From my position, I could see the door and most of the room aside from the side of the bed. My partner was sleeping nearest the door. I was on the other side. The room was dark, but some morning light was starting to filter into the cracks between the blinds, with the shapes of the furniture in the room being visible. I could see the cracks of light underneath the door being reflected onto the wall opposite, as we'd left the lights on. And then, I saw something. A shadow moving back and forth underneath the floor. I started to feel even more afraid. Then I heard a very loud footstep just outside the door, where the shadow was coming from, and the heavy creak of floorboards. I was at this point completely paralysed with fear. Then and I still can't believe this happened as I type it out, I saw a dark grey figure glide from the door across the room. It was hooded, almost Grim Reaper-esque, and I distinctly remember observing its transparency as it floated in front of the big wardrobe and around the bed to where I was laying. It was at this point that it went out of my line of vision, and being unable to physically move, I didn't turn to see where it went. I summoned up the courage to use my right hand to shake my partner awake. She, after a good few minutes, woke up and turned the light on, becoming concerned when she saw the state I was in. Apparently, I was totally pale and shaking and unable to speak until she had managed to calm me down. I'm still recovering now. It was the most visceral, horrifying thing I'd ever witnessed. I think what made it so scary was the fact that I got a very sinister energy coming from whatever the thing was. We're now back at home, and I'm not sure if I'll be back to the house for a long time. Roughly three years ago in 2018, I had an experience so scary, I had to leave town shortly after it happened. It was a Thursday night at roughly 9pm, while I was in my room watching some Netflix on my bed. Just like any other school night, it wasn't anything special. It was going like any other normal day, until I would hear faint sounds of a bird outside being attacked by some creature. Now, this could be seen as normal throughout the day, where it would be being eaten by a cat, but at 9pm, even I knew that was strange. It went on for a few minutes of struggle until there was a sudden crack and then silence, as if the bird was being toyed with. Although this may seem suspicious, I shrugged it off as I really couldn't care less about a random ass bird on Thursday. A quick note before I go further, I live in an old house built in World War II for the workers of the airfield nearby. These houses are not big for today's standard, meaning I could hear anything going on inside my house. Near these houses is a field with holes left from bombing runs in the war, and where houses once were are currently parking spaces for the flats built over the old runway. Anyway, a couple hours went by from the bird incident, when suddenly I heard a thud downstairs, as if someone, or something, had fallen over. The thing with this was that my parents were both in bed sleeping, I did what I thought any sane person would do and went downstairs to investigate. And what I found was not what I was expecting. Lying there on the floor was the lifeless body of a crow with its wings widely spread out across the floor. This freaked me out as all the doors and windows were locked so I had no clue how it got in, especially in that position. At this point, I was quite freaked out. So I put the bird in a bag and laid it on the table. I was too spooked to go into the pitch black garden to throw it out, so it was there, ready for the morning. 
this one coward's act of mine could be the one which saved my life. Once I made my way upstairs and into my room, I was very cautious of my surroundings. I would keep looking in the corner of my room in case someone was there. Hours go by of me laying in my bed, watching Netflix in my dark room. When I looked up and could have sworn that I saw a shadowy figure with no certain outline, which I could only describe as being similar to the red face guy from Insidious. I quickly got my phone and shined my light in the corner to see what it was. But as I did it, disappeared into thin air, confusing and scaring the heck out of me. At this point, it was 3am and I hadn't slept yet. Usually, I would be asleep by 1 or 2am, but there was no way I was sleeping that night. Only a few minutes after I saw the figure, I heard tapping on my window, which is two stories up. I went to check the windows, but no one was there. There was no way that this was a person who would climb up the side of my house, which took out the possibility that I was being played with by a friend. This was the point at which I knew something paranormal was occurring. After the tapping, I turned on my light and turned up my Netflix to full volume to make myself feel more comfortable. Even with the high volume on Netflix, I hear yet another set of tapping on my window. So once again I check, but this time it's different. On the road in front of my house, I see a person waving up to me. I got to the window within five seconds of tapping, so there's no way he climbed down and ran across my garden onto the road in that time. This freaked me the fuck out, so I closed my curtains and lay down in my bed. Bam! Out of nowhere, I hear the loudest crash I've ever heard just outside of my window. An orange glow lit up my window as I hear screaming coming from below where the person waving once was. I raced to the window to see what happened when I set my eyes on the most horrific sight I had ever seen. Two cars turned to one as they collided and have both been set on fire with one of the drivers still alive in the blaze, screaming, trying to get out. The other races to the other driver, trying his hardest to get him out. I rushed outside to help burn my right hand in the process. Only a few minutes later, the orange colour which lit onto the houses was met with flashing blue lights as an ambulance arrived on scene. At this point, the driver, who was alive, was taken to the hospital in a bad state. The other driver was long gone. His body had turned into charcoal like that on a barbecue. The one who was taken to the hospital had inhaled too much smoke, so I didn't have a chance to talk with him about what happened. I knew that this happening shortly after what had happened to me was no coincidence. The crash happened dead on where the man waving at me stood. The creepiest thing about the cars and the crash is that one of them was so long gone in the fire that the car and the person were completely unidentifiable. I just knew something was up. I didn't get a wink of sleep throughout that night. I was so shocked about what happened that I took the next week off school, but even that didn't help me. Every time I would look outside or leave the house, I would think of that night. It drove me insane. The incident was put onto the newspaper where it said the survivor went into a coma because of his injuries. This got even worse. A few weeks passed as I'm slowly getting back to normal until one night. I overheard my mum talking to her friend about that night. Her friend said she also saw a shadow figure in her room when she went to get a drink of water and then tapping at the window. This was the moment I knew it was paranormal. This was two days before the survivor of the crash woke up from his coma. So at this point, I had no clue what was coming. When I heard my mum talking to her friend, I shot up and went to the hospital where the survivor was. I requested his family to call me when he was in a stable state so I could ask him about how the crash happened. It was a long shot, I know, but I had to know what had happened that night. A couple days later, I got a call telling me he was up and in a stable state so I got a bus to the hospital. On the way, I looked out of the window and I saw a total of four people staring into the bus with no expression, like I was being watched. This got me in the same state as that horrendous night. Once I arrived at the hospital, I entered the survivor's room and asked, 
how exactly did the crash happen? I was only going 35 miles an hour, until out of nowhere, I saw a man standing in the middle of the road, waving at some random house. He was right in front of me, so I did what anyone else would do and swerved out of the way. Once I swerved out of the way, my car suddenly stopped like I crashed, but I saw nothing in front of me. No lights, no trees, nothing. So you saw no other car? No. Only once I saw the flames did I see the crumbled up car, but that wasn't the weirdest part of the crash. Only once I got a good look of what happened, I saw some sort of shadow standing on the roof being engulfed in flames. At that moment, my eyes widened as I realized the dark spots by his neck on his gown, similar to that of the man waving at my house. I busted out of the room and ran as fast as I could toward the bus stop. As I was running, I turned back to see a man, possibly the survivor, in a window waving down at us. This was the last straw. I got home as fast as possible. I screamed at my mum, saying we need to leave as soon as possible, and explained it all to her. I stayed at my grandparents' house while my parents moved out of our house. This took a couple of months. I'm always keeping an eye out on that figure in every dark corner. I'm always watching. However, this is not something which has helped me recently. The reason I'm saying all of this now is because something else has happened to me recently and I don't know what to do. The date is currently August 15th, 2021. Once again, a bird appeared in my house with its wings spread out. I'm beyond frightened and don't know what to do. I am now just waiting for another crash to happen or more waving people. There's one thing I know for sure though. My plan worked. My great uncle owns a lot of land in northern Saskatchewan, Canada. Some of this was pasture that he uses for cattle. But half of one of his largest properties is fenced off and the cows can't go there. In the sectioned off lactose free zone, the entire place is densely packed with foliage. I mean, when I hunt, I almost only use game trails and small clearings because a lot of the brush is too thick to get through without a machete. The ground itself is blotted with some small steep hills towards the entrance of the property. There is one main dirt road that goes from a Texas gate at the entrance all the way back to the farthest side of the property. Coming off the road in the hilly area, we have a camp. The camp consists of a camperized Atco trailer. Picture a big ass yellow sea can in front of the entrance, gated with barbed wire because sometimes my uncle will move his cattle to different fenced off areas of the land. With my mother's pull behind trailer that we can't pull anymore, sitting perpendicular to the Atco and a tiny dinghy 70s, 14 foot pull behind that a family member gave me so I could have privacy at camp and not have to sleep with my mom. Needless to say, we spend a lot of time in the woods and both my mom's and my door were facing the direction of the Atco, meaning I had a suedo alleyway between my door and my mom's wall. And finally, in front of the Atco trailer, we have a fire pit and close next to it in front of my mom's place, there is a table for food prep. We've always had lots of wildlife, like big cats and bears that could harm people. I actually had to put down a bear that came into our camp and was far too comfortable with people not too long after. So from so since I was young, I learned to recognize the sounds and sights around me. And while cautious, I'm rarely afraid of anything out there, especially given that I'm usually armed when I'm not with multiple people. The summer before last, we had a remarkably calm experience there, where hardly any critters we had to deal with, and it seemed the bears and pests were leaving us alone. No droppings, many small game trails had grown in, and the camp that usually took two days to set up was exactly how we had left it the previous trip. It was peaceful. It being summer, I filled the days with woodworking, fishing trips, and the occasional hike looking for berries and setting traps for rabbits, 
grouse, and other small game that could be prepared quickly over the fire with. My family, but mostly came up unlucky. Regardless of the seeming lack of disturbances, we always were careful at night, making sure to have a bright light and keep lookout for anything. After the first week, we began hearing noises around the camp very late at night that would drive the dog insane all night, to the point we just had to keep her inside, but never saw anything. It almost felt like whatever it was, was probing and checking out our camp nightly, but always staying far enough away and hidden enough that we could never see it with our spotlights. Then one night, just like any other, bar the eerie quietness that usually came around that time, I left my mother's camper a couple hours after the daylight had. Disappeared with a lantern style LED light, and as a rarity, I didn't have anything to defend myself. No gun, no bear spray, not even a knife. So I was a little bit more cautious and observant than usual, given I felt more vulnerable. As I walked from the exit of my mom's camper, I looked around for a minute, scanning the tree line, and then began to loop around to my door. I panned as I walked from right to left from the entrance to the fire pit, and then to the table. It was there, just behind the table, not 20 feet away, that I saw a naked, extremely pale, almost grey, probably just because of the dark, lanky humanoid figure standing still and directly facing me. As it caught my gaze, I felt my heart drop and immediately went cold. I probably only stared for three seconds at most, but it felt like several minutes as my brain processed what I was seeing. It stood somewhere between six and a half and seven and a half feet tall, with low slumped shoulders and had a frail thin body that reminded me of photos from the Holocaust, but with disproportionately long limbs. I couldn't see the legs fully because of the table, but what I could see looked like sinew and skin stretched over the leanest and thinnest body I have ever seen. I know I might be sounding like a dramatic bitch, but I couldn't describe the primal fear and shock that came over me. It was like a combination of the feeling you get being threatened at gunpoint, and hearing someone talk stalk you in the woods, but ramped up to the point where I could barely think. I couldn't make out many details of the face, but the light cast small shadows on the face that made it look like it had shallow features, similar to a nose and lips and eye sockets that were smoothed down. Almost like Voldemort in Slenderman's Love Child. I ran like my life depended on it. To be honest, I thought it might have. The last few feet to my door. Once inside, I grabbed my shotgun stuffed several shells in my pocket, loaded the gun, aimed it at the door. I sat in silence with the hammer and walked back waiting for the doorknob to turn or the frosted glass to break. I sat and waited for hours into the early morning, expecting to see or hear something, but I never did. Not even any foliage moving or items moving. Eventually around 4am, I lowered my guard, propped the shotgun next to my bed and hesitantly went to sleep. When I woke up, hardly believe in what I'd seen the night before, I was around the area to see if there was any shapes or items that I could have mistaken and warped in my mind into the creature. I saw, but the only thing in that area was a table with some pots and pans on it that were blackened from the fire. I'm still not quite sure what to make of it, but I do have some ideas from what I witnessed, given the fact that I believe it was stalking us and staking out our camp for several nights, along with positioning itself between me and my mother's camp, directly in front of the path that I took every night, leads me to believe that it has some level of intelligence, comparable to low A person laying a trap or setting something up. As I mentioned, I looked around after exiting my mother's camper and never heard anything, which tells me that either it was waiting there watching or it's so incredibly quiet that I never heard it move. Even a leaf. Which wouldn't line up with us hearing the disturbances from the previous nights. 
It also left as quietly as it appeared, which leaves three options. Either it went out of its way to use the same road entering the camp that a person would for convenience, it silently crept out through the game trails, or it didn't wave until after I had lowered my guard and my adrenaline died down. I'm honestly not sure which option is more likely or more off-putting. I'm not really sure what I saw, but I know it wasn't human. The photos and drawings of these crawlers reminded me a great deal of it. So I thought I'd share that maybe one of you could enlighten me as to what it could have been doing or its intent or provide an explanation to its behavior. I know it's not worth much online, but hand to God, I swear this isn't a piece of fanciful writing and I would be happy to share any other details if anyone wants more info or further clarification. I hesitate in telling this story because I don't want to contribute to the Ouija board stigma. It's a fact a board with letters painted, stamped or stenciled on it. Or the way Hasbro makes them, a sticker on pasteboard. It's not a portal or gateway, and nothing lives inside them. It would be rather tight. Energy feeds off energy, and the board being an inanimate object can't emit its own energy. That comes from those who use the board. I was given my first Ouija board by my grandmother, I think for my 14th birthday. She liked to give odd things for birthdays for some reason. A group of the neighborhood kids were bored and hanging out in my room. We didn't know what we wanted to do, so just hung out chatting about whatever kids chat about. There was one girl being stoopy and looking in my closet and spotted the board. She came out all excited and asked if we could try it and I said, yeah, whatever. So two of them start facing each other with their fingers on the planchet and started asking questions. Silly questions like, does so-and-so like me or does he have a girlfriend? Well, that didn't end well when the thing pointed to no, backed up a bit and pointed to no a second time. She got upset and decided she didn't want to play anymore. Then it was my turn with someone else. I forgot what she asked, but the planchet didn't move and she became frustrated. So she got up and someone else sat down. This is where things became weird. She asked if she could speak to her grandmother who had recently passed because she missed her and it pointed to yes. So the thing starts doing a figure eight, slow at first and then gaining momentum. Then it stopped. This girl started to ask if her grandmother was present. It said no and she just had to ask who we were talking to. Well, that did it. It spelled out devil. A rocking chair across the room started rocking all by itself. There were screams and a stampede out of my room and out of the house. Luckily, no parent were home at the time. They didn't tell their parents right away. But later that night, they all had nightmares and they had to tell their parents. Their mothers called my mother all upset. Apparently the fathers thought it was funny, but the mothers didn't and I got in trouble. Even though I wasn't the one who pulled the board out of the closet and said so, but that didn't matter. Grounded. The nightmares weren't all they suffered. Of course, looking back, I think that group exaggerated just a wee bit. They heard things and felt things that scared them so much they slept in their parents' room a night for a week. I think that pissed them off more than what happened. They were told to stay away from me. Thinking back, we kids were taken advantage by a prankster spirit who knew exactly what to say to scare kids and it worked. Other than being grounded in my rocking chair rocking by itself, nothing happened to me. I didn't have any nightmares. The only nightmare was my mother, see or feel things. Some believe her, the idiometer is what causes the planchet to move. I think we being hormonal teens at the time worked a psychic connection or linked together, causing the chair to rock. Or it really was a trickster. There's nothing more disconcerting when you're reading in bed and your normally docile cat who was sleeping at the foot of the bed suddenly jumps up, arches her back, hair standing on end, 
ears flat, and letting out the most horrible, ferocious growl I've ever heard, while staring at the corner of the room. I was 16 or 17 at the time, reading in bed before falling asleep. I don't remember what I was reading. Could be Stephen King, Anne Rice, or some other author. I do remember it was engrossing. My cat, a manx, a tailless cat, was sleeping soundly at the foot of the bed, hogging it to be exact, spread out practically the width of the bed, where I had hardly any room for my feet. I wasn't much of a TV person, preferring to read over watching some scripted show full of nonsense. So I'm sitting there reading, everything is quiet except for my cat snoring. Yeah, she did that, just enjoying my book. The room was quiet and mostly in shadow, as the only light was the one on my nightstand. It was the largest room in the house since it was in the finished basement. I hated cleaning it though. I feel the pull of sleep beginning to reach out to me. Not quite tired enough, but not going to be able to stay awake much longer, opting to read a few more pages. When suddenly my cat, precious, mom's idea, jumps up and growls at the corner of my room. I mean full on attack mode, arched back, hair standing on end, ears flat. It was hiss, growl, hiss, growl. I'm scared shitless at this point because I see nothing there, but she's hollering, howling, hissing and growling at something only she can see. I'm watching her and staring at the corner, seeing nothing. I do what any rational person in my position would do, sink under the covers and bury my head. I couldn't wrap my head at what got her so riled up. Then, as suddenly as it started, it stopped. She licked her paws. I was peeking, satisfied that she chased away whatever invisible intruder there was, and went back to sleep. Meanwhile, I'm still jittery and not sure I could fall asleep. I was going to do it with the light left on. I thought maybe she was having a nightmare, but there were two other occasions. A couple of weeks later, I woke to her hissing and staring at that same corner. It wasn't full of fury. It was more like warning whatever to keep its distance. I still didn't see anything. Third time, same thing. Woke up to her hissing at that corner after a couple of weeks went by, but this time I felt brave. I got out of bed and walked over to the corner, trying to find out what was upsetting her. And it was cold. The type of cold that chilled you to the bone. It was summer. That was quite a few years ago, and Precious has been gone for almost 20 years or so. I still miss that cat even to this day. I have her picture taped on my wall. I've had other cats with their own unique personalities and loved them dearly. I have two now, but Precious was special who lived to be 25. This happened twice to me. I was reading as I always did before going to sleep. I don't particularly care for ebooks, but I read them when I'm in bed with the lights out on my tablet so I can turn it off and just roll over and go to sleep without worrying about turning off a light. The first time, I was reading a story by I forget who. It was a Kindle book. And they seem to publish authors who have no hope of getting published, except self-published or on Kindle. But this one was pretty good. It was a ghost story, but truly people don't know how to write those anymore. So I'm reading and my eyes start to get tired. So I turn off the tablet and settle to fall asleep. And I was just drifting off when I heard this long, low, guttural growl right next to my ear. I looked to find the source, but there was none. The cats were outside, so it wasn't them, even though it really didn't sound like a cat, nor a dog for that matter. It ended without any incident. I laid there contemplating what it could be and why it happened. I had no answers and decided maybe I was hearing things, so I went to sleep until it happened another night. The second time, I had finished reading for the night after growing tired. I shut off the tablet and settled to sleep. I remembered it was a nice sleep and may have or not dreamed. I don't actually remember. I woke up suddenly hearing that same low guttural growling. I laid there listening to it when it suddenly stopped. I listened for it a few before allowing myself to go back to a sleep. Haven't heard it since.
I'd like to share a number of little anecdotes from my dozens of times being at the notoriously haunted and long abandoned cemetery, Bachelor's Grove. I think they rival a lot of the stories to come out in the last 20 years about experiences in that cemetery. For one, among the first times I went to the cemetery, which is situated in the middle of a forest preserve, it was with friends, and we saw the notorious disappearing house, or at least one of them. We didn't even know it was supposed to be there. Once we had spent our time in the cemetery, we continued walking west, past a stream that ran through the area. We walked for some time, and I even took a photo inside of a nearby well where this house apparently was, attached. This was in approximately 2001. The house that most people have reported is said to be white, but what we saw was brown. It did look like it had candles in the windows, and it had a sheltered porch area. The more we walked towards it, the more it stayed the same distance from us. We were so preoccupied with looking for ghosts that we didn't even realise that the house wasn't supposed to be there. And we didn't put it together for some years after, including several other visits without consequence, and one with an especially large amount of consequence, at least to me. After I heard about the disappearing house in 2004 or so, I brought multiple friends back to try and find it, and we never did. One time in 2014, a friend and I walked for five hours in the thick of the woods, off the paths, past the cemetery, past the nearby stream, and the more we walked, the more the view of the Midlothian Turnpike, i.e. at the end of the forest preserve, stayed the same distance from us. Finally, we gave up and turned around, and we got back to the cemetery entrance within 20 minutes. That forest preserve is about a three block radius if you look at a map. There's no logical way we walked for that long without coming out the other side. On Friday, June 13th of 2003, I was still something of a skeptic. I went to spend the night at the cemetery by myself, because I thought I'd never see anything. I snuck into the forest preserve area past a small radio antenna slash tower, because I knew there would be police stationed at the main entrance to prevent trespassers, and there were. By this time, I'd been there so many times I knew the place by heart. I quietly snuck onto the main path just past the entrance. Once I'd walked through the woods for long enough, dressed in all black, and with a good deal of adrenaline, I didn't even have a flashlight, but I found that I didn't need one. The moon was so bright and full, yes, it was a full moon on Friday the 13th, that I didn't need a flashlight. I walked around a fair amount. I was thankful that for some reason there was no mud and no mosquitoes, and the weather was a bit brisk, but not too cold. I'm pretty sure that I arrived at the cemetery around 11pm, and not a thing happened until about 2am, but at that time, everything happened, and it was beautiful. I sat at a grave that had been dug up in the 60s, so it was a bit of a pothole. I believe it was the Newman grave. I tried to settle in, but I was on high alert the entire time, until I did actually start seeing things. A lot of people have horror stories of shadow figures and deep negativity, but what I saw was so blissful and warm it made me really happy, and I've always associated that warm feeling with the place since then. It began with me seeing two people slow dance in a circle, patiently, gracefully, and almost menacingly. It was a bride and groom in old-fashioned regalia. The groom with a top hat and coattails, and the bride with a white wreath on her head. They were too far away to see too many details, but the intensity with which they gazed into each other's eyes was not only implicit, but undeniable. So much so that I could hear the music, although I knew I couldn't. It's natural for a skeptic to assume that this was merely a mirage, the eyes playing tricks in the moonlight, but it's hard to explain how bright everything was. The moon was not only luminescent, but everything had a slight glowing hue to it, which allowed me to make for certain that this couple in the distance dancing their mesmerizing dance near the entrance to the cemetery, were not my eyes making something out of nothing. The more clarity I felt, the more happiness I felt. I felt as if I was connected to all of the families who would come to have picnics and visit their loved ones, 
since this was, after all, referred to as the cemetery in the park at one point. White orbs began to float around in the area, and they didn't seem to be representative of bodies, but they were smaller. They looked like what Disney movies portrayed lightning bugs to be, basically clusters of white superballs floating in the air. There was not only a glow, but a sort of fog in the trees. And most of the orbs that I saw up in the trees and what looked like light mists of glowing white smoke. To my left, a large glowing red light crept up over the lagoon and the nearby Midlothian turnpike. It looked like red spotlights were coming up out of the lagoon, lots of them. The side of the road next to the lagoon was immersed in red light going straight up to the sky. I kept waiting to hear an ambulance, but I heard nothing. I didn't even hear crickets for a while. Combined with the moonlight, these new red lights gave me even more light to see, and on the ground, I saw a broken carriage and a dead horse. I want to be clear that it was bright enough to make these things out clearly. The carriage was pretty smashed up, but it was still recognisable as a carriage. I didn't know of any sort of history where a horse and carriage ran into the lagoon and both died for no apparent reason. I heard that years later. Another thing I will say, there are stories of a yellow man, which is to say, apparently some Dick Tracy type of character walks around in a yellow overcoat. I didn't see that exactly, and I never heard of it until recently, but what I did see was a glowing yellow humanoid figure that would walk for a few steps and then explode into pieces, then reform as a bunch of orbs that rapidly coagulated, walk a bit more, then explode. All of this happened in a manner as if it were indifferent to me. This stuff continued to go on, uninterrupted, for at least two hours. I sat in the moonlight and sketched what I was seeing at one point, and that was just as things were beginning to develop. What I did sketch also were potential mirages, to be clear, but that was before the red light really kicked in. It wasn't all peachy keen through the whole night, though. I had heard of the shadow figures and hooded figures, and naturally I was worried about ritual abuse and devil worshippers that are rumoured to be about the area. What I did see was hovering hooded figures moving back and forth about the fence area, paying particular attention to the entrance. They zoomed back and forth over and over, and that made me pretty nervous, but they seemed more like guardians than antagonists. What made me more nervous was that I began hearing animals screaming. I specifically heard a dog screaming in pain, and it felt like it was very close to me, but I couldn't see it. The dog didn't seem to want to hurt me, but I didn't move from my spot at that gravestone until the sun began to come up. Just before that happened, it was as if a dimmer switch had turned and everything down, and it all faded from view as the crack of dawn only slightly began to creep through the moonlight. At which point, I walked to a nearby diner, had breakfast, and came back to the cemetery to take pictures with a disposable camera. Naturally, not one photo came out. They were all completely black. I'm an 18 year old male. I live in Chatham, Illinois, just to help create a map of where certain things may reside for those interested. I see myself as quite a logical person, more so than most. Though sometimes when my mental health is suffering, I become more prone to being willing to accept illogical beliefs. Though these periods are typically very short lasting. These experiences listed below happened years ago and I've had plenty of time to think about them logically. I'll try to keep them concise. This was a few years ago, Chatham, Illinois, spring. My house was largely surrounded by woods, but there were larger areas where there was grass that we mowed as well. There was a long grass area from our house all the way down to a lake. Each side of this grass patch was covered by woods, one side more than the other. At this time, I would typically walk to the lake, alone, every day around 8 to 11 a.m., I would just look at things, do miscellaneous things, hang out. One day, after being at the lake, I started walking back up to my house. Then I heard someone or th something 
ruffling the leaves on the area to the side of me in the woods line. I looked ov over only for a second and I saw something big and black. They were tall and had thicker limbs. I didn't look long enough to get any smaller details. Possibly it was a Bigfoot, possibly it was a Dogman, or possibly it, they, were a person in a costume suit or in weird clothing. Those aren't typical clothes for this time of year. No one should have been at this location. It's private property. All of my close neighbors are above 50. The closest is much older. Right as we saw each other, it, they, started running. Not necessarily away from me and deeper into the woods patch, but they started running along the woods line. I then quickly bolted back to my house, told my dad's friend that was staying there, and went back out with my phone whilst recording a video because I figured no one would believe me. I didn't catch them on video, nor did I see them again, despite going out again multiple times. Even alone, late at night, with no phone. They may have been silently watching me at the lake for some time. I, for sure, saw something out of the ordinary. I'm just not sure what. This was many years ago. I was at my grandparents' house. Mechanicsburg, Illinois. They're Christian and go to church every Sunday. They have many little things all over the house. Artworks, artifacts and whatnot. One day, me and my little brother were staying over at their house. I was staying in the guest bedroom. My little brother was staying on the living room couch. So after everyone had been asleep, including me, for hours, I woke up in the middle of the night to crying sounds coming from the living room. I went out there, feeling a bit off, and saw my little brother was crying. I asked him why, and he said he, saw, he said something. I don't remember his exact terminology. Was running up and down the basement stairs. This caused me to be more frightened. I stood there for a minute, then out of the corner of my eye, just looking barely enough to see some of it, I think I see something in the dark kitchen, and it moves over to the basement door. If something was there, I only saw part of it. A long skinny black slash ash coloured arm. That was the part of the thing I may have seen. It freaked me out, and at that time I cried in fear. I eventually went back to the guest bedroom, locked the door, and prepared to defend myself in case I needed to. I eventually fell asleep. The next day, I asked my brother about it. He said he was just messing with me. Weirdly though, everyone was asleep, not just me. So I don't understand how his crying could have been to solely target me. But possibly, though I figure unlikely, he meant solely about the stairs comment he made. Also, when I asked him why he was crying, he immediately said something was running up and down the stairs. That's a pretty bizarre thing to immediately come up with, especially when under emotional distress. So I figured him messing with me was unlikely. If I actually saw something, I have no idea what it was. There is little place for something to hide in that house. Maybe if it did exist, and if possession is a thing, it possessed some object and came out of it, and got a kick out of messing with people, but it didn't want to be caught messing with people. My grandma, who lives at that house, has many, many paranormal stories, but we all think she's a bit nutty. I don't know for sure what actually happened in this experience. I think my older brother has told me about some of his experiences at my grandparents' house as well. Chatham, Illinois. I've had many experiences of hearing my name being called but I think most people have, and it may just be the brain making it up. Outside, at night, in empty places, I've heard a baby crying. I've heard people yelling help and other similar things. Also in the day, from a storm drain pipe that drained into a stream, I've heard some things. I've heard stories of beings that call out your name or call out for help. Though this could have just been a hallucination or a mishearing or something else, or an actual sound from something but it was just a normal person doing a normal activity. Divinan, Illinois. I was a young child, two-story house. One day, me and my older brother heard people walking all around and talking upstairs on the second story. We were downstairs in the first story. No one was upstairs. 
Everyone was downstairs sleeping, except for me and my older brother. We were awake. This could have been a hearing of ghosts. I've heard of many similar things happening. The house belongs to a church. It was right next to a church. Though it could have been a two-party hallucination, or something outside that sounded like it was coming from upstairs. I've heard talks about that house having black mold, but who knows? I figure this was a genuine experience. I've seen many weird shadows and things out of the corner of my eyes, but I think everyone does, and the human brain naturally does this, and it's nothing paranormal, at least the majority of the time, maybe all of the time. Uncle's wedding spot. I touched some black powder that was in a bowl at church. I felt a weird jolt through my body. I'm not sure what that powder was for. Ash Wednesday? Or why it made me feel like that. Streaks of light in the sky, spots of light. Explainable as space phenomena, aircraft, satellites. Though who knows? Memory of being in a room as a very, very young child. An aluminium or aluminium coloured room. There's a thought in the memory of it being an alien craft. Possibly, after seeing the room, I turned around and saw an alien. This was very likely just a memory of a movie I saw or something that's happened before. Old watching of movies and similar things may sometimes get mixed up into my personal experience memories. Especially as when I watch movies, I invest myself in them so much and live every experience the main character lives in my mind. I recreate their pain, emotions, everything. I think more so than the average person does. I've had weird dreams. Aliens, powers, interdimensional travel, etc. Separate dreams, or different. Most likely nothing quite paranormal, just some very odd dreams. I honestly feel like I have more experiences, very big ones, but I just can't quite remember them. I can feel them there, I just can't quite grasp what they are. I do suffer from DPDR, or a long-term general dissociation, which means my memory is shot at the moment. Maybe I'll rewrite this if my condition ever goes away. Hi there. So I'd like some advice on some strange things that have occurred. Just a heads up, this is going to be long. Before I say what happened, we live in an apartment complex. The first apartments in which a lot of these occurrences happened, we had moved out of and no longer lived there. We moved due to ongoing issues we had with the people who lived next to us. We were offered to have us move into a different apartment, so we did. Just to be clear, the apartment in which we moved into is still within the same complex. So it all started not that long ago, around 2019. I was home alone at the time, working on some homework that I needed to catch up on. Meanwhile, my family was out at the store. I remember that I had left my blue hoodie on the couch, and then I just went inside my room to do my work. Some time passes, and I walk back out, and my hoodie's gone. I look everywhere, but I can't find it. After searching for what seemed like forever, I decided to check inside this mini closet that we had near our kitchen. Once opening it, I look to see that my hoodie is just tossed on the floor within the closet. I know for sure that I wasn't the one who put it there. While I thought it was odd, I just assumed that perhaps I did it and just didn't realize. Some months pass and it happens again, but this time with my phone. I was in my room chilling just using my phone, when all of a sudden I had to use the bathroom. I got up and it wasn't even 5 minutes when I got out, only to see that my phone wasn't on my bed where I had left it. I walked out and found it placed on the living room table. My mom, who at the time was the only one at home besides me, was sitting on one of the couches fixing her recipe book. I asked her if she was the one who had moved my phone. She said she didn't, and that she hadn't even been in my room. She also seemed serious when she said it wasn't her. My mom isn't the type of person to pull pranks or joke around like that. It would make more sense if it were my dad who were to do it, since he's the one who's known to pull pranks, jump scare us, and just joke around in general. But he wasn't home. 
It couldn't have been my older brother either because he was out with friends. Once again, I assumed that perhaps I was the one who did it, even though I didn't. Months pass and it happens a third time, this time with my pajamas. It was the night and it was super hot. So I decided to borrow the fan that was in my parents' room. I had taken out my pajamas and placed them on my bed while I went to grab the fan. As soon as I came back, my pajamas were gone. I looked for them, but couldn't find them. At some point I went back into my parents' room and right there on the floor were my pajamas just thrown. I honestly tried to forget about it and move on. Time passes and it happens a fourth time. At this point I was going insane. It was also around this time that I was having these weird dreams. Now I'm not sure to take the dreams seriously or not, but I thought I would add them in. In the first dream, I see myself sleeping in my bed and sitting right next to me is a shadow figure. This figure had no features and it seemed to have just been watching me as I slept. I didn't feel scared, let alone threatened. I was more confused and weirded out. The second dream happens the night after. In this dream, I felt something cold come up towards me and kiss me. I was confused when I woke up, but didn't think much of it since it was just a dream. After this, we ended up moving to the other apartment. So far, nothing happened when we first got there. It wasn't until my mom said she saw something. My mom is someone who has experienced the paranormal in the past. This occurred about two months ago. She and I were watching TV up in her room because my dad at the time was using the main one that was downstairs. She told me that as she was watching the TV, she saw this figure out in the hall walk past and into the direction towards my room. I tried to assure her that it was just her eyes playing tricks on her since we were just staring at a screen. She was super hesitant though and that she was sure that it was real. The same night as I was sleeping, I woke up some time in the middle of the night. This was strange to me since I'm a deep sleeper and waking up in the middle of the night is rare for me. On top of my bed, I always place my retainer box and phone before I go to bed. As I was awake, I clearly heard someone touching and moving my retainer box around. It only lasted for a few seconds and then it stopped. Now this easily could have just been a hallucination so I don't think much of it and just went back to sleep. The next night, something happened again. I was sleeping and once again, I woke up at some odd hour in the night. I was trying to position myself to be more comfortable when all of a sudden, I felt a hand touch the back of my neck. It was quick, but it made me jump so fast under the covers. After some time, I took a peek and didn't see anything. I just assumed that perhaps it was another hallucination I had. I even laughed for how I reacted. Months pass and nothing strange happens. That is, until something disappears. Inside my drawer, I always put my headphones when I'm done using them. One night, I had put them away inside my drawer. The next day, I wanted to use them, only to find out that they were gone. I tore my entire closet apart, including each and every drawer. They were nowhere to be seen. No one in my family took them either. I was upset that I would have had to go out and buy a brand new pair because apparently the ones I had disappeared. So that's what I did. I bought the new pair and I'm not kidding when I say that a few days later, the ones that I had lost reappeared inside my drawer. The same drawer that I had torn apart along with my entire closet. I was shocked and couldn't believe what I was seeing. There was no way I would have missed them. So far, that was the last strange thing that's happened as of now. Besides my things being moved around, I've never seen anything. It was more so than not minor occurrences. Nothing sinister ever happened. There are times where I have felt cold spots near me, though that could have just been changes in temperature. Just to be clear, the apartment complex in which we live is new. I don't see how it could be haunted, it's not old. Now I'm not sure if this is any correlation, but when I was younger, about 13 or 14 years old, I tried to play with a Ouija board by myself. Yes, I know it was stupid of me to have done that. Trust me, I now know better. 
not to mess with that stuff. Now I'm 19, so it's been a while. I had made one myself with a piece of paper. When I tried using it, nothing happened. After a while, I figured it wasn't worth it and got rid of it. Ever since then, these strange things began to occur that I've mentioned above. There were countless times where I felt like I was being watched, though that could have just been me being paranoid. I also wanted to point out that even after we would move these things, would continue to happen. Like I said earlier, the headphone incident was the last thing that happened. That was two to three months ago. Things have become a bit more calm. Is this a good sign that perhaps whatever it was has decided to stop and move on? I'd appreciate some insight on what it could be that has caused these things to happen in the first place. My hubby is thoughtful. He had the best of intentions when he bought the old but safe 1984 Mercedes for myself and our daughter in 2002. The problem? The car was haunted. Not just haunted, it was possessed by something that didn't like me. I honestly felt it wasn't me specifically, it was the fact I was a woman. My hubby was excited because the car had history. It had been used in films and was owned by a famous divorce attorney. Yes, the car had been used in many films and its primary owner was a prominent divorce attorney. However, he only represented husbands. That's important for later. Oh, also, he was found, passed away in his car. It always parked in our driveway, outside of our garage. Once parked there, our garage and also the room adjacent to the garage, our living room, remained incredibly dark. Even though our living room had an entire wall of windows, we could never seem to get enough light to see. There was a heaviness to the air too. Our daughter was petrified of the garage. Even now though, the car had been gone for years and she's now 25. She still turns on all the lights before entering the garage. My hubby was so excited with the car's history. Well, whatever the history, it was clear as crystal. The car didn't like me. Anytime I drove, it would stall and refuse to start. It would happen in bad places. The middle of the freeway was one, but its favorite was the middle of intersections. I would just be trying to get from point A to point B. Nope. I would call my hubby. I'm dead in the intersection again. Strangers are pushing the car as we speak. He sent the mechanic and the car was towed to his shop. The mechanic kept the car for two weeks, trying to duplicate the problem. No luck, it drove fine. All systems checked out. My hubby called me to say the car was ready. He picked me up and dropped me at the mechanic's shop. He stayed there to see that the car started. On the way home, it again stalled. I informed my hubby then. I no longer cared if he believed me. I refused to drive the car again. My husband was now the only driver. He never had an issue with stalling again. Once it wouldn't pass smog, it began to sit. Sit on our driveway and wreak havoc in our home. The darkness and negative energy was so thick, it was suffocating. We were arguing all the time over nothing. I'd come home in a good mood, only to feel frustration and anger once inside my home. This went on for years. Finally, we decided to get rid of the car. A tow company was scheduled to come take it away. I took pictures during the process. I was nervous, but excited to be rid of this evil. I still have the pictures. I swear to this day, there's a visible face in the driver's side rear window that changes expression as the car is being loaded on the trailer. Once the car was gone, my home felt lighter. It was brighter. We no longer needed lights in our living room that had a wall of windows. The heaviness was gone. The anger and frustration that we felt about each other was gone too. We just celebrated 32 years together. If we had kept that car, we'd be divorced or one of us dead by now. That I'm sure of. Our neighbors had a cat named Wrangler. He used to come and visit us every day. 
My daughter used to love reading stories to him. I have pictures of the two of them sitting on our porch. He seems to be truly listening. One day he came over and I noticed a horrible wound on his backside. He'd obviously been in a fight. I went to my neighbors who owned him and asked if, they, asked if they knew about the wound. They affirmed they knew, but felt a vet visit wasn't needed. He's an outdoor cat, shit happens. I was stunned. I asked for permission to take him myself. They said, it's your money. He went on major medications and I had to clean and pack his wound daily. He was inc incredible through the whole process. In doing blood work, it was discovered he had feline AIDS. I was devastated. This meant his recovery would have to take place in our garage away from the other cat that I had inside my home. Our neighbors stopped caring for him completely. So after he fully recovered, he became our kitty. It kills me that I had to keep him outdoors. I knew the dangers that awaited him. My daughter insisted that we get him a collar and tag. It also had a bell. He seemed happy to be ours. We could hear his collar ring every time he came to bed. AIDS was horrible. He could never seem to get enough to eat. One morning, we didn't hear his bell. My daughter called for him. Once in a while he'd behave this way. He was a cat after all. My daughter asked if she could go look for him. I agreed and continued to make breakfast. Suddenly, I heard my daughter screaming. She ran into our home, clutching me, sobbing. I asked, what's wrong, honey, what's wrong? Through sobs, she said it was Wrangler. A coyote got him, and he was, what was left of him, on our neighbor's lawn. I grabbed a blanket and went to him. Almost all of him was there, be it in pieces. Obviously, the coyotes could tell he was ill. I scooped him up, and we buried him under his favorite tree in our yard. For weeks after, we would hear his bell ring outside our door. We'd always check, but there was never anything there. We knew it was him, our wrangler, letting us know he was okay. My parents bought their home in the early 50s for $18,000 in California. My dad was extremely proud that it came furnished. What a deal. My dad was all about bargains. His favorite piece was a wall unit made of dark wood that had a grandfather type clock built in the center. My dad babied that unit as if it were a family member, cleaning and polishing it regularly, even talking to it. Don't misunderstand, he was brilliant. A microelectronic engineer, a genius really. Fast forward to 1992, two days before Christmas, he dies suddenly of a massive heart attack, his second, in the living room. My mom grieves horribly for a very long time. We began talking to her about redecorating, using her inheritance from my dad to make the home her own. She finally agreed and soon after the house was filled with workers. I happened to be visiting when I believe my dad voiced his opinion about the changes. A worker was looking to remove the family member unit from the wall. He thought my mom was nearby so he'd loudly asked, hey, you want this clock unit removed? He stated he heard, a, he heard a very loud affirmative no, so he didn't remove the piece. Later, my mom came through the room and noticed the only item left in the room was that piece. She asked the contractor, whom I'd been chatting with, why the piece was still on the wall. He left to speak with his workers, came back and said, my guy says you said no very loudly. Is that not correct? My mom responded, he didn't ask me. I've been outside in the laundry room and backyard all morning. I truly believe that it was my dad. He was angry at the thought that his beloved clock might be replaced or removed. It's a favorite family story to this day. To start off, I worked at an elderly home for more than a year. I'm turning 20 this year. This happened when I was 18. Keep in mind that English isn't my first speaking language. I've heard many things about the two elderly homes in the city I lived in. I learned the stories when I worked there from some of the workers and told me some scary stories they experienced and what visitors had told them. 
It wasn't exactly nerve-wracking, but there was a few creepy stories. An example that I've also witnessed was after an elderly person passed, their alarm would still be ringing, even though no one lived in that room anymore. For those who don't know what I'm talking about, the elderly people get an alarm for them to push on if they need help with something. We would see it on a clock slash board and go and help them. There shouldn't have been a reason for them to be ringing. Really creepy. But some people have different reactions to it. When I started to work there, my co-workers always let me do the more challenging work since I was new. That happens at every work when you're new and don't know anything. They all seemed scared or, you know, anxious about the basement. The part of the elderly that I was assigned to had their washroom down in the basement. Every part of the elderly home could have their clothes washed down there, but since I worked at the part where the elderly home is at its oldest, I forgot to mention that. The building is two different houses, put together if that makes sense. One has been there since like the mid-1900s, and the other part was built sometime in the 2000s. I worked in the oldest part, where the wash room was in the basement. No one would will willingly go down there. But since I had no clue, they let me go. I'm sure they were like, if she doesn't know, it won't hurt her. If I didn't know then, I know now. There was always a creepy feeling in the basement, like someone was watching you. I knew in an instance why my co-workers were willing to send me down there. I always had music on, like old music, for apparent reason. It made me feel about better about it. The cleaning staff had their carts with cleaning stuff in the basement as well. While I listened to the music, I heard something fall over. I looked for the source and saw that a bottle on the cart had fallen over. I got out of there quickly. Another time, I was hanging white sheets to dry in that one room that heats up and is blowing. Don't know the name. When I was done, I turned around to turn the lights off. I swear I could see a faint shadow by the sheets, like behind it, like a contour. I got that scene from The Conjuring when Lorraine is taking down the laundry and I ran my ass back upstairs. I refused to leave anyone's side after that. They knew I was in the basement, so they probably didn't question me further about that. I'm not sure about that one. It was late. I hadn't slept well the whole week, had watched scary movies and such. I'm a believer of the paranormal, so when someone tells a story about paranormal activity, I believe them. But the sheets were moving around and since I was already frightened, it could have been whatever. I never told my co-workers about that one, but I did tell them about the feeling of being watched, things falling over and whatnot. This is the time they decided to tell me their stories and I was like, wow, couldn't have told me before. They thought I didn't see or hear anything since I never said anything before. I remember a time from that basement so vividly that even writing this makes my tears well up. I came in on a non-working day to talk with my boss about something. I don't really remember now. I asked my co-workers and they actually said that she was in the basement. We had flex, but okay. My boss had an encounter with another person with stocking of supplies or something like that, one of the co-workers said. So off I went to the scary basement. So when I got down there, I heard the voices from upstairs, but I also heard other voices. Like, it sounded like my boss, seriously. I had walked a bit in, so you couldn't hear the others anymore from upstairs. I walked to a door. I heard someone talking behind it, thinking it was my boss and was like, oh, she's in there looking at supplies, right? Opens the door and instantly I'm met with darkness and the voice is gone. I looked inside at first, not realizing it got all quiet. Then I got frightened by the darkness, shut the door hard and trotted away. I didn't realize it right away, however, that it stopped talking. I was just freaked out. Another time I was really freaked out was when I walked into an elderly woman who lived at the elderly home. I was going to give her the medicine she had at that time. 
So I walked in and she sat in her wheelchair, kind of facing her bed and therefore could see me walking into her room. I said my hello and what I was doing, but she wasn't focused on me. She was kind of looking behind me. But I wasn't surprised. It's nothing new. I turned to my left to get her medicine right by the door. When I did give her it, she stopped me and asked if I saw the man standing by the door. I looked at the door and it was cracked open a bit. I didn't fully close it and it was dark outside the door. We shut the light off at night and have like night lights along the corridors. You see a man standing at the door, I asked. Not right now, but when you walked in, he was right behind you, just staring into the room, she answered. That freaked me out. I mean, I'd gotten used to the weird feeling, but I must have noticed something, right? Maybe not. I walked towards the door and looked outside, but there was no one there. I hadn't heard anyone walking outside the door either. Many would probably say it's her mind playing tricks because of her age, but I've never heard her say something like that before. I asked her what the man looked like, and she said that he looked like a fisherman, raincoat and a rain hat. I made sure she took her medication and walked to check with my colleagues if someone had been there, but they said no. The only visitors that had been there were at noon, no one else. I mentioned everything the lady said, and one of them said that the lady had an experience where someone tried to break in. My only thought was, who breaks in somewhere in a raincoat? She was a nerve wreck when I came back and said she wanted to have her doors locked that night. There is a fisherman picture a little away from the room, but I doubt that she imagined him being there. My grandmother lives at that elderly care. She said that she woke up one night and saw a man sitting in the chair in front of her bed and like watching over her. He too looked like the man the other lady mentioned. Raincoat and rain hat. Sus, isn't it? We think that he might have been a patient at the elderly care and watches out for everyone. A fisherman wouldn't be out of order really, since that city I lived in used to handle fishing as a living, if you know what I mean. I'm hesitant to leave my room at night, besides for the bathroom, because if I'm the only one awake, I tend to hear voices from downstairs. We've got a big creaky house, so I'm sure it's usually my brain turning normal settling noises into conversations. I can handle the ones I'm not involved in, and I think I know the hallucinations by indicators like me knowing very specific details about who the voices belong to. I just don't like it when they say my name. I've heard both sing-songy calls from down there and harsh whispers from maybe the third stair up to the hallway. Again, I used to accept these as brain-fucky quirks, until other people started hearing it. My younger brother is 16 and really loves scaring the shit out of himself. When he claims to hear things, I don't really pay it any mind because he had the same shit childhood as mine, and I wouldn't be surprised if he got similar issues. We've even heard things at the same time, including heavy boots on our stairs, a woman crying in my parents' bedroom while no one was home, and a man's cough from his bedroom while we were eating dinner alone downstairs. We responded to all of these by tactically checking the house with kitchen knives and then locking ourselves in our bedrooms. Recently, my mom told us about waking up to a growl beside her bed, which I've experienced myself, but again, wrote off as a hallucination. And she told us in secret that my extremely skeptical stepfather recently heard someone whisper his name twice from under the bed. Of course, because both of them were asleep, it could be extremely mild sleep paralysis. It just weirds me out that both of them admit to something they've made fun of me for taking a boat before. A few hallmarks of weird shit that's gone down recently. My mom and brother were sitting at the counter when the top of a coffee jar popped into the air and landed directly beside it. I heard them both shriek as I was walking up the stairs when it happened. My skeptical girlfriend slept over and said she woke up around 3 a.m. to the sound of children running in the hallway. My bedroom door was open, even though I closed and locked it, and neither of us recalled getting up. 
I have two younger siblings, three and five, but obviously neither would be awake and they can't leave their shared nursery without my parents unlocking the door. She jokes about my haunted house but claims not to believe in ghosts. Parents went away to stay at a resort for a few days. Picked up my brother from work at 11 after my own nine hour shift and my dog was closed in the laundry room where he sleeps. There was blood and diarrhea all over the floor. So we rushed him to a 24 hour vet. Turns out he got so nervous being locked in there he bursted blood vessels in his colon and let rip the red tides. Weird part is, he's a really chill young guy and hasn't done anything like that before. There's also only a four inch space between the wide open door and the laundry machine. He'd have to nudge it closed somehow, which doesn't make sense and isn't something he's ever done in his five years. My fear was that someone had been in our house and closed him in there. Again, he's a really chill guy and from experience, He'd go anywhere anybody led him. We live on an acre of land in a little farming community and a lot of neighbors visit him and hop the fence to bring him treats and toys. I kind of brushed this off as a weird incident and my brother and I were starving and decided to eat outside before cleaning up the blood shit. On the porch, we talked about how our dog could have closed himself in there. Both of us couldn't come up with anything that was, wasn't scary as hell. Like 10 minutes into choking down some burgers and we both jump up. The light in the living room, which we could see from our seats, turned off. This essentially confirmed my theory that someone had closed the dog in there and they were still in our house. I get ready to call the cops, but my brother runs to the garage and stupidly turns on the light, which can be seen from fucking everywhere because it's separate from the house. He comes running back with a mini hacksaw and a goddamn mallet. I'm pretty good at shutting off my emotions for survival, so I took the hacksaw and was just kind of resigned to death or killing someone. I'm really scared of cops, so calling them just didn't seem worth it anymore and went around the back of the house. From the back, all of the windows to everything are visible. We scanned the dark living room, the kitchen and the front room and saw nothing. Then my brother goes, oh fuck. Through their balcony door window, we can see that my parents' bedroom door is wide open into a dark hallway. Fucked up thing is, we'd gone up to change before we ate and the door was most definitely closed and I'd left the light on. Again, I should have called the cops at this point but I was so numb to all reason and we went inside. For some reason, my brother started yelling and slamming all the doors he checked, which was surprisingly intimidating. I didn't chime in because he's got a deep voice and I have an extremely feminine and light one, which wouldn't do much work. We checked every room, every bed, closet, bathroom. The last thing we checked was the nursery closet and I swear to God, I thought someone was going to jump out, but there was nothing. Nobody was in there, unless they somehow managed to escape unnoticed in the 30 seconds it took us to run inside. We slept on the couches that night. Again, my brother and I were home alone. I'm not religious, but I like Catholic imagery, so I have a lot of prayer candles. It's pretty common for my Jesus and Santo Nino de Atocho ones to inexplicably fall off my desk. I've only been in the room when it happened once. I was doing my makeup and right behind me in the mirror, both just slid off and hit the ground. They're sturdy enough not to break. It's just a weird recurring thing. My mom saw someone walk into my brother's room and from the corner of her eye, I apparently was at work. But she claimed she didn't remember that my brother was at work as well until he called her later to pick him up. We have a weird Harry Potter style closet under the stairs. It's really creepy, painted with a thin coat of streaky gold paint and it has the names and ages of three kids that lived in the house before us painted on the door. They were allegedly a really creepy religious family of like six kids and five adults all crammed in here. Reportedly got in trouble with neighbor parents for playing Ouija, lol. It's happened before, but it's become relatively frequent that the last person will turn off all the lights and walk upstairs, only to see that the light in the closet is on. Last month, my mum woke up to get a glass of water and as she was walking up the stairs, she heard the door creak open 
and the light switch click on. She's not white, so she had the good sense to just keep walking rather than investigate. This happened last year. I started dating a girl and on a date, we decided to go for a walk in this gorgeous cemetery next to my house. As we were walking, I felt a tap on my waist. It sent tingles throughout my body and assuming it was her, I told her to stop because I didn't like it. She had no idea what I was talking about. Moments later, I felt it again on my right hand. We were holding hands, my left in her right. I knew this wasn't her because there's no way she could have reached around my back to tap my right hand with her left. It was then that I got this super strong feeling of being watched. Now, my girlfriend is super scared of spirits because she's extremely susceptible to them too. So I didn't tell her anything, but I could feel cold sweat beading on the back of my neck. I made an excuse and we left. On our way out, I continuously felt the taps until they finally stopped near the entrance to the cemetery. I thought that was over with, but when we got back to my apartment, my girlfriend asked me if I heard humming. I'd been so caught up in my thoughts, I didn't realize that I heard a little girl humming a ring around the rosy. As soon as I tuned in though, it stopped. I told her I thought I heard something, but we just played it off on the fact that my building was super old and the walls were super thin. Until my girlfriend left that night, we both kept getting the feeling we were being watched. I walked her to the train station and the feeling stopped. After her train arrived, I started walking back home and I started getting a slew of weird thoughts. Random children's songs, random words. And then I felt like I was shaving thoughts, but instead of in my own voice, I heard them in a muffled little girl's voice. Worlds like, why don't you play with me? You're so boring. You wasted my day. Stuff like that. I was absolutely terrified when they were coupled with the sensation of something continuously touching my hand or pulling on it as if a little kid was trying to get my attention. I ignored her as best I could, but the craziest thing happened when I crossed an old train track. She started screaming in my head, stop, don't go there. I can't go with you. It's too far from home. I didn't stop. I crossed over and then the voice of the little girl started crying and she yelled out, fine, I'll tell mother on you. Immediately, everything stopped. My mind cleared up. The feeling of being watched stopped. I went back home and fell asleep with no problem. The next day, I was doing some work when I started getting the feeling of being watched again. I was petrified. Not long after, I could feel breathing on my skin. It was a horrific feeling. I didn't know what to do, so I started texting my friend who had a ton of experience with spirits. She told me not to pay attention to it in case it was a demon and not to type anything that it could see for itself. So I called her. I didn't tell her anything about the humming, just that I think I picked up a malicious spirit. Not five minutes into the call, she looks at me and goes, are you having rings around the rosy? It was then I knew I wasn't insane. I even later did a genetic test for schizophrenia, which came back clear. I switched to my phone and typed to her that the little girl was singing, and she sent me some prayers to say and some Wiccan spells if those didn't work. But soon after, the little girl just vanished again after another hissy fit that I wasn't playing with her. She was furious and screamed at me that she was going to get her mother. That night, I had a very vivid dream about the little girl. She lived in the late 1800s to early 1900s. I saw her as a child being abused by her mother for not being pretty enough or smart enough. I saw her go to a school for mentally challenged kids, but they were all strapped into what seemed like torture devices. Then I saw her being lobotomized and finally murdered by her mother. At the very end, she told me her name, Charlotte. She was eight. The next morning, I went back to the cemetery, determined to see if I could find her tombstone. Sure enough, where I first started feeling the touches on my date, there was the tombstone that said, in loving memory of our special daughter, C. 
and the rest of the name was weathered by age. The date had said 1882 to 1890, exactly eight years. I was freaked out and went home immediately. No more appearances that day. That night, however, I was yanked from my bed. I looked around but couldn't see anything, but I had an overwhelming feeling of pure evil and dread. I saw images flashing before my eyes of Charlotte's mom whipping her and abusing her for not being normal and not being a lady. I felt an icy cold grip on my neck and my throat felt like it was being crushed. After a momentary paralysis, I turned on the lights, pulled out my phone and started reciting the prayers my friend sent me. I heard screaming in my head but that felt deafening, as if she was in pain. But eventually, it all disappeared. I never heard from Charlotte or her mom again. Two months later, however, my landlord was fixing a pipe in the kitchen. We would often talk about stuff when he was doing maintenance. So I asked him about the property across the street that they owned but was completely abandoned. He said it used to be a school for mentally deranged children basically psychopaths, and that they were found in the basement was full of torture devices and gurneys. They would strap children in to give them lobotomies. He even showed me pictures of these things. The house was abandoned because museums wouldn't take the items, and the city wouldn't help them get rid of them claiming that they were protected under some bullshit monument or artifact law. A little more research done by myself and I found out the buildings around me used to be mini farms with tons of slaves belonging to the upper echelons of society and that my apartment was a brothel and then a hotel and then a mansion to some wealthy man and his wife who had a daughter before being turned into apartments. Oh, and the streetcar tracks that Charlotte wouldn't cross? That building used to be a church and that ground was holy. I never felt more validated that I wasn't insane in my life. Just to clear this up now, there's a likelihood of this being something my own mind has conjured up and circumstances around it possibly just falling into place out of sheer coincidence. I'm sure this is common, however, there are certain aspects that just get me and make me think it's possibly something on top of that. And just to clear up now, never had a history of psychosis or anything of the sort, no mental health problems in the past, maybe fleeting anxiety. Although lucid dreaming is something I've tried to practice a lot. So there's a distinct possibility I've created this from somewhere in my mind. But this felt different to me, very different. Hence why I'm posting it. This event happened about three months ago. I went to sleep as normal, and when I say normal, I meant by browsing Reddit for hours before I actually sleep until about 3 a.m., which yeah, is normal for me. Oh, and just in case this becomes relevant, I'm a 25-year-old female. I remember drifting into sleep while still on my phone, and that's how I knew I'm like, okay, time to put my phone on charge and probably fall asleep. I'm not sure how long into my sleep this happened, but it started by my name being called, repeatedly. I'm not sure how long for, but at one point it got my attention, and I was distinctly aware that I'm not awake, but conscious, and speaking to someone that isn't me. For the purposes of this post, I'm going to refer to this future self as they slash them. They asked me if I'm aware. I tried to say yes, no sound came out, on either side. There were no words, it's just like thinking and the awareness is there. Instantly understanding images, but no words. They told me that I'm speaking to myself and that the year for them is 2077 and that they've been in an accident, caused serious brain damage and organ damage and have been put into a coma. They told me I'm basically not alive but machines are keeping the brain active and that they signed up to a scheme a few years prior, an experiment that people are encouraged to undertake and sign up to, should they ever be in a state where death is imminent, to carry out an experiment. 
You get paid for it. Special insurance for the best health care. And all you do is agree to it should you ever be on the brink of death, but the brain is intact. And you give them DNA samples monthly. They did explain that they don't know why they were setting it up, because they said they had serious brain damage. Regardless, they seemed aware of everything that was happening outside of the coma. I remember sensations of panic and them trying to calm me down. I remember trying to ask so many questions about if this is real and what happens, and for them to prove it to me. No words still, just feelings and images. It felt like they were inside my brain or I was inside theirs. It felt both foreign and familiar. Regardless, they told me a couple of things that were going on in my family at the time. I said I wanted proof of something that was incoming, something that when it happens, I can be sure this is real. I asked for lottery numbers. I felt amusement at this, probably theirs, like they tried to laugh. They told me they knew I was going to say that because they would. But they said that although they wouldn't remember them anyway, they would give me football scores and election results, but that they can't do that because I'm a gambler. I would bet on it and I might win a lot. This is where my emotions just went mental. I felt myself trying to cry. I felt dread, passion. They told me that they wouldn't do anything that could change the way my life goes. That might change the people we meet. They said that if this worked, they promised themselves they would never ever jeopardize our children being born. In that moment, I got it. There was a moment of understanding and I felt like I was actually speaking to myself. They got serious after this and said they had to pass on information. You're going to remember as much as you can and you're going to wake up. So you remember and write it down. I agreed to this. They told me that in the coming years, there's going to be research funded for the study of the possibility of transmitting information through brain cells, not just through space, but time as well. DNA based quantum entranglement. They added something else in there. I've tried so hard, it hasn't come to me, I'm so sorry. And they told me that when this is made public, be aware of it. Keep looking for the first story that pops up on it. And that I need to reach out to the lead researcher and give them some specific bits of information. I wrote as much of this down as I could remember upon waking up. I know for a fact I missed some, but got enough, I think. I won't post this because it contains personal details of an individual whom I do not know. And I was told to wait until this is made public. I remember scrambling inside my head to recount everything they told me. Basically, personal details of a person that had clearly been shared with myself, but someone's son. I'm assuming he's going to be the lead researcher when it comes, but it does contain specific instructions. They told me it's fragile, so don't even tell my brother. They know that's the one person I would go to about the instructions because they have to be handled in order. They told me to just keep going how I am. Everything works out. And then I got that feeling you get when you're trying to fall asleep and you feel like you're falling and then wake up just as you're about to hit the ground. And I was awake. I wrote down as much as I could and I didn't sleep any more that night. When I did finally sleep though, I woke up feeling pretty invigorated that my life's going to end up as something I'm happy with and not want to change. Even the opportunity of winning a shed load of money isn't tempting anymore. I'd love to hear anyone's thoughts and if anyone knows anything about the research possibly, if this even exists yet, please let me know. Like I said, there's a good chance this was momentary psychosis or the most intricate dream I've ever had, but there's a part of me that just knows. I was eight years old when we first moved into the house on the edge of the forest. My parents had their doubts about buying a house with a backyard bordered by forest. They had concerns about wild animals getting into our bins or hunting our dogs. And were worried one of us might go too far into the trees and get lost. But it was cheap. My dad liked the seclusion. My mom loved the house itself. And my siblings and I were excited about playing in the backyard and exploring the forest. Our first sign something wasn't right 
was that our dogs were absolutely terrified of the forest. They never went into the forest for any reason. If a toy they'd been playing with found its way past the tree line, they'd refuse to retrieve it. And when one of us went in, they would pace anxiously until we returned. On occasion, we'd notice the dogs staring at a spot in the forest in obvious distress, sometimes growling or barking, but we could never see anything there. My brother once carried one of the dogs into the trees to show her there was nothing scary about it, but she wriggled out of his grip and sprinted into the house in a panic. If we were in the backyard when it was getting dark, we sometimes heard noise like someone was walking through the forest, sticks crunching underfoot, branches being pushed aside. If we called out, there was no response. But if we shined a flashlight around, we would occasionally catch a glimpse for just a split second of something that we could swear looked like a person walking around in the dark. My parents quickly banned us from entering the forest at all after dark. And even during the day, we weren't allowed to go out of sight of the house. My sister's bedroom window looked out at the backyard and the forest beyond. And she remembers looking out her window one night and seeing a shadowy figure standing right at the edge of the backyard. She says there was something wrong with it, like it wasn't quite standing on the ground. And it was a little too tall to be a person. And it was sort of distorted. And she was convinced it was staring at her. She called for our dad saying there was a man in the yard staring through a window. And when he ran outside to chase off whoever it was, she continued to watch the figure. It didn't move away, but when the lights from our dad's flashlight passed over it, it suddenly just wasn't there anymore. We regularly heard knocking at the back door at night with no one there. Our parents thought it was teenagers playing pranks and stopped bothering even opening the door. Until one rainy night when the knocking was persistent and agitated. My mom pointed out there might be someone needing shelter from the heavy rain outside. But when she opened the door, not only was there no one there, but there were no wet footprints on the porch. The knocking continued the whole time we lived there. It would happen several times in the span of a few weeks, then stop for months and then start up again. My parents eventually installed a security camera and there was never anyone at the door. The camera wasn't all useless though. About three years into living there, my brother started having night terrors and sleepwalking. When he went sleepwalking, he would always go out to the back door and start walking towards the forest. My mom, being a light sleeper, would hear the door open and would run out to get him before he made it into the forest. After the third or fourth time it happened, my brother asked to see the camera footage because he wanted to see how he looked when sleepwalking. I guess thinking it'd look funny. The footage showed him walking out onto the porch, then pausing as if listening to something and shaking his head, then reluctantly walking forward as if being pulled or forcefully guided by something. One evening, my dad was in the backyard and he heard my sister calling him from the forest, seemingly in distress. Thinking she'd gone exploring in the forest and fallen over and hurt herself, he ran in and started calling to her, but quickly realized it was too dark to see her and he couldn't pinpoint where her voice was coming from. He told her to wait where she was while he grabbed a flashlight. When he ran back into the house for the flashlight, he saw my sister inside, safe and completely unconcerned. At the time, my dad hadn't told us about hearing my sister's voice in the forest. So when I heard my mom's voice coming from the forest months later, while I was outside with the dogs one evening, I didn't question it despite the fact I'd seen my mom inside recently and hadn't noticed her walk past me. My mom was calling for me, saying she'd gotten her sweater caught in some branches and needed me to come in and help her. As I walked in, the dog started barking, alerting my dad, who saw me through the window wandering into the forest. He came outside and called to me, and I said I was just helping mom. He yelled back that mom was inside and I needed to run back to the house as fast as I could, which I did. After this, my parents had a fence built around the backyard and started looking for a new place. In the time between the fence being built and us moving out, it got way worse. We'd hear knocking at the door more regularly as well as tapping on the windows, as if someone was walking the perimeter of the house and trying every window. We would often hear scratching and scraping sounds on the fence and voices beyond it. My brother's night terrors got more frequent and one night, 
My mom didn't hear the door open when he went sleepwalking, and he woke up standing at the fence, staring into the forest, with the dogs barking at him. The last morning we spent there, less than four years after we moved in, we woke up to find the back door fully open, and the security camera footage showed it slowly swing open on its own. Since moving out, my brother's sleepwalking has stopped, though he still gets night terrors and he suffers from pretty severe anxiety. A few nights ago, he called me out of the blue, and after a bit of small talk, he asked me if I think the door being opened that final night means whatever was out there finally got in. He was trying to make light of it, saying he was getting into the spirit of Halloween, joking about how maybe we should all get exercise just in case something latched onto us all those years ago. But I think he's deeply bothered by everything that happened. I know I still am a little. I get nervous around dark wooded areas. I don't know what I think was out there, in the forest beyond our house at night, but I get the feeling that given the chance, it would have swallowed us whole. I was a sophomore in high school when this happened. I haven't gone back. It's midsummer in New England and my best friend, let's call him Anthony, and I are hanging out. I live on conservation land, so aside from the houses at the very front, there are no other developments and woodland that spans for acres and acres. The state put down some paths, so I suggested that we go exploring. We geared up, I brought my pocket knife, sprayed down in bug spray, and headed out my backyard. We hadn't explored too much, but I knew the area somewhat well, so we decided to hell with the trials. We're going to be real men and forge our own path. We enter the woods, thickly forested with pine, maple and oak trees, and make notches in the trees on the way, so we can find our way back. It's around noon, so I'm not too worried about it getting dark. After all, the sun sets around 8pm in the summer, but just in case. We walk deeper and deeper into the woods. About 15 minutes and the forest is alive. Bugs, frogs, birds, everything in this forest is loud. Slightly irritating, truthfully, but it's nice to take in the sights and sounds. Soon, we stumble upon a peculiar scene. A perfect circle, probably 20 feet in diameter, that spans from the ground all the way to the sky. I'm perplexed, but Anthony is curious, so we decide to go in. The first thing I noticed is that the overgrown weeds and grass that surround us stop at the perimeters. All vegetation past the line is dead. Not bare, but dead, crunching under our feet. I don't just mean the grass either, but the tree limbs that extend in are also bare. Leaves down the branch until it crosses the line. Being the middle of summer, nothing should be dead and I've never seen a branch behave like that. I'm feeling extremely uneasy. I turn to Anthony and ask him if he feels uneasy. He says he feels like we're being watched. I agree. It's then we notice the strangest scene. The entire forest has gone silent. Not in rest, but in what feels like suspense. I'm feeling very uneasy now, and I know that we need to leave. We run out of there following our tree marks, and when we get back to my house, the forest is alive. Ever since then, every summer, every winter, a snarl of branches, sometimes leafed, sometimes not, reveals our path through the forest. I swear that whatever was watching us from that circle peers through and wants us to come back. I'm a Catholic and I go through phases of devotion, but my faith is strong and I try to do good. I understand this leads me towards some explanations over others, but I'm truly at a loss for words with this one. It was early May of this year, 2021, and for Easter, my grandfather sent me a nice care package. I was a sophomore at a secular college at the time, and it was a sweet surprise. In the box was a bunch of assorted candies, a stand-up crucifix, and a small metal case adorned with an image of the Pope, and marked on the pack with the papal symbol and the Greek letters Alpha and Omega. I opened the clasp, and sitting on a thin lining of felt was a beautiful metal rosary. On each bead was a rosette. 
Every marker for each decade, a set of 10 beads. A different sate and a location associated with the Vatican. I took it out of its case and rested it on my desk. Underneath was a small pendant, probably half an inch in size, and on it, Pope Francis with St. John's Palace on the back. Overall, it was just stunning. I noticed a note from my grandfather, and he wrote that the rosary was from his trip to Italy two years prior. It was made of silver, blessed by Pope Francis, and he noted he wants me to have it, because I'm his special one. For those who don't know, May is the month of the rosary. In honour of Jesus and Mary, I resolved to do at least a decade of my rosary every day. I would go to my desk, take the case off the top shelf, and walk about seven feet to my bed. I'd open the case, take the rosary out carefully, close the case, do my prayers, and then put it back in the case and on the shelf. I did this consistently for a week, and it became a time for reflection and general peace in the presence of God. One day, I went to do my routine and grabbed the case and brought it to my bed. I opened it, and the small pendant fell out when I took the rosary out. I heard it clink off my bedpost and hit the ground. I got on my hands and knees to look for it, moving boxes and my bedside table trying to find it. I couldn't. I did what any Catholic does when something gets lost, and I did a prayer of St. Anthony. I was a little confused, but it wasn't the rosary itself, and I wasn't going to tear up my room looking for it since I was moving out in a month. Now six days had passed, and I did my rosary every day, putting it into the case and back on the shelf. The pendant was still nowhere to be seen. I was feeling sluggish, so I decided to nap before doing my routine. I had a great dream, don't remember what, but woke up to my room being saturated with the smell of roses. Living on the third floor on a campus that doesn't believe in flowers, I was very confused. It was, however, time to do my rosary. I walked over to the top shelf, grabbed the case and walked to my bed. I opened the case and pulled my rosary out. I felt my heart drop as underneath it was the pendant I lost a week ago. I felt it and it was warm, a contrast with the cold rosary in my hand. I knew it wasn't there before either, and I checked the paper thin lining to make sure it hadn't fallen underneath. I thanked God, but to this day, I'm perplexed by this experience, and I still can't explain it. When I was young, I had a plethora of problems at night when it came to sleeping. I'd sleepwalk, sleep talk, scream in my sleep, have full conversations I wouldn't recall with my eyes open with family members, night terrors, I'd see figures in the dark, and frequently wake up mid-conversation in my empty bedroom, swearing that someone was beside me. Typically when this happened, it would seem like I was answering a question, and I'd be very confused when I realised nobody was with me. I also had these strange dreams where everything would be black, and it was just me and this same girl I didn't know, and it would seem like we were communicating telepathically. They had strong emotions in them, and although there were big gaps in between them, I would think about them for very long bursts. I'd refer to her as the lake house girl, and she seemed pretty sad. The dreams with her, although infrequent, have continued into adulthood. The last happened six years ago, with her continuously telling me to look in the basement. I turn 28 next week. These things all occurred for me from the age of four to five, to the age of 12 to 13. I also wet the bed during this time, and a good majority of the time I recall being awake when it would happen, but just being too terrified to make the movement to go to the bathroom. My sister had all of the same issues that I did. She's eight years older than me although her bedwetting lasted until she hit the age of 16. I've been told by my mom that I had some of these issues prior to my remembering them, but obviously, although I have a few memories from a very young age, I don't recall them. The main thing that's always stuck with me about this time period was me seeing things in the hallway. 
It would happen almost nightly for a really long stretch of time. And it lasted for at least a few years, then got less frequent. At the time I was six, and my mom was going through chemotherapy, and my home life was fairly traumatic. My bedroom was at the end of the hall to the left, and I had a bunk bed that I'd sleep on the top bunk on. It faced the hallway, and the first night I'd started seeing things. I requested a nightlight because I'd gone the whole night without falling asleep. It would always start with a sinking feeling, and my attention would go straight to my door that led out into the hallway. I'd sense something there, and then I'd begin seeing shadowy figures slowly creeping towards my doorway. Some seemed like they had hoods over their heads and others not. I don't recall ever making out facial features. They'd get to the doorway and then just deteriorate, but there would always be a steady line of them and they would just keep coming. I'd brought it up to my parents a few times and between that and the sleepwalking and screaming, my mom took me to the doctor and they just told her I had night terrors and sent us on our way. When I'd bring it more, my parents would just get angry. So I kept quiet about it and only talked about it occasionally with my sister. One night it got particularly bad and the figures were making it through the doorway and I started screaming uncontrollably and my dad got mad and came in and unplugged my nightlight and locked me inside my room. I sat there terrified for a while and a shadow appeared on my wall but didn't move. Then I got the sinking feeling a hundred times worse than I'd ever had it before and it felt as though my room fell away from the house altogether along with the world as I knew it at that. I started seeing these little imp-like creatures all around my room in the darkness, along with something hanging outside of my window. I have little splotches of memories of this night that I still recall, but I've blacked out large portions of it, probably due to how bad it messed me up for a long time. I met a girl some years ago and had some similar experiences, and it sparked my interest in adulthood, and so far fairy folklore, little people slash little brother stories, and some cases of alien abductions and sleep paralysis have had some eerily similar details and brought back some memories. Anyone else have any experiences similar to this? I think I had sleep paralysis occasionally, but some of the experiences, including the really intense night, didn't seem to be that to me, but I suppose that it wouldn't seem that way. Although I do recall moving the night I got locked in my room. We would also go to a cabin at the Lake of the Ozarks every weekend, starting when I was six. And I'd only see one figure there a few times on its own. But I would occasionally wake up knee deep in the lake, just staring off into the water or towards the end of the cove. I had always thought it was connected to the lake for some reason. And a few years back, my family replaced the electrical there and they found a very old German doll head in the attic with two candles beside it. The attic is so small that you'd pretty much have to be a child to really go up there. Before we got the cabin, my grandfather on my dad's side owned it and he hadn't gone down there in 17 years. So I'm unsure whether it was up there from someone who'd been squatting there or if it had been up there from the family my grandpa bought it from. They were the Willis family and they built the cabin themselves and their family cemetery is a few miles from the cabin that I only got to visit when I was six, but I plan to go back soon. I've always referred to 17 as my lucky number prior to us getting the lake house too. Unsure if that is significant or not, but it feels like it might be. I had a pretty scary experience with my husband. This happened about a year and a half ago. I've always been a huge paranormal fanatic. I would always find places to go explore that were known to be haunted, which means I have a lot of stories, but this one is by far my most scary. In my home state, there's an abandoned asylum on the outskirts of downtown in a pretty sketchy area. The building was originally a mental health facility in the 40s, 
and was eventually made into a drug rehab center. And finally, a boy's home where it would eventually shut down in the 80s. It's a relatively small building, only two stories and maybe eight rooms on each floor and one large room on both floors on the far side of the building, all windows busted out. The building has a history filled with tragedy and has a well-known reputation to be haunted. I've been to the building on a handful of occasions, but had never been on the bottom floor due to flooding. I had never had any experiences there except maybe a feeling of unease. There was a day I had asked my husband if we could go. He was hesitant at first as we had been there a few months before. We usually went every six months just for fun. But he eventually agreed and said he wanted to go at 3am. Me being me, I agreed with him. 2am rolls around and we're at the asylum with our baseball bats. For protection. As I mentioned, in sketchy areas occasionally we'd run into homeless sleeping there. So it's just a precaution. I also had brought a Ouija board and an EMF reader. This time that we visited, the water on the bottom floor had drained out and I was very excited to finally go down there and explore it. We started upstairs and swept the whole building, making sure nobody was there. While sweeping the bottom floor, I didn't have any feelings of unease, but I was a little freaked out to see satanic symbols and dead birds on the floor. At this point, I had figured that the downstairs hadn't been flooded for a few months, as there was a lot of graffiti and the dirt on the floor was dry. We started on the upstairs with candles and the Ouija board, and tried to make contact for nearly an hour. Nothing. Nothing on the EMF, nothing on the board. At this point, my husband and I are just bullshitting around because we weren't expecting anything to happen, just having fun. We moved downstairs and by that time it was about 3am. I was feeling fine at first and we did a few sessions on the Ouija board in different areas of the lower floor. I had asked to stay away from the large back room as the satanic symbols had made me uncomfortable. After the sessions, we walked around with the EMF detector and I noticed it was only spiking in the spots we had the Ouija board sitting. My husband and I were pretty weirded out, but we just kind of blew it off and thought there was maybe an explanation. My husband decided he wanted to go to the back room. I said it was fine as long as he stayed close to me. We made it a little more than halfway when I started to get a gut feeling to not go any further. Every hair on my body was standing on end. I told my husband that we needed to go and I noticed he was on edge as well. I ended up running down the hall back to the outside alone. It was unlike me to go anywhere alone in the dark as I'm terrified of it, but this feeling was too much for me. When my husband and I were both back in the car and I had calmed down, he explained to me that he had felt the most evil feeling or presence he had felt since a previous haunting he had dealt with. We were both pretty freaked out and decided we were done for the night and wanted to go home. About three nights later, I woke up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. When I was coming back from the bathroom, I had a weird feeling, but I wasn't completely awake so I ignored it. When I reached the bedroom and closed the door behind me, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I looked over to the corner of our room and I saw a hunched shadow figure, not much taller than my 5'4". I stared for a second but told myself I was half asleep and went back to bed feeling a little uneasy. About a week later, my husband asked to talk to me. He told me that he had seen something in the bedroom the night I had gotten up to use the bathroom, as I had woken him up getting out of bed. He began describing what he saw, and I was in utter disbelief because we had both seen the exact same thing. When I asked why he didn't say anything that night, he said he thought he was imagining it. Needless to say, we were both scared shitless after that, and I think our fear fed more into the situation. It went to us seeing the figure almost every other night, our ankles being grabbed, and things being moved around and found out of place for the next few weeks. There came a point when I was so fed up that I smudged with two different smudge sticks and very angrily told it to leave us the fuck alone. After that, it just went away, gone, like it never happened. To this day, 
I believe it followed us home from the asylum, as we have never had issues in our house before and always left the Ouija board in the car. I had a strict rule about it coming into the house. Do I think the spirit was the same entity we felt that night? No, but I definitely felt it came from the asylum. I think this was a spirit that just wanted to mess with us, nothing malevolent. To this day, we haven't returned to the asylum. Even thinking about it over a year later, I can still feel the pit in my stomach of when I felt that evil entity that night. In my backyard, my dad has a woodworking shed, the size of a small barn or big shed, about 30 to 50 yards from the house. My dog hates the shed. He cries to get out of it because he hates it so much, so you have to pick him up and put him in it, but close the door really fast. Also, he's a lap dog, very tiny. Also, when you walk into the shed, it's a big rectangle with the long sides perpendicular to the door. There are windows on the left and right side of it, but not on the wall where the door is and the back wall. Plus there's a huge workbench in the centre of the workshop. Okay, so this happened between November 28th and December 4th, 2020. I can't remember the exact day though. One night my sister, we'll call her Susan, went into my dad's workshop at about 8pm. Pitch blackout and far from the house with all of the house lights off because our parents were asleep except us two. She was painting a cooler for her boyfriend at the time, but needed it finished by tomorrow because she was leaving early to return to college. Since it was her last night and I wouldn't be able to see her for two weeks, I decided to go in there but not help. When I got in the shed, I was surprised thinking, wow it's cold, and how the heck did she get dog's name in here? Well about an hour after I had our dog on my lap, we were sitting very close to the back wall with a two three gap between us listening to Mr. Ballin on YouTube. Hindsight 2020, that definitely didn't help. I get this super strong whiff of freshly lit cigarettes, which wasn't too odd. My dad's a smoker, so growing up with him I've learned and know the difference in the smells between old and fresh cigarettes. But I thought I should mention it to Susan because it was really strong. Yo, Susan, I just got a super, super strong smell of freshly lit cigarettes. What the heck? Who cares? Dad smokes in here all the time, what's your point? Okay, chill, I was just saying. Thought I should mention it because it's weird. Not even 15 minutes later, my dog is still sitting on my lap. Sits up and then starts aggressively growling and barking at the windows. Keep in mind that it's pitch blackout and you can't see out the windows because the shed lights reflect off the windows, making them like a mirror. Then my dog hops off my lap and starts to run around the shed, continuing to aggressively bark and growl at all the windows. Susan and I are terrified, because he's never an aggressive dog. Also, if we would tell him to stop barking, he would instantly stop. But as we were yelling at him to shut up, he just wouldn't. Finally, he stopped running around the shed, looks in between us, like in the perfect middle of us, and starts whimper whining defensively but growling too at the wall that has no windows. Susan, what the heck? What the heck? What the heck? Stop it now. I'm not leaving now. I'm too scared. Me, silently crapping myself and visibly scared. No, nothing is going on. Let's just go inside, Susan. I promise nothing is going to happen to us. Before we go inside, we gather all of her painting stuff and cooler. I grab a super long screwdriver, then hype myself up in my head to open the door. 30 seconds before I opened the door, a super cold airflow entered the room, and I knew it was a sign of a ghost, which made me want to get inside now. So now my 20 year old, 21 year old sister makes her 16 year old brother protect her, act like the older sibling and go first. Later found out she thought either her or me. I turned off the lights which caused my bad anxiety to go to the worst anxiety I've ever had built up and getting ready to explode. In the blackest of black darkness with my eyes not adjusted, thinking I'm going to die, I slowly opened the door with it creaking unbelievably loud. I had the screwdriver held like Cod's knife commando grip 
and looking so slowly around the door, with Susan holding on to me, literally shaking, and my dog, who's ready to run to the house. I thought I saw something, so told Susan to book it. We closed the door and ran into the house, turning on all the kitchen lights. We get inside and Susan says, Oh my god, where's the dog? Now I'm afraid that my dog's dead and screamed, Oh crap, probably outside. We called his name, with the door cracked open for about five minutes, but he wouldn't come. So not wanting to, but wanting my dog to be safe, I convinced Susan to come with me to check the shed. She wanted me to go on my own. Unwillingly, she came with me to go look. I was still gripping the screwdriver like a knife because I could feel something out there. We get up to the shed doors and open it. My dog is there with his tail down, not wanting to leave it. He hates it in there and won't leave, meaning whatever was there followed us. I picked him up and ran back into the house. When we got back inside, we realized that all of the lights that we turned on were now off. We couldn't have turned them off because of how scared we were and our parents had fallen asleep. I locked the door and sprinted upstairs. This was from 8 to around 10 or 11 p.m. More things happened that night, but I didn't experience it because it was in my sister's room. I have more experience if you guys want to hear them, let me know. Also, I bleeped the words to make them more friendly. Plus, this is probably obvious, but I'm 17, and my sister is 22 now. When I was a child, there were times when I dreamed. I would find myself walking a narrow path that was surrounded by a thick forest. At one point, I would come across a fence with an open space, which the path ran through. And leaning up against the fence off to one side was this man in a yellow suit and matching coloured fedora hat. Since I first met him, he would always be there at the fence looking at his beautiful golden pocket watch. As I got close to him, he would click the lid of his watch closed and look up at me with a gentle smile. I would run up to him and give him a hug, laughing happily as though meeting up with a lost friend. The last time I saw him in my dreams, he took the time to explain his pocket watch to me. It was an intricate affair, with not only told the hours, it also told the current year and month it was. It was many years later before I saw him again, this time in reality. The magic shop. This happened to me when I was living in Bellevue, Washington. I would often go to the Pike Place Market in Seattle. I knew the market by heart from childhood visits to my dad's best friend, Michael's house off of 85th and Aurora. The market was deceptively huge. Most people just walked the street level of the market where you could buy meats, fruits and vegetables and various handmade crafts. The market actually has three other floors underneath where you would find various bookstores, clothing shops, jewelry shops, a comic book store and even a magic shop. The trick is finding either the staircase or walking down a semi-steep ramp just off to the right of the brass pig on the street level. One day, I decided to travel to the market and find a present for myself as my birthday was the next day. I was greeted by the familiar musky smell of incense wafting from the Tenzing Momo incense shop, off to the left and up a narrow ramp. I walked slowly up to the brass pig turned right and sauntered down the ramp into the maze of businesses below. I walked down the narrow hallway of the second level until eventually it opened into a room with an enormous clock in the corner and a ring of chairs in the centre which faced outwards. From what I read, this part of the market used to be a train station way back in the early 1900s. I walked into the magic shop on the right and began to excitedly browse the narrow aisles in its myriad of items. As I walked over to the glass cabinets, I noticed a group of people standing in the entrance, whispering to each other with their backs to me. I looked over at the owner and asked, what's going on? A lady is ODing out there, he said grimly. Have you called 911, I asked. I am right now, he said, grabbing his phone. Carefully, I pushed my way through the murmuring crowd. Directly across from the store was a blonde woman slumped in a chair. 
Another lady was sitting next to her, holding her hand with tears in her eyes. Suddenly, I saw the spirit of the blonde literally stand up out of herself, look around and scream silently. Then she fell back into herself as I heard a familiar click from across the room. I looked over to my left and to my surprise was the man in the yellow suit and hat. He was holding his golden pocket watch with its matching coloured chain. He jerked his head up and for a moment we locked eyes before he just disappeared. Oh my god, said the woman holding the blonde's hand. She's breathing, she's breathing. Not long after, the paramedics arrived and began to attend to the blonde. I pushed my way back through the crowd and hid myself in one of the aisles, shaken from what I just saw. Once the paramedics and the crowd were gone, I asked a young man who was also in the store if he could walk me out as I was too scared to leave by myself. I was relieved that he said yes. He escorted me until I was a couple blocks away from the metro bus station and we parted ways. The next morning, as I was sitting on the couch, my friend and roommate Sean came out of his bedroom. His eyes were enshrined in dark circles and he trembled as he shuffled over to me. What's wrong, Sean? I asked, leaning forward. With shaky hands, he handed me a yellow folder. This is for you. I looked at the cover and my gut twisted as I read the title, Conversation at the Train Station. I sat in silence as I read the story. When I finished, I looked at Sean. I woke up this morning around 2am and wrote this. I couldn't help it. The whole time that I sat there writing, I felt there was someone standing behind me with their hands on my shoulders. I didn't dare stop until I was done. I was too scared. So am I. Have I ever told you about meeting a man in a yellow suit? He shook his head, tears beginning to well in his eyes. So I told him the childhood story as well as what happened the day before. I explained that the man he described in his story wearing the suit and fedora was the same man. We both burst into tears at that point and hugged each other on the couch. It took us a long time to calm down. Finally, when we both stopped crying, I leaned back and cradled the folder in my arms. Thank you, Sean. I'll treasure this, I said. To this day, I believe that the story was an apology from the man in yellow for scaring me at the market the day before, as much as it was a birthday present from Sean. To this day, I still have it. In my younger days, just after high school, I was what most would consider a vagrant. No home to speak of, but not quite homeless either. Growing up poor in a poor, dying factory town assures few things. But most of the kids in my town knew and understood clearly that the only way to escape such a bleak place was to leave. Find work somewhere else and don't come back, unless you want to be trapped forever. And I was no exception to this understanding. It was the result of this desperate retreat from certain poverty that led me to work as a labourer in the pipeline industry. Grueling work, but decent pay. A fair start for one such as myself. After about three months of working, my foreman, who we'll call Jay, discovered I was staying at a motel and wouldn't have it. He was kind enough to invite me to stay with his family until I found an apartment and I was grateful for his offer. Jay and his family were honest rural people who lived in an honest rural area. A house with a barn and a field surrounded by the wooded hills of Chili Cove. No neighbours and one road in and out. Very similar to houses I had seen and been around growing up. It was a great area and great company and I was thankful for such a turn in my luck. The first evening I stayed there, Jay's wife got me situated in my room and I became acquainted with everyone in the house over dinner. After our meal, I stepped out for a cigarette and decided the tree line behind their barn would be the best area to smoke privately and inoffensively. The sun had set and then some by the time I stepped out of the house. The moon was high and full, keeping the valley I was in dully illuminated and casting the surrounding hills as dark shadows against the star-filled sky. A night that I think most would find peaceful. 
But as soon as my boots met the grass, that primal instinctive warning that a man gets sometimes began to slowly creep into my core. That alarm that tells you something ain't right here. Being young and dumb and brave, of course, I shrugged it off and continued to the tree line, attempting to keep the growing feeling at bay. When I at last approached the shadowed tangle of trees and underbush on the outskirts of their yard, I reached into my pocket, pulled out my pack of Marlboros and my matches and struck it alight. As I brought the match to my cigarette, I saw it. Mere feet away from where I was standing, just barely within the trees, was the stark and outstanding silhouette of something huge. It stood crouched and still had to be at least seven feet tall. Large pointed ears and a narrowly elongated snout. Its eyes glimmered that weird infrared colour you see when animals reflect light in their eyes at night. Oh my god, oh my god there's a wolf, that's a wolf, were my initial panic stricken thoughts. It was in the midst of this processing that I realised there was no way this was a wolf, because wolves don't stand upright, and this creature was unmistakably on two legs. It was slouched low, one arm hung down past its hunches, and the other was pressed firmly against a tree to the right of it. Broad shoulders and savage posture, it didn't move. It didn't seem startled or threatened or afraid, but simply aware. It knew I saw it, and it knew that I knew. I wish I could say I did something, anything. I wish I could say that I ran, or that I screamed, or even moved, but I was frozen in fear. Standing rigid as a statue, and nothing but a quickly dying matchlight between me and whatever monstrous thing was in front of me, we locked gazes for what felt like hours, but what was probably only moments. And as though the creature had decided it was done terrifying me, it straightened up and backed away slowly into the darkness of the trees. No sound, not a broken twig or rustled leaf to be heard. As soon as my legs allowed me, I ran like hell back to the safety of Jay's house, slammed the door behind me and was met with a look of concern from my foreman and his wife, who were watching TV in the living room. There's something out there, it was the only thing I could gasp. Jay exchanged a glance with his wife and looked back towards me. Boy, if you're going to stay here, you need to understand that there's things out in the woods that you best not pay attention to. He said it so nonchalantly, like he was talking about last night's football game. You hear a strange noise and you ignore it. You see a strange shadow, you ignore it. And if you get a strange feeling, you come inside and forget you felt it. There are things out there we just don't understand, but we respect it because it's their land. We just live here. It's been 15 years since my encounter with that creature in the woods, and I still think about it often. And though I stayed with Jay and his family for another three weeks after that night, I never felt easy on his property. That feeling never left. That warning stayed alert. And I will never go out to the woods at night unless I have absolutely no other choice. Once you know what's out there, you never see things the same again. I know this might seem far-fetched, and I know that many won't believe what I'm saying, but this story, I had to share. For context, this haunting, I guess I'll call it, happened from about six to 10 years old or so. I lived in a relatively new home, in a small neighbourhood in Western Massachusetts. I had a loving family, and apart from what I will talk about here, a normal childhood. I'll start by saying I don't remember too much from my early childhood, but these experiences stand vividly in my mind, as if they happened yesterday. It started off when I was about six, with terrifyingly vivid recurring nightmares. Nightmares that seem out of place for a young kid, who was never allowed to be exposed to violence or horror content. One common one included me trying to desperately to jump up on my bed, while a large snake slowly approached me from my hallway. I could feel pure and an unadulterated terror, 
as it keeps closer and eventually struck me, to which I would wake up in a sweat. One of the worst ones is where me and my father would be standing in front of a hallway that branched off to the left and led into my parents' room. Five to ten humanoid-like figures would bound out of the darkness of the hallway and proceed to eat both me and my father alive. I could hear him screaming as they reached him, and when they eventually reached me, I would wake up tingling where the humanoids had first bit down onto me. Keep in mind, I was very young when these dreams began, but they persisted for the next four years. Now, dreams alone are not enough for me to go on Reddit for the first time and pour out my childhood trauma to strangers. I remember I began to feel like I was being watched in my bedroom at night. It seemed like the darkness in my room became oppressive and I would be filled with pure dread and terror. Although I didn't know what, it felt as if something was about to happen, like every molecule in that room had stopped moving at once. This is when I first saw him. My bed was situated where my head was against a wall and the foot of my bed pointed towards a window. To my right was the door leading into my room on the same wall my head was against. Just to the left of that was a door on the adjacent wall leading into a Jack and Jill bathroom I shared with my sister. There was just enough light from the window that I could see the outline of a tall black figure with the outline of a top hat sitting on its head. I don't remember fully what its face looked like, at least 10 years ago, but I do remember seeing some sort of liquid reflecting light where his face would have been. I quickly ripped the covers over my head and sat there frozen with terror, unable to move. This went on for many, many months. Every time that sense of dread filled me, I knew he was there, but wouldn't dare to look for fear that he would attack me. There were a few times that I was so convinced I was not going to make it, I screamed for my parents, and they always came running to find nothing. My dad would always tell me, who's the scariest thing in this house? To which I would lie and tell him it was of course my strong gusto father. He always assured me nothing would happen to me while he was there, but I knew if this thing wanted to do me harm, there was nothing he could do. Up to this point, by about eight years old, the nightmares had become more graphic and appearances more frequent. Always filling up that doorway, just standing, watching. Up to this point, I had never been physically touched or attacked by it. That was until one night when I was bunkered down beneath my sheets and that familiar feeling of dread washed over me. I froze in my bed with the same feeling of anticipation. Only this time, something would finally happen. There was a scraping noise that I could tell came from that bathroom and suddenly my leg was grabbed through the covers. I freaked out, bawling, crying and beelined to my parents room where I stayed for the night. I was never touched again, but he was there most nights until we moved to states when I was 10. Of course, I tried to explain what was happening to me, but it always brushed off and I eventually stopped talking about it as no one believed me and I didn't want to scare my little sister any more than I had already. Fast forward to two years ago when I was 18, sifting through old storage boxes filled with my old school drawings and notebooks my parents had kept. I was flipping through a school notebook filled with grammar practice and such when my heart sank. There in my school notebook was a drawing of the top hat man. I practically shoved it down my parents' throats while shouting, see I told you it's the fucking top hat man. My parents went pale and profusely apologized for not believing me. They even went as far as to ask me if I needed counselling. In reality, I was relieved that I had some proof, and today I absolutely love horror as a genre. I guess maybe because it gives me a feeling of control I never had as a kid. If anyone has any questions or insights to offer me, be more than welcome. If you had a similar experience, please tell me about it. I'm going to try and attach the pictures I took of my elementary school notebooks. But like I said, it's my first time posting here and I'm still not entirely sure if I'm doing this right.
Every year, when we get the first solid snowfall, I head out to the trees beside my in-laws' house to get my pine boughs for my Christmas wreaths. To give some context, my in-laws live in a rural area on a hundred acres. When you go up the driveway and kennels are on the right, there's a barn straight ahead and to the left is the house. The house has fields right beside it and they extend back behind the barn. There's a huge bush, 20 to 30 acres of trees at the back of the field. If you walk past the house to the left, you can walk along the edge of the field. The field drifts to the right and to your left it is a small patch of dense trees and a pretty steep embankment down to the road level. I packed up my dogs Kaiju, Echo and Kivli, three Alaskan Malamutes. You guys thought they were instrumental in my making home safely from the last time I was out in the forest, so I bring them with me every time I go out into the forest now. Kaiju is a big guy weighing about 120 pounds, not a chunky guy. This is just a solid dog. Echo has grown up a bit since our last outing and is almost as big as Kivli now. I get everyone out of the car and since this is a family property, they know very well and they all have fantastic recall. We go off leash. I brought an offering of tobacco, as suggested by my dear friend who gave me some incredible insight from an indigenous Canadian perspective. I made my offering in a safe place where my dogs wouldn't find it and where other animals couldn't get to it, and listened as I was instructed. I didn't have any feelings of immediate fear or anxiety, so I thanked the forest spirits, again as instructed, and we made our way down to the pine trees. I cut my bows from the bottom of the trees and made sure to only take what I needed. I tried to take the branches that are blocking out the smaller trees growing under or near them. I was putting my cuttings into a bag and I felt like something was off. Keiju, who normally does his usual perimeter to pee on every tree in sight, was sitting no more than five feet from me, facing the tree line on the embankment, totally still. So still that snow was collecting on his fur and was totally undisturbed. This made me take an inventory of my dogs. Echo, who bless her heart, is a total spaz when she's off leash. She has to be running absolutely everywhere, it's like she's afraid she won't get to see everything unless she runs everywhere as fast as she can. She was also sitting completely still, directly beside me, staring towards the embankment. Kivli was the furthest away, maybe 10 to 12 feet, standing, head low, ears up, tail straight down behind her. I immediately thought it must be a deer. There's a heavily used, well-worn game trail down here, and these guys love to watch the deer. I still have a nagging feeling something isn't quite right, so I pack up a little faster. Then I hear it. Kaiju is growling. Kaiju never growls. He's a giant teddy bear. The scariest noise he makes is a Chewbacca sound and that's just adorable. But now, he's definitely growling. Kivli is circled back, head still low. If you need a visual, think stalking wolf. And she's grumbling too. Echo is now standing up, hackles up, baring her teeth. Message received, kids. We're out of here. I grab my bag, check my exit options, and start walking briskly towards the closest trail up the embankment. Keiju's up front, Kiv and Echo on either side. And I realised, the trees are silent. No birds, no wind, no nothing. It's like we're in a sound vacuum. Kaiju is now stopped dead and is staring straight down. There's a skull. Not sure what it is. Could be a deer. Could be a calf. Honestly not sure what it could be. I have photos to help hopefully identify what it was I was looking at. In a link below. In a small, shallow, for lack of a better description, grave. No other bones. Just the skull. A very clean skull. Kaiju's growling again and he's got his teeth out this time. I noticed up the embankment, there was what looked like a makeshift shelter. This shelter was directly overlooking the hole with the skull in it. All of my dogs are losing it now. They're full on howling now, which is being answered by the other three dogs up at the kennel. It was eerie. It was like they were trying to call for reinforcements. I got an overwhelming urge to be still like something was trying to wrap me in a blanket to hide me. 
All I could get out was the word Nacht, night in German, which is what I usually use to tell my dogs to watch me. They all stopped howling, but hackles stayed up and low growls kept going. As soon as the blanket feeling was gone, we ran. I've been to that cluster of trees a hundred times. I've never found bones of anything down there. I've never felt like I'm being watched, and I've never been scared to be there. We regularly plant new seedlings down there and clear out the grapevine from the older trees so they don't get choked out. We put out peanut butter pine cones with bird seed for the birds in the winter and keep the hunters out of that area so the animals have a safe place to rest. So my friend had moved into a shared house in the old side of Roseville, California. He invited me over about a week after moving there. He lived with a couple of girls who were in a relationship and also moved his newish girlfriend in with them. The girls occupied one end of the house near the backyard and my friend and his lady were in the bedroom next to the front yard. There was another bedroom in the middle of the house that connected to my friend's room via a conjoined bathroom. This was the only bathroom in the house. So the first night, my friend invites me over to hang out. I'm at work, closing manager at Taco Bell. And I tell him it'll be a couple of hours before I can come over. And he says that's fine. They just made some edibles and there were plenty to spare. So come on over and chill. A couple hours later, I get off and head over to his house. Upon knocking on the door, the two roommate girls answered. They told me that my friend and his girlfriend had eaten some edibles right after making them and promptly passed out after inviting me over. Not that surprising when it comes to my friends. They invited me in anyway, since I had made the drive out and also brought some weed with me. We played All-Star Battle Royale on PS4 until about 2am. When they were turning into bed, they directed me towards the guest bedroom. So the layout of the guest bedroom is as follows. It's right off of the living room and it's conjoined by the bathroom to my friend that I came to visit's bedroom where he and his girlfriend were sleeping. There was also a pulled down attic door on the ceiling near a standard sliding door mirror closet. When I had the first entered the room, I jokingly said to one of the girls that the attic was creepy as hell and I had to open the door once myself to know what kind of noise it made so I'd know when to nope the hell out if I heard it while sleeping. So about 15 minutes later, I'm ready to sleep and I'm plugging my phone into the wall socket and setting an alarm. As I'm slightly bent over messing with my phone, I hear the telltale creaking noise of the attic door opening. I spun around and looked up, and sure enough, it was open a few inches, but there was nothing but darkness to be seen in the gap. It honestly scared me quite a bit, but the bed was much more comfortable than the couch we had been hanging out on earlier. So I was determined to sleep in the room, ghosts be damned. I mustered up the courage to close the attic door, with some effort mind you, and lay down to go to bed. A little while later, as I was drifting off to sleep, I heard the noise of what sounded like my friend waking up, stretching, yawning, and walking through the living room, I laughed to myself a little bit, thinking that he probably had extreme dry mouth and was heading for some water. Then, I was suddenly struck by a feeling of dread. I didn't hear any footsteps as the voice crossed the living room. Immediately upon realising this, the light switch on the wall by the door near the living room flips on hard, like someone slapped it up with force. My eyes were already closed when this happened and I'm somewhat ashamed to say I shut them even harder when I heard the light switch. I laid there for a long time, artificial light searing through my eyelids and eerie silence hanging in the air. Eventually I fell asleep from sheer exhaustion, though I don't know how long it took or what time it was. The next morning, I was the last person in the house to wake up. Everybody was up and in the common areas of the house, making breakfast and talking. The door from the guest room to the living room was open, and the light was off. Most strangely though, my socks were neatly folded and tucked behind a mirror leaning against the wall. Tucked as in pinned where the mirror was leaning against the wall. 
even though I had kicked them off while laying in bed. I walked out to where everybody was conversing and, after saying hi to my friend and making fun of him for passing out, decided I would talk to them about what happened the night before. I started off lightly with the questions, not wanting to be crazy friend who doesn't get invited back to hang out. So the conversation went as such. Hey guys, good morning. So, did anyone go into the bathroom last night through the room I was sleeping in? Various responses of nope, nah, we slept through the night. Okay, so nobody would have turned my light on then. Again, nope, didn't touch it, etc. And was it on this morning when you guys woke up and came out? Again, no, it was off when we woke up and nobody said they turned it off. Okay, final weirdest question I said, half laughing. Did anyone pick up my socks and tuck them behind the mirror? At this point, they all stopped what they were doing and were just staring at me. I thought my sanity was being seriously questioned when finally one of the girls said something along the lines of, wow, so the house is already messing with you? I stayed over at the house four to five days a week for the next few months because of my curiosity about the haunting and the property itself. There are a lot more occurrences I can write about if you guys are interested that ramp up in intensity as time goes on. Just let me know. It started about 18 years ago. I was a teenager and lived in the outback of Queensland, Australia, about 380 kilometers of driving to the closest coastline. I was a pretty normal kid, not into anything paranormal or supernatural. I liked video games, obviously still do, girls and wrestling. So once a week, my mother and I would take a 40 minute walk to my grandparents' house to watch WWE with them. We had always done this and it was kind of the highlight of my weeknights back then. By the time we left my grandparents, it was usually close to midnight. This particular night was in early spring, so I remember the temperature being really nice, not hot yet, and a slight sweetness to the air. The moon was almost full, so the area was very well illuminated. My mother and I often took a shortcut following an old train line. It went close to the tree line, but there was a chain link fence that would separate the tree line from the cracks and a few street lights that peppered the track area. As we're walking down the tracks, my mother walking behind me, I see what looks like a litter of dead kittens that were not there when we made our way to my grandparents' house. Feral cats were pretty normal in my time, so while sad, I didn't think much of it. As I'm about to pass by the kittens, my mother lets out a weird sound. So I stopped to look back at her. She's frozen and looking at the kittens. I look down and they're gone. I instantly get a prickly feeling running down my neck and the light closest to us flickers out. I freak out and grab my mother's arm to run when I see something really big jump on the side of the chain link fence. It's whitish gray in the moonlight and moved fast into the tree line. I couldn't tell if it had fur or not. We hear this shrill growl, cry, and I start running as fast as my legs would take me, my mother right beside me, yelling that I'd better not leave her. I hear the fence again, glimpse back and see nothing. But we're close to our street at this point and I dare not stop running. Ahead of us, the chain link fence is about to run out. As we leave the tracks, giving way to the tree line once more. I'm so scared at this point. I swear I hear something running in the trees, but I couldn't bring myself to look. We hear that growl or cry once more and burst onto the road, all the way to our house and inside. Locking the door, like that would actually do anything if it wanted us. My mother is crying and I can't find my voice or collect my thoughts. Needless to say, I didn't sleep. I sat in my room, looking toward the tree line across the street. I wasn't expecting to see something, but a part of me couldn't help but watch. I never saw it again. We moved away a few years later. I'm now in my 30s and have my own family and kids. Still in Australia, but a lot further south. 
We've had a lot of rain this spring, and it keeps setting off the safety switch in our electricity box for some reason. Two nights ago, at 1.13am, I noticed the kitchen had no power. I gather my shoes and light to go out to the box and fix it. It's pouring down rain, and there's a big tree that I have to get through to get to the box. I do just fine, pry open the box and fix what needs fixing. As I close the box, I get this prickly feeling down my neck, and I feel like I'm being watched. Out of nowhere, I hear a shrill growl. I froze, the memory flooding back into my head. My hands start shaking, but I make sure the box is closed properly and head back towards the tree. I try to duck under its branches and it catches the collar of my shirt, yanking me back unexpectedly. I nearly yell out but force my shirt free. I get up and go inside, shaking, soaking wet and slightly annoyed. I go to my room where my wife is with our baby. The tree is on the other side of our window. As I enter the room, my wife asks what grabbed me and did it make that weird sound? I looked surprised thinking the sound was just my head playing tricks on me. I reply, the tree caught me. She shakes her head. No, it didn't. I saw something grab you and you fell. I laugh a little nervously and remove my wet clothing, reassuring her there's nothing there. She doesn't look convinced and closes the curtains. I change and gather my wet things for the wash. As I'm putting them in the laundry, I notice the rip on my shirt collar. Three rips all near my collar, but so cleanly ripped, you think it was cut. I threw away the shirt. I didn't want my wife to see and be freaked out even more. I don't know if the second thing has anything to do with the first. I still don't even know what the first thing was, or how I'd begin to find out. I'm just a nerdy dad. It was a September day, around 7pm or 8. I was 20 years old. It was a pretty average day. Keep in mind, no one but me and my dog were home all day. I lived in a townhouse with my mom and two siblings and her boyfriend and my dog. The day I was chilling in my room was the basement and I was just laying in bed watching YouTube, waiting for a move to come up with a friend, just relaxing. And I remember I started to get sleepy from just being bored and idle. So I started to doze off with the TV still on and shit. The thing is, I was home alone that day. My dog was the only one with me. But he was upstairs, posted up by the window like usual. Right, so eventually I doze off. And I start basically seeing myself sleeping in my room. Like I'm in third person COD caster mode in COD. And I remember trying to move and like wake up because it felt so real. I thought I was still awake, but in the dream or whatever I was in, it's like every time I tried to get up or move, my body would just slump over or go limp. And I would try my hardest to move just an inch, even a finger, but I couldn't. Every time I would try, I would be stuck in that position, slumped over limp on my bed in weird positions. So in that state, I remember when I was laying there stuck. I recall out of nowhere hearing my sister at my door, which is close to my bed since my room isn't too big. I hear her call out my name and she's asking for me to open the door because it's her. I still can't move. Then I hear my brother along with her voice say the same thing. Next thing I know, I hear my mom's voice pleading to open the door for them to hurry up and open it. And the thing is, the whole time I thought it was real because it sounds just like them. It terrified me. There was something about it felt off-putting and not genuine. As I'm stuck there trying to process what the fuck is going on, I notice that I can still hear my phone going off by my pillow, getting text notifications, and I also can still faintly see the LED colored lights I have on my TV still on and changing colours as well as hearing the background YouTube video playing. But when I start to realise that the door knocking got harder, to the point I thought the door wasn't going to hold up, then in one sudden second, it stops. And within the state I'm currently in, I close my eyes, and once I did, 
I started seeing memories I lived through with my family and siblings when we were younger, and I started to cry. I noticed memories I either forgot about or that had never happened start being played out too. I started feeling drowsy in the dream or whatever it is, and my vision just goes black. It felt like forever, but then when I open my eyes again, I see that I'm no longer in a place I recognize at all. It was like a very woodland area with a grassy opening area in the middle, surrounded by more dead wintry and trees around. I then see my dog, a small white Pomeranian poodle, running towards me, and I bent down as to pick him up, and notice as he's getting closer, it's not my dog, but morphs into some small, about three feet tall, I'd say, creepy, dark, black alien-like creature. It looked like a raisin, honestly, like that's how its skin looked, and very moist looking. Once I notice it's not my dog, it's too late, because it latches onto my right wrist, and starts, like, taking me over. But while that's happening, I get the urge to fight back, to not let this go on, because I want to leave. I was terrified. It then overpowers me, and is on, like, my chest on top of me, while I'm on the floor laying on my back. It's still latched onto my wrist, by the way, but I remember I start choking it out by the neck, and turn it over now. It's on its back to the floor like I was. I ended up overpowering it, and once I do, using all my strength, I wake up. First thing I notice is a very sharp pain in my wrist where it was latched to. It's tender as well. My whole body was shaking and had goosebumps, but I look at my phone and see that it's only been like 10 minutes in real life, but it felt like eternity. I then go upstairs shook and scared. I find my dog just laying by the door to the basement. He jumps and is ecstatic to see me like he was scared too. I immediately take him with me and go outside. I also call my siblings to just make sure they're all good and they're all fine. Everything felt surreal at one point. I didn't know if it was a dream or not. I honestly thought I was like schizophrenic at one point because of when I kept hearing my family members' voices. I told my friend about it and he thought I just had sleep paralysis but I've never had that in my life ever. This stuck with me till now. I don't know. Feel free to let me know what you guys think about this. After spending a few years living abroad with my father, I returned to my native country. I was ready to start my adult life. From zero. From my mother's guest room. I was then in my early 20s. She had recently moved into a new apartment. The building was newly built on the edge of the city. It was nice. High ceilings, large rooms, quiet neighbourhood, though on the edge of the bad side of town. Rumour is that the area used to be known for prostitution, drugs and the occasional dead body. Until this new building came around. Given my experiences and boredom, mostly boredom, I decided to try to see if I could connect with anyone. Stupid me. I drew up a flimsy Ouija board on paper and used my own gold ring as a pointer. Didn't look worthy of making contact with the bottom of a garbage can. It's a Ouija. It doesn't have to look special. If it's meant to make contact and something's there, there's a chance you just might. And you may not like the results. I spent two minutes drawing the letters, the words yes, no, goodbye, and probably 10 minutes talking to what I thought was nothing. I'm very impatient. I asked typical weird questions. Hello? Is there anybody here with me? Are there any spirits who would like to communicate with me? And so on. Never getting any response, I said goodbye, tore up the paper, and that was the end of that. Or so I thought. Days went by, and little things started happening. I felt as if I wasn't alone. I started seeing shadows in the corner of my peripheral vision. But being who I am and having had the experiences I've had, I didn't think much of it. It didn't scare or faze me one bit. Days became weeks. Weeks became months of this. And with the time, my paranoia settled in. As this time I was struggling to find work, and being a burden to my mother took a toll on both of us. 
stress levels in the home were consistently growing. There were occasions when I would hear kids running just outside my bedroom door. So I'd get up, open the door, and there'd be nothing there. I'd be as quiet as possible to see if I could hear kids at all. Nothing. I'd run outside, no kids, no movement, silence. At this point, I knew what was going on. I knew I opened a gateway for someone or something to communicate with me. This is why I don't believe that saying goodbye after ending a session will close or end communications. It's bullshit. If something wants to communicate, it will. Many times I'd be asleep in bed and wake up because I felt someone pull my leg. Nobody there, but I'd have a big bruise on my leg. These just kept getting more and more intense. On one occasion, I got caught off guard. I was just getting out of the shower. The bathroom doorknob jostled as if someone was trying to rush into the bathroom. I froze, looking at the doorknob. I knew I was alone, and so there's now hair standing up on the back of my neck and goosebumps down my spine. And immediately after, I heard a little girl laugh as she ran away from the door. For a split second, my heart stopped. I snapped myself out of the stunned scare and flung the door open. I tried my best not to emit any sense of fear and tried to shrug it off. I put on music with a happy tone, got dressed and played my favourite video game to take my mind off what had just happened. Soon after this occurrence, I found work, which was a bit of a relief. It meant I didn't have to be in that apartment as much. I worked long hours, I came home, slept, woke up and went back to work. The leg pulls, bruises, shadows, it all continued. Not daily, but it did. I said enough in the morning I woke up to see little red claw marks on the wall and ceiling. That was the signal to get out. It looked like something with three fingernails took an uppercut swipe at the wall and also skimmed the ceiling in one swing. I went to get a chair to get a closer look. Think of an oversized cat's nails leaving crayon marks. This was before Facebook existed, so taking a picture wasn't something easily accessible. From that moment, I began to work the idea into my mother's head that she deserved an upgrade in life. So I got my boss to help find a place closer to work, and that was that. A month later, we were out of there. Lucky me. Whatever it was, it didn't follow. As far as I know, my mother never experienced anything. She never seemed out of the ordinary, and I never told her. This is from many, many years ago. She's since died of natural causes. She lived for many years after we moved out. May she rest in peace. I've been dying to tell this story that happened to me in the middle of August of this year. When I was startled awake from a sound sleep, just someone standing in my bedroom by the window, staring at me. I've never doubted the paranormal or supernatural. I believe undoubtedly in the existence of ghosts, spirits, spectres, apparitions, whatever you want to call them, and poltergeist activity. Although many videos on YouTube and paranormal shows on TV don't convince me because they're obviously fake and for entertainment purposes. There are a couple of exceptions, of course, but most, you've got to admit that the most terrifying thing about them is that someone posted them. Again, there are a few exceptions that have convinced me that something happened. I've used a Ouija board by myself and even collected vintage boards. But that is another story. I've used automatic writing, study astrology, tarot, geomancy, necromancy, runes, playing cards, aka cartomancy, and dabbled in pal mystery. I've seen ghosts, not see-through apparitions, but solid individuals in broad daylight. One was a friend whom I hadn't seen in a while, whom I saw walking in town. I called to her and she kept walking, thinking she may not have heard me, and it was unlike her to ignore people. I finally weighed my way close enough. She stopped and turned, and her eyes were black. 
I thought I was seeing things and followed her into a store and couldn't find her. I saw a mutual friend who knew both of us and asked if she'd seen her. And she told me no one has been in the store in the previous half hour. I was confused. I know I saw her. And to some it may sound like she was avoiding me, but it wasn't like that. Puzzled, I went home and saw the local paper. That very friend's obituary was in there. She committed suicide two weeks prior by overdosing on pills. I believe seeing ghosts is a personal thing. The mutual friend didn't see her entering the store, but I saw her plain as day. Must have looked like a fool shouting her name in public. But you want to hear or read about my experience with the shadow man. Shadow people, I had trouble believing in them. I thought they were urban legends like Slender Man, Bloody Mary and Zozo. Videos claiming to capture them always were lacking. I went to bed as usual on that night in mid-August. The night was perfect, not hot and not cool. Great sleeping weather. Nothing was happening that I was interested in doing, so I decided to go to bed and do a bit of reading until I was tired enough to fall asleep. That was at 11 and I finally got tired at 12.30 and drifted off to sleep. Suddenly, I was startled awake from a sound sleep. I mean, wide awake. I could move all appendages, so it wasn't sleep paralysis. I think it was close to 3 a.m. or thereabouts. The street lamp and moon shone through my bedroom window. That never bothered me as I could sleep with the lights on or off, and have. But I noticed a figure, or rather a silhouette of a figure, standing inside my window. I was convinced it was a break-in, and laid quietly, waiting for him to make his move, but he never did. He was around 6'2", tall and broad-chested. I mean, he was big, and just staring at me, never moving. I won't deny that I was scared, thinking this guy was going to bash my brains or suffocate me, but that didn't happen. As I was watching him, trying to figure out how that big guy got in my window without being stuck, he started to fade away until he wasn't there anymore. I laid there for a few minutes longer, thinking if I got out of bed, he'd reappear. After what seemed like forever, I jumped out of bed and turned on the light. I examined the window and found nothing unusual, such as being smashed or even open. It was how I had left it. You would probably think that I wouldn't go back to sleep after that. I did, but with the lights on. To be honest, I was relieved that it was a shadow person rather than someone breaking into my house. The guy faded out of existence, I think. The thought crossed my mind, he just went invisible to catch me as I got out of bed to turn on the light. But I haven't had a second encounter with any shadow people as of right now. Unfortunately, I can't prove any of this because I didn't have my phone on me or near me because it was in another room charging. I spent a lot of time thinking about this encounter. I'm just glad it didn't result in my hospitalization or burial. Last year, I moved into an old farmhouse that my husband has spent over 20 years of his life at. It was built in the 1760s, and there's been an ongoing joke with the family that the house has seen a lot and has a lot of travellers. We live in an area close to an old fort in New Hampshire, and my husband and I both grew up hearing stories about the French and Indian War. My husband also grew up being told that multiple people died in the house. I was finally able to verify this with a newspaper article, but never previously actually experienced anything here. I had visited the house multiple times before moving in, and nothing ever really struck me, until I visited in October, three years ago. As soon as we got close to the property, I became terrified. It was just pure fear. I thought maybe it was my depression or anxiety and nothing made it give me a second thought. I moved in and occasionally felt like someone was watching me, but I figured, hey, it's an old house. But the weird part is, 
During the months of September to January, I'm full of fear and terror. At first, I suspected a case of seasonal depression or something, but the amount of fear I felt was almost agoraphobic, which is highly unusual for me. There's a field across the street from our house, and I'm unsure of the history, but it seems most of the fear is centered around this field and a particular tree that's located in it. Last September, my husband was also out shoveling and felt like something was watching him and quickly realized a black figure was watching him from the tree line. He said he felt a deep sense of fear and then it randomly just disappeared. The newspaper article I found did state a man fell to his death in October of 1893, but I feel like it's something so much darker. I live in an old farmhouse that was built in the 1760s. My husband has grown up in this house for the past 20 plus years and rarely experienced anything other than the occasional old house creaking, etc. He had a few unexplained experiences in the barn before it was torn down, sounds of people talking, what sounded like hay being thrown, etc. But that was really it. Things have been slowly progressing since I moved in last year, starting with my husband seeing a black figure watching him from the tree line. We at first attributed it to sleep deprivation or shadowing because it was last winter in the middle of the night during a snowstorm. However, we have seriously been decluttering decades of things. The apartment we live in is where his grandparents lived before they died and no one ever got around to decluttering anything and things are getting weird. Here are just a few things we've experienced. I'm not flat out saying it's paranormal as we are both parents to a newborn. You know how sleep deprivation can be. Mixed with some unrelated stressful things going on in our lives. As I was cooking a snack in the middle of the night, I caught a glimpse in the corner of my eye of a woman in a long flannel nightgown. Five second flash and gone. Heard disembodied what I could call chatter while using the bathroom in the middle of the night. Very muffled sounds like laughing and just general conversation. We found out this was a tavern. Things are being knocked over in a closet where we found a hidden, either warning oven. It's in the middle of two fireplaces or food storage. This same closet mysteriously opens in the middle of the night. We haven't caught it, but noticed it's open when we get up. Sounds of banging. At first, I truly thought it was maybe old pipes and old house equals weird noises. But my husband said three years ago, all the piping was redone and he's never heard these noises. Major issues with our internet router. The internet company has come in three times and can't explain why the signal keeps dropping randomly. Replace the router, still happening. This doesn't even cover the weirdness outside. There was a confirmed death via a newspaper article in the barn in the 1800s via a foreland at night. Where the old barn was is downright creepy. It sounds like things walking through the leaves. We live in an area that was very active during the French and Indian War as well. And there's just this weird, I don't even know what to say, surrounding the property. I will update if more things happen. My husband said this is the most activity he's ever witnessed in the 20 plus years he's lived there. I have sisters who are twins. Let's call them egg and chicken. Which one was born first? That's irrelevant. Anyways, I spent a lot of time with them as I babysat a lot when my single mom worked which typically meant I would play PlayStation at some point to amuse them. So we had just moved to a new, it was an old house by a creek, house. On the first night I babysat them while it was storming outside, something creepy happened. I was playing Monster Rancher 2 and my sister Chicken stared into the room next to us, which happened to be a closed off porch type entryway to the home. She was around three-ish, I would have been 13 or 14 at the time but I didn't think too much of it 
as my other sister Egg paid it no mind. They were three. Children are fucking weird. So the next day, while I was outside, I was with my sister and noticed the creek had risen a lot, which made sense because of all the rain the previous night. Well, my sister Chicken kept clinging to me while we were outside staring at the little walking bridge that went over the creek. She was normally talkative but wasn't saying a word and she eventually wanted me to pick her up, so I did. Egg, in the meantime, was minding her own business, running in circles and humming, which was kind of her morning routine. We did later find out she has autism. I believe Asperger's was the final diagnosis, but they never seemed to settle on it. After Egg finished running around, we went back inside and Chicken finally relaxed a little. But she stayed close to me all day. Later that night, it was the usual me playing games with them sitting next to me, or on me. And then out of nowhere, Chicken looks into the entryway and starts screaming bloody fucking murder. She was pointing into the corner of the entry and screaming, crying. She covered her face and tried to crawl away. I still can't describe how I felt to this day. So I called my grandparents who rushed over all the while Chicken was freaking out. They finally arrive and after a while, she calms down. The next day, everything is like the past 24 to 48 hours never happened. She was happy as a clam after. No issues for weeks. And then it rained and stormed again. To save time, basically the same stuff happened all over and over again. It would storm, she would be weird about the entryway and then stare at the walking bridge the next day and then freak out that night staring into the entryway. It didn't take me long to figure out the pattern of the storms causing her freakouts. Most everyone just assumed she was afraid of them, but that didn't explain a lot of the other behaviors. But I don't think they believed me since I was a teen, taking care of two kids. Anyways, the creepiest night happened when Egg, who was usually very quiet and hardly talked, spoke up. At this point, we had lived there for three-ish months and Chicken was sleeping in my bed at this point because she was always kind of afraid. I was supposed to storm that night and instead of having me babysit alone, my grandma and great aunt came over to help. They wanted me to do what I usually do, so I played PlayStation. I think I was into WWE or F Smackdown too, if curious. When it started to rain and storm, Chicken lost her shit and started freaking out pointing at the entryway, which is odd because she usually didn't do that until the day after a storm. While Chicken is screaming bloody murder, Egg, who hardly spoke or could communicate very well, goes, oh, and walks into the entryway, point to the corner and goes, you mean him? I cannot describe how heavy the room felt in that instant. I think that was the first time in my life I felt dread, I do not know. That moment has crystallized in my head. I'm not sure how long after though. It felt like time froze. It felt like I could see a lightning bolt permanently sticking out of the ground. The smell of two drawing storms was extra pungent. I could see everything for a mile through the darkness that somehow seemed bright as day. Then, in one fluid motion, my grandma and aunt got out and went to the porch. One grabbed egg, the other opened the door and screamed something like, you're not welcome here anymore. Leave her alone. She doesn't want to play anymore. And then after that, the rest of the night felt like a blur. And then that was it. She never had a problem with storms again. It turned out some years before we ever lived there, a little boy had drowned in the creek after it had flooded from a bad thunderstorm. My grandma and aunt had done some research into the history of the area and found that out. I guess he just wanted to play with someone one last time. A little over a decade ago, I experienced the scariest event that's ever happened to me. I was, at the time, living with my mother. Her home was one of the oldest houses in the city she lives in which is known as the oldest town in Texas. The house has quite a bit of history. It's known in our family as being haunted. When you walk through the house, 
You can feel it in the hardwood floors and the walls creak from the weight pushing down on the floors. When you were alone in the house and this happened, you knew that someone was walking through the house. You would go to greet whoever was coming, but often there was nobody there. I only say this to give you the sight that something is or was up with that house. Moving on, the night of this experience. I was up at 1am playing Red Dead Redemption online. While sitting in the gaming chair, I suddenly got an odd feeling. As mentioned above, the house gives you these odd feelings at different times, so I just tried to ignore it. All of a sudden, while playing, the hearing in my right ear goes out. It literally felt as if someone cupped my ear, and then the loudest ear ringing I've ever had started. I wish that I could adequately describe how intense the ringing was. Immediately, my body hair starts standing up and I get an intense feeling that I can only describe as my brain, telling me I'm about to be attacked by a predator. In my head, I'm literally telling myself, dude, you're tripping, stop being a wimp. You know how to fight. Why are you afraid because of your ears ringing? And things along that same thought pattern. The ringing finally subsides after about 30 seconds or so. I stay seated and continue gaming on Red Dead Redemption. I'm thinking about how odd it was for about one minute before it happens. Whoosh! The hearing in my left, other ear, goes muffled immediately the ringing starts blaring. Once again, the hair on my body stands straight up. I can feel the tiny hairs on my body pushing against my clothing and I once again get the feeling that I'm in danger. I'm telling myself things like don't be a wimp, stop being a bitch, yes, again, and so on. I'm telling myself this while at the same time, my gut is telling me I need to get away. My inner dialogue would be hilarious to listen to if the situation was different. It would be a mix of dude you're tough, why are you tripping? My gut at the same time is telling me leave now, go, something isn't right. Well of course, my brave manly dialogue wins and I push through until the ringing stops and the muffled cupping of my ear clears up. All is clear on the home front, right? Of course not. I'm not even gaming anymore after the second event. I'm staring at the TV thinking about what just happened. I'm literally thinking about what kind of medical conditions would cause that type of reaction in one ear and then the other. I'd guess another minute or so passed and then whoosh. Both of my ears feel as though they're cupped and the sound, atmosphere or something is snatched away from my senses. Of course the ringing, the ringing that I cannot begin to adequately describe. I promise you that there was not one single hair on my body that wasn't standing straight up. I feel that they were standing up so straight that they were pushing new hairs through my skin. Every millimetre on my skin was goosebumps and hairs trying to vacate my body. There was no inner dialogue telling me how brave or tough I was. My gut was screaming at me, run, run, run now, run now. I cannot describe the terror that was in my body. I felt like a child about to be devoured by a lion. I stood up and turned around on quick walk to the bedroom. It honestly took every bit of my manly ways to not break off into a dead sprint through the house. I climbed into bed next to my wife who was asleep. She rolled over and touched my arm and woke up. Baby, what's wrong? The goof swamps on my body was so irregular that it brought my wife out of her sleep. I know how they felt to me, but if anything, I'm understanding how intense the sensations were. I don't remember what I told my wife, but I'd imagine it was me downplaying what had happened so that it didn't scare her. I'm sorry for the anticlimactic ending. I didn't say anything. I didn't hear anything chasing me. When I got to the room, no furniture moved or anything spookier than what had already happened. I've had some strange experiences before in my life, but I can tell you that nothing that I've ever experienced has caused my body and mind to go into primal fear mode. I had always thought that I knew what primal anger, primal fear, or primal emotions are. Up until that point, I didn't. I never believed in Ouija boards until I was in college. 
My freshman year, my roommate bought one and we all decided to play with it as a hoax. We planned this whole thing out and we scared him real bad. Next time we used it, we decided to actually try it and see if it would work. And it did. Too well. We lived in West Philly next to a cemetery and on land that used to be a mental asylum for indentured servants and slaves, as well as a farm where a lot of slaves died before abolition. Not to mention all the people who died to violence in West Philly over the years. We got a lot of interesting people at first. A doctor who died from typhoid fever, a slave who was whipped to death, a young man who shot in the 80s. We were even able to find some of their graves in the cemetery exactly where they told us they'd be. It was like uncovering a key to the past, but then things started to get really bad. We got a child who refused to give us their name or tell us anything about their past. Instead, it kept asking us questions and when we didn't answer, it would start to spell the answers out for us. Things that none of us would know about each other or what we never talked about. Stuff like childhood nicknames in foreign languages. Stuff like embarrassing moments. We would play for hours, so we had a lot of time to spell out whole paragraphs. And then it uncovered one of our friends, who wasn't even playing, secrets. Some childhood trauma that she hadn't told anyone about. She started sobbing and immediately stormed out. We tried to say goodbye to the spirit, but it wouldn't let us. It was vehemently pushing the eye away from the goodbye. We finally hung up, for lack of a better word, and chucked at our friend who then told us the story. We were all dumbfounded. She never played again, but we were hooked. Unfortunately for us, every time we used it after that, we would get the same spirit. Eventually, we uncovered his name, Yubel, and he told us that he wasn't technically a real kid. He died during the pregnancy and killed his mother along with him. She never named him, so we picked his own name. He said we were his first and only friends and that he loved us and would find a way to be with us. We immediately were freaked out and put the board away for good since we were convinced Yubel was a demon. Only, it wasn't for good. The board would magically appear around our dorm. It would be open and have the eye set to yes. We would hear some strange noises at night. Footsteps, croaking, rattling. Whenever we talked about anything in the room with the Ouija board, strange things would happen. My roommate had set up these glow-in-the-dark decals in his room. Our other friend said she liked them and that she wanted some. The same one who vowed never to play after it uncovered her secret. That night, she went to bed and when she turned off the light, her ceiling was covered with glowing symbols. She called us over and we all saw it, but when we tried to take photos of it, it wouldn't show up on the camera. After we turned the lights back on, they had disappeared and never came back. We had enough, so we decided to play one last time and tell him to stop and leave us alone. He got angry and started saying a string of random numbers and letters. We googled them, convinced it meant something, and the only thing that came up was a radio station. We tuned in on our phone and it was a religious radio channel and the host said all the sinners who were listening would face eternal damnation. We were terrified and then the eye rapidly started spelling out see you soon, three, two, one, goodbye. And as it did that, my friend's stuffed rabbit croaked as if it were a dead creature and flew off the shelf. We ripped him open to see if there was a voice box inside or something to explain it. And there was nothing. We threw the board into the closet and never touched it again for the next two years. Two years later, I came across it again, realizing it must have accidentally ended up in my stuff after we moved out. And I decided to play with it to see what would happen this time, thinking that last time it was all an elaborate hoax my roommate had cooked up to get back at us for scaring him the first time. This time, it was me and a whole new group of friends and I. As soon as we asked the first question, it starts spelling out Yubel. I never let it finish. I immediately moved it to goodbye and told my friends we were done. I've tried the board several times since then, and every time I get Yubel. No matter who I'm with. People who have never even heard the original story. I'm done with these for life.
Ever since playing with it the first time, I've attracted spirits like wildfire. This is a very long story, and I'm not the best at writing things out, but I'll try. I live in Georgia, the state, in a rural town not too far from a major city. There's a set of woods that's behind our house, and it divides two neighborhoods, and it's about a mile wide, if that. Strange occurrences have always surrounded these woods. Small things like random trash, tarps, etc. I should mention, it's more swampy marsh than woods, so it makes camping in there impossible. One night, I was taking our dog out. He stays in the back half of the house due to him not liking the other dogs. I took him out the side door and walked around the house to the fence. For some reason, when we left the house, he was absolutely terrified. He didn't want to go out. Very unusual for a dog who's quick to snatch someone's soul if prompted. Not thinking about it, we pushed onward. After we tinkled, we walked back. This is when I noticed it, or rather, heard it. Crunching of leaves. At first, I thought it was one of our dozen cats on the property, until I realized it was matching my steps. If I walked, you could hear it walking. If I stopped, it stopped. There's a small clearing between woods where one of the sheds is. That's when we saw it. My dog was first to see something, and then I saw him some, I don't know, creature? It was taller than the shed, so maybe a good eight feet tall, and it darted across the clearing at a crazy fast speed. My dog, who again isn't scared of anything, bolts so fast, I dropped his leash, and he ran to the door whining. I was quickly behind him. Once we were inside, I quickly bolted the door and ran to tell my girlfriend what happened. She immediately wanted to investigate, saying it's probably a woodland creature. Armed with two flashlights, we went out the front door. As we walked toward the wood line, we could hear something moving around. It sounded maybe 200 yards away. As we scanned with our flashlights, we saw nothing but kept hearing it. Then we heard it get closer and closer until it was maybe 20 feet away. Still nothing. No eyes, not even an animal call. Just rustling. My girlfriend, now scared, heads for the house. I decided to check with the neighbors to see if maybe one of their dogs got out. When I arrived at his house, my neighbor, who we'll call Dave, explained that all his dogs were accounted for. Curious, he came to investigate. This is when I noticed that whatever this thing was following me along the wood line to Dave's house and was now behind Dave's house. Gun in hand, we went into his backyard scanning for something. We could hear it rustling or maybe running. About a hundred yards away in thick swampy woods. Way too thick for a person to walk in, let alone run in. Then it stopped. It was dead silent. Scanning and on edge, we hear and see nothing, and then BAM! All of a sudden, it was five feet in front of us, sprinting at me. It slammed the fence so hard, it rocked it back and forth. Dave, scared shitless, shot randomly as well. Nothing. We never saw it. Never had it got close to us. Again, as I mentioned, the woods are thick. Too thick to run in, so what the fuck teleported silently in front of us and slammed the gate? Spooked, we were about to run. Then we heard it. It was human in nature, but not English. It sounded alien-like. Not a known language. Dave, a hunter for the last 40 years, still to this day can't explain what that was. Anyway, after we heard that, we bolted. He covered me and I ran to my house. Not 10 minutes later, we both hear a loud explosion coming from the woods. It shook our houses and flickered our power. I ran outside to see what it was and of course, nothing. But when Dave came out and confirmed he felt the same thing, we were both once again terrified. Moments later, a few strangers from the neighborhood came driving down to our cul-de-sac and they all agreed the blast sound they heard came from behind our house. 
911 was called and the two police officers interviewed us separately. Our stories matched. The responding officers refused to go anywhere near those woods. They took the reports and left. To this day, we're still not sure what that encounter was. Also, Dave doesn't go outside at night anymore. It spooked him that bad. I'm a person who was very into lucid dreaming and is searching to have my first one. I've had a dream journal for about two years because of that. This is why I wrote this dream down. I have a lot of dreams about other things that are striking as well, but this is the most insane of them all. The time I predicted my aunt's cancer. I haven't seen my aunt in over 10 years at this point of this dream. When my grandfather died, all four of his daughters broke apart. Huge legal battles occurred and my family vowed to never see that side of the bloodline ever again. And that's how it was for 10 years. No communication, no texting, no birthday phone calls, not even anything from my cousins. I was 14 at the time, not a mature adult, so it was hard to make my own decision to speak to them, even if I wanted to. That part of my family was over, or so I thought. In August 2020, I had a dream so jarring that I woke up in tears. This is what I wrote down. Dream where I was given a day to prepare for surgery. I had a feeling I wasn't going to survive. It was for my uterus. I had cancer, sick. Lots of stressful crying and thinking about death. Horrible dream. The entire dream felt like ages, but it was all suffering and anxiety. That's sadly all the details I put down. It just felt so real, so raw, but I didn't feel me during the dream. I could just feel the stress and anxiety and fear. Anyway, fast forward to September 2020. My mother tells me to have a seat. She needed to talk. Jay, aunt, was sick. She had gone into a shock while bringing groceries inside her condo. According to her neighbour, she just stood outside looking at her front door for 10 minutes, not responding. Her neighbour and best friend thankfully saw this, went, oh shit, and went to help her. She guided Jay into her home and sat her down. This is when she went almost completely comatose and passed out multiple times. The ambulance was called and she kept having these jolting moments of consciousness. Confusion was infesting her mind it seemed. She had no idea what was even going on or where she was. She went for testing while in the hospital and was told there was something very wrong. She had cancer of the uterus or at least the doctors thought. Immediately she had to go through testing and screenings. The cancer was so bad there was nothing they could do but remove it all, hysterectomy. As if they didn't, it would travel to her stomach and eventually kill her. I didn't know the term at the time of my dream, just as I remember knowing my uterus has to be removed. During all of this, Jay was so positive, so grateful for life. She was amazing. The operation went well, after of course going through many months of chemo. I'm happy to say she has made an almost full recovery. Unfortunately, the type of cancer she has slash had was fallopian tube cancer. The survival rate, even after operation, is only five to 10 years. Because of this cancer, I reunited with my family. All is well now, and I'm so blessed to be with them. I told my mother I had this dream, and she said she believed me. I told her right after she informed me of Jay's health. My mom told me that all of the women on her side have had these abilities to pre pre predate things in dreams, deaths, cancers, etc. The women of my family have also felt this pull of wanting to go home, despite being home. I believe it may be blood related thing. I'm not sure. I try not to talk about it too much as it makes my mom very anxious. The only one I can talk to about this 
is another aunt of mine, P, who is a lifelong researcher of finding out the truth of what life really is. Something that I had no idea she did, thanks to the 10 year gap of them not being in my life. And what boggles my mind is that I do the same thing. Research NDEs, past lives, etc. Just as my Aunt P does. Yet I wasn't introduced to it by her at all. I found it naturally. Such a small niche and study, and yet here I am doing the same thing she has been doing. Weird how it all connects. This story took place a year ago, when we decided to have a vacation in Luxembourg for a few days. We were staying at my uncle's house, he lives in Luxembourg. Me, my mom, and dad were given a room on the second floor. The room was close to the stairs. My uncle and aunt's room were right across from ours. Now, when we were putting our luggage in the room, I decided to take the bed farthest away from the door since there was a power socket right beside the bed and I tend to watch videos before going to sleep, so I need easy access to my charger. My mom took the middle bed, and my dad the bed closest to the door and bathroom. Well actually, the real reason I wanted the bed farthest away, was because right beside the bathroom door, was a long lampshade. It's one of those old lampshades where the top looks like someone put an umbrella on it or something. That lampshade really gave me a bad feeling. At that time, I didn't really understand why I felt that way, just that I didn't want to be close to it at all. Now here's the creepy part that night. It was around 10pm at night, and I was still watching videos on YouTube my mum and dad were sleeping already, since we had a rough day of sightseeing and it was raining so we were all tired. I kept looking in that direction of where the lampshade stood. I felt stupid being paranoid to be honest. I just felt like something was there. When I look at that particular spot, it feels like it's darker in that area compared to the rest of the room. I tried my hardest to just focus on the video I was watching. It didn't work by the way. Around 20 minutes close to 11, I heard my mom whispering or whimpering, I don't know. I thought she was sleep talking. I thought she was having a weird dream. It happens to all of us sometimes. Five to ten minutes later, she started whimpering louder. Now that got me worried, so I started shaking her trying to wake her up. She wouldn't. So I called for my dad who was right beside my mom's bed. Both of us started shaking her and calling her name. After a few seconds, that got her to wake up. My god was she a mess. She was crying and kept looking at the spot where my, the lampshade stood. She kept telling my dad, that she wanted us to get out of the room. So my dad woke my uncle and told him we were sleeping downstairs in the living room since something happened with my mom and she doesn't want to sleep in the room anymore. We got her downstairs, I quickly went back to the room to get my phone from my bed. And I kid you not, when I turned around to leave, I saw on the spot where the lampshade stood, something or someone stood behind that stupid lampshade peeking out at me. A literal black figure as big as the lampshade. Let's just say I ran out of that room as fast as I could. My mom explained to us downstairs what the hell she dreamt about. She told me she could see the room in a dream. She saw me using my phone and my dad asleep. But what caught her eye was something or someone that was standing behind the lampshade, staring at her apparently. She couldn't move, so she tried to apparently scream for us, and we couldn't hear her. That screaming is apparently me hearing her whimpering. She started panicking because she couldn't move, and that figure was giving off huge amounts of bad jujus. So she started screaming louder in a dream, where she saw me moving to her, shaking her, till my dad also joined in. And it's like she got slapped and she was awake. That creeped me out. Why? because I saw the same thing. I told them about me seeing the same thing when I went back to get my phone. My dad asked my uncle what the heck is up with that lampshade. He told us he doesn't know where the lampshade came from because they bought the house it was in the attic with the other furniture. 
My aunt thought it looked elegant, so they put it in the guest bedroom, which is where we slept. That night really solidified my belief of the paranormal, and there are things out there that are good and that are bad. That thing, whatever it was, was by no means good. My uncle threw that lampshade away. That's what he told us months later when my mom asked him about it. I am never sleeping at my uncle's house again. For the rest of our stay, we slept in the living room and we never went inside that room during our stay. But every time I go to my uncle's room to play some PS4, I always get a bad feeling where the guest bedroom is. I don't know what that thing is, but I don't really want to know. It was August when I moved in. At the time, my mother had been suffering from multiple health issues for months and had to be in and out of different hospitals fairly often. She and my father slept in different bedrooms since he had grown more and more agitated about my father's loud snoring. In the months that I stayed with them, my mother's bedroom always made me feel a bit uncomfortable. She had rose pink organza drapes hanging around the canopy bed and the room didn't get much direct sunlight, since its only window faced the northeast. I never wanted to stay there for longer than 15 minutes. Due to her illness, my mother lost more than 30 pounds and weighed in me at 85 pounds by the end of October. She had all these antibiotic resistant infections affecting multiple organs. Her doctors were extremely puzzled and couldn't pinpoint what the actual causes were. It was heart-wrenching to see my mother slowly withering into an extremely frail and depressive person. At one point, she even thought that she was dying. In early December, one of my mother's cousins came over to the house for the first time and was very concerned about my mother's bedroom immediately. It's full of messy energies, as she described how she felt, and said it gave her a bad headache as soon as she entered the bedroom. But I got my parents' attention. My mom's cousin informed my parents that she knew someone special who might be able to help with my mother's odd illness. The person was a medicine man slash feng shui master. Running out of options, my parents agreed to invite the master to the house the following week. I was home with them on the day the master arrived. He first instructed my father to remove all the wooden statues my father had collected over the years. You can put them in the garage or storage room, definitely not in your living space, the master claimed. According to him, each of those statues carried their own chaotic energies and were not the friendly ones. When he entered my mother's bedroom, he shook his head in disbelief, told us that there were things he did not like and that he needed to get rid of them ASAP. He handed my father a hulu, calabash in Chinese, used by traditional medicine men slash women as containers for various substances. The master told my father to leave it in my mother's bedroom with the lid open, and then we waited. That was in the late afternoon. My father and the master's assistant were at work, moving the wooden statues from the house to the garage, while my mother rested in the guest bedroom with me. Around dinner time, my mother started to develop a horrible panic attack. She was extremely jittery, short of breath, and couldn't stop scratching her chest. She told me it felt like something was inside her chest and she needed to get it out. I had never seen my mother that way. Her face and chest were beet red and she had acted like a wounded, angry animal. Scared and alarmed, I ran to the garage to tell everyone what was going on. The master yelled out, we've got something. He instructed my father to retrieve the hulu from my mother's bedroom and put the lid back on. My father followed the order and brought out the hulu, then handed it to the master. Right after that, my mother's panic attack subsided quickly, like nothing had ever happened. Her face and chest returned to her normal pale fair tone, with visible red scratch marks she had done to herself just moments ago, and she was calm. The master grabbed the hulu and stared at it for a while, then closed his eyes before declaring that we caught it. What was in the hulu? We all wanted to know. 
According to the master, it seemed to be a type of black magic, an ill-intended spell that someone had cast onto the house. However, my mother was not necessarily the target. It was only because she had a weak immune system to begin with that made it easy for the bad energy to attach onto her. Strangely, after that unexplainable event, my mother's health was improving day by day. The next spring, she regained her health. Even the doctors were amazed by it. No, my parents didn't tell the doctors what had happened with the master, since they didn't think the doctors would believe them after all. That was more than 10 years ago. Until today, we still had zero idea what the hell was going on. I'm just feeling grateful that my mother is still with us, with good health and all. And they still live in that house, happily and peacefully. Around mid-August 2021, my sister was walking her friend home, and it was about 9pm, and he lives down the same road as us. Mentioning we do live out in the boonies in southwest Montana. And as soon as they left the house, the TVs lost signal. But it was a clear night. You could see all the stars. She then comes running back inside, and this is what she said happened. She kept hearing someone yelling coming from the north side of the end of our road. She said she thought someone was arguing, and it was short bursts of a male yell. Then, when they walked down the road a little further, she heard the man yelling in the woods next to them. They stopped and just listened, until it did it again, and that's when they ran inside. About 10 or 15 minutes after they came in, the TV's back on. Nothing happened for about a week after that, until one day, I got home from a friend's house, probably around 1 to 4 p.m. And I actually heard the yelling my sister was talking about. It was exactly how she described it, but it was coming from our backyard, which is also a wooded area. I was spooked, so I didn't go check it out, but this is where everything started to kick off. My sister never had any more experiences after this, but that night, I heard the yelling the tapping started. And it's not knocks or taps in three, it's like one, two, one, two. With about one second between the first two, then the second two are right after each other. The first time I heard it, I was laying in bed and it was tapping on my window around 3pm. So it was still daylight then, on the wall right by my bed where my head lays. My window is about six feet off the ground. On the wall, my bed is about entered 10 feet off the ground. After it happened, I looked out my window and I didn't see anything. I asked my dad if he had tapped on my window and he said he didn't and my sister isn't home. This same pattern of tapping almost every day since this happened, or at least four to five times a week. The end of October, I was looking for something in my car and was walking back up the house and it was raining and I had my hood up and I heard someone yell my name very angrily. It sounded very close. It sounded just like my mom, but she was at work at the time. I ran inside and asked my dad if he called me. He said no and we kind of patrolled the area and didn't see anything. At this point, I legitimately thought I was going crazy. Nobody I talked to believed me or told me not to worry about it until my boyfriend and I we're just sitting in this truck at the end of my road because there's no houses down there. It's quiet and that's our favorite thing to do, just sit in his truck. We stayed out late. It was probably 4 a.m. My landlord owns a ranch and it extends to where my road ends and we were petting the ponies and he said, I think we should go back to the truck. I feel like there's something over there. And right as he finished saying that, all the ponies ran away from the spot he was talking about so we got to the truck, sat and talked for a while, and the tapping stated happening again to me. It sounded like it was on the truck, but he said he heard it in the distance, but it was very soft. It went continuously for about three minutes, which is the longest it happened. It stopped for 20 poor minutes, then started again. We ended up leaving the area 45 minutes later, and his truck was making weird ass noises like it wasn't wanting to keep moving. He said it's never done it. 
in the past, but it is a 2010. A couple of days ago, my boyfriend introduces me to one of his friends who claims to be a psychic medium. And my boyfriend didn't tell him my story or anything. But as soon as we were walking into his house, he said he felt a negative presence in the room. And when I was in the bathroom, he told my boyfriend he saw it, but didn't want to explain what he saw. But I do remember him carrying his Bible around. For a little more context, I've lived here for 14 years, and this is the only time something like this has happened. The only thing that changed before all of this happened is I had to foster a dog and gave him away to a new home. We only have one neighbor that is close to our house and they just moved in. No one in my family has met them yet. Besides my sister, no one else in the house has experienced anything. And my sister hasn't experienced anything after the first time it happened. My family moved from the UK to Ireland in 1999 when I was 12, and my brother was nine. We moved to the town where my mother is originally from. She had a lot of family there, but her dad had passed away years earlier. We moved into an unfinished new build bungalow in a small neighborhood. Apparently, the husband of the couple who originally started building it died before it was completed and it stood empty for a few years before she sold it onto us. I'm skeptical as to whether that is relevant or not, but I added it just in case. We had been there less than a year, when one night my mum, who's a very light sleeper, woke to a bang around 3am. We had this little fish-shaped radio that stuck to the wall in the shower, and she thought maybe it had come loose and fallen down. So she got up to check, but there was nothing out of place. Before she went back to bed, she went to check in on me and my brother. Both of our bedroom doors were closed. I'm not sure which room she checked first, but when she looked into the room, the blankets were folded back and the bed was empty. She went straight to the other room thinking maybe we were in the same room or something, although that wasn't something we'd done before. But again, when she opened the door, the blankets were folded back and the bed was empty. At that point, she understandably panicked, woke my dad and they started looking for us. They walk to the sitting room, the door is closed. When they open the door and turn on the light, they find us seemingly sound asleep. They both firmly agree that my brother and I looked as though we'd been picked up out of our beds and cradled under our knees and neck and then placed down in the sitting room. Him across an armchair, and me on the couch. I can remember them waking me up. I felt like I had been in a really deep sleep. I was super tired. The lights really hurt my eyes and I was confused. They were asking what had happened, but I had no idea how I got there. Oh, and my brother was there as well. My brother doesn't have any real memory of being woken up at all, but I remember it took them a minute or two to wake him up. The next day, my dad joked that we must have been abducted by aliens or something, which I thought was pretty funny at the time. For context, neither me nor my brother had any history of sleepwalking, or sneaking out of our rooms for that matter. We never really spent much time together. We'd usually be in our own rooms, doing our own thing. I never had any fears or trouble sleeping after it happened. I wasn't scared. I would quite often have dreams though, where I would suddenly shoot up off the ground, hundreds of meters into the night sky, and I'd be looking down at the ground as I went up. Every time I had this dream, I was always looking down over the neighborhood where we lived. I can never remember what I was dreaming before I'd fly away, and I'd wake up before I ever landed. I don't have the dream often anymore, maybe once or twice a year. My parents still live in the house 21 years later, there's often been bumps in the night and odd happenings since that night. Like the time my mum got up for work one morning and found a passport sized photo of her dad beside the kettle. Or they'll get up some mornings and the attic stairs will be open. Their dogs sometimes growl at absolutely nothing. 
although all of those things seem pretty easily explainable. The photo was in the top of the cupboard above the kettle. It most likely fell out. The catch on the attic stairs can sometimes stick, so most likely it just wasn't fully secured. And well, she's a highly anxious dog, so I don't put too much weight on her growling either. Either way, my parents don't pay much attention to any of these occurrences, so they're not bothered by it. I have absolutely no explanation for what happened that night though. Neither do my parents. I never really spoke about it to anyone ever since because it just sounds like some crazy story. But how did we get there? And without making a sound? How were all the doors closed behind us? Why doesn't my brother remember? This is not something that scares or worries me at all. I'm more curious than anything. Has anyone else ever experienced anything like this? Or have any logical explanation as to what might have happened? Has anyone come across the Enochian calls? And if so, how are they introduced to you? This is a shorter version of how I was introduced to them. So one day in 2008, after my shitty studio apartment got broken into but nothing was taken, two websites mysteriously appeared as bookmarked sites on my computer. One was the Enochian calls, and the other was a link to the US Navy. Now that Navy thing was strange, as I had recently been re-evaluated by the VA for benefits. Now you don't have to believe me, but I had never heard the word Enochian before that website showed up on the computer. What struck me initially was that in the beginning before the calls, there was a message that seemed to be aimed at me, or rather those like me. But the gist of it to me was not to get involved in the affairs of man, because they would weed themselves out. Also, to not stay in any one place for too long. After that, I read the call for the first time. The short of the calls is this. Basically, the best way I could describe it is that it's like a telephone book. Reciting the calls is like dialing, and then at the end you insert the name you want. Sort of like how you would dial an extension. After I got the bookmark, I did some research and found it was a type of magic. Most commonly known because of its use by one Alistair Crowley. However, what I think people don't understand is that these calls must be pronounced correctly for things to happen. Otherwise you could be saying abracadabra for half an hour, and still be where you were when you started. Anyways, I became obsessed with learning everything I could about Enochian, and I found someone who in their forward seemed to have knowledge of things and an understanding of other things. They had also prepared a list with how to properly vocalise the words, giving examples of when something should sound like the A in bar, far or car, or when it should sound like the A in rate, hate or bait. So when I recited the calls using the ways written, all sorts of strange shit started happening. So impressed was I that even though I had the information I need, thanks to the computer, I still tracked down a copy of this person's book, which I still have to this day. In 2010, something happened that made me completely stop using the calls. So for me, it takes about 30 minutes to recite the calls. This particular time, I chose a random name to insert at the end. And then, at the end, it happened. A voice from nowhere and yet seemingly everywhere spoke. Just the two words. Ma, eh. But in those two words, I understood what power there was in the voice. When I heard those two words, my ears stank like nothing I'd ever felt before. Understood that this was a time in my life where I thought I had a decent grasp on supernatural shit. It was in those words I understood two things. The first was why the Lord doesn't speak to man. The vessel, or to put it more simply, the body, could not withstand it. The second was that even though that wills the vessel that is typing these words is not like other men's, the difference between spirits and souls. That doesn't change the fact that the vessels are the same, and as such, just as limited in certain aspects to any other. When I heard those words, it was like my ears tried to close the hole on its on. The pain was extreme and unexpected. 
shaken to my core, I stopped reciting the cause. But the pain is not why I would tell people not to investigate or perform the cause. It's because one must understand what it is they are saying in these calls. One must understand that they are calling on spirits to help them, not as an individual, but as a fellow servant of the Lord. If one were to review the calls, I would urge them to see how many times that particular phrase is used. Now, unlike this world where faith cannot be seen, in that world, the truth of a person is clearly visible. And that's where shit goes real bad, real fucking quick. Mankind is not loved by all spirits. It's only the desire to be near the Lord that keeps them from jumping mad shit. So imagine what would happen if something you didn't like in the first place was found to not serve the Lord as they had claimed when they asked you to help them. The Lord doesn't always intervene on man's behalf. That's why I would advise against dabbling in Enochian. So the first one starts in a townhouse I used to live in with my mom and sister. The way it was set up was there was the front door and inside directly to the right was stairs that led to three bedrooms. Mine was at the front, so my window went over the front door. Any time of day or night that you'd look inside my room from outside, it always looked like it was getting black. Even with the light on it would do this, but there would always be a weird halo around my closet door and that had no light bulb in it, so no explanation for that. One day I was sitting in my room just on my phone, wearing an oversized t-shirt that covered my blanket. My door was closed and none of our cats were inside with me. I don't remember falling asleep, but I woke up after like 20 minutes and my legs stung really bad. So I looked and I had like 30 scratches all over my thighs, just deep enough to break skin. And I know it wasn't me. I had a really bad habit of biting my nails off. That room made me so uncomfortable, I refused to sleep in it for like six months until my mom forced me to stop because she thought I was being ridiculous. I also had friends tell me they had seen very tall, dark figures in my doorway while coming up the stairs to my room. After my grandparents passed and we moved into their house, I started smelling cigars. My grandpa used to smoke them and no one else smoked at the time. I also used to hear footsteps a lot. There was a laundry room in the back that every time I went in there, I'd get so uncomfortable, it almost made me physically sick, every time. There was a room in that back that was literally always cold, and there was no real explanation for it. It had heating, and the house was built right there. There was nothing wrong with the room slash walls. It was just always freezing in there, even with space heaters. My mom had a house built on a hill and I got to move there by myself for a couple months before everyone else. And every night I used to hear a weird melodic music, like a 10 second melody coming from the laundry room. I went in there because I just went to do the old house to do the laundry until my mom moved in. After she moved in, she did laundry and I found out that the music was the washing machine turning on and off. There were multiple nights that I laid down and as soon as I got comfortable and closed my eyes, I heard a man talk directly into my ear. Didn't recognize the voice and I could never make out what he said. After I moved into my own apartment with my mother, I've experienced things a lot more often. I used to have a toy light that plays lullabies for my daughter that has an auto shut off of 15, 30, 45 minutes. And it would turn itself back on almost every single night, hours after she had fallen asleep. And it was on a tall dresser that a toddler wouldn't be able to reach to turn on. I get the absolute worst feeling going into her room alone. Again, it makes me want to throw up. Her toys turn themselves on all the time too. There was a time I was about to go to sleep and decided to grab something from my living room. And as I go to open my bedroom door, I hear someone talk. And then as I open the door, I heard something drop. And out of the corner of my eye, see my daughter's stuffed lion fall from an upright position. It was old and gifted to her. It literally cannot stand up without being held that way. 
Another day, when my ex and I were fighting, he stormed off and I didn't see where he had gone. And then I heard stuff moving around loudly in the kitchen, so I asked him what he was doing. He came out of the bedroom and asked me what, and as soon as he came out, the noises in the kitchen stopped. One time I lay down in my bed with the door open, that's why I have to close my door now, and right as I did, I saw this weird blacked out thing run, hunched, across my hallway. My husband and I heard people talking all the time. Lights get turned on, doors get opened or closed, things disappear and then reappear in plain sight or hidden. I felt someone touching me when I know for a fact there was no one near me. Also, sage literally will not burn in this apartment. Like I'm not making this up. You can try all you want to light it outside. As soon as you step outside, it will spark up. If you light it outside, then come inside, it immediately burns out. I've never seen anything like it. This happened to me a few years ago, and it wasn't until today that I realised I may have been in some sort of danger. My husband and I were camping with two friends in a pretty remote area, deep in the mountains, on the shore of a small lake. Our first morning there, I decided to paddleboard to the other side of the lake. One thing about me, I have submechanophobia, which is fear of submerged objects in water. It doesn't affect me too badly, I love the water. But I get the heebie-jeebies when I see sunken boats, large fallen trees, massive boulders in the water, stuff like that. It's worse when I'm alone. I do pretty okay when other people are with me, and it has to be a large, clear body of water. Swimming pools, rivers or lakes where the water isn't super clear don't bother me. So I go off by myself on my board. The lake is one big oval, so you can basically see everything from the shoreline. However, where we had set up camp, you couldn't see the whole lake, so I quickly lost sight of my husband. I started to freak out a little bit because I had immediately seen a big sunken tree. This is a high Sierra lake, so the water is crystal clear, but quickly turns black because of how deep it is. I told myself I was being silly and needed to get over my dumb phobia. I didn't really see anything else, but I decided to stay close to shore because usually that makes me feel better. But this lake doesn't really have a typical shore. It's all granite rock that just quickly and steeply drops into the water. I still don't really see much in the water, but I'm really starting to panic, which is weird. I have this overwhelming feeling to go back as fast as I can, but I think I'm just being dumb. I tried to deep breathe because I really want to get to the other side where there is a waterfall. So I trudge on trying to calm myself and enjoy nature, yet still feeling like I should go back. As I'm paddling, I start to realise how alone I am. I keep looking around hoping to see a hiker, but I'm completely by myself. I try not to think about that because I'm almost to the waterfall and the view is gorgeous. As I get closer, I see there is an island, for lack of a better word. Just a large amount of granite that is fairly close to shore. There's a single plastic chair sitting on the island, which is funny, but slightly unsettling because it's such a weird thing to see so deep in nature. I'm still freaked, so I figured if I got off my board and onto the island, I would feel better because I would be on land and my phobia wouldn't bother me. I pull up my board and I start walking around, trying to enjoy the view, and I just can't. I feel terrified. The waterfall is so much louder now that I'm near it, and I realise if I were to scream, no one would hear me. My husband is the only person around for miles, and he can't see or hear me, and I'm terrified. I keep looking around because I feel like I'm being watched. I decided I can't take this. Even if it's just my stupid irrational fear, I have to get back as fast as I can. I get on my board and paddle down the centre of the lake rather than keep to the shore, because it's quicker that way. It takes everything in me to do it. I can't shake the feeling I'm being watched, and I feel so damn vulnerable in the centre of this deep blue lake. 
I'm shaking the whole way back. But as I'm getting closer to camp, relief sweeps through me. I get off the board and go see my husband. He happily asks me how it was, and I can't talk. He asks me if I'm okay and I just start crying. I tell him I think my stupid phobia made me panic, even though I didn't really see anything in the water. I feel totally insane, and I'm just happy our friends aren't back from their hike to see me behaving so irrationally. We left later that day. Since then, I've become more open to the unknown. I was thinking about it, and it suddenly hit me that maybe something was going on, and it wasn't just my phobia, especially because I never even really saw anything that triggered it. I'm not sure if I just freaked because I was alone, the phobia, or something else. I guess I'll never know, but I'm curious if others have been in a similar situation or have any insight. In the place I live, the concept of UFOs or other paranormal stuff doesn't exist. No one talks about it and no one has any experience to share that would be considered paranormal. Although I consider myself paranormally positive, I'm very skeptical of what I read or hear. However, I still don't know and I can't explain what I saw that night. Before I start, it's important to give a layout of the area around my home. My house is in the middle of a forest. The only visible building from my home is on the south side. Close to my home on the west side is a small hill and behind it is a small village with less than 50 people. Although the village is not visible, I can see the hill from the windows in the dining room and the kitchen. Between my home and the hill is a heavily wooded area with a couple cliffs. So that makes the area between my home and the village inaccessible by any means. At the peak of the hill is a dirt road, I think three to 400 meters away from home in a straight line and parallel to it. Back to the story now. It was a summer night of 2019 when my mom and I decided to go to the kitchen and prepare dinner. Since it was already dark outside, I believe it was nine o'clock and without wind. To go to the kitchen, we had to pass from the dining room. Because that room was dark, I noticed two bright red lights on one of the windows. My mom noticed that too, but paid no mind at the time. On the other hand, I went to the window to take a better look because those lights were very unusual. I actually opened the window to have a better view. At first, I thought it was a parked car on the dirt road with its rear lights facing my house. Then left and right to the big red lights, I saw other two red lights smaller and much less bright. I found it very strange that one or two cars would be parked there because there's nothing on that road and it's only used by farmers with tractors when they go to the nearby fields. However, it wasn't yet the season for the farmers to work on the fields and even if it was, tractors are very noisy. I never heard a sound from whatever the lights belonged to. That wasn't even the strangest part. For two minutes after I noticed the lights, they weren't moving. Then, suddenly, they started to make a small and smooth movement left to right, all of them still keeping the same distance. I can tell for sure that no cars could make such a sync movement, at least without a noise. I made extra sure to pay attention to any kind of noise. Then, I thought it could be some kind of a drone, but I also dismissed it because of the lack of a sound. I have since seen drones from up close, and I know for a fact that they are noisy. In such a small distance, I would have heard something. Also, it couldn't be something flying in the sky for two reasons. First, the lights were under the horizon line. They seemed to be for something on or above the dirt road. Second, no object or aircraft can do any movement from left to right and back repeatedly. Since it was pitch black outside, I couldn't make any shape of whatever the thing was. But the more I looked at it, the closer I thought it was and the more I felt uneasy and like I was being watched. When I thought that it could be actually right beyond the fence, 
50 meters from my house. Above the tree line, the lights suddenly turned off. No movement up or down, nothing. Just the lights turned off. I stayed for a few more minutes to see if the lights would reappear or if I would hear any sound, but nothing happened. My mom, who also happened to look at the lights from the kitchen the whole time, told me that she also felt the same uneasy feeling as if we're being watched. Now, we weren't drunk or anything, nor do we have mental issues or taking any kind of meds. In fact, we never did. Especially my mom, who's a skeptic and doesn't even believe in the existence of anything paranormal. For the first time, left hints that it could be something else. I don't claim that it was something paranormal. Perhaps it could have a very easy explanation. Also, we never saw anything similar before or after the incident. In any case, whatever it was, I hope it wasn't there to stalk us. As I'm sure some of you are aware, the hunting season for white-tailed deer is about to start this weekend. I've, 25 female, began spending a decent chunk of time in the stand with my partner, in life and in most ventures generally, because we've discovered that hogs have been rooting up the oats and generally causing havoc and scaring away the deer from the feeder. We've gone out a handful of times in the last two weeks, attempting to catch the miscreants at it. So far, no luck. Very frustrating. At any rate, because of the hogs, I've been spending more time in a stand, after dark, than I ever have in my life. We've been up there from 9pm to 1am, 10pm to 2am, 9pm to 11am, and every other weird time slot you can think of. I mention this just in case it's relevant or helps paint a picture. There have been a few things that have happened that I've struggled to explain away or rationalise, and my partner is out of ideas too. The first thing happened about a, about a week and a half, or two weeks ago. It was around one or two in the morning, with a decent chunk of moon illuminating the area. I was only half paying attention to my surroundings, because I'd already written the night off as a bust, when all of a sudden, I became aware of a weird whirring slash flapping sound. I thought it originated from something behind me, but my partner said he heard it coming from away and to the front slash left of us. At any rate, it was loud, airborne and passed quickly over us and away. I'm very familiar with the sound drones make and this wasn't it. It also wasn't a helicopter, the sound was too small if that makes sense. And it wasn't a bird, it sounded too mechanical. It was flying very low, probably just above the tree line. We couldn't see anything. The second thing happened about a week ago. We weren't in the stand, but it was weird and out of the norm, so I'll mention it. We live on the same property that the stand is on. It was around 9 or 10 at night, when all of a sudden there was a distant boom like an explosion, which hit our home like a thud. If you've spent any time around heavy artillery or explosive, you know what I mean. It was strong enough that my sister-in-law, who lives down the road, called us asking what the hell just happened. It could have been a natural gas explosion, but the weird part is, is that my partner did some internet digging, and a local emergency management website had posted asking for any info on an unknown explosion back in 2016, during the same time of year. We still have no clue what it was. And then, lastly, tonight. We were out in the stand once again. It's gotten cold and we've had a ton of rain all day, so everything was damp and dripping. We went out at 10 and it was about 10.30. I was preoccupied with trying to keep my fingers and toes warm when suddenly I became aware of a weird murmuring. My partner heard it too, but he was hearing damage so I don't think he heard the full breadth of the tones. To me, it kind of sounded like muffled voices off in the distance, like several someones having a conversation too far off to make out the individual words. But the direction the sounds were coming from doesn't have any buildings or dwellings, it's just woods. And there were several different tones. My partner said it kind of sounded like a cow moaning, but not quite. There are cattle in the area, 
and we hear them vocalising all the time. This wasn't that. And there isn't any grazing land in the vicinity of the sound's origins. They carried on for maybe 30 seconds, slightly rose in a crescendo, and then died off and faded away completely. I want to stress how indistinct these sounds were. If I hadn't been listening intently, I don't know if I would have heard it. All of this, coupled, coupled with the general gut feeling I have whenever I'm out in the dark alone, has me wondering. I don't necessarily feel endangered, I just generally watched and noticed. I have very good instincts and I try to listen to them. I'd love to know what you all think. There may be rational explanations for all these phenomena. All I know is, I don't want to be another hunter with another creepy story. But I feel like I'm starting to see a bell curve emerge, lol. Thanks for reading. I moved away from my home state almost a year ago. Between then and now, I've gone back to visit once, and I stayed where my sister, Em, was staying at the time. I got involved with a friend, John, years prior. Em had been staying with him as per my recommendation. The rent was cheap, and she was allowed to do what she wanted. At this point in my life, I had just become religious. And I also th felt as though my spiritual senses had become more refined after a baptism. I led my life with logic. So naturally, I was not a believer of the paranormal before this. It started out small. Whenever I was home, I'd hear knocking on the wall that separated my room from my sister's. They started soft, but would get louder as my stay unfolded. One night, they were loud enough to make me think someone was knocking at the door all the way downstairs. When I went to answer, nobody was there. I usually chalked this up to ding-dong ditches or someone being impatient. I began hearing shuffling or thumping in her room as well. There was a cat that enjoyed getting into her room, so after plenty of these noises, I decided to block off the door with something heavy. It didn't latch shut. As I was home alone again going into the night, I heard more noises and got up to see if the cat somehow got into the room. The barricade I had placed was not moved, and the door was tightly shut. One night, as I lay to sleep, I heard another loud knock. This time, it was in a very common rhythm that I heard all over the place. The beat was often used as a form of communication or as an attention getter for most people. There's usually a string of them, then a pause, waiting for the last two beats from the recipient of the first ones. This would tell someone you're there in response. I thought it was the door, but nobody was there. I came back upstairs to hear a loud thud come from my sister's room again. Nothing was in there. Cat was asleep. One day, when John wasn't working, I came out of my room to speak to him. I couldn't find him anywhere, so I checked my sister's room and thought I saw his forearm wrapped around a giant teddy bear on her bed. The teddy bear blocked the rest of his body. His arms were pale with scars and veins, very easy to recognize for me. I decided to let him sleep. Later, I heard the door open and close. He had just come in from shopping. I asked him why he was sleeping on my sister's bed instead of the couch, and he gave me a strange look, assuring me he had never done that before. He had gone shopping before I woke up that morning and hadn't been home since. I went for a night walk, which I love, and later came back and hung out with John. He asked me if I knocked on the door to play a joke on him. He demonstrated the same beat that I had heard while I was alone, but I never told him about the knocking. Another day, he asked me why I stared at him through my sister's window when he was parked outside. He described me wearing a black bra and no top, but I didn't even pack a black bra with me. Any bras I did have were light in colour. Later, he told me of a figure hanging onto the side of a truck that was driving down the road next to the house. It was apparently adorned in black cloth, and he couldn't see any feet on it. It was hooded, and the cloth looked like silky see-through material. He said after the truck passed by a telephone pole, the figure had disappeared. After each occurrence in the home, we looked for intruders, but never found any. 
Going into that room alone gave me a strong sense of dread and threat at times, to the point where I'd lose focus and forget what I went into the room for. My sister was rarely ever there. The house was previously a drug house. Ever since, I've been experiencing things going missing. Putrid smells, cold gusts, noises, and even felt as though I was bitten on my stomach as I was trying to sleep. I feel as though someone is tr standing in my peripheral staring at me. I feel their eyes, but when I look, there's nobody there. Does anyone have advice, information, theories as to what's going on? I can't explain many of the things that went on, and I was bitten on the stomach last night. I'm getting uncomfortable. I recently moved a few minutes away from my old house in rural Illinois. My old house was situated on a farm with 40 acres of land. Me and my sister have had our fair share of creepy and maybe paranormal happenings, but nothing this bad. And I'm afraid that whatever that lived on our property there has followed us to our new house. Backstory. My sister takes one of our dogs to check on our houses in the paddock because they were making noise. She says she hears something behind her and turns around to see an eight foot plus unnaturally skinny thing with antlers. She had said she fell on the ground and was paralyzed with fear. As she was laying, the dog, who will cower at anything, goes into full attack mode and starts to go crazy. At that point, I run outside with my aunt and we see her on the ground. No ungodly being. I was very skeptical until two months later. I go to my friend's house who lives right down the road on Halloween for a sleepover. And he shows me two videos from his security camera. The first showed a pale arm hanging over their front porch. The second video showed a finger touching the lens of the camera and a long arm reaching up. Something to keep in mind is that the deck where the camera is situated is around 12 feet above ground. In the middle of all this, his parents see what we are doing and get super mad and scold him about how these videos were not to be shown to anyone. They then went into the other room and the rest of the sleepover went normal without anything of that nature happening again. But that is what kind of kickstarted the whole paranormal and cryptic craze. Present day, as of about two months ago, I had a dream where I was with my dad, sister and friends, going to an old amusement park of sorts. This place was indoors with the exception of a paintball arena outside and had a jungle gym, arcade, birthday rooms, etc. The place has been shut down for years and in the dream it looked way more dilapidated than what it looks like in real life. When we parked the car, my vision zoomed up to the roof and it had a deer with blood all over it. The deer appeared to be dead and lying there. We get closer to the building and my vision zooms up to the sign and now the deer is staring at me with a gigantic smile full of human teeth and saliva dripping down onto the pavement. At this point, I was a bit unnerved, but we still went inside. The inside of this place looked just how it did when I was a kid with everything in perfect condition. I turned my back on my group for maybe 10 seconds to look at the prizes they had. And when I turned back, the whole place turns into what it looked like on the outside. Everything is rotting and no lights, except for one. One single light is shining on my group. The people you thought were my friends and family were now gray and pale, black eyes with blood coming out of their mouth and pointing at me with a black expression. The deer comes behind them and they all, including the deer, start saying, let death erupt, you're going to die. You're going to die with your eyes wide open. It started as a whisper and upped in volume until they were all practically screaming. I woke up, but right beforehand, the deer said one thing that I still have imprinted in my brain. Remember me, and then said my name. I had the same dream last night and nothing changed except the deer. 
It had grown to around what I think is around double its old size. Tonight, I went out to lock up our chicken coop. I was walking back inside and heard, remember me, my name? And shortly after, come closer. I told you, remember me. The voice sounded like me, but had an odd and sinister undertone. It sounded like an impressionist who tried to impersonate me, but had smoked for 30 years. Very raspy and false. This leads me to right now. Nothing else has happened, and it all stopped the second I got inside. I've told nobody. I will not anybody. So this story is about my great, great grandpa, named Marty. He was on his way to his herd after being on a trip in town. He was with his trusty reindeer that is pulling his sleigh. The reindeer is really calm and isn't spooked easily, so he really likes to take him into town to trade and buy stuff. They were walking along a forest on their way to the tundra and his family. It's really dark, with only the moon that gives out a bit of light. He isn't bothered by that. He's walked through this path hundreds of times without any problems. He does a little yoik, yoinking his trusty reindeer. Then out of nowhere, the reindeer stops. Marte tries to make the reindeer move, but it doesn't even budge. The reindeer is looking at their left side, looking at a thicket. Marte decides to look in the same direction as the reindeer, but the darkness makes it so he doesn't see very well. Then suddenly, out of nowhere, a bone-freezing cry comes from the trees. The reindeer gets spooked and starts running. Marte is fast enough to jump on the sleigh before he gets left behind. The reindeer is sprinting away and isn't even thinking of stopping. Marte looks behind him and in horror, he sees a small shadow following them and shrieking. He can barely see it, but he does see it has a human shape. Then he whispers himself to himself, God damn it, it's an Aparis. The reindeer is running at 60 kilometers an hour and the shadow is right behind them. Marte thinks to himself what to do because if that thing manages to run three circles around him, he'll go insane. He yells back, child of the forest, if you let me calm down my reindeer, I can help you. It works, the shadow stops. The reindeer has calmed down enough. He jumps off the sleigh, takes the sleigh off the reindeer, and ties the animal to a tree. But he doesn't tie it properly so that the reindeer can break free if things go south. He pulls out a candle and lights it. He draws a cross on the snow and sits down. He then says, come out, I'll help you. Sure enough, behind a rock, a small child appears. Probably four years old, skin pale as snow, missing an eye and a foot. It only has a small leather dress on it. Marte then tells it that he's going to baptize it. He starts by drawing a cross on its forehead. Then he starts to pray. He does the Lord's Prayer, but he starts at the end and reads it backwards. He then gives the child a name, and since it's a girl, she gets the name Needle. The child now looks at Marte and whispers the words thank you to him. It then runs back into the woods. Marte takes the reindeer and escapes the place as fast as possible. He returns to his family, but decides not to tell anyone in case they become scared. But after that, the crying wasn't heard again. So a short explanation of the Eparas. Back in the old days, the Sami people had hard access of getting medical help since they lived so far away. So if a child was born with a disease or was injured, they couldn't afford to treat the child. They had limited resources, so taking care of a sick child was a risk to themselves. So they would have to leave the child to die in the forest. The child would then die and become an Eparas. It would then haunt the area, crying for its parents. The cry is said to freeze bones and make the bravest of people piss themselves. They're really fast and will try to run circles around you. If it manages to do three laps, you would become insane. Some are said a turn into a termegan, a type of Bruce bird, and the only difference is that it has red legs. 
there is a way to escape any paras. Speak calmly to it, just like with a child. Then you're going to baptize it. By reading the Lord's Prayer backwards from end to beginning and giving it a name. But do not give it a human or animal name. Common ones for boys are hammer, knife, axe, etc. And for girls, needle, gold, spoon. Then the child will leave and is never heard again after it has found peace. I was on my way to work, just as normal as any other day. Same time, same route, same music, same coffee. Almost made it there too. In all honesty, I don't remember what made me drive off the road and into a ditch, totaling my car. I don't remember the crash. I swear to this day I made it to the next stop sign and got behind a black Dodge Challenger and made the next right turn behind it. It must have been an out-of-body experience because my car and I were in a ditch 20 to 30 feet before that stop sign. Fast forward, I woke up in the hospital, disoriented and confused. I'd never been in a hospital bed staring at the ceiling before, so I guess I was asked the routine questions, do you know where you are? My smart ass always having something to say, it's not heaven, I probably wouldn't be going there. A hospital? Do you know why you're here? And for the love of all that's good, I couldn't remember one single bit of it. I legitimately thought I made it to that stop sign. Didn't even know I had a car accident. No, what happened? Is there anyone you'd like us to contact? I didn't remember that I was married, much less remember the name of my spouse. But it was at this moment when I looked up and saw at the foot of my bed, three large shadows. There was one officer at the window to my left. Two nurses on my right between the bed and the wall, and the doctor was at my hip to my left. I asked, why so many people? The doctor said the nurses had to be there, and the cop had to do a report. I pointed at the shadows at the foot of my bed, but they were gone now. The doc confirmed, there's nobody there. Still dazed and confused, the officer, now standing at my hip and the doctor at the foot of the bed, told me I was in a car accident. So I asked if there was anyone else injured. People in the other vehicle, walking pedestrians. God forgive me if I hit an innocent animal. Lord knows we have deer, fox and bunnies in the area. No, just you. It was just you. I'm a person with a good heart, so maybe it was the relief that I didn't hurt anyone else. I started to cry. The officer kindly wished me a speedy recovery and made his way out. I wiped my tears, opened my eyes... And like the worst jump scare in a 3D movie, there was an old man in my face repeatedly saying, help me. I froze up. I felt my heart skip a beat. Hair stood up on my arms, legs and neck. I sensed my blood pressure drop and the heart monitor made its noise. Trying to evaluate the situation as best I could, as quick as I could, I looked around. The nurses who were to my right were gone. I must have missed the moment they left. To my left was the old man in full body apparition. It wasn't just him. There were four phantoms asking me for help. Three male and one female. They all had clothing like the kind you would see in the Civil War history book era. The nurses rushed in because of the beeping machine attached to me and I passed out. When I woke up, there was a surgeon telling me the extent of my injuries which I don't feel are relevant for this writing, so I'll leave them out. I asked him to send up the hospital priest. He tried to press for information as to why I wanted the priest, but I simply told him I wanted someone to pray for me. Again, I passed out. The time lapses between passing out and waking up were never clear to me. When, when I woke up again, the priest was there with me. He stood to my right in plain clothes, asked, why I wanted him there. I asked him to close the door. After he did, I told him everything I saw. The shadow people, the old man, and the three with him asking for help. I asked the priest to pray for any lost souls, to bless the room I laid in, and to bless me with holy water. He told me he understood my concern and would pray for me, and come back to check on me. 
I spent another three weeks laying in that hospital bed, passing out and waking up. After making a full recovery, I've gone back to the hospital to visit the cathedral and thank the priest. I don't know if the prayers by the priest helped. I can only hope they did. In 2004, me and my family went to visit some family friends in the countryside of Italy. It was me, 11, male, my big brother, 15, and my parents. We get to their house and it's pretty isolated, at least a 10 minute walk to the closest neighbor. We were all struck by this very old beige and beautiful brick house. The house has two stories and divided in the middle with a wall. Two families shared this house. Originally, there hadn't been a wall dividing it. Our family friends lived on the right side of the house and the neighbors on the left. As it turns out, the neighbors were moving out just a day after we arrived. My parents had the idea that me and my brother could stay on the near empty left side of the house to make it less crowded on the right side. We agreed happily, but would later regret this decision. So when the neighbors finished moving and left, me and my brother were asked if we wanted to go check out the left side of the house since we will be staying there for a week. As we enter the front door, we notice that the hallway is just cobblestone, no tiles or floor. In front of us on the left is a staircase, and on the right, the hallway continues a bit, leading to a storage room. As we both climb the creaky stairs, we state that this place is weird and a little bit creepy. Cobblestone in the hallway and the old squeaky wooden stairs. Anyways, at the top of the stairs, you face left and see into the kitchen, and the bathroom is to your right. Walk into the kitchen and go left and there's a bedroom. This is where it gets bad. The neighbors had only left a few things behind, which was a queen sized bed in the bedroom, a cross hanging on the wall above it and a portrait of mother Mary on the opposite wall. Me and my brother lay down on the bed and discuss why they left these strange things and go on to say we feel a bit uncomfortable here, like we're being watched. We had been in the bedroom about 10 minutes when suddenly we heard a noise from the bathroom, like something fell on the floor. We lean over the foot of the bed to see through the kitchen into the bathroom. We saw nothing and laughed at how spooked we were. But as we were laughing, the light in the bathroom turns on with a distinct click and then off again. We stop hanging over the foot of the bed and sit so we can't see into the bathroom anymore, but we still hear the clicking. We looked at each other with a mild panic, saying with only our eyes, what the fuck? when my brother starts laughing hysterically. Now I was scared as hell. Why is he laughing? As I look at him, I'm getting even more scared at how long and crazy his laughter is. I noticed that his eyes looked scared while he's laughing. And then he said laughing, I'm scared, I can't stop. I don't know why I'm laughing. Everything had piled up. Old creepy house, the stuff left behind, feeling watched, the lights going on and off, and my brother's strange laughing episode and the overwhelming feeling of not being welcome. Simultaneously, we run like our lives depended on it, out of there and straight to our parents and hosts. They all just laughed at us and said we were just imagining it. My brother and I wholeheartedly refused to go back in there, and sure as hell wouldn't be staying there for a week. Our parents thought we were silly and said, no problem chickens, we'll stay there then. I remember clearly how my parents looked, after their first night in that side of the house, tired and pale. They both said that they had never felt anything like it. They had heard plenty of noises in the night, but the worst thing was the overwhelming feeling of being watched and unwelcome. They said it felt as if someone or something was hovering around the bed, hanging over them with rage. They eventually fell asleep, curled up as close as they could together. After they had told their story, our hosts said a little cautious well the neighbours had told us that their great-grandfather, who had built the house almost 200 years ago, was still living there as a ghost. My take is that because the family which had lived there for generations left and some foreigners immediately took over, we angered the ghost. Allegedly, this ghost had not bothered his family before, but they knew he was there and that sometimes strange things happened. Our family friends 
have now moved away as well. So, some background for my issue. I've lived in my current home for about two years. We bought the house and moved in at the beginning of the pandemic. After we moved in, the estranged husband of the owner told us that the owner had passed away in the house exactly a year before we bought it. Spooky part one. The owner's name was Donna Johnson. She had a husband who she had been separated with, but never legally divorced, and a son named Hunter. She was very social and loved holding parties at the house and was very athletic and loved to exercise. Donna died after drinking heavily and falling down a flight of four stairs. Spooky part two. Now comes for the coincidences. The landing of these stairs is maybe a foot from the doorway of my room and my room used to be Donna's exercise room. So it's needless to say that I've felt her around a lot. When I first moved into the house, I had Zoom for school, which meant I was sitting in my room for most of the day with the door closed. That meant, of course, that I was alone and no one else was in my room, but maybe 15 to 20 times a day, I would feel someone watching me from my doorway. I would turn to look and the door was still closed and of course, no one was there. As I stayed there longer, I would feel someone watching me from closer and closer until it felt like she was looking over my shoulder. Now I should clarify that her presence never felt malicious. She always felt like a lonely mother looking to take care of someone. At this point, I would talk to her in a lowered voice and just acknowledge her presence whenever I felt it, because her energy seemed to lighten when I did. I grew to like Donna's presence, and she would even come and stand by my bed while I went to sleep. She felt like a nice aunt or grandmother. However, she wasn't the only one I felt or saw. There was one night that I was getting ready for bed. The light was still on and I was watching Netflix in bed. My door opened just a crack and I expected one of my teenage siblings to walk in. But a little boy, maybe around six years old, wearing a Spider-Man t-shirt and black sneakers, walked in holding a kid's water bottle. He walked maybe three feet into my room and dissolved, starting with his feet going to his head. He was just gone. I looked back at my door and it was still ajar. I instinctively called this boy Anton. I don't know why, it just fit. The only other time I physically saw Anton was a time he walked into my room wearing and holding the same things. It was just like before, but arguably more frightening. He crawled up onto my bed while I was sitting at my desk and just swung his feet for a bit before dissolving again. Anton never felt dangerous, but his energy felt negative. I felt him around other times, but I would never feel Donna and Anton at the same time. The only other issue I had with Donna was a time when I woke up in the middle of the night. There was no reason for me to be awake. I felt fine, but I just couldn't sleep. So I did the usual, get up, get some water, go to the bathroom, all that jazz. But when I was walking to the kitchen to get some water, I was bombarded with energy. I felt Donna there, but there were so many entities that it was overwhelming. I could tell I wasn't welcome. There was one energy in particular which felt very, very, very malicious that I remembered clearly. I felt that spirit several times and it terrifies me. Donna's presence faded slightly after that. One day, there was a wildfire and we were forced to evacuate. As I was grabbing my stuff to leave, I felt Donna's presence super, super strong. I could feel her telling me that she had to go take care of her son. Once I came back to my house after the fire, I maybe felt her once or twice, but she really was gone. The only spirit I still feel in my house is the malicious one. The fuck does this mean? Since around 2014, I think, my brain doesn't process time well. 
I've had periodic experiences with something that I've been to calling the bathroom ghost. A vast number of these experiences have happened in or around the bathroom of places I lived or stayed at for some odd reason. The first encounter in what I think was 2014, I was at a friend's house where I often spent the night. I was in my sophomore or junior year of high school at the time. I always got a lot of strange feelings in that house. The air felt heavy and wrong in a way that I couldn't quite explain or articulate. And certain rooms I just couldn't be in because they would make me feel anxious for some reason. Anyway, one of these days I was staying over, I heard something strange that scared me half to death while I was in the bathroom. To the left of me was the door, to the right was the bathtub. On my right side, I heard a voice whisper, hey, clear as day, not far from my ear. It made me jump out of my skin and I recognized that it sounded exactly like my friend's voice. Now the speed with which I convinced myself it must have somehow just been the shower curtains shifting was honestly remarkable. But just as soon as I'd calmed myself down, it did it again. Hey, in that whispered tone, in my friend's voice. Needless to say, I got out of that room as fast as possible. Now I want to clarify that there was no way this could have actually been my friend. Reasons being that A, the voice came from the side of the room opposite the door, and there was no nearby room through which he could have spoken through the wall or something. Also, the voice wasn't muffled in any way. B, I could clearly hear my friend talking loudly to his mom in the living room, which was at least 30 feet from the bathroom door. Now, I only experienced this once in that house, but here's why I think that whatever this thing was, it's followed me. In my first apartment with my friends, there was one notable circumstance of something happening in the bathroom. Now, this may not have been the same thing. It wasn't a voice which mimicked one of my friends. This was at least three to four years after the first experience. But myself and my two roommates were all sitting in the living room watching movies when we suddenly heard an odd sound from the bathroom. The hairdryer had turned itself on. It had been plugged in, so maybe it was just a spooky coincidence. But there hadn't been any sort of power surge to have triggered it and we were all pretty spooked. There were a couple of other interesting brief experiences in that apartment, but those are even less potentially related, I think. So maybe those can be shared some other time. The most recent experience which truly makes me believe that this thing has followed me happened just last year. Not too long after moving into my current apartment. Once again, I was in the bathroom and I heard a voice come from the door. Clear as day, I heard my fiancé's voice say, Hello? Reasonably, I had assumed that they had came to the door to talk to me, which we do with some frequency, so I responded back, Hello? I didn't get any further response, so I started to get a bit nervous. My fiancé had been in the bed when I went to the bathroom, and the bedroom is just next door, but we have long since learned that we can't hear each other if one of us yells from the bed towards the bathroom. Hence why we sometimes stand outside the door to talk. I got out and, a bit nervous, asked if they had been trying to speak to me through the door. They were lying down where I left them when I came into the room and they very casually told me that no, they hadn't. Fully shaken now, I told them what I heard and they were a little amused like, ah, the bathroom ghost strikes again, which I did also find funny. They weren't making fun of me for being a little freaked out by any means. My fiancé is not the type of person who tries to scare other people by messing with them, so I know they weren't just playing a joke on me and acting like they had no idea what I meant. About a year and a half ago, I was sleeping in bed with my wife. I'm having a strange dream about a shadow figure chasing me saying, you need to let us in, you need to let us in. This voice is calling to me in a child's voice. I'm running from this thing and it's getting closer. You need to let us in. It gets to the point that this shadow is about five or so feet away in the middle of saying, 
you need to let us in. And my wife elbows me and wakes me up saying, baby, did you hear that? I'm just coming out of my sleep and she says, I heard kids talking. I asked her if it was our boys talking. She replies, no, it wasn't the kids. Even while she was telling me that she heard kids talking, I was already wondering in my mind if I was talking in a kid's voice while I slept. When she said no, it just reaffirmed to me in my head that I was dreaming and talking in a child's high-pitched voice. I played dumb and tell her that I don't know what it is and everything is all right. In my head though, I'm convinced that I'm talking in a child's voice. Really, I just wanted, didn't want to freak her out and tell her that I'm being chased by a shadow saying, you need to let us in, while simultaneously speaking in a high-pitched voice while I'm sleeping. The next day, I go to work and I'm telling people that I worked with what happened. I'm not giving the details of me being chased by a shadow, and I wasn't getting into details about what the shadow was saying. What I was telling them was that I was talking in my sleep and apparently I was talking in a kid's voice because I woke up my wife and she thought kids were talking in our room. I must have told two or three people about me talking in my sleep while making light of the situation. I'm completely certain at this point in time that it was me. Fast forward a year or so to roughly six to eight months ago. At this point in time, we've moved from our house in Colorado to a place in Texas. Once again, I'm asleep and I'm having a near identical dream. A shadow is chasing me saying, you have to say that we can come in. Once again, I'm running from this trado trying to escape while it's saying that's over and over. This time, the shadow was close. When I say close, I mean within arm's reach. As the shadow is reaching out to grab me and is inches from touching me, a high-pitched child's voice says, come in. As the shadow is inches from grabbing me and the words come in are hitting the second syllable, my wife elbows me, baby. I wake up and the first thought that pops in my head is that I'm talking in a kid's voice again. I wait for her to tell me what she heard, that, that she heard kid's voice again. She asks me, were you just standing over me on my side of the bed? I just saw a shadow, or maybe she said silhouette, staring down at me. I tell her, no baby, I was lying here asleep. Once again, I didn't say what I was dreaming about or detail what happened before. I don't wanna freak her out and say something like, hey, that's crazy. I was just dreaming about a shadow figure while you saw one in the room. Cool, huh? I downplayed the situation while comforting the wife, but in my head, I immediately thought back to the first dream and how it was the exact same dream that happened before. In both dreams, a shadow was chasing me. In both dreams, it was an identical high-pitched child's voice telling me to let us in. And the most scary thing of all is that in both dreams, Right at the climax, my wife has woken me up right as the shadow was about to catch me. After this most recent dream, it makes me wonder if it was actually me speaking in the child's voice the first time. I think back on how I made light of the situation and joked about it at work with co-workers. I went a few months without telling my wife about the dreams, but I finally told her. She remembers both instances and it really freaks her out. I've got to be honest that after the second incident, it has caused an immense amount of food for thought on my end. I don't necessarily feel scared from the dream, but the weird factor feels like a 10 out of 10. So for background, we live, rent, in an older house from the 1930s and we moved in October 2020. My husband was deployed until the end of November 2020, so he wasn't there at first. It's two stories with one bedroom, living, dining, kitchen, and bathroom upstairs, and a finished basement with a bedroom, bathroom, and storage room. Our daughter sleeps upstairs, and we sleep in the finished basements. I'm a huge skeptic, and I don't quite believe in ghosts. But I definitely believe in demons because of my religion. For this reason, I'm pretty freaked out by the paranormal. 
When I moved, my mom and dad helped me move in. They live pretty far, so they stayed a few weeks. My one day, my mom asked me why I was pacing the house all night. I told her I heard it too, and it must have been the pipes creaking. This is a regular occurrence in our house, and it really freaks my mom out. But I attribute it to wood floors and old pipes. My mom comes to visit in May, and we take a trip to see some family. While I'm gone, my husband tells me how terrifying it is to be there alone with the footsteps. While he's downstairs, he hears pounding on the door. He grabs a gun and runs out, but there's no one there. I'm under thirty seconds. It's almost impossible to get out of sight of our door between the busy road. And two large parking lots. Strange, but he dismissed it. We got a ring camera. A month later, there's pounding at our door again. A month later, there's pounding at our door again. Our blink camera registers absolutely nothing, or maybe the Wi-Fi wasn't doing well since my husband was gaming. We figured maybe it was the back door, and we mistook it for the side door. This was pretty hard to explain away, honestly. A few months go by with nothing. Then, while my husband is out hanging out with some friends, I decide to get in the shower. The shower is directly under the dining room. I hear the chairs scraping across the floor and assume our robot vacuum has started, and maybe my husband put it on a schedule. So I check our indoor camera and find the robot sitting in the living room. I go check. And see, two chairs have been moved. Thankfully, my husband is almost home, and he calms me down. He tells me the chairs might have been out of place before my shower, and maybe the sound was air in the pipes. No big deal. This is an old house after all. Then earlier, I was sitting in our recliner with my daughter, who has a crout. She's passed out in my lap. It's a heated, vibrant recliner. So it's on, and it's not exactly quiet. My husband went to Walmart to get some popsicles and shower steamers, so it's just me, the baby, and the dog. I see what I think is my husband creeping through the dining room, and I hear him messing with something on the table and maybe with the door. Then my husband texts me, "I'm checking out at Walmart now," so I'm panicking, but I don't want to wake my daughter. I still can't hear it moving around. I think maybe it's a mouse, but I know that's ridiculous. My dog lifts his head up and looks into the dining room. He perks his ears and stares for about thirty seconds, and then puts his head down. I felt better knowing he was aware and not afraid. My husband gets home and confirms there's no one in the house. Earlier that day, my husband and I got into an argument, and I took my rings off. Bad, I know. And told him if he isn't okay with just one kid, he needs to marry someone else. We're struggling to conceive, and it's been really hard on me knowing he's desperate for another kid, and I'm okay if it never happens. I hadn't put my rings back on, and they were still on the dining room table by the door, right where the rings were. We have two and a half weeks left until we can move. It can't come fast enough. I'm afraid to be alone here. I was living with my grandparents during high school. Well, one night I was with my buddies and had a single beer. I came home around twelve and went to bed. Usually, when I go to bed, I would put on a DVD just for the noise. At the time, I would just pop in Pirates of the Caribbean. Remember the scene where they're on the boat when Elizabeth Swann is eating with Barbosa? When the scene starts, there's a lot of clinking glass. Anyways, the paranormal part. I woke up to what I thought was glasses clinking, and I just thought it was the movie, but it had long ended. So I walked into the room next door. I was upstairs, and I saw this grey, foggy, blue bar with patrons drinking and stuff. They were dressed like Civil War soldiers. Well, one offered me a beer before I was to die at war. I freaked out and slept downstairs the rest of the night, or I tried. The next morning, my grandma woke me up to ask me why I was on the couch, and I explained it to her. 
She doesn't really react, just asks me to show her what I saw. So he went upstairs and I showed her where the bars were, tables, lights, etc. Well, it turns out her house used to be a hotel and bar that fucking Civil War soldiers were at, and I described the location of the bar in near perfect detail. It still gives me shivers, and I wonder what would happen if I accepted that drink. Here's another one I have. A buddy of mine, Jay, has always been into paranormal stuff. Always scoured the internet, back when it was cool, for any paranormal he could get his eyes on. Jay lived five-ish miles out of town in a rather big house. Apparently, it used to be smaller, but they added onto it at some point. So whenever I would hang out with Jay, and not smoke anything illegal, I would frequently crash into his sister's across the hall, since it was usually empty. Different story. Anyways, I always kind of got the heebie-jeebies. Like I wasn't alone in there, but I never thought too much about it, since I wasn't smoking illegal things. Also, for whatever reason, his sister had a boatload of those glow-in-the-dark sticks on her ceiling I wouldn't frequently get lost in. One day, I was there hanging out with his mom. She would cook us munchies, and they started talking about Herbert. I was like, who? So they explained he was some guy that used to live in the older house that they had added onto. Apparently, he died some sort of bloody death. It's involved in acts, I think. I'm not totally sure, but apparently where it happened was right outside Jay's sister room. That's also where the old house used to end. Jay then tells me he sets up cameras and mics and catches stuff on occasion, but nothing too crazy. He also knows I've had some weird experiences with the paranormal and said I'm something like a hypersensitive person or super sensitive. Anyways, he asked me if I would sleep in her room and before he could explain, I agreed. I also learned later, he planned to use me as bait. Flash forward to the next morning when we woke up. We end up watching the movie and it's pretty normal. You hear his mom walk around and eventually flip off light switches and go to bed, as well as his cats here and there. Around two-ish maybe? You hear those super loud stepping sounds up the stairs and steps by sister's room and then silence. Then maybe a little while later, it happens again. Then once again, like someone is stomping up the stairs to stare into the room, only to vanish. You never hear them leave. On the final time you hear the stomping all the way up, and then you can see when I get up to the bathroom between the rooms, you can hear an angry gasp or grunt, then some angry surrounding things, and then like someone was running away from me. And that was it really. I remember getting these weird pins and needles feeling just in my legs, really intensely. It was like a hot and cold shock at the same time. Anticlimactic, I suppose, but when I think about it, it still gives my legs the shivers. Before I tell my story, I'd like you to know that English is not my first language so I'm sorry for any grammatical mistakes. This happened back at the beginning of 2019. Me and my family had been living in a very old wooden house for about three years before this happened. It was a really big and old house that had floor made out of wood and really big windows with no curtains that gave us a view of the backyard that had no lighting system, so it was completely dark during night. Before my family, the house stayed empty for about five years, and the only people to ever live there before us and besides the original owner were a couple that only stayed there for some months. I had never been alone at night in that house, considering that my parents or at least my sister were always home with me during the night time. When we first moved there, I spent a year having the worst nightmares of my life and it was really traumatizing. One day, when my parents were traveling to visit my brother, who lives eight hours away, and would only come back the next day, my sister decided to go on a date with her boyfriend around 7 p.m., leaving me alone in the house. Even though I had always been kind of creeped out by that big old house, that for some reason still had incandescent lamps making it creepier at night, on that specific day, I wasn't really worried when she left me alone. Obviously, before she left, I checked to see if all the doors and windows were locked, and they were, 
So I wasn't really worried. And I lived in a very safe and good neighborhood. So I wasn't really paranoid about burglars or anything. When it was around 8 p.m. and I was watching some TV show in my sister's room, located at the end of the hallway on the first floor, I heard footsteps coming from the living room and at first, I just thought it was my dad because this person seemed to be wearing boots. But then I remembered that I was completely by myself and that the house was all locked. I hadn't heard any doors or windows open and after pausing the TV and knocking the TV on the living room was off, I kept hearing something walk around the living room with really loud and heavy footsteps. The steps seemed kind of random. The person seemed to just be walking in circles or something, but the steps became louder and closer and I realised they had entered the hallway and were about walking to my sister's bedroom. The door was on the far right of the room and the bed was in the far left on the opposing wall, so I couldn't see the hallway or anything besides the door. The footsteps were getting closer to the room and then suddenly stopped really close to the door, but not close enough for me to see it. After silence for a few seconds, the footsteps turned around and walked back to the living room, stopping somewhat in the middle of it. I waited some minutes and, not hearing those sounds anymore, I, in a dumb move, decided to check around the house to see if I'd find someone. I checked everywhere on the first floor, checked all the windows and doors and found nothing. The only place I didn't go to alone was the second floor, which the only way to get there was by walking in a really old metal spiral staircase. I called my sister and when she got there, we went to the second floor together and to the outside of the house and found nothing. The thing that sticked with me the most is that if this was a person, it would have been impossible for them to go up those metal stairs without making any noise, considering how loud their footsteps were. After this day, I never stayed alone at night there and we moved shortly after, not related to this. Nobody in my family believed me at the time and just called me crazy. I always had nightmares when living in that house, before and after what happened. Especially when I slept in my sister's bedroom. There are some other details that I didn't find necessary to put in here, but what I told is basically the most important part. I just wanted to tell someone about this, because nobody ever believed me. I'll preface this by saying I was very, very young at the time. I'm 20, male, trans dude, which sort of matters for context later. I think I would have been seven to nine and I was a big fan of ghost hunters. I had this cringy ass tap shirt I'd wear with pride after we went to a ghost store in St. Augustine. I live in Florida and my fam wanted to go on a little vacation to St. Augustine. I'm sure any paranormal lovers out there are familiar with the location. It's been featured on a few of those popular ghost shows quite a bit. We initially went to just eat seafood and see the lighthouse and stuff, but there were a bunch of nighttime the ghost tours advertised. Anyways, we went. At first it was a bit cheesy like all ghost tours were. They really hyped up the events of what happened. I can't remember the exact name of the location. I'm sure you could find it if you looked it up. But they were telling us about three little girls who would play with this mini rail in the back of the house. Basically, the train malfunctioned and the girls got trapped in the carriage and unfortunately drowned. We got past the touring part and they did this thing where they completely turned off the lights in the house and let you just sort of wander around and see if you could get any activity. I remember I was with this immediate feeling of dread. The house just felt very heavy. I chalk it up to me being younger than even a preteen and I got scared easily. Still, it's interesting to note. After the tour, my dad, mom and brother all decided they wanted to check out that park where the girls drowned without a bunch of other people there. I was super against it, freaked out and wanted to go home. I ended up just clinging to my dad the entire time. My brother and mom went off on their own and me and my dad sat on a little park picnic table. It was completely dark as it was a rather large area 
and the trees blocked most of the light pollution from streetlights, etc. My dad had gotten his phone out and began recording while I sat with him. He asked a few innocent questions like, is anyone there? Feel free to talk to us, etc. Just generic ghost hunter rhetoric he had seen on TV. Me and my dad weren't really having much happen. Still, the area just had a certain feel about it. We went to check on my mom, who was sweating and she heard whispering around her. My brother had caught this video on his old flip phone of an orb by a street lamp. I don't personally believe in orbs or find them interesting at all, but this stood out since it was much brighter than the lamp it was next to, and it floated into the sky before completely disappearing. Weird stuff. It was getting pretty late and I kept pestering them to leave. So we went back to the car and my dad listened back to his phone recording. He let out this sort of nervous chuckle and we all just looked at him and asked what, since my dad is the type of dude to not really be shaken by much. He said he picked up a voice on the phone. It was a little girl, basically whispering. The words train track were heard very clearly, followed by the voice just repeating train over and over again, very quietly. It was incredibly unnerving, especially after knowing what had happened in the area. At this point, I'm practically begging my family to drive us back to the hotel. They had all asked me if I was doing it, since at the time I was a little girl with a fairly high-pitched voice, considering my age and all. I absolutely don't remember saying that though, and also, why would I just say the word train repeatedly? After we left, I think we picked up a few other things, like just slight whispers, but it was hard to tell due to how shitty phone speakers were at the time. It was one of a few notable paranormal events I've had happen in my life though, and the voice recording in particular always stuck with me. It was on an old flip phone slash duke phone that I don't think we have anymore, but I'll definitely try to find it and post it here. So yeah, that's it. Just figured I'd share it here since it was always pretty interesting. So this happened sometime in the middle of 2017. I'm not sure as for other countries, but here in Brazil, all houses are gated for safety. And the only places where you can find houses with their front doors leading directly to the street are in closed condos. My friend James threw a small group hangout in his place. He lived in one of those condos with dozens of identical small houses. So it was maybe five or six of us clutched into a tight living room having pizza and watching some shit on the TV. We were all going to sleep over that night, and as it is for every group we hang out we have, everyone would possibly spend the night awake. It was maybe around 1am when we all decided to go for a late night walk around the condo. It's pretty safe, with tall walls and a good doorman, as all condos should be, so it's always nice to walk around there. We all went slowly down the street, passing through many houses identical to his, talking quietly so we don't wake up the neighbours. Eventually we stop by the empty children's playground and decide to climb the little wooden house. Kind of forgot the specific name for it now, but you guys know what I mean. Those small wooden house thingies with a ladder on one side and a slide on the other. There was enough space in it for all five or six of us to sit, talk, smoke and hang out. No one around, no annoying kids, just silence and peace for us to chill. Behind this playground, there was one of the condo's walls, and behind that wall, some woods with big trees looming over us. On the other side, the street, then the sidewalk and the many identical houses. Every two houses, there was a light pole, lighting everything up. We were all talking about random stuff, listening to music at a very low volume on someone's phone, when eventually we ended up getting into the paranormal subject. As our topics came and went on spirits, ghosts, spooky stuff, horror movies, etc. and so forth, we noticed James, our host, get quite tense. He wasn't necessarily into the conversation and was visibly getting serious and gloomy. All of a sudden, he said something along the lines of, yeah, we shouldn't be talking about those stuff so nonchalantly and deliberately. It kind of bothers them. All of us knew James was a medium, He'd mentioned a lot of times how he'd always see spirits and interact with entities in his childhood, 
but ended up blocking that away. However, still seeing some stuff every now and then. Even those of us who weren't spiritual or anything respected him and never dared to doubt a thing. Mostly because his grandma, who he still lived with and cared for, was highly spiritual and had many times confirmed to us that he was saying the truth. We all loved and knew her enough to know she wasn't bluffing or anything. She firmly believed it, he firmly believed it, and there was no reason we'd be dicks to doubt and question their beliefs. Therefore, when James said that, we all just nodded and changed the subject. A few minutes later, James was still a bit shook and went, It's getting a bit late and you're all kind of loud guys. We're going to get cold out here. Let's go back and drink some more. We all shrugged, agreed and hopped off the wooden house. Then, when we were all going up the street, James looked back apprehensively and said, So as I said, please avoid talking about that stuff in that way, out of nowhere. He's been standing near that light pole looking at us since y'all first touched that topic. Needless to say, we all got terrified shitless and bolted up the street. Later on, we tried to talk to him into elaborating further what had happened. He clarified that the male entity meant no harm and was purely looking at us as if curious. I remember questioning James why he saw it, if he blocked that off his mind. And he said he'd been trying to sort of reconnect with the other side in hopes of seeing his deceased mom again. We don't talk much about spirits since then. So, quick background. I had two gin, I believe all supernatural entities are gins, experiences to date. The first occasion I'll narrate at a later date, since that happened when I was quite young, and I put less of an emphasis on it, even though it was scarier. So the second experience occurred while I was in grade 10. This was in my native country, Bangladesh. I was about 13 or 14 at the time, and was preparing for my O-levels examinations coming up in a month. I was studying late that night while my brother passed out in my room. The door to my room was closed but unlocked. The acts even happened at midnight, which is not really that late by Bangladesh standards, as the city doesn't really quiet down till like 1 or 2 a.m. That night, while working through some study material, my door suddenly crept open. I was facing the door, so I stared at it for a bit, but didn't really make much about it. Once I stared back down at my book, the shit happens again, and the door opens up a bit more. Once again I stare, and then go back to studying. Then it happens again. Now the door's open to a point where the light from my room should go right outside and let me see why the door keeps opening. This time I stare at the opening, but to my surprise, it's pitch black outside. It almost felt like someone was blocking the light, and I felt this presence stare directly at me. Now after a long term stare battle, I reassure myself it's probably just the wind and go back to work. This time, a thin curved rusty metal rod comes through the door and bangs sideways between the door and the wall. I look at the thing and shout at it in a harsh tone. Right then, the metal rod goes back into the darkness and I hear faint footsteps going into the living room. This was a weird experience since there weren't any signs of a break-in. My parents were asleep and their room door was locked and no one else was inside the house. This is the narration of my other din experience, first in chronological order. It's weird that I don't really get that scared when I recollect what happened, even though this was much scarier than my other later experience. It was in Dhaka, Bangladesh. It was the early 2000s. I was about six years old at that point, and like most Bangladeshi kids at that time, slept in my parents' room. We were pretty well off, but most parents during that period would rather use the spare rooms for other purposes. It was a winter night, and I was suddenly woken up sometime in the middle of the night. This was before the time there were cell phones. I felt my legs were quite chilly, and so I tried to get the heavy comforter on my leg. 
I looked back and there was a face at the edge of the bed by my legs. No other body parts, just a face on the mattress and its bright red eyes and mouth glowing in the dark. I stared at it for a while in disbelief. It then opened its mouth and asked me to come with me, I'm your uncle, in Bengali. I didn't speak, so he repeated the same instructions again. This time, I looked the other way and basically punched my mom with my outstretched arms who was sleeping on the other bed near me. She woke up in a haste and I asked her to switch on the lights ASAP. When she had gotten up and switched the lights back on, the figure was gone. To date, I've still not forgotten that face on my bed. One thing to add is that my brother had a habit of sleepwalking during this time and there was this time when my dad had to physically drag him from the entrance of our house to our room as he kept on banging on that door to let him go outside. During the night this happened, he was sleeping beside me so perhaps this entity, Jin, tried its hand with me. Okay, so this happened in February 2021. I was 19 at the time and was in my last year of school and was shooting a music video for a final exam submission with my teammates. There were five of us in total. We were shooting in a suburban area where one of my friends lived. Two of the friends had gone back to my friend's house to get the camera as she had left it there to let it charge while she took us to the park. So I was sitting on a bench with one friend while the other was walking right in front of us, all of us just waiting for them to come back. It was around the time it got dark, but fairly bright. So I'm just sitting there in silence with my friend when I hear someone distantly shouting my name. I didn't live in the area, so I didn't think anything of it, figuring it was someone else with my name in the park being called out. This went on and on and got louder that I honestly got confused, like, what if it is me being called? So were my friends. I got up to see who it was and it was a middle-aged man wearing a white shirt calling out to me. When I looked at him, he knew who I was and motioned his hand towards me, you know, like beckoning me. I was extremely confused and there was obviously no way I was going to too near the man. But I did start walking towards him with my friend. He just shouted, pick up your phone your mom is calling you and I was like, what? Because my phone was in my pockets and I knew she wasn't calling me. Even then I checked. After saying that he got into his car and left, I hadn't even made it halfway through the distance between us. My friends thought it was someone I knew and when I told them I had no idea who the fuck that guy was, they were as freaked as I was. The things I don't understand are... How did he know my name? I don't live in that area and nobody else called me by my name since we were pretty much just focused on our task. The next thing is, why did he say what he said and spoke it in English? Where I'm from, English is not at all the conversational spoken language, especially weird from a middle-aged man. For me, what makes it even weirder is that I do speak English mainly because of my dad. But that's a whole other story that's not important. And the only thing that matters is that he spoke the language I mostly speak, in which nobody, never a stranger, would speak in this place at first conversations at all. And he referred to my mother as mom, which I guess is common, but again, that's what I specifically call her. It's not the usual term used here. I just don't get that if he was a weirdo, then why did he leave? Why did he beckon me towards him and then leave after telling me mom called? It was so weird. I had never seen the man before. My friends initially thought it was a relative of mine and were just as freaked as I was. Anyway, we had to shoot, so I didn't think much of it, so I just let it go to the back of my mind. I'm not scared by it, but I am perplexed by it. I can't seem to conclude whether it was paranormal or some super creep. I guess the only thing I can add, if it's worth mentioning, is that during that time I had become fairly agnostic and struggled with my faith in God a lot because I was studying advanced biology in school and I don't know, it just seemed to me that existence was just an evolutionary product. 
So in those one-on-one -on -one conversations, you know, you sometimes have with God, I asked God to send me a supernatural sign in front of a bunch of people because I didn't want to be spooked, lol. Because I find supernatural things pretty convincing evidence of a higher power. At the same time, I feel like I'm just making things up because I want it to be like that. I just can't explain it. And I wanted to share this if anybody has some explanations or anything at all to say. The story is about a guy named Antti. He had checked on his reindeer and was walking home. It was the midsummer day and the midnight sun was shining bright. He then notices a smoke in the distance. He decides to check it out in case it's someone who's lost. He appears at the smoke, but there's no one there. He walks closer and there isn't even a fire. He thinks about it and decides to sit down beside it. He sits completely still and doesn't move a muscle. After a bit, a thick fog comes towards him. He's surrounded by the fog, but decides not to move. He sits completely still. He's heard about the Ardna Havdi and remembers what his grandma has told about it. After a while of sitting in the fog, he hears something. It's a dog barking and the sound is moving towards him. He then sees a dog running towards him. But he recognizes the dog. It's his brother's dog that bit him when he was a child. The dog is springing towards him, but he doesn't move. The dog lunges. The dog is mere centimeters from biting Auntie's throat, but it stops. Auntie just says, shoo, go away. You don't scare me. The dog looks him in the eyes and runs back and disappears into the fog. Auntie keeps on sitting still. He's been sitting still when he sees a big figure in the fog. The figure is walking towards him, but he doesn't move. He then sees what it is. It's a giant moose. And he has always been afraid of moose after one was killed his uncle when they were getting a wood. He will always remember the sight. His uncle getting kicked in the chest before the moose stomps his head, killing him. The moose is only a meter away from him. It keeps on walking and disappears back into the fog. And he is still sitting still and he has been the whole night. He then hears something. It's a yoik, but it's not any kind of yoik. It's the same yoik his uncle made him when he was a child. The yoik is getting closer and closer. Then a human figure is standing in front of him. He doesn't recognize the person. It then moves closer and now he can see it. A wound on the chest and face. It's his uncle. They look at each other in silence. Then his uncle opens his mouth and says, you are the reason I'm dead. You should have been the one getting killed by the moose. You should be the one walking this endless tundra by yourself. Auntie doesn't answer. His uncle then pulls out a knife and is walking towards Auntie. He just closes his eyes and says, you are not real. He opens his eyes and sure enough, his uncle is gone. Auntie has been sitting the whole night. Then the fog disappears and the ground stops smoking. He then stands up and walks towards the spot. He starts to dig and sure enough, there's a small wooden chest there. He opens it and there are a bunch of gold and silver coins there. He picks up the chest as it's about to leave. Before he does that, he picks up a bunch of small stones and makes a cross on the ground. He does a prayer and walks home. So a short summary of the Ardna Havdi. No one knows who the grave belongs to, but many think it belongs to older or people of the underground. The basic premise is that on Midsummer's Day, if you spot a smoke in the distance and there's nothing there, then it's an Ardna Havdi. You are then supposed to sit there the whole night and wait. You are not allowed to move or else you will go insane or get killed. Then you will encounter three of your fears. They could be fears, childhood fears, or past trauma that haunts you. If you manage to sit the whole night without moving, you will be rewarded with a bunch of silver and gold.
For the last four or five years, I've been witnessing a shadowy figure in my parents' bedroom. I'd like to say a bit more about it, but there really isn't much I can say, other than it resembles a human, but has no features. The way it holds itself is very rigid, and overall it's massive. The only defining thing, which sounds way specific and rather strange, but the figure always appears to be wearing a 1950s bowler hat, but as if it was fused to it and part of it. It's safe to say that the first time I saw it, I freaked out. I ran straight to my mum and told her what I had seen. She's a big believer in anything paranormal, me, not so much, and told me that it's nothing to be scared of, and she didn't think it was anything malicious. After about the tenth time of seeing it, I got used to seeing this rather large, human-looking thing just sitting on my father's side of the bed, almost staring straight towards the door. I even started seeing it so much that I would greet it so I wasn't so afraid of it, but I never felt truly safe. About a year after the first time I saw the figure, I spoke to my sister about it, and she told me that she had been seeing the same thing from time to time, and I finally felt like someone actually believed me. That didn't mean that I would stop seeing the figure at all. Three years later and in 2020, I was still seeing the shadowy figure on my father's side of the bed, and I would pretty much shrug it off at this point, no longer afraid of it, and to be very honest, I almost completely forgot about it. Then around February in 2020, things started getting weird. I, for whatever reason, stopped seeing the figure altogether. Consciously, I didn't really care or think about it, but it was always in the back of my mind. Shortly after I stopped seeing him, I dealt with episodes of sleep paralysis. At first I thought nothing of it and thought it was where I was on a new medication and was rather stressed. But slowly, the sleep paralysis started to get weird and slightly terrifying. I would wake up and feel like I was being watched by something, but I could never determine where from. This carried on for weeks and each time it was the same thing. Until one day, I was laying down, feeling exhausted at this point. I knew what was going to happen when I fell asleep, and I didn't really care. So I laid down and prepared for the worst. Once again, I think I wake up, but this time I know something is wrong. I feel like I'm being held down to the mattress. When I feel like I'm being watched again, I try to frantically look around, but I can't, and that's when I notice it. This figure I've been seeing in my parents' room for years now, standing at my door, facing me. The only way I can explain how the thing looked was, I felt as if it had eyes, and they were directly staring into me. But there were no eyes visible. After what felt like hours of just being star stared at, this thing lunged through the door, and I woke up instantly. Since then, I haven't had another sleep paralysis episode. I thought that would be the end of everything, but I then started to see the figure again in my parents' room, but it was no longer sitting or looking out of the door. It was standing next to the side of the bed, which my mother now slept on, since they swapped sides. I've only seen it move closer to the door since. I get the feeling that this thing is no longer harmless, and I'm kind of lost on where to look for any sort of answer. I understand that people may not believe me, but I'm just looking for some sort of information that may help me figure out what the fuck is going on. This was in the late 2000s. I don't remember exactly the year, and it happened to my then wife and myself in our home. We lived in a nice quiet area our home was at the end of a road. In front of our house, there was obviously a road. On each side, we had neighbours whose homes were anywhere from 50 to 100 feet away. At the back of the house, it was woods for miles and miles. We used to love seeing all the wildlife that would enter our property at one time or another. But as I said, the biggest plus was how peaceful it was. It was wintertime in southern Massachusetts. A cloudy night, but no storms, and it was around 11.30. We 
We were in our living room, just watching some movies. I was relaxing on an easy chair, lazy boy style. My wife was sitting on a small couch, about six feet from me. There was no noise but for the movie going on, and all of a sudden there was a flash. Everything went all white for a tiny fraction of a second. Like all you could see was just the colour white. And when that was over, really quickly as you may imagine, something was very different. You see, the room was really a huge addition that the house's previous owners had done, I guess sometime in the 90s. They built that and a sizable deck outside it. The room was very large and had cathedral ceilings, which at its top must have easily reached 15 feet. This is a guess, I don't know for sure. It looked like it would go up forever. On the ceiling, there were a bunch of small lights and a skylight. Being nighttime, the skylight looked like a black square and the lights were providing great illumination. Courtesy of a dimmer, the lights were just right. Not too strong, not too weak. Well, right after the flash had gone, I looked up to the ceiling and what I saw froze me in place. Gone were the lights. Gone was the square skylight that was dark because it was night. Starting from about seven feet up from the floor, yes, had we stood up, we could have feasibly touched it. There was what looked like an inverted, as in upside down, pool of what looked like, for the lack of better words, milk. But it had a strange glow to itself. I watched, fascinated, as this white stuff rippled gently, with small waves, like it really was a thick liquid. My mind was horrified and curious at the same time because I couldn't think of any phenomenon that could have caused what I was seeing. A pool of glowing milk, lazily rippling, suspended above our heads. I immediately thought that I must have imagined that and to get confirmation that I wasn't having some medical emergency that made me see things. I looked at my wife who was on the couch. She was staring up at the same thing with her mouth open. All of a sudden, in another flash and in a blink of an eye, the pool of white stuff wasn't there any longer. It had lasted maybe 10 seconds and everything had gone back to normal. My wife turned to look at me, wild-eyed, and I said, did you just see that? And she said, yes. I asked her what she thought it was and she said she had no idea. I dabbled with the idea that this was some odd lightning thing but there wasn't any storm and I'm not aware of any natural phenomenon with these characteristics. Nothing was damaged. In that room, there was a good deal of electronics and what we saw looked damn solid. As I said, the consistency and look of regular milk. I remember thinking that the ripples and little waves I was seeing in that stuff was something that they hit your body. You'd have really felt them. It felt like whatever this was, it had substance. In any case, this really spooked me big time. This occurred in the middle of September in 2014, when I was 10 years old, just the beginning of fifth grade. The layout of where this happened. You would walk across the streets Take like a minute or two to walk into their driveway, go down the hill, and then take a right, and about 10 feet from the back of the house was the trampoline. Looking out from the trampoline with the house behind you, to the right was a white picket fence with houses to the right of that, and on the left was dense trees that slanted into the middle of the property about 200 yards. When I was a kid, I would go to my neighbor's house to go jump on their trampoline in the backyard. I jumped on it so much that I didn't have to ask any more because I was there four times a week, every week, for two years. One Saturday night with my friend and I, we'll call him Jay, decided to go jump on the trampoline at about 5.30 p.m. We crossed the street, walked across the road, went back to their hilly backyard and then got on it. Jay and I were jumping and doing tricks for a little bit, having fun, but felt uneasy and uncomfortable the whole time. Something just felt off. At about 5.45ish or 6pm, the sun was just starting to set. The sun was tapping the horizon, looking actually very pretty, but we were in the shadows of the house. 
Jay was having fun, but then mid jump, froze, face white as a ghost. He slowly and shakily pointed his finger towards the dense trees and said scaredly, What the hell is that? I'm already crapping myself, but slowly turned around. In the distance, about 150 yards away, in the shade of the trees was this probably around nine foot, super skinny bony thing that was white with a gray tinge to it. Its head was oval shaped like a football, had foot long finger claws, six to seven inch fangs in its mouth and bright white piercing eyes. It was half hidden behind a tree with its hand around it, just staring at us angrily. Jay and I just stared at it horrified and in disbelief for probably 10 seconds, but it felt like 10 minutes. It was like we were in a trance and couldn't move either out of fear or because of it. The thing looked like it was going to run at us. I could just feel it. I told Jay that we had to leave now or we would die. With all of my strength, I forced my little 10 year old body to move and Jay was ahead of me. We jumped off of the trampoline and started running, but Jay tripped and I wasn't gonna stop. As I was sprinting up the hill, I looked over my shoulder to see if Jay got up and I swear this thing was coming. So I ran even faster than I have ever run before back to my house. Jay entering right after me, scared to death. We never went back there. I lived there for another two years and never talked about it again. I told my parents about it, but they didn't believe me, which is understandable because who's gonna believe their 10 year old about something like that? I haven't told anyone this story except my girlfriend because I literally blocked it out of my head, even when all the haunting stuff happened, until I was reading Reddit and remembered it a day or two ago. Ever since that day when I'm alone in the dark, not at home, I get this overwhelming feeling of being watched. Also, it kind of looks like Slenderman and a skinwalker combined. Mr. Ballin on YouTube has a thumbnail that kind of looks like it, so if you look up the most believable alien encounter, the Skinwalker Ranch story on YouTube, and look at his thumbnail, imagine, that and Slenderman combined. Me, my two dogs, and now my fiance, drove a long way to get to our campsite in the Ozarks, Barkshed Recreational Area to be exact and it was west of Mountain View, Arkansas. We drove all day Wednesday, May 19th, to get to our campsite and set up by dark. We are completely alone at the campground as it's the middle of the week and the week before Memorial Day. And the camp we chose is a recreational area, which means no electric hookups, water or bathrooms and definitely no camp itself. As we're setting up, I hear this bass-like rhythmic noise that I'm only noticing in my subconscious. I don't know why, but I'm feeling like something is wrong. He and I kept setting up our otherwise perfect campsite until I noticed both of our dogs staring across the small mountain river and into the forest beyond it. Then I ask myself, haven't I been hearing the strange noise coming from that direction? And now they hear it too? I ask my boyfriend to stop rattling tent stakes and lend his ear to this noise. He hears it and the dogs are even more alerted to it since all the other noises, including literally all of the bugs, frogs and birds, not to mention our own unpacking noises and us chatting, have ceased. At first we wrote it off. It must be some new mountain noise that we just aren't accustomed to. We live in a relatively flat region of the country and my boyfriend says it could be the rocks settling. I didn't think that was quite right, but I'm not about to go investigate at dusk in bear country before camp is set up. As we're putting the final touches up, like rugs and some solar string lights for the nights to come, the noise gets louder. I would say they were almost more comprehensible. They weren't just a bassy noise anymore. The noise had bass, but it wasn't just bass. It almost articulated, like it was making nonsensical syllables, then pausing, then making more. 
It got closer and closer, like it was coming towards the edge of the small river opposite us. And I swear on everything I love, that it was talking some strange static. Like he was stopped by a car with busted speakers at a stoplight, and they were blaring gothic trap music. But just the talking part, and with the windows up. No music, just loud, muffled, mumbling and static. I had a hard time not telling my boyfriend that we should just go. We had both heard it as well as the dogs. But it quickly got farther and then went away, almost completely. So we decided to zip ourselves up in the tents and try to sleep. I woke up many times during that first night to my female dog trembling and growling. And when I strained and listened, I could hear that same muffled bass noise in the distance once again. I did manage to sleep a few hours that first night and morning thankfully came before the noise could get closer again. The following three nights were completely normal. They were filled with sounds of tree frogs, bullfrogs, whippoorwills, cicadas and owls, just like you would imagine from the mountains at night. On Friday night, we got a couple neighbours camping with us and even more on Saturday. My boyfriend also proposed in the middle of a shallow river on our big 18 mile hike, and of course I said yes. Other than that strange, ominous noise that accompanied us on our first night, it was the best trip I could have asked for. I'm just wondering if anyone here might have a rational answer. I don't know what's going on, and I feel like I'm going crazy. The first time this happened was a few years ago, when my dad subscribed to Netflix for the first time. So I started watching Cell, and I didn't know what it was based on a Stephen King book, because in Spanish, I'm Argentinian, the book is called Cell, and the movie is called El Pulso. I started watching it and thought, oh, it's like this movie I watched a few years ago. Maybe it's the remake. I googled it, and that movie never existed. Let me explain. I saw this Cell movie in 2017, and it was released in 2016. But when I was in high school, like in 2013 or 14, I remember vividly watching another Cell movie on YouTube that was quite old because they were using old phones, like the Motorola ones that came in different colors. And I even remember details. A young John Cusack was starring it, and I remember this because when I watched the 2016 version, I also thought that was really cool that he was doing the remake. The character that played Samuel L. Jackson was played by another white actor that looked like the old man that appears in the old Pet Cemetery movie. And I remember watching this old Cell movie on my aunt's computer in my grandparents' house. I remember that it started with Cusack driving in a hallway. When something happens and when he gets down of his car, he sees this two girls buying a hot dog. One had this green old Motorola full of stickers and the other girl had a similar cell phone, but in pink. And I remember this because I thought the phones were really cool and I wanted one. And then the one with the green cell phone attacked the other. A woman fell, everything was chaos and Cusack went back to his car. I also remember that at the end, he escapes with his son and the final scene is of them both walking down on train tracks. I remember it so clearly, but it's hard to explain. I remember that it was in parts and in bad quality. And I remember getting a little mad because I was liking the movie, but not the fact that it was segmented in parts and in poor quality. When I Googled this old Cell movie and I couldn't find it, and then I read on Wikipedia that the 2016 one was the first and only adaptation of this book, I felt like I was going crazy. I couldn't believe it. A few weeks or months later, while I was cleaning my bookcase, I found out that I had the book. I have a small Stephen King collection that my mum gave me as a gift, but I don't really like him as a writer, so I haven't read all the books. I started reading Cell and realized that the beginning was exactly like the old movie I watched and apparently didn't exist. So at first I thought that maybe I read the book and mistook it for a movie. But first, I didn't remember that I had it. And second, I'm autistic and my special interest is books. 
I remember every book I read, and I'm pretty sure I never read Cell while in high school. I didn't think much about it. This story became an anecdote, and everything was cool, until a similar thing happened to me a few days ago. A few months ago, I started following a band called Whiplash. I thought they were Chilean, and I'm pretty sure they were because I started following them before they debuted. And when they did, and I listened to their first songs, they had a Chilean accent. I also remember watching their TikToks, and in a trend where they present themselves, they put the Chilean flag. I also recommended them to some friends as this new Chilean band. And then, when I listened to their last song a few days ago, all of a sudden they're Mexican, and they've always been. I started feeling really sick. I was hurt, and I had to rest in my bed all day. I don't know what happened. It felt so surreal. A few years ago, in my first year of college, I was living in a dormitory apartment with three other students. The apartment had two bedrooms, two people each, a bathroom and a common room slash kitchen. When we finally got all settled, we began to notice strange things occurring. The first occurrence I remember is my roommate standing on the threshold of our bedroom, talking to me through our doorway. I was laying in my bunk facing the door. Suddenly, the door slammed shut between us. The bedroom doors locked from the inside, and I had to get off the bunk to open the door to let her inside. Both of us were shocked, but shrugged it off and ignored it as wind. Throughout the rest of the year, doors, particularly the bedroom doors, would slam shut on their own, or shut while we were in the bathroom slash kitchen slash class, locking us out of our rooms and forcing us to call maintenance to allow us into our own bedrooms. Within the month, I began to receive scratches, almost looked like a small cat scratches, on my arms and legs while I was sleeping. They always occurred in threes, like claw marks. Small stuff would move on its own or disappear, like pens, books, cooking utensils, etc. Over Christmas break, I had a handful of coins for laundry stolen, and my roommates swore they didn't touch it. On move out day, I found the coins in our bathroom closet behind the rolls of toilet paper. My roommates also installed speakers in our com common room to create a surround sound effect for our TV. The speakers would turn off and on on their own, and one night while we were cooking dinner, all three simultaneously emitted a high-pitched screeching noise, like microphone feedback, which sent us all running to our rooms terrified. The oven would also be found turned on, which one roommate continuously blamed me for, despite me knowing that I had turned it off when I was finished cooking. Around this time, I also began to feel extreme melancholy, almost depressed. I began to dread going back to the apartment after class, and when I was there, I would do nothing but sleep and eat once a day. When I left the apartment, I felt and acted completely normal, but once in the apartment, I would become extremely depressed, like a cloud was hanging over me. Towards the middle of the semester, one of the girls in the other bedrooms and I decided to switch rooms, and she took over my old bunk. She also began to wake up with scratches, and told me she began to feel very depressed in the apartment as well. So much so, that only two months after moving into my old bunk, she secretly moved in with her boyfriend in a separate dorm, despite the $500 fine from the college if she was found out. Both of us also experienced several occasions where we would feel like we had our hair tugged, being poked, or had our covers pulled on while we were laying in that bunk trying to sleep. The one and only time I was alone there, I felt like a trapped animal. I was huddled on my bunk for over an hour, experiencing an overwhelming instinctual need to hide and feeling fear like something was standing in the doorway, physically threatening me. My heart was hammering for over an hour, like my body and subconscious knew there was some danger there I couldn't see. The relief I felt when I finally left an hour later was unlike anything I had ever felt before. The reason I finally decided to post this is because a few days ago, nearly five years later, I've come to find out that a student who had previously lived in that room over a decade ago 
killed herself over the winter break and was discovered four days after her suicide. There's a young adult book series called Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark that as a child I would often check out from the public library. In one of those books, there's a particular story by Ray Bradbury called The Crowd, which is about a man who ends up in a car wreck. After being dragged out of the car, he finds himself surrounded by a thick crowd of silently watching people. They don't move. They don't speak. They just stand there staring down at him. When the paramedics arrive, the crowd vanishes. This was the only story in the series, but truly frightened me. Little did I know that, years later, that story had prepared me for my own real-life encounter with the crowd. I was living in Lacey, Washington when this happened. I was living in an apartment complex located just off on Ruddle Road. The road had a nasty curve not far away that was prone to car accidents, especially at night. Some serious, some fatal. One evening, while watching TV in the living room, the power suddenly flickered and then blinked out. Seconds later, I could hear the sound of a car crashing on the main road. In the silence that followed, I decided to put on my shoes and black trench coat and run up the road to see if anyone needed help. When I got to the road, I immediately looked to my left where the infamous curve was. There, in the small stand of trees that lined the road, was an overturned car. From what I could tell, the car had taken out a power pole on the other side of the road before careening into the small stand of trees, coming to rest on its hood. Next to the car, there was a small yet thick crowd of people standing in a circle. I jogged over, having to practically push my way through the crowd to find out what they were silently staring at. At the centre of this macabre crowd was a young woman. She was moaning and writhing around, eyes wide in terror and wet with tears as she kept scanning the crowd of silent observers, pleading for help with her gaze. I dashed in, knelt down by her side and grasped her left hand. The crowd took a collective step backwards. It was then I suddenly remembered the story from my childhood. My stomach sank. These were them, the people. It was real, it was all around us, and I felt like I was keeping this crowd from coming closer and doing who knows what. Look at me, just look at me, I said, trying to push down my own fear. To my relief, her eyes flicked to mine. I told her, you're going to be okay, you're going to be okay, before saying louder, has anyone called 911 yet? There was no response from the crowd. I quickly fished out my cell phone from my pocket and dialed it myself. One hand on the phone, the other still grasping the woman's hand. It was an agonizing few minutes before the paramedics arrived. I kept speaking to her both to keep us calm and to keep her from looking up at the people. When the paramedics finally arrived, the entire crowd abruptly vanished, exactly like in the story. I didn't let go of the woman's hand until I was literally shoulder to shoulder with the paramedics. At that point, I walked back to the sidewalk and looked around. There were only a few neighbours on the opposite side of the street watching what was going on. Other than the paramedics, the injured woman, and myself, the street was deserted. I shuddered, looked at the woman one more time, and then ran back home. To this day, I can't remember the ending of that scary story. I feel like I don't need to. I saw it with my own eyes. In April 2020, my partner and I sadly lost a son at 17 weeks gestation. I had an infection in my uterus, which was undetected, and after several days in hospital with some worrying symptoms, I went into premature labor. I was also septic, so after delivering our boy, I was very unwell. To say it was tragic and traumatic would be an understatement. We named him, and for the purposes of this post, we'll call him H. At the time, my older son, A, was two and a half years old. 
Too young to really understand anything except that mummy was sick in hospital. We haven't purposefully not told him about H. We will in time, but there was no reason to confuse him at such a young age. We don't talk a lot about H at home. H is not a name that is familiar to our older son for any reason. Around July this year, I was driving A to a Saturday morning activity when he said, Mummy, you should meet my friend H. He's here in the car with us, and pointed to the ceiling of the car. I didn't want to overreact or ask too much in case he felt the need to make things up, so I simply said, that's good, eh? Is he a nice friend? And he said yes. I told my partner, and we both had the same reaction. Weird coincidence, but also, kids have imaginary friends often. Not a big deal. Next day, A told my partner that H is here when they were playing in our lounge room. My partner asked, oh, okay, where is he now? And A pointed in the air to the corner of the room, above where we kept H's ashes on top of our bookshelf, and then said, he's like an astronaut, he can float in space. A few days later, when my partner took A off to childcare, I gave A a kiss and hug, as I always do at the front door. A then turned to his left, and enthusiastically said, Bye H, I'm off to school, before running out the door. By now, my partner and I are just looking at each other in amazement. Over the next few weeks, this happened several more times. Sometimes A told us that H is asleep, so would stay in the car if we arrived at our destination. A also told me that H was in hospital, not an astronaut anymore. This time freaked me out a little as, of course, the only time we could hold H was in hospital. Our only memories of him physically were in that setting. But mostly, these visitations felt special and a bit magical. The final time H visited, that we know of, occurred in the car again. Just A and I. He told me, H is here with us, mummy. And curiosity got the better of me. I asked, A... Is H a man or a little boy like you? And he said to me, with a tone like I really should know this already, No, mummy, H is just a little baby. Sometimes I can hold him. And he cradled his arms like he was holding a small baby. That was absolutely an oh shit, but also a wow moment. I was raised agnostic atheist, so it's all a bit overwhelming to ponder on too much. But we have decided it was H just letting us know he's okay and with us still, somehow. A few weeks later, I found out I was pregnant again. I like to think H was here with us through the early weeks, and is still with us still, always a special part of our family. I do believe young children can see things we can't explain. I'm so glad A had this chance, though we most likely won't remember it. I'm currently a 50-year-old male living in Greenville, South Carolina, and my first paranormal experience occurred back when I was in middle school. I had an uncle named Eddie who bought and restored historic houses, essentially a high-end flipper before we all knew what the hell that was. He purchased a house that was in the historic area of Earl Street here in Greenville. I don't remember the exact street, but it was definitely in that area. And he invited my grandfather over to look at some of the work he was doing. My papa was a carpenter and I routinely tagged along just to get to spend time with him and watch him work. We got there and got the grand tour and were told that an elderly woman had lived there and was heating her upstairs bedroom with a kerosene heater of some sort. The fumes from the heater suffocated her and she ended up dead and wasn't found for a good while. My uncle bought the house at an estate auction because the family was unwilling to deal with the aftermath of that, and he set about working to get it in shape to resell. After Uncle Eddie gave us the tour and talked about what he was wanting done, he asked if we were hungry and offered to run and grab some burgers for us while Papa figured out what he'd need in order to do the work necessary. We gave him our order and Uncle Eddie took off for the food, so it was just Papa and myself left in the house. Nothing really spooky happened right off, And from what I remember, there were no vibes to the place. 
So Papa did what he needed to do while Uncle Eddie was gone. And then we popped a squat on the stairs and started killing time until the food arrived. Around five minutes after we settled on the stairs, we both started hearing what sounded like footsteps at the top of the stairs, walking back and forth along the hall. Then we heard what sounded like a door open and close. Figuring someone else had to be there, we went upstairs and to our surprise, found no one else there. We were 100% alone in the house. Rattled, we sat back down on the stairs and waited to see if we heard it again. And it didn't take long before we definitely heard the sound of someone walking around upstairs. There was no denying it was footsteps on the second floor. Then we heard the stairs creaking as if someone was coming down the steps. Only we were sitting on them looking straight up the staircase. And there was absolutely no one there. The footsteps continued down the stairs very slowly, and both of us were too stunned to even move. I remember feeling like I couldn't move at all, but I think that was due to fear and not whatever was going on around us. I don't feel like anything was making me stay where I was. I was just too freaked to process anything other than hearing this invisible person slowly coming down the stairs. The footsteps walked past us, even making the step we were sitting on creak as it went by. Then it walked into the foyer of the house and ceased entirely. At this point, we both decided we weren't really feeling this ghost house shit and left to go sit in Papa's truck until Eddie returned. Well, of course, we told Eddie about what happened and were surprised when he said that he'd heard noises and footsteps in the house too, but it wasn't going to stop him from finishing up the work and selling the house. That's someone else's problem, he laughed and then asked my papa if he was able to do what he needed done inside. Papa politely declined, and after some nervous laughter, we left. Eddie's wife ended up falling in love with the house, and he renovated it for her and they lived there until his death about 15 years ago. So I guess whatever that ended up actually being, his problem after all. So from the ages of 11 to 16, I went to the summer camp deep in the mountains of my home state. Every summer was the same boring and bland bit of my last summer, something that to this day shocks me to my core. That summer, our usual camp spot was caught on fire, so the camp decided to find a different area to hold the summer camp. This was our first camp experience not being in cabins, but in actual six person tents. Since I was 16, I was camp counsellor for Tent D. So one other teenager my age was in charge of four of the kids who were from the ages of 11 to 14. Me and the other camp counsellor, a girl who at the time was my camp girlfriend, decided to play a prank on the younger kids and tell them scary stories. After a few hours of telling them one of the camp, chaperones came up and told us a scary story of his own about how way back in the days of groups of settlers coming from the east on the way to California, got stuck in a blizzard, and how once they ran out of food, they slowly began to eat the weak. Over time, they grew to like the taste of human flesh, ultimately becoming something twisted, a Wendigo. But ever since that night, I don't know what to believe. After the chaperone was done, he told us it was time to go to bed. So me and the other counsellor got the kids ready for sleep before we went to sleep ourselves. We were outside the tent cleaning up the trash when my girlfriend noticed something moving in the tree line. I told her she was full of shit and to hurry so we can go to sleep. Once inside the tent, I closed it and zipped it up behind us when I too thought I saw something dart across in the same area my girl claimed she saw before. Thinking nothing of it, I laid on my cot and drifted off to sleep. But before I could, I awoke to this blood chilling howl. It was the mix between a human scream with some kind of howling. Before I could open the tent to investigate, I heard two shots from a gun before whatever it was ran off. When I opened the tent, the camp chaperone was standing there facing the tree line where me and my girl saw the shadow moving, holding a shotgun with a look on his face that was of absolute fear. He turned to me and said to go back in my tent and not come out. I listened 
and went back in and told everyone to stay put. We heard that howling again and the chaperone fired two more shots. Then we heard scratching on the bark, one more howl and then what sounded like a human cry of pain before whatever it was, was done for good. After what felt like hours, we heard the chaperone say it was safe to come out. But before we could, we heard one more shot. Then his voice said, don't listen to that. It wasn't me. Then we heard one last shot, then silence once more. One of the other chaperones opened the tent and asked if we were okay. We told her we were okay, just shaken up. She then asked if we knew where the first chaperone was. We shrugged our shoulders and she told us to try and get some rest. Next morning, we were told to pack up and were leaving due to a possible bear attack and the chaperone from the last night was missing. To this day, nobody has ever recovered. Just a bloody shotgun that was empty. But I think otherwise, that was now a bear. That was something far more evil. Far more hungry, far more human, or as human as possible. But what do you guys think? I posted not too long ago about moving out of a nightmare apartment. We had a house built on the opposite side of town and land. There was nothing but old farmland. I thought I'd done everything right. Even had a rabbi, I was raised Jewish, come and bless the house. It's been about six months since we moved in, but it seems like everywhere we go, something keeps happening. I'll highlight the few of the ones that really stick out. This one, I'm really not sure what it even is, but I've seen it three times now. It started one night when I first saw this gold light fill the hallway outside my bedroom. I tried to write it off as a trick of the eye or maybe a passing car. A few weeks later, I was sitting in the living room and all of a sudden, the bright golden, almost sparkler-like ball of pure golden light flying. It was flying around my daughter's room and then disappeared down the hallway. The last time I saw it, it was of the exact same appearance, still flying around my daughter's room, but this time being followed or chased by a pitch black ball. It looked like it was trying to flee from whatever was chasing it. So I kept this to myself because I didn't want to startle my wife since it's a new house. But one day, she was telling me about how one morning she was taking the kids to school. In front of the car was a ball of light that looked the same as I described floating down the road. The next strange occurrence only happened once but still startled me. I had some weird feeling one night and woke up to see a girl with long dark hair in a white looking nightgown standing next to my bed staring at my wife. It moved toward my wife and I blinked. It was gone. I'm a very light sleeper and any noise in my house will wake me up. On this particular night I was woken up by what I thought was my daughter screaming. I thought maybe she was having a nightmare so I got up from my bed only to see something that still bothers me to this day. Standing in my laundry room was a man in a grey suit. The top of his head was above the doorpost and he had the most disturbing grin. It was almost a comical looking smile that went up his face. As soon as I saw him, he began to dissipate, almost as if he was in water and faded away. As he was fading away, I had an intrusive thought enter my head. This idea or thought entered my mind, telling me I was not meant to see him. It wasn't for me. Even now, I feel as if someone is watching us just lurking in the shadows. The next morning, I told my wife about what happened. To my surprise, she responded, you finally saw him too. She begins to tell me how she keeps seeing the same grinning man. She tells me that she's seen him in the neighbor's yard along the tree line just standing there watching. When she checked the side mirror to double check what she saw, the mirror was blacked out, almost like a void. It's happened about six times now in different places. She also gets these intrusive thoughts, but each time it's the same. I was waiting for you, I am watching. The more I try to think about it and try to remember the details, I get a migraine. 
There are other small things that happen, but are not really noteworthy. Every so often, I'll see what looks like a shadow peeking around the corner or moving quickly around the room. I just wish I knew why these things keep happening. It began with small things, like frequent wall knocking, footsteps walking around my bedroom, not coming up from my friend's apartment above me. I hear this stuff a lot, so that's not really a concern. Yeah, it's a little creepy, but it doesn't bother me. Not nearly as much as what else I'll list. This one time, I was with my friend sitting in my room, and my mom left 15 minutes prior for an appointment. My friend and I were chilling on the bed, and we heard three loud knocks on my bedroom door. And she asked if it was my mom, and I was like, yeah, and I told her to come in. But she didn't answer, because my mom wasn't actually there. I had gone to open the door in case she didn't hear me, but there was nobody there. Another time, I had another friend over, and I went to get us some water from the kitchen, and I heard her saying something. So I said, one second. I was like, one room over. So I wasn't more than 15 feet away. And I came back and asked her what she had said. And she looked at me and said, I didn't say anything. But it was so clearly her voice. She's not the type to pull pranks. She's a teacher and we're really close. And she knows I get super freaked out. So she wouldn't do anything like that to freak me out. I was on FaceTime with my friend one time. She's from Norway. I had my laptop on the desk facing my bedroom door. I left the room to get something from the kitchen and ended up having a conversation with my parents for four or five minutes. I came back and she said that my door was swinging open and closed. I have this jewellery box from when I was a kid. You know, the ones with the ballerina or fairy and it plays a little, little classical sort of tune. She said she had heard that music while the door was swinging open and closed. I was sufficiently creeped out. I've had other instances where I'll be on FaceTime and one of my friends will hear or see something while I'm in another room or not paying attention. Another time, I was laying on my bed and I felt as if something had slammed onto my bed from underneath. The whole thing shook. Most of the time, it's just knocks and footsteps inside the room I'm in. Things will move around. Pretty basic. Maybe a month or two ago, I was sitting in my mom's bed watching a show. Both my parents were in the kitchen and I saw a tall black shadow figure pass through the hallway into my bedroom. I was so freaked out, but I was sure it wasn't going to harm me. Now one of my friends can see, hear and communicate with spirits, etc. And my ex-girlfriend, who I just recently broke up with, is someone who can sense and feel when there is something present. I was walking with the two of them to the front hallway and when we passed by the living room, they looked at each other and said, you saw that? They said, yeah, but I didn't see it. They told me it wasn't a harmful spirit, just a man who probably used to live here. Mind you, whenever something happens, my dog notices it too and her ears perk up and she'll be looking in the direction of the noise or whatever is moving. Now, by far the creepiest thing that's happened to me was a month ago, maybe a little more. I was taking a video of myself for TikTok and I felt my hair get tugged. I didn't think anything of it until I rewatched the video and I saw a lock of my hair get pulled away from my head. So this was at a crazy phase in my life. So I'm going to tell it to the best of my ability. And I will be changing names to protect the identities of those who were involved. I was living with my roommates, Phil and Lauren, while I was dating my fiance at the time. We were having random conversations about random topics until Lauren started to talk about her trip to New Orleans and her visit to the old French quarters. She said that she stopped by a couple of gift shops and other little places where they sell souvenirs and things of that nature. Anyway, she mentioned to us how she saw a Victor doll from the Corpse Bride movie, 
and she was such a huge fan of Tim Burton that she needed to have it. But unfortunately, she didn't have enough money to buy it. So she took it upon herself to just take it. We all found it funny at first. It was something she would do, and at the time, we were just stupid kids getting out of high school. It was funny, up until she mentioned she stole the doll from a voodoo store in the French quarters. When the word voodoo was thrown in the air, some of the roommates that lived with us at the time found it even funnier, and the rest felt uneasy about the whole matter, because she was mentioning how she would wake up with scratches and hear weird noises in the middle of the night. We let her know that what she did wasn't a good idea to begin with, and that she should find a way to properly discard the doll, but she insisted on keeping it. A couple of days go by, and she shows us some more scratches that she got in the middle of the night, and how she'd liked something was in the room, but she couldn't see it when she opened her eyes. A couple more days go by, and at the same thing happens, then she tells us that the doll moved from the spot she always had it. We were confused and looking at each other puzzled and asked, you know where the doll went? And she answered with confusion, the doll was under my bed. We grabbed the doll and put it in the garage on top of a box where nobody would move it. I don't know why or how that would have been a good idea, but we stuck with it. I came back into the garage to smoke with Phil and we didn't see the doll on the box where it was left. We looked on the ground next to the box and there was the doll. It was almost like it was staring at us, mocking us. I was a little skeptical about it until we put it back and we all went to bed one night. And when we wake up, she comes back out holding the doll with the look of fear on her face telling us that the doll made its way back in the room. I know she wasn't lying because nobody ever goes in her room when she sleeps, especially since Lauren and Phil were dating and he would work overnights and she would stay up all night talking with him and watching movies. With that being said, she went to bed shortly after Phil came back and when they woke up at 6 p.m., when everyone knew they hadn't stepped into their room, the doll ended up in some different spot of the apartment we lived in. The longer she had this doll, the worse things got. Our smoke detectors went off for no reason. Lights would be turning off and on for no reason. We would hear scratching on the walls in the bathrooms. We would occasionally smell sulfur in the air. And if that wasn't weird enough, Phil and Lauren's door would never stay open. It would always close by itself. We knew something was in that apartment, and we're all glad we're out. Unfortunately, Phil and Lauren split a couple years later and kept the doll, and he went to live his life. But wherever they are, I hope they're okay. And Lauren got rid of that godforsaken doll. In honor of Halloween, I thought I'd finally type up this story from Halloween 2015 and share it here. It's long. I promise it all connects. Halloween that year was on a Saturday night. Last minute, I decided to attend a friend's board game theme party. I drew a Ouija board and an old white t-shirt with a sharpie. It turned out great and had a nice time at the party. The next day, Sunday, November 1st, I had a typical hungo Sunday. I left the costume on the floor in a pile of laundry that I was too lazy to pick up. I'm in bed that night with my dog and her eyes start swelling up out of nowhere. Like it was huge and she couldn't see. Her whole face was swelling. I panic and rush out to take her to the emergency vet. I go to get her out of the car at the vet, except when I do, all of the swelling is gone and she's completely fine. Being young and poor at the time, I decided to skip the emergency vet and went back home since my dog seemed completely normal. We get back in bed and a couple of minutes later my dog's face starts doing the same thing, just swelling up out of nowhere. I rush back to the emergency vet and this time, even though the swelling disappeared again, I decided to admit her to the vet to get her checked out. They run tests and give fluids and check for insect bites, but nothing showed up, she was completely fine. We go back home. It's late. I pass out and so does my dog. No more face swelling. Cut to 3.30 in the morning. I wake up and my dog is sitting on the edge of the bed, staring at the wall where my closet is and doing a low growl. 
I look in the direction of the closet and the door is open. And inside the closet, I see this dark black slash grey misty thing, furiously clawing at my clothes on the hanger and making them swing back and forth. Terrified, I couldn't find my voice to scream, so I just lifted my hands in the air and slammed them down on the comforter to scare it away. It turned and looked at me. It didn't really have a face though, just like a hooded black hole. And then it vanished through the back wall of the closet. I didn't know how to process it. I thought I was maybe seeing shit. So I just sat motionless, wrapped as tightly as possible in my comforter until it was lights out. I burned the Ouija costume the next day and smudged with some sage just to be safe. That apartment was in a building built in the early 1900s and I saw lots of ghosts after that. Every six months or so, I would wake up, always between three to four in the morning and see a figure in my room. All of the other ones I saw were more neutral in terms of their energy. They were more white and misty and had faces and weren't dark and faceless like the first one. I would ask them, please leave me alone and they would disappear, pretty harmless. I still don't quite know if what I saw was real or just my mind playing tricks on me late at night. The one part that makes me think it was real was my dog's face swelling. I FaceTimed my mom that night. She saw my dog's face and told me to go to the vet, so I didn't imagine that. But was that the demon attacking my dog, or just a coincidence? I'm a rational person, but I swear that Ouija person costume opened up some sort of portal in the bedroom. It started when I was at my grandmother's house, getting it ready for sale slash for her to move. She had a deck overlooking her dock right on the river. Lovely view and place. I'm taking a sick break from cleaning on the deck overlooking the water. All of a sudden, I catch movement in the chair next to me and look over to see the typical Japanese onro spirit. She looked soaking wet, milk white skin, scraggly black hair covering her face and what seemed like a torn up black negligee skirt combo for clothes. I stare as long as I can, but when I blink, she's gone. I go in to tell my girl we're done for the day and we go home. This was a dark time in both our lives. Addicted to heroin and just self-destructing on each other. Well, shit got weirder once we got home and got high. It definitely wasn't the drugs making me see this shit, since it was an isolated incident in my addiction. Sometime later, we were in the bedroom, sitting on the bed, when she ran out of the room to get something from another room. I finally look away from my computer to acknowledge her, and who's sitting on the edge of my bed looking at me? I assume. Couldn't see, though, her hair. My friend from Grandma's porch. I was never able to see her feet either time, which struck out to me, because I judge most people, apparition or not, by their footwear. And even though we were within arm's reach, each time sitting diagonal from one another, as soon as I blinked, she disappeared. Once again, not wanting to freak the missus out, I decided to go cook dinner and try to push these experiences down to that take to the grave section of memories. So I got the George Foreman going, salad and bread is already plated, and just finishing up some sides, when I see my girl walk from the front room of our place down the hall towards our bedroom. What caught my eye is when I saw her, she looked over her shoulder giving me the fuck me eyes and started to take her shirt off as she got out of my line of sight. I quickly follow her to see her from behind, topless, and about to take her shorts off when she enters the room and out of my line of sight. Once I got into the room five seconds later, it was totally empty. At this point I scream out, Jessica, where the fuck are you? Were you just stripping for me in the hallway? And she yells back from the hallway bathroom she's been taking a shit for the last 10 minutes. And what the fuck am I talking about? I barge in the bathroom and unload everything I saw that day leading up to the doppelganger. She's thoroughly spooked and pissed a ghost is trying to seduce me. Some needed levity since she said I was white as a sheet. Later that week she went to rehab without me because I had court problems and we broke up. 
My grandfather sold my trailer out from underneath me and kept the money. My step-grandpa died and I moved into the aforementioned grandma's house. Could never make heads or tails of the Onryo on doppelganger. Never felt evil or any maliciousness. Can't help but think she was a warning me about my now ex. And I got to learn the overwhelming amount of paranormal shit that goes on when you live on the water. A lot of stuff just passing by. Only one malicious entity, but that's a fucked up story for another time. And most of my friends had an experience while I lived there. But that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. My husband and our children have lived in the same home for almost four years now. The home was originally built in 1906. At the time this story takes place, we were remodeling our kitchen and bathroom. About two years ago, my little brother came to visit for a couple of weeks around Christmas. He was sleeping in the living room, which is probably 50 feet from our bedroom. The second night he was there, around 3.30 in the morning, I wake up to him shaking me and standing on my side of the bed with a mountain dew and a bottle of water. He scared the holy hell out of me. Freaked out, I asked him what in the actual funk was he doing. He said, what do you mean? He asked me to bring these to you. Confused, I said, wait, what? No, I didn't. He said, yes, you did. You yelled across the house for me to bring these to you. I was a little confused, but thought maybe I was yelling in my sleep and dropped it. The next day, I yelled out to him from my room while folding laundry. I yelled for him multiple times and he never came in. So I went to the living room and was like, really, dude? I've been calling you for five minutes. And he said he couldn't hear me, which really made me question the night before. A couple nights later, around the same time, I woke up to screaming. I jump out of bed and start running towards the screaming. As I get out of our room into the hallway, my little brother is standing outside my door, crying and hyperventilating. I start panicking like, what's going on? And he tells me that he woke up to get something to drink, walked back to the living room, and when he laid back down on the couch, I was standing at the foot of the couch just staring at him. He said, dude, what are you doing? And the figure that looked like me didn't answer. So he said my name three more times and asked what I was doing again. And it still didn't answer. But instead threw her head forward and looked at him. And then turned to the right and ran into the den. He said the figure was wearing the same clothes I was wearing. But her face was horrible and distorted. He was terrified and told me he didn't want to stay in our house anymore. So he went to my mom's and stayed there the rest of the time he was there. Now, nothing has ever happened to me in my house. My kids said some things have happened to them, but I just chalked it up to kids being kids. Until the other night, I was home alone and decided to take a bath. I get out of the bath and get dressed. And as I go to grab the doorknob to leave, I looked back into the mirror. And on the left side of my face was a woman's face completely torn up, like cuts everywhere. She had grey hair and was wearing a robe with a nightgown underneath. I was so shocked I couldn't move. I went to turn to run out of the bathroom, but nothing. I couldn't move, and all of a sudden in my left ear, I hear a whisper in a woman's voice say, you're the only one that understands. I finally could move and ran out of the bathroom and called my husband. I'm still kind of freaked out by it. And if I have to go into the bathroom, I leave the door open. Nothing has happened since. And I'm really hoping nothing else does happen because that was scary. I have noticed it's any time we're remodeling or changing anything in the house that something paranormal happens. The day before this happened to me in the bathroom, we finished putting new hardwood in the hallway. I remember as a little girl, always being in tune with the paranormal. Seeing my grandfather and his mom, who I never met, was a common occurrence as a child as they died in the family home. As of today, the home is a hundred years old. My great-grandfather built it with money he earned from owning a gambling den and pool hall. It was a humble home. In that time, 
four people died in that home from old age and sickness, alongside countless pets. However, this is the horrible aura of seething hatred that resides in the home. Ever since I was young, the house instilled a sense of grave fear, and I could always feel a horrible presence. Many house guests over the years would also complain about feeling something evil nearby. My mom, brother and myself would see a haunting black shadow figure with piercing red eyes. However, it wasn't truly human in appearance. It had a long, featureless face, long, gnarly fingers, and a tall body that would contort. You could always feel him watching you, even when he did not manifest. He would call your name in the day and at night, distinct male voice, hence why I call it a he. When he would manifest, you would see him either on the ground crouching and cocking his head at you, his hands pry open doors, and yes, they would open enough for him to peer at you with those eyes, and he'd cling to the walls like Spider-Man and stare at you while slowly making his way towards you. He would back away and look confused if you spoke to him or asked for help. I believe he caused physical harm to myself and others. My dad and my ex-husband would feel someone sitting on them and strangling them at night. Once, I woke up with scratches on my face after seeing him in my bed. He traumatized me for years since I always had insomnia. My mom for years was convinced someone sent a demon on her, but it never followed her or us when we moved. He can't leave the house. I live next door now in another home my family built. You can feel and occasionally see him stare at you from the windows when you're outside the home, especially in the evenings around 3am. You don't feel his presence in the sense of dread until you enter the threshold. My husband feels it every time he goes to visit and has seen the being the one time he slept over almost six years ago. We were talking about him last night and my husband mentioned in detail that I used to see and hear his behavior. He, of course, had to insult the creature when he was creeping towards us by calling him an ugly bastard, but he's seen worse. That apparently confused him and left him alone after that. Over the decades, the house has been blessed and Quanderos have been called to help, but he remains watching, instilling fear and calling you. We don't know what he is or how to get rid of it. I feel like something ties him to our him. My gut tells me that he was murdered long ago and tries to instill the same fear he felt when dying. Any help or advice? My brothers live there now. I want to be able to visit them with my daughter after she's born and not feel this hatred. Let me start by saying that I'm a huge skeptic and can almost always find an explanation for supposed paranormal encounters. I don't believe in ghosts and I'm pretty good at using logic and reason to debunk most stuff, but I can't explain this one. I've been trying to for years and I just can't. Now, let's go back about 10 years, give or take. I was living in a house in a small town whose previous inhabitants all died of old age or natural causes. We rented the house and the landlord was the eldest son of the previous inhabitants. I would hear footsteps in the attic pretty regularly and see orbs in the dining room often, but none of that is very substantial and is easily explained away. Orbs could easily just be dust in the sunlight and footsteps are easily explained because we had two large dogs and two cats who had full roam of the house. That's not why I'm here though. The reason I'm telling you this tonight is to tell you about the time that I was laying in bed one night and felt something I still can't make sense of. I was still wide awake, watching TV and scrolling whatever social media platform I was using at the time. So this experience wasn't a dream or anything like that. My bed sat in the corner of the room with the headboard and one side against the wall. It was a small single so it wasn't very big at all. I'm six foot two inches tall and took up most of the bed. I was laying on my side facing the TV with my back towards the wall 
and the time was around 2am on a warm summer night. As I'm laying there relaxing, I felt the mattress compress behind me, as if someone or something had sat down. I felt something touch my shoulder as well. I can only describe it as feeling like a hand gently placed on my shoulder. When I turned around to see what it could be, there was nothing behind me except for the wall, but I was able to see exactly where the mattress had compressed. I was able to see the indent in the mattress, as if there was something with substantial weight sitting there, but there was nothing. A shiver ran down my spine and I could feel a cold spot in the area where the thing was sitting. Only a second or two later, I felt the hand leave my shoulder and watched as the mattress decompressed. Whatever it was, had left. I quickly got out of bed, grabbed my blanket and pillow and went downstairs to sleep on the couch. I didn't even turn the TV off. I stayed up all night thinking about this experience and try to make sense of it. Ten years later, I'm still unable to make sense of it. That was the first and only time that I've ever experienced anything like this. As a skeptic, I don't want to believe that it was paranormal. I want to think that it was something explainable, but I simply can't explain it. I still think about it regularly, and it just doesn't make sense. I want to know what you think. I want to know if you've ever had a similar experience or if there is a possible explanation that I may be overlooking. Did something visit me that night or is there a more reasonable explanation that I just haven't thought of? What do you think? I live in a historic mining town. I think my house was built in the 70s, but I'm pretty sure there was another much older home in the same spot before this manufactured home was delivered here. It's a small lot and there are areas of the yard where grass grows funny, like there's another foundation buried. Anyway, I have a couple things that have happened since moving here about five years ago. When I was digging a garden, I found half of a gun buried, like split in half, looked very old and rotted. Turned it into the police, never heard back about it. I have a friend that is in tune with spirits and paranormal things. She's not very comfortable with my basement at all and says whatever it is that's down there just isn't a very nice entity. Once, I was up in the middle of the night in my living room had a strange feeling that the front door was going to open for some reason. Then I see my cat very slowly slinking towards the front door. Lo and behold, the door very slowly creeped open. Jumped up, locked and dead bolted it. Never happened again. One day, I was up at about 3am for whatever reason. Smoke detector in the basement started sounding. I didn't smell any fire, so I felt the basement door didn't feel heat, so I opened the door. Didn't see anything, so I turned the lights on and went down to check it out. Nothing. Checked out the smoke detector, pulled it off of the ceiling, and it was full of water. What the fuck? Checked my boiler system and water pipes. Not one sign of a leak. Had to replace that smoke detector from the mysterious water damage. A few years later, the same exact occurrence. Started sounding in the basement, went and checked it out again. Nothing except a beeping smoke detector. No water this time though. I was playing around with one of those talk to spirits apps. Didn't think it was real. One day, my cat started acting funny, so I pulled the app out. It was pretty late at night again. I asked if anyone was here a couple times. Didn't get a response. But all of a sudden... The smoke detector in the hallway, which was near me, started doing the low battery beep, like it just chose that exact moment for the battery to die. Got a little frustrated with these battery operated smoke detectors and installed a commercial system with intelligent smoke detectors. One day I was working from home and the keypad in the living room started beeping. Went to check it out, the keypad says trouble in system basement smoke. 
As soon as I read it, the keypad stopped beeping and it went back to normal. The system is monitored with a resistor, so for whatever reason, there was a drop in resistance in the wiring that goes to the basement smoke detector, which is mounted in the same spot. I have a theory that an old mining home may have rested in this spot where the new home was placed, and that it may have tragically burned down with someone inside. It would explain the weirdness of the smoke alarm at least. So I, male, 30, haven't had a paranormal experience of any kind until this past weekend. I was staying in the guest room at my father's house, which has quilts from each of my ancestors hanging on the walls. My father's house is new, brand new in fact. They moved in this April after the house burned down on Christmas Eve of 2019. They'd only been living in the house a couple of months before the exterior fireplace connected to the house lit the roof on fire. The house is enormous. The room I'm staying in shares the wall with a bathroom on the west and a room with a full bar to the north. That room connects with the living room slash kitchen to the north, which is huge. I'd say the distance between the guest bedroom and the living room is about as long as a bus, so they're a bit of a distance away. I'm sitting in bed, passively playing Animal Crossing just after midnight, maybe 12.30, when I hear my dad talking on the phone, he's absolutely a workaholic. So for a second, I didn't think much of it. But he retired a few months ago and doesn't stay up late at all anymore. The conversation sounded pretty tense and I couldn't quite hear all that was being discussed. But my dad sounded very matter of fact. From what little I picked up, he was aggressively trying to explain his reasoning for disliking some guy. I got closer to the door to hear better, not wanting to open it and disturb him, but the sound didn't get any louder. I decided to open the door and when I did, the voice disappeared. I like white noise to sleep, but my dad hates it, so he keeps his house dead quiet. I walked into the living room, trying to hear whatever might be going on, but it remained silent. I shook it off and decided to use the bathroom right before bed. I sat down on the toilet, phone in hand, and proceeded to drop the kids off at the pool. Then I heard my sister's voice, closer than my father's voice was, and clearer as well. My sister is very much into the paranormal, and is very much convinced that paranormal things are happening to her. She certainly has treated a Ouija board as a toy for many years, and always desired to have a ghostly encounter. So I'm not sure if she provoked something or not. I remain skeptical, but I'm re-evaluating those feelings now. She recently had a baby and was staying the night at my dad's because the baby was sick. I still couldn't phrase what was being said, but I could tell she was telling a story. The only clear thing I heard was, he is killed and he will kill again. And that was more than enough for me to pinch it off, wash my hands and run to bed as fast as I could. I put in headphones and stayed up for another hour and a half watching Animaniacs until I was tired enough to sleep. When I turned off the phone and took out my headphones, I could hear my dad's voice again. It sounded like it came from the bed I was in and it said, hey bud, just like my dad does. Only there was nobody there. I think I encountered a mimic, though I'm not entirely sure. I'm curious what you think and how I can best avoid pissing it off, or preferably, ever hearing from it again. I grew up in a very historically rich area of my estate. My town was founded in the mid 17th century and was occupied by the British during the Revolutionary War. I had a friend in elementary school who had lived in a very old home on the corner neighborhood off of our town's main street. It was a large two floor colonial home with a beautiful interior, plenty of rooms and spaces. It was used as a headquarters of sorts for a British officer, a general if I recall correctly, but isn't registered as any kind of historical site as far as I'm aware. At the date of this incident, I had been going over his house maybe around a year or so. 
I had been told it was haunted and shown their basements, which was a small old wooden door that opened up to what I would call a dark cave. The basement sloped downward as if it had been dug by hand and lined with field stone. On the wall remained old iron chains and hooks, which the parents claimed were used to chain up British prisoners, not slaves to my knowledge. One night, I recall I couldn't sleep well, as was typical for me to sleep over as a kid. I remember being a little afraid and on edge that night. I know my friend was asleep, so I tucked myself under his bunk bed, mostly covered with a view of the door to my left and window straight ahead. I flipped on my grey brick Nintendo DS and loaded up Pokemon Diamond, volume off so as not to wake anyone up. Somewhere around 4am, I heard shuffling coming from the other end of the upstairs where the bedrooms were, coming from down the hall where the parents' master bedroom was. I dismissed it, as his father was a barely 6 foot 4, 300 pound guy, but the pacing didn't stop, it carried on, which startled me. What the hell would his father be doing this for at 4am? It carried on for no more than a couple of minutes. Down the hall, back up, back down, then silence. The steps stopped around the bedroom door to my friend's room. My heart was racing and I put down my DS and lowered the blanket that had sat over me to look and see. I saw the old glass and brass doorknob to his bedroom turn and the door opened. I looked all over the frame. I didn't see a thing. I didn't hear anyone, see anyone, nothing. It stayed open for a few seconds and then began to close. What terrified me was the knob to the door had begun to turn as the door closed, as to not cause the tick when the door would shut. In my position, I could see both ends of the door and there was no hand on the knob as it turned. The steps returned, pacing down the hall, rhythmically, and disappeared at the stairs. I don't remember much else, other than taking my skateboard and going to Dunkin' Donuts maybe three hours later. I couldn't wait to get out of the house, but my friend wasn't going to wake up for me, lol. When I had mentioned it to him, I simply remember him saying something along the lines of, I told you it was haunted. I wish I had something to say about the basements, but for good reason, I stayed away. I do remember that it was one of the last times I spent the night there. That was that. It was by far the most interesting experience to date that I have memories of. I'm an American Civil War reenactor. I was attending an event deep in North Carolina cotton country at the beginning of November, where we set up camp in the original fort that was on site. One of the things reenactors do to add some authenticity to events is to send out four to five guys on what's called picket duty. It's basically a safety watch that stands guard outside of camp at night. I wasn't too terribly tired that night, so I volunteered to be one of the four sentries to go and stand watch that night. Now, before we go to our respective posts, we all determine a call sign, so that way, should anyone come up to us, they can call out the call sign, make their presence known, and other camp. Our call sign for that night was O Virginia. Fast forward about two hours or so, it's now approximately 1.30 or 2am. I was posted along a stretch of trenches leading up to the main ford, about 25 yards outside of camp. I was leaning against a tree, letting my mind wander, when I saw movement coming from a section of wood line. A figure emerged and began slowly making his way towards me. I snapped to the position of port arms and said to the figure, halt and make your presence known. The figure stopped only for a breath before saying, I am friendly. The figure came up to me and he revealed himself to be a middle-aged man in confederate garb with sergeant stripes on the sleeves of his dirty jacket. I distinctly remember a strong sense of pipe tobacco coming from him. He made a brief bit of small talk with me, asking how my post was going, did I kill any Billy Yanks, so on and so forth. As he finished his conversation and began to turn, he looked back and said, got enough rounds in your box, 
referring to my leather cartridge box that held my blank reenactor rounds for my muskets. I only had a few days left for the next day's event, so I said if he was offering, I could definitely use a few more. He dug around in his pockets for a second and produced three cartridges and placed them in my hand. Immediately, I knew they were live rounds. I felt the weight of the lead bullets in my hands. This is a serious no-no, as you are not allowed by any means whatsoever to bring live ammunition or bullets to a reenactment event. I stared at the cartridges in my hands for a moment, and when I looked back up to say that I could not accept these, the soldier was gone. All that was left was the smell of sweet pipe tobacco. I pocketed the rounds, finished my guard shift, and in the morning I put the three live rounds in my truck. I still have them now. I made a point of looking for that sergeant the following day, but to no avail. To this point, I'm unsure of the circumstances. Could it have been a fellow reenactor playing a joke? Someone trying to cause issues? Or maybe, potentially, a sergeant from a time long ago since past was keeping an eye out for a fellow soldier late at night. Whoever you are, sergeant, you stuck with me. Let's not meet under these circumstances again. I grew up in a small town in Massachusetts. Furthermore, my dad lived in the oldest house in the town, which was around 150 years old when I was in high school, and I stayed there overnight once a week. I shared a room with my half-brother, who rarely slept there. My bed was against a wall that was connected to the upstairs hallway where all the bedrooms were. There were a few weird things about the house, but the weirdest parts were in my room. Above the fireplace, again, a really old house so there were fireplaces in most rooms. We found that the wood boards were loose and easily came out. There was a small compartment where we found some old knickknacks, but nothing too crazy. The other odd thing was that it was a metal door knocker that you'd see on the front door houses hanging on the door. I never thought anything of these when I chose the room to stay in, but it should have been a red flag. With the house being so old, my family would joke about the house being hoarded, like anybody would. You'd get the usual creepy sounds that an old house would have, but there was something off about my room. With my bed against the wall to the hallway, I could hear people walking up and down the hall. It wasn't a weird thing until I noticed that almost every night there would be footsteps pacing up and down the hall. I would bring it up to my family, asking who was awake and things of that nature, but nobody ever said it was them. I tried a few times to get up and open the door to see, to see who was walking, and there would never be anyone there. If that wasn't enough, when I finally decided I was just imagining these noises, I started to hear someone using the knocker on my door. I'd respond with a hello or who's there, but never got a response. Again, I thought it was someone messing with me, but when I brought it up, everyone thought I was just being crazy. After it happened four or five times, I finally decided to get up and look who it was. When I opened the door, there was nobody there and I didn't hear any footsteps of people running away. This is when I decided something was really going on in the house. A couple of weeks later, I woke up in the middle of the night. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary until I rolled over, eyes still closed, to face the other bed in the room. There seemed to be a light on in the room which didn't make sense, so I opened my eyes. What I saw sent chills down my spine. There was an older man sitting on the corner of the bed closest to me in what looked like a sailor's outfit. He had a weird green tint to him and he was looking right at me. Being a school knight, I decided to just turn back the other way, close my eyes, and forget I ever saw it. I fell back asleep to the thought running through my head, you didn't see anything, you didn't see anything. The next morning, I told my family about what happened. They were obviously skeptical, but it did give more credence to my other mentions of noises I'd hear throughout the night. To this day, I don't know what I saw, but my dad moved out of the house shortly after. It still seems weird that I was the only one to experience something like this in the house, but I do know 
I believe in ghosts. As a disclosure, I'm skeptical of ghosts now as a grown adult, but I've recently started becoming more interested in the supernatural again. And I remember experiencing things in St. Augustine as a child that still make me feel a little uneasy to this day. My friends insisted they'd truly seen spirits for themselves with their own two eyes. But perhaps the oddest part of all was that even professional adults working at this school as teachers, public safety officers, dormitory supervisors, etc., also said they'd had experiences on the campus, like seeing doors slamming out of nowhere. In general, we were never told by the adults that ghosts aren't real, ever. Instead, we were told that there was no reason to be afraid and not to let such stories or sightings bother us. My first year at the school, I lived in a dormitory for girls in grades six, seven and eight, which was supposed to be very haunted. I occasionally felt as if someone was watching me when no one was around and often felt cold currents of air at random during hot, sweaty months, during the dead of night in a room with no air conditioning. The latter was probably just external airflow, making its way inside via cracks or gaps in the walls. But my roommate and I were still terrified at the time. I still remember that more than once, I'd end up not sleeping at all and relating my fears at breakfast the next morning with the staff working the night shifts. I was told to never go to the bathroom on the first floor during the night. This wasn't an issue because I only lived on the second floor, but there was a famous sighting of a ghost of a person with a broken neck and my friends claimed that they'd seen the apparition as well. Once, during an unrehearsed fire drill one evening, a few girls told the dorm supervisors they'd just spotted someone in one of the windows and they were too terrified to go back inside. I know they weren't deliberately trying to find an excuse to not go back indoors because some of them had only towels on from being caught in the shower when the fire drill first started. When the supervisors did a head count, no one was missing. Despite this, the supervisors looked worried, even as they told everyone to go back inside. There were constantly strange smells around the school that we couldn't place and rumors of deaths on campus such as a blind girl who died from horrific burns in the shower long ago, or a woman who was murdered by her mother. Some of these stories were even told by the adults who worked on the campus. So, truthfully, while I may be skeptical now, I've had enough experiences and heard or seen enough from others to still feel that there's a window of possibility for there being more to reality than can be understood on a mortal level. I think if I hadn't ever lived in a place like St. Augustine, I'd be a lot more closed off to the possibility of such. And if I had lived there longer, I only attended school there for a total of three years, perhaps I'd have eventually seen something that would have made me be a believer for good. A little backstory about the spare room. When I first bought my home last year, there was a family of around 13 people living in it, six of which were adults, three small bedrooms and one sketchy annex in the garage. A year later, and the neighborhood is still telling me stories about how awful these people were as neighbors. The annex room was initially shoddy framing and drywall work, presumably installed by that family. The walls were painted a weird green colour and the rug was a wrinkly stained mess. It became apparent that someone had been peeing in all four corners of the room. I figured it might just be pets, but there was a mirror that had please help me written on it in makeup and the room locked from outside. The day we got our keys, I got called to respond to the Seattle riots with my National Guard unit and was gone for about a month. During that time, My wife and the in-laws began renovating the home to make it livable. I felt guilty being unable to help. My wife got together with my mom to convert that scary extra room into a man cave slash jam room with all my music equipment and memorabilia. 
It came out really nice, but I haven't found much time to use it in the past year. A couple of months ago, I built a gaming PC and decided to set it up in that room. Now that I've been going in there almost daily, things have started to feel a little strange around the house. I get the sensation someone is standing directly behind me, once or twice a day in the room. Our TV set on fire in the living room a few weeks ago. Our water main burst last weekend, causing us to dig our yard up over the course of three days. And my garage light keeps turning on and off. I can hear the light switch. This morning I got out of the shower to find that my wife had already left for work. I'm coming down the hall and I hear it clearly say, hey babe, from the spare room at the side of the house. I replied, you're still here? To which I got silence. I looked out the front window and sure enough, her truck was gone. That's when I heard it again, babe, come here. I grabbed my things and nope to work, lol. Anyway, when I was pulling out of the driveway, I could hear what sounded like a girl screaming from outside, followed by a bang. I stopped before backing into the street thinking, was that my phone? I waited for a second before continuing on my way, thinking it might be the school across the street. I got about 50 feet down the road before I heard it again. This time it was faint, but sounded like it was coming from in the car. I paused at the stop sign and rolled down the windows to see if it would happen again, as it had sounded identical to the first one. Nothing. I roll up my windows and continue on my way to find that it happened several more times, almost like a recording. Same scream and bang over and over for another mile or so. Anyway, I'm weirded out for the day. Might sage later and bang some pans together, I don't know. I had this experience while working in 2013. I'm a photographer slash videographer and had landed a gig shooting behind the scenes photos of an upcoming theater production. The photos would be used as promotional materials for the premiere, which was coming up in a week. So I basically had to shoot the rehearsal, just the director, actors and myself on the largest stage in town. It was very cool to see all of the seats empty the director puffing away cigarettes and swearing loudly in a place where you usually see the patrons dressed up and having a cultural experience. The play was all set in a beachside house that was built in the middle of the stage. There were several moments in the play in which all of the lights in the beach house were turned off, plunging everything into darkness, only leaving the emergency exit signs alight, pulling you out of the theater experience and reminding you that it's all a play after all. So every time this happened, I put my camera down and listened to the dialogue in the darkness. The third time this happened, the flick of the lights, the darkness, I again put my camera down and patiently started to wait for my next shot opportunity. As I stood there, I started seeing something greyish being illuminated by the emergency exit sign. All of the actors and the director were to the right of me, there wasn't supposed to be anyone to my left, but I decided to turn and say hi to whoever was with me, so we could exchange silent greetings so as not to disturb the performance of the actors. So I turned. What I saw has never left my mind to this day, and has made me rethink my sceptic outlook towards such things. There stood a young girl, wearing a dress. Her, her hands were outstretched towards me, but not in a way that you'd think she would grab me, but in a way of begging for something. Her palms facing up and her fingers barely curled. Her face was full of tiredness, grief, maybe disrepair. Her legs were just not there, and she was very slowly moving towards me, maybe floating. I don't know, it was a very smooth and gentle movement. So you could imagine with the level of detail I recall her, I must have had eye contact with her for maybe at least two to three full seconds, which to me felt like an eternity. After the third second was when I finally managed to unfreeze myself and react. What I saw was so vivid and so there 
that I instinctively turned my head away and swiped with my hand in her direction, as if to protect myself from the imminent collision between us. Not letting out a peep so as not to embarrass myself in front of the theatre people, I lit up the monitor of my camera with shaking hands and pointed it in the direction of the girl. She was gone. I continued my work with my eyes darting everywhere and wondering what the hell just happened to me. I really wanted to speak to the theatre staff about my experience, but I never did in fear of being ridiculed and potentially losing future gigs. I never made sense of this. Okay, hey again. So this is one of my childhood stories my mom told me of the demon named the sloth. So I was around four to five years old and I have a twin sister, but we moved into a new house for the first month. All things are quite simple. After a month, me and my sister randomly would talk to our mom about the man in the bedroom window. The thing is, I was in one window, not a window I can even reach or look out while my sister was on the other side of the house. Same issue. Anyway, the ghost was telling us to open the window and let it in, according to what my mom said. Month three, and now me and my sister were terrified of the bedrooms, as we kept telling mom he's trying to open the windows himself. Now the problem my mom said with us just seeing things, is there was no trees or anything really to make the shadows a branch could do to make us see things. My mom said my sister one night told her the sloth now wants us to leave the house with it. My mom did call the cops to do a check at this point to make sure we weren't being stalked by a crazy person. We even added cameras. Nothing ever appeared. Month five, maybe six, my mom said random loud banging on the front and back door would happen at a random hour. She said she would call the cops, but no one was there. Late month six, my mom said she entered my bedroom to see me praying to God and praying to Jesus like a minister would, trying to make the man go away. Remember, I was less than six years old at this time, doing a prayer with words I shouldn't even know yet. Month seven, I go up to my mom and tell her the man has long arms and is calling himself the sloth. And my mom said my sister reacted to the sloth coming to my window too. Later in the month, My mom said she looked at her window and saw a shadowy head looking in. My dad was out of town at this time for business, so my mom grabbed us, put us in a closet and called the cops. No one was there on camera, no footprints. Hell, it was snowing now as we entered December and no prints anywhere. My mom called my dad that night and told him her thoughts. So they got the property blessed by the local church the problems instantly stopped. However, the story isn't over. At this point, I've never heard this story till I believe 2014, maybe 2015, and me and my sister, mom, were watching the show Paranormal Witness. When on that show, they had a medium that came into a place near where we lived, and she said these words. There is a demon in this house. Someone let in years ago, and it's called the sloth. At that moment, my mom started freaking out in a way I've never seen her do. Then she paused the video and told us the story. At this point, I'm caught up. My mom refuses to watch it, so I watch it alone to see what they say about it. Well, the sloth demon is a child killer. If you let it into your home, or if not, it may try to lure kids away from the home into traffic or other dangerous situations. When I was in high school, senior year, my brother, 12 years older than me, who's an architect, asked for my help on a commission for a building model on scale. He usually only had me go and glue the smaller pieces that were boring to do, and just bought some pizza and left me to watch movies on his couch. This time, the project was a little big, and he was going to pull an all-nighter on me. It was around 2am when I just started to surrender to the spell of the Sandman and fell asleep. I'm well known in my family and around friends for being the sleep talker, 
My wife constantly kicks me when I talk sleep because sometimes I even sing. Bad shower singing. I usually am aware of what I'm saying because I actually dream of the things I talk about when asleep. Often, it is just a blurry dream, but I know I'm talking because I end up waking myself up when this happens, especially if I scream or go loud in a dream. It was just around 3.15 when I felt a sudden move. My brother, who had this pretty shocked and concerned look on his face, had shaken me down to my bones in a rush to wake me up. I remember I was dreaming of a scene where different entities were surrounding some kind of altar, with a person sitting in the middle, and I was speaking in a language I couldn't understand. By that time, my brother was perplexed, talking to me, and asking me if I was alright. He said I was speaking in Dutch, a language I've never learned or heard of, and I was chanting slash praying something like, please save us all God Almighty, forget our sins. My brother knows German, but he never spoke in front of me or my family in different languages than Spanish. We're from Mexico. And there were zero to no movies in my youth spoken in Dutch. I pretty much only knew Spanish and a little English back then. The creepy thing is that he said I was pretty much going quiet at first, saying other things and mumbles in Spanish. Every word I spoke was a little more clear than the last one, until I was speaking fluently, randomly words of fear like apocalypse, shadows, death, as if I was just playing bingo with Halloween words. To this point, it was all normal for my brother, as I often did this. Not with those choices of vocabulary though, but then I stopped and suddenly started speaking Dutch and pretty much screaming the prayers out loud. I'm being honest, I cannot remember hearing myself in the dream as I normally do when I go loud. I would have woken me up. I was honestly dead asleep to the point my brother had to shake me vigorously to wake me up. This hasn't happened again, but once, a friend during a sleepover told me I was mumbling words that sounded Asian. I didn't scream that time but it legitimately sounded like I was having a solid conversation with someone. I didn't believe him, but he had me on tape. We haven't found anyone that can actually translate it, but a friend from Korea said that it sounded like a language some relatives of him speak that is exclusive of an island in Korea called Jeju, but he couldn't translate as it was different from what he speaks. Let me preface this by saying this story is completely true. I didn't experience it, but my mother is very much a I have to see it to believe it type, and while religious, is still quite realistic. Some years ago, I lived in Savannah with my dad and stepmom, who I'll be calling V for this story. V's mother, my stepgrandmother, was sick at the time and lived in central Georgia. Each Friday, V and I would drive from Savannah to her home to take care of her for the weekend, clean the house, etc. We'd drive home Sunday night and be back in Savannah by about 11. At the time, I was working a part-time retail schedule, so I didn't always have weekends off. In 2015, on one weekend when I couldn't go, V called me Sunday night sounding worried. Her tyre had rapidly lost air on the way back. We later found out that her father had worked on her car over the weekend and neglected to completely screw the cap back on. Her tire was now flat and the Georgia backyards are rarely maintained and are often little more than barely held together piles of gravel. Driving them with a flat tire is extremely dangerous. I asked her location and offered to drive out and meet her. She agreed. I hung up and headed out to meet her somewhere near Dublin. A little under an hour later, she called me back, immediately starting with, you are not going to believe what happened. In her own words, a short time after our call ended, a truck pulled onto the road from out of nowhere and came up behind her. Out got two young men. She was frightened and put down the window barely an inch to talk to them. They asked if she needed help and she said yes, one of her tyres was flat. They offered to escort her to a nearby somewhat hidden gas station to air up her tyre. She agreed, but made sure to keep a knife within reach in case things went south. 
As promised, they led her to a gas station off of some little dirt road. According to her, the place didn't even look like it was open. But it was brightly lit and there was a working air pump. She got out to fill her tire and, as most pumps were until recently, it was cash only. Well, coin only. She had none. Then, one of the men told her to check the coin return. She did and found six quarters, exactly enough to air up her tyre. They told her not to worry and went to work, airing up and checking all of the tyres. Although she tried to offer a monetary reward next time she came through, they refused. They told her that they often did this and all they wanted to do was to help. The only thing they wanted in return was for her to attend church the next week and to pass on the kindness to someone else. She said that as they got into their truck, she could almost see a faint golden glow about them. She never saw them on that road again. To this day, she is totally convinced that she met a pair of angels. I don't know what she met, but I'm very, very happy that they were benign. I've always seen paranormal things that can't be explained. The first part was while my family and I lived in England. When I was about 12, I would get woken up by a little girl in an old fashioned pink dress. She always puts her finger to her lips to gesture for me to be quiet. This went on nightly for about a month. Last night it happened. She did her usual finger to the lips gesture to be quiet, but this time she gestured for me to cover my eyes. Dumbfounded, I did as she gestured, but being curious, I peeked from under my covers. I saw her standing outside my door, standing next to the window, just outside it, and she had a look of fright on her face. The next thing I know, she takes a quick glance at me before I see an arm grab and shove her out of the window. Terrified, I quickly covered my face and shortly after, I fell back to sleep. I mentioned it to my stepdad who was very curious about what happened. He did some research about our house to find out that there were no deaths in our house prior to us moving in and before it was built, it was just farmland. Fast forward 16 years in the USA, here just a few months ago in our new house. My stepdad and I are living in the living room watching TV and my two children, daughter five and son seven, we're playing in my son's bedroom. I had walked into our kitchen to warm up my coffee in the microwave. From where my stepdad was sitting, he had a perfect view down the hallway, where the bedrooms are and the microwave in the kitchen. Upon returning to the living room, the atmosphere felt a little different. And the look of fright and worry on my stepdad's face was as if he saw a ghost. I'd ask him if everything was okay. It took him a few minutes to answer, as if he was trying to rationalise what had just happened. He'd walked into the kitchen and I followed him and asked himself if he was okay. He told me that he watched my daughter walk into my room, was inside for a few minutes talking to whom he thought was herself, to find me wearing all the clothes that I had on for that day, following close behind her. He could see me in the kitchen in front of the microwave and me walking up the hallway at the same time. He said he thought he was seeing things, but couldn't help keep looking between me and me to make sure. We heard the kids approaching, so I told him to wait a minute as I didn't want to talk about it in front of them. What my daughter said when she came into the kitchen was very eerie. With a straight face, she looks at me and says, Mommy, you're funny as a ghost. My stepdad and I exchanged looks of what the fuck I'd asked her to repeat what she said. You're funny as a ghost. I have no idea what to make of it. Is this some entity approaching the children looking like me to seem le less frightening for them? Or something more sinister? Or is it a guardian angel interacting with them looking like me to seem more familiar? I remember back when I was a child, I would go to my cottage with my grandparents pretty often. It was a quiet, cozy little college up in Canada. 
on a piece of land gifted to my family by my uncle, who owns land he uses for his farm. More often than not, it ended up just being myself and my grandparents up there. But nevertheless, it was always an amazing time. It was surrounded by forest all around, and always had an eerie feel to it. About 500 metres away from the property is an abandoned Mika mine that was collapsed intentionally back when Mika prices dropped and use for the material diminished. That, mixed with the fact that there's random pieces of equipment and vehicles ranging from old-fashioned TVs to broken-down school buses, it made for some pretty amazing adventures. Now that I've painted a picture in your mind of the type of area my cottage is located in, let me proceed with the event. I was up at my cottage with my grandparents and my sister. It was raining, and there wasn't much to do outside, so we were spending it indoors. My grandmother was watching her TV shows, as she always did, and my grandfather was outside doing something manly. He's always been the type to never sit still and accomplish such great things. Naturally, my sister and I got hungry, so we decided to make some cereal. We make ourselves our bowls and sit opposite to each other at the table. Now, this table is perfectly round and curves down on all sides and widens again at the base. This would make the table very awkward and hard to manipulate. Anyways, as I grab my spoon and start mixing up the cereal, I let go of the spoon to say something to my sister, and the bowl slides towards her. Being a child and being oblivious, I casually say, Whoa, how'd you do that? To which she replies that it wasn't her. So I checked under the table to see if she had something under the table there, but she didn't. I sat back up and said, Whatever, cool trick anyways, and grabbed my spoon, and as soon as my spoon left the bowl to bring up to my mouth, the bowl slid towards her again, but even harsher this time. Needless to say, we both jumped out at there screaming, and our imaginations were left to blame. Flash forward a couple years, and the exact same situation happens, except this time at my house. It was with a bowl of ramen, but the exact same situation happened but this time I was treating my sister very differently. Accusing her and blaming her for what was happening, even though I could see it wasn't her. To this day, we've still brought it up to one another occasionally, just to verify that what we've remembered is accurate and true. Many other situations have happened, but my phone is being very laggy right now, so I'll leave it with this question I keep on asking myself. Could we have possibly upset a spirit who worked as a miner? Who possibly parishes that we're unaware about? I'm not sure if this will get any attention, but if it does, I can explain more encounters I've had. All of your opinions matter to me. Please share your thoughts. My mom was VP of our local hospital, and when the hospital was purchased and made public, they got a brand new hospital built for them. The main priority on move day was obviously getting all the clients to do the hospital safely and the equipment and medicine. The old hospital was locked after that but was still being used as storage so staff could go back and get less important items over time. Only three people had access to the hospital, key and security code for alarm, and my mom was one of them. If someone had to return to the old hospital for something, they had to be attended by one of the three key holders. So my mom told me in the beginning, it didn't feel too weird, just felt like being in an empty building. But the longer it was abandoned is when the weird stuff started happening. When she had to visit the site with the VP over construction, a big storm had hit and damaged the roof over ICU. So they had to investigate the damage. My mom went to her old office first because she was like, well, since I'm here, I may as well grab a few items that are still left behind. She heard music playing down the hall when she left and just assumed her colleague was on the same floor and wanted noise to be less freaked out. He hated going there. She went to the fifth floor, site of the damage, and her colleague was there. So she asked if he had just come from the ground floor as well and he said, no, why? I came directly to the fifth floor. Like I said, the building was heavily alarmed and only two other colleagues had access, with my mom already there. 
and the alarm resets once you've entered the building. So if one of the others had come, it would have triggered the alarm again before disarming it. So there was definitely no one in the building with them. I asked my mom if I could go with her the next time she had to visit, which was soon. So she could let the construction team in and there were a few things I experienced directly. Only the generator to the building was on. Full electricity was cut off, but room lights would turn on by themselves as you walked by. Phones that were disconnected would ring as you walked by offices. The nurse's station help pad that patients would buzz from their room rang as well, and the ringing would follow us, as in stop ringing on one side of the wing and start ringing on the other once you got closer to a different nursing station. Patient call lights would turn on as you walked by rooms. These were the lights that patients operated from their beds. No beds and no other light switch to operate them. The pharmacy alarm was just constantly going off and there was no way to stop it. The construction guys were of course freaked out and I wanted to make sure electricity was actually cut off before they started working. Because of all the lights and alarms and my mom was like, yep, yeah, I can show you. They said that was going to be the quickest job they ever completed. And the reason for fixing an abandoned building is like I said, still using it for storage and didn't want rodents getting in through the hole in the ceiling. Other stuff happened, but this is long and I think they'll get the gist. On the night before my first day of seventh grade, I was drifting off to sleep but was partially woken by an odd feeling. It's like my brain wanted me to pay attention to something, but I couldn't figure out what, until I noticed a sort of clicking sound. It took me a few moments to figure out what it sounded like, the claws of a large animal clicking against the hardwood floor of the dining room as it walked. It sounded like a huge dog walking slowly, and it was getting closer. It stopped right outside my open door. My instincts told me I shouldn't turn to look around. I shouldn't move at all. I held my breath. I heard it breathing heavily. That wet breathing sound you hear from big dogs. I heard it lick its lips and shift positions occasionally. I don't know how long I lay there waiting for it to move away. But eventually I drifted off to sleep, still hearing its breathing. We a dream, right? I thought so, until today. In a conversation about hauntings and strange occurrences, my stepbrother mentioned that the time there was a dogman in the house on the night before the first day back at the school one year. The year I entered 7th grade and he entered 8th grade. Apparently that night, he heard something too. And unlike me, he saw something. He remembers hearing the clicking sound too and thinking a stray dog had somehow gotten inside, despite the house being locked. I heard it walk through the dining room and down the hallway, then stop outside my door. Then, eventually, he heard it move on, towards his room. When it got to his door, he was watching. Though it was dark, he faintly saw the silhouettes of a person appear in his doorway. Sure that the dark was simply playing tricks on him, he stared for a while. Thinking his eyes would eventually adjust and see more clearly, he was sure whatever was there was staring back at him. Eventually, he quietly said, hey, to the figure in the doorway, and it silently disappeared. He ran to the door and looked down the hallway, finding nothing there. He used his phone as a torch and searched the entire house, aside from our parents' room, as the door was closed. He peeked into my room and saw me sleeping, so he assumed I'd slept through the entire thing. He checked that the front and back door were both locked and that no windows were open. Finding nothing out of place and no strange person or dog anywhere in the house, he went back to bed. Neither of us had ever spoken about it until today. I thought I'd been dreaming. He'd convinced himself he just heard odd noises from outside and thought they were inside and the figure in his doorway was just his eyes playing tricks on him in the dark. It wasn't until we compared our experiences and found we'd heard the exact same thing on the same night that we realised 
It may not have been a dream or a noise from outside or a trick of the light. So, to set it up, during one weekend while my friend's mum and sister were out shopping and such, I went over to her place just to chill and do what 13 year olds do. Jump on the trampoline and play with her doggos, duh. Eventually getting bored from being outside, we decided to play hide and seek in the house. To set up the house it took in as best I can, she had two living rooms and the kitchen was in the middle of these. The carpet living room was to the far left, the tile living room was to the far right, and that's the one you see when you walk into the house. Clear view all the way down the hall when you get toward the kitchen. A wall separated the kitchen from the hallway, but you could still go around to get to the kitchen and living rooms, and then down the hall was the laundry, bathrooms, bedrooms, all that. And my friend's room was adjacent to the wall that separated the kitchen. She was closest to the front door. Everything was tile except the bedrooms and the left living room, so it was easy to hear people walking around. So, I'm the hider, she's the seeker. She starts counting in the living room to the left. I immediately hide in her room and get under the bed with the door shut. I hear, ready or not. A few seconds later, she proceeds to go down the hall to the rooms. A few more seconds pass, and a door is heard being opened, followed by a triumphant, gotcha. Silence follows. Gentle but panicked footsteps are heard coming back up the hall. She quietly opens her bedroom door, shuts it, and then climbs under the bed with me. You know how whenever Shaggy and Scooby saw a ghost, and they would get all fear-stricken and white in the face? Pretty much how she looked. And when I went to ask her what was wrong, we both froze and held our breath as we heard slow, heavy footsteps coming up the hallway, and they stopped right in front of the door. We genuinely thought someone had broken in because we saw a shadow on the other side, and then realised there was no way to get into the house besides the front door, or the garage door, which we would have heard or seen. It eventually went away, so we immediately got up and out, grabbed the scooters by the front door and got the fuck out. Once we were far enough away from the house, she told me she thought she had seen me running into the laundry, but wasn't entirely sure, so she checked it out anyway. It was small and quick enough to be me, I guess, so why not? And then nothing was there. That's when she freaked out and hid with me. While reciting this story to a friend I had over last year, she said something that actually scared me a lot more. What if my friend saw was hiding running away from something else? And that's why we heard those heavy footsteps coming up the hall. What if there were two ghosts and the smaller one just wanted a safe place to hide? The other night, I let my dogs out in the backyard so they could run and use the restroom. Like an hour later, they're barking like crazy. My dogs normally bark, but generally only if there's a person or another dog. And even then, the barking they were doing the other night sounded really aggressive. Like they were fighting something or were scared. I went to let them in as I didn't want them to wake my mom, who was sleeping upstairs. I didn't really think anything of it. Until tonight at dinner, when my mom told me she had been awoken by the dogs. She told me that she went to the window that looks out over the backyard to hush the dogs, when she saw something in our backyard. She described it as having an Afghan wolfhound-like body, but with shaved hair, and moving like a sloth, but faster. On a whim, I showed her a picture of the old creepy paste of the rake, and she agreed that that's what it looked like if it had blonde fur. The sloth movements also reminded me of a story I'd heard about a Wendigo and how they had puppet-like movements. She told me that after the dog started to growl at it, the thing awkwardly maneuvered its body up the back fence 
into the park behind our house. Up a few houses to the right, where another neighbour with dogs was, before retracting and going to the empty plot directly to the right of us, and seemingly disappearing. A few other important pieces of information that might help. I live in an area that is situated just outside the town, but it has a pretty dense forest surrounding it that is fenced off due to being military property. The plot next to us is a drain area that's covered in thick, tall grass. This also isn't the first time that we've seen something strange in our neighbourhood. Family and guests always say they see several shadow figures along the streets, and my sister and I once saw a very weird deer at the park. To go more in depth about the deer, it was young without antlers and was very light coloured. My sister and I went to the park where it seemed like it had gotten stuck and couldn't leave. The park is fenced in since it belongs to the school. Once we entered the deer started running straight at us, but then changed its mind and left the park like it hadn't been unable to moments prior. We watched it for a little while just to make sure it didn't get hit before walking up the hill to our house and it started following us again. It could be nothing. It's just weird behaviour for the deer in this area, who will usually run away the second you even turn towards them. It was also strange that such a young looking deer was by itself, when usually the mothers can be found with them. I'm not saying it was a not deer or anything, but my sister and I had joked about it at the moment as we're both avid cryptid fans. That all happened like a month ago, and the only reason I bring it up now is because its appearance at night would look a lot like the creature my mother had described. One night, I saw my husband walking into our bedroom. He moved oddly, not his usual walk. I went in to talk to him, and no one was there. I found him playing video games across the house wearing a totally different shirt. One night, very late, I was driving home on a dark road from a friend's house and saw something move a little in the road. I flashed my high beams and there was a woman standing in the middle of my lane wearing a bathrobe and her head slumped over so her hair was in her face. I panicked and honked. She didn't react at all. I swerved and kept driving and called the police. My initial thought was that she could have Alzheimer's and wandered out. The police checked and couldn't find her at all, but the way she moved so slowly when I saw her made me think she isn't fast enough to walk or run away from the scene. Plus, that stretch of road is only one mile and there's two exits. I was sitting at one of them. I kept an eye on the news afterward to see if there was a missing person. I still wonder if this was a real ghost or a lost elderly woman. So when I was a kid, I lived in an 80 year old home that was really cool and also haunted. It had secret passages built into the walls. My bedroom was the attic, redone. And I found out when I was older, that the previous owner had died in the home. In that home, I would hear my name being called from above very often. I was young and it happened so often that I really believed houses could talk. My family would also hear footsteps going down the stairs. And when I got older, my brother told me he heard his name a lot in that house too, from the same female voice. In my next home, built in the 1980s, I'd see shadow people and hear footsteps constantly and occasionally hear kids giggling in the middle of the night. I had thought maybe the giggling came from outside, like neighborhood kids. So I checked each time and no one was around. I was still a kid myself and remembered being jealous that other kids got to play around midnight. I lived in an apartment for a year that was built on a Native American soil. The residents would share stories of seeing Native American ghosts in their units. I didn't see a full apparition, but something weird would bang on my bed at night and my dog would growl at thin air. I saw shadow people there too. Now onto my home as an adult. I'd hear something running through my house and then stop in front of me. My dog heard and saw it too and sat up and stared at the spot where it stopped. 
It's weird because the floor changes from wood to carpet and the sound of the footsteps changes as well once its feet hit the carpet. Another time, I came home from work and heard someone in my bedroom say, hello. I was home alone. Also, I see a shadow person in our bathroom here, usually walk into the closet. So we're planning to try learning and putting the history of the morgues past together, as most of the 150 year old history has been lost. Some pieces were brought to light through the Waverley Hill Sanatorium, connected by the body cart tracks. And some facts were found out of the wreckage of the once morgue's dark past. Me and some friends work at the morgue now, the haunted house during the Halloween season. We're hoping to connect with the spirits that haunt the grounds and hopefully learn some history. As what we do know is the owners went missing without a trace. Bodies were mistreated and left behind to decompose. And that the morgue's history was lost when pieces were destroyed or sold at auction. We know so far of six residential ghosts, nicknames and two identified. The child wanders the halls and plays peekaboo with workers and visitors. The top hat man or the coolest ghost I've ever met, according to the devices we used to communicate with. He did better or actually the best conversation I think any of us have ever had trying this stuff. But anyway, this spirit is a friendly spirit. We identified him in our last hunt as Owen, thanks to a medium. His wife is with him as well. However, we know from what he says, he didn't die at the morgue. The lantern woman. She wanders the graveyard room, furnace room and the slab room with what looks like a lantern you can see. But in two photos, I don't have them. When I go to the second investigation, I'll ask for them. You can see a woman in a white dress. Ironically, the ghost has the simple name Six. We don't have interactions with him or her, but we know it's not a friend. However, we are safe from it. According to the medium and ironically Owen, the ghost was discovered after a medium came through. She walks into a room, can't name the room, and felt uneasy. She asked us to pull up a map for the room and on the map, the walled off section shouldn't have been walked off as it isn't in the blueprints. However, the medium did say that the wall was damaged. Six would be something possibly worse than the next spirit. And lastly, the gremlin. We're not sure of his origin, but he isn't hostile until provoked. You'll know he's near if you smell a skunk or rotten smell. We learned how kind he can be the hard way. We got his name as he scratched the mark of the gremlin into a worker that taunted him two years before I joined. The gremlin doesn't like being spoken to and will watch people in the graveyard, storage and gurney room and he will rarely make an appearance in the body furnace. Yes, the original furnace is still there and is accessible. Actually, workers tend to use it to hide from customers. However, the gremlin is known to attack using rocks and other items by throwing. anti scratches. We will be doing a new research trip, hopefully getting a hold of Owen again and this will take place sometime in December. I don't know exactly how old I was. Too young to know much about death, if anything at all. I'll try not to make this drag out too long while providing proper detail. A boy in my class had passed. How? I don't know. And my mom took me to the ceremonies. It was one of those where they had the funeral services and then the burial immediately after because it's all on the same property. For some reason we were late, so I didn't see the boy in the casket. We made it just in time to accompany everyone else outside to the burial grounds on foot. The slow walk had me bored, so I started playing tag with one of the other kids. I didn't recognise him at the moment as my classmate. He had on a sailor suit and seemed happy to see me. I remember that after a while, my mother called my name, came running after me and grabbed me by my arm, scolding me. I told her I was just playing with the boy, but now he was gone. What boy? Stop lying. Behave yourself. Blah, blah, blah. 
a young man, probably early 20s, intervened in my mother's lecture. I don't remember the words verbatim, but it was him asking, What boy? You're the only kid here. This got more people's attention, including that of an older lady, and her attention drew a crowd. She turned out to be the boy's grandmother. The young man and the grandmother insisted on knowing what little boy. They told me calmly to look around, and repeatedly told me I was the only child there. The grandmother asked me to describe the boy. When I mentioned his sailor suit, it rang a bell. The twenty-year-old said that the little boy they were burying had a sailor suit. Then the grandmother agreed. Everyone began talking among each other in a worrisome excitement, trying to figure out what was going on. I was confused about what was going on. The grandmother asked me if I would recognise the boy I was playing tag with and had someone else bring a picture. I couldn't recognise him though and scared that I had done something wrong. I didn't answer. The grandmother ordered for the coffin to be opened. A yelling lady protested, I'm guessing his mother. But in the end they, guessing again, groundskeepers, raised the coffin above ground level and got it opened. They asked me if the boy laying there was the boy I was playing with. This is probably why I remember this so vividly. Fucking traumatised. Anyway, then I saw the boy appear again, holding his grandmother's hand at the other end of the coffin. Then just as quickly as he appeared, he was gone again when I looked up at the grandmother to tell her he was right there holding her hand. My mother escorted me away from the coffin. In the meantime, the coffin was closed again and began to be lowered. The grandmother reached in and gave me a hug and a flower, told me to throw it into the grave. It took me a minute to react, but I did. Then, my mum had me say goodbye to everyone and we left early. Years later, my mother still denies this ever happened. So I've been holding on to this experience for about a year now and have decided to share it with you guys, mostly to get it off my chest. I work in a deep underground potash mine. For anyone who has never experienced what it's like to be several thousand feet underground, it's a very uncanny experience. There's no natural lighting and usually the only artificial light comes from your cap lamp or any vehicles you're operating. You can hear the earth shift and the vast weight above you slowly bear down on the tunnel you're working in. I had been working underground for about six months and was being sent to an abandoned part of the mine to make it safe enough for crews to be sent in to recover some equipment and machinery that had been left behind. The area I was being sent in was infamous for being the location a mine operator, that I will refer to as Chris, had been killed by being pinched in between two pieces of equipment and having his torso split in half. The accident had shaken a lot of the guys underground and many refused to work in that area again. So as the junior operator, I was the unlucky bastard that had to go in. I was sent in by myself to get the job started and was supposed to get another operator to come help me once I was ready. The beginning tunnel had so much potash dust piled up over the years that it reached my knees and made it almost impossible to see while driving in my bolter, a vehicle that drives eight foot metal bolts into the ceiling to prevent the ceiling from caving in. I remember feeling so uneasy while I was in there, like I wasn't supposed to be there. Once I got to my first location to start bolting, I began setting everything up. I was setting up bolts when I noticed a moving light coming from the opposite end of the tunnel from where I had entered. I initially thought it could be another worker that was also doing work in the tunnel, so I started doing cap lamp signals, our own form of sign language with our lights so we can communicate. I signaled for whoever was making the light to come towards me. Once I made that signal, the light stopped moving and after a few seconds, disappeared. I was becoming worried and tried to reason to myself what the light could be. It really couldn't have been another worker because it wasn't safe to go to any farther until my work was done. It couldn't have been a piece of equipment because it responded to my light. I was terrified and honestly didn't know what to do. I was scared to attempt to leave because my bolter kicked up so much dust. 
but I also didn't want to go by foot because I'd only have my cap lamp for lighting. I decided to stay camped inside the bolter till my backup arrived. The light never returned and when my co-worker arrived, I gained enough confidence to finish the job and leave. I don't know what I saw, but I can't help but think it's the soul of Chris. The idea of his soul being trapped in that tunnel really bothers me and I actually left the underground for his surface position, partially because of this encounter. Now to what I experienced. I think it was maybe around three years ago. I remember it was winter because it was really cold and snowy outside. I was left alone in my family's cabin while we others went Christmas shopping for food and last minute packages for some friends or something. I don't really remember why they went out, but that's not important. My point is, I was all alone in our cabin, playing some games on my phone while listening to some music on the radio in my room on the first floor of the cabin. I remember that I suddenly got cold and went to get a blanket that was on our sofa. Just as I was about to get up and grab the blanket, I saw some kind of shadow in my side vision. I didn't really care that much because I thought that maybe it was just my imagination playing a trick on me, because I didn't really like being alone in general, and especially not in a cabin on a mountain in the middle of winter. I got the blanket and went back to my room to play some more games. About one hour passed and I'd forgotten about all the strange shadow, but when I saw it again, this time it stayed in my side vision for about three to five seconds before it went away again. I got a little creeped out about it since I was the only one in the cabin at the moment. Therefore, I decided to lock the room to my door. Right after I locked the door to my room, I heard some kind of crying upstairs on the second floor of the cabin. At first, I thought it was my little sister who was about three years old at the time. She used to cry a lot and I asked out loud, what's wrong, did you hurt yourself? I heard her answer, yes, I feel while playing with my dolls, can you come upstairs and help me? I unlocked my door and headed towards the stairs when it finally hit me. I was alone in the cabin, so whatever the fuck was upstairs could not be my little sister. I sprinted out of the cabin wearing only a t-shirt and my dad's slippers and it was freezing cold outside. I stopped running about 150 meters away from the cabin and looked at it from a distance. In one of the windows on the second floor, I could see a shadow just standing still and I got the feeling it was staring at me even though I could not make out any eyes. I stood there outside of my family's cabin in the freezing cold for about 30 minutes and cried until my family finally arrived. My mum and dad asked me what was wrong, but I didn't want them to think I was crazy, so I just made up a story. I don't remember what I told them, but they seemed concerned about me. One thing I remember is that I talked my mum and dad into driving me to my grandparents' cabin, because I refused to enter the cabin. Ever since that day, I refused to join my family when they go to our family cabin. It's really hard to explain, but the feeling I got that day in the cabin can only be described as not wanting, like someone or something wanted to harm me. And I have nightmares about the shadow figure thing, even today. It's haunting my dreams. Keep in mind, I've never been much of a believer, especially around the time this happened. This is really the only unexplainable event that's happened in my life. Back in 2013, I was 19 years old. I was with my friend at his great grandma's house, who he was staying with, and our other friend. It's down in San Isidro, not a nice area. The house was in the middle of the barrio. It's a very small and very old house, so it's likely to have some history. We would frequently go there to hang out have a blunt and some beers on the porch while listening to music. In many cases, we would spend the night to avoid driving, after the beers. Sometimes I get a really creepy vibe there. His grandma stayed in her room most of the time, but sometimes would crack the door open and I would see her pale face peeping through. Creepy lol, 
but also just the old antique feeling of the house wasn't always ideal for comfort. Anyways, one night, me and my friends dozed off and fell asleep. My friend in his, his room, the other on the couch and me on the floor. Suddenly, I'm woken up by my friend on the couch who's frantically looking for his phone. He's low-key panicking because he can't remember the last time he had it and needed it for something the next day. My friend comes from his room and we help him look for it. We tore apart the couch, under the carpets, we even went out to our cars to check if he'd left him in there. Nothing. The whole time I'm using my phone to call his to hear it vibrate, but from what I remember, he kept it on silent. We start to believe the possibility that his phone could have been stolen. Maybe from the porch or maybe from one of the cars. At one point, we all sit down and call his phone again. This time, somebody answers. We can hear that static windy sound like they're on the freeway with the window open. We hear an almost cliche ghostly voice loudly whisper, I got your phone. My friend tells whoever it is that he's a tracker on his phone and to just come give it back and he won't get the police involved. The voice didn't respond and hung up. Now we're all angry, especially my friend. It's apparent someone stole his phone and had the audacity to answer it and taunt him. We call again, they answer, same static windy sound, but no voice, and they hung up. We're all contemplating what our next move will be, and are thinking about calling the police. Then, while I'm sitting on the couch, I reach my hand behind it, and feel his phone wedged between the couch and the window. The cu we found his phone. He was very relieved and we were all happy for him, but then it dawned on us. Who the fuck answered the phone? Whose voice was it that answered and said they had the phone? It's impossible. It couldn't be a prank. We were all in this tiny living room together and we all heard the voice. We felt this really eerie feeling because we all heard this creepy voice, but there's no explanation for how it could have happened. When I was little, my parents rented this house. Spoiler alert, it used to be a security house used by narcos where they ki kept kidnapped persons. We found out years after moving out as it came out in the newspaper at the time. It had two facades, two entries completely different, ended on different streets as well. One entry was blue and the other one was beige. It also had two different numbers, a lot of bedrooms, all of the mirrors were broken, and I mean all of them. All the locks were outside the rooms. They told my parents that it was because the owner of the house had small children. It had an inside pool, but we never used it as it felt strange. It wasn't deep enough as well. It was just a room with a pool in it. No windows in that room. The house was huge, to be honest. We stayed one year at that house. It was awful. My sister and I, at the time 10 and 8, were the ones that stayed more in that house with my mom. My dad traveled a lot for work and when he was there, nothing would ever happen. My mom also never felt or saw anything. I never slept alone. It felt like someone was watching me all the time. My sister began to speak to someone there. I caught her talking to it several times, but she denied it. One day she screamed in the shower and when my mom went to see what was going on, she had scratches all over her back. This happened to me too, but I didn't feel them. I just saw that I had them in the mirror when I used the same bathroom. But I didn't say anything. I don't know why. I just kept quiet about it. We never used that bathroom again. One night, we were watching the TV in the living room, and my mom called us to sleep. We got up, and I turned down the TV. When we were at the stairs, the TV turned up again. I went back to the living room to turn it off. When I turned, I saw a black shadow in the kitchen looking at me. It had a humanoid form, like a very big man. And I just stared at it, as you could see through him. It had a human form, I mean. He just kept staring at me with a defensive posture. I don't know how to describe it. Suddenly, my sister took my arm and told me in a dead serious tone, do not look at him. That's when I understood I was seeing a ghost. We ran as fast as we could to my room. 
My mom checked it out, but there was no one there in the house, just the three of us. To this day, my sister doesn't want to talk about it. It was horrible. You could just be doing your homework in the dining room and suddenly you could hear a man screaming like they were killing him in a horrible way. It echoed through all the walls. We cried a lot to move out of that house, but we were in the new city. My mom really didn't have any money to move out with my dad. Those are a few stories I have of that house. I have a few more I don't want to remember, to be honest. I just kept them closed in my memories. The house I grew up in, my family and I believe, was haunted. We had a lot of odd things happen and many of our guests would see or hear things without any mention from us about the creepy occurrences. It wasn't uncommon and for the most part didn't feel malicious. One night though, I felt terrified from my experience. I was about 16 or 17 and I was laying in bed trying to sleep. I was having trouble sleeping and I usually sleep in the pitch black. The house itself wasn't old, but was very creaky and it could be loud when it settled at night. So I heard creaking and at first didn't think anything of it. It sounded like there was someone standing outside my room. So I got up and checked, but no one was there. I brushed it off as the house settling and went back to bed. Then I heard a creak in the corner of my room. The way my room was set up was the head of my bed was against the wall and my bed stuck out, so there was free space all around my bed. I again didn't think anything about the creak. A couple of minutes later though, I hear another, and then a couple of minutes after that, another. The thing was though, the creak sounded like they were slowly traveling around my bed. I got up, turned my lights on, and sat on my bed for like 10 minutes, not one sound. I get up, switch my lights off, the creak start again, it sounded like there was someone slowly walking from one side of my bed and then back around to the other. I heard no footsteps, but the floor of my room creaked a bit where you were standing on the floor and that's what I was hearing. I got up and switched on the lights twice more. Both times the creaks would stop. It also sounded like the creaks were getting faster. After probably an hour of this, I almost fell asleep with my light on and decided, fuck it, I'm turning off the light. This is just in my head and it's not I'm too tired to deal with this shit. It was like 2am. I turn off my light, the creaks continue but I ignore them. I'm almost asleep when I swear it sounded like a child's voice say hello in my ear, very softly. I was like half asleep when this happened but my heart started to beat fast. I told myself it was a dream and it just felt really realistic because I wasn't fully asleep yet. It sounded so real. A couple minutes passed and I didn't hear the creaks or anything and was just starting to convince myself that it was a dream. When in the other ear, louder than the first, I hear a really deep voice whisper, are you scared yet? I jumped up from my bed in one leap towards my light switch and turned it on. I was freaked the fuck out. I slept with my bright lights on all night. Maybe I hallucinated because I was scared. I don't know. But I never had anything happen like that before or since, and that was 10 years ago. Still creeps me out when I think about it. The first experience happened a few months ago. I was in my sophomore year and was preparing for my teaching practicum. Anyway, it was sometime close to two or after two in the morning. I was writing my lesson plans with the lights off, so the only light from my laptop lit up the room. I was at it for a few hours due to idling on YouTube, but when I was almost at the end, I suddenly felt uneasy, as if someone was in the room watching me. When I looked up, my attention was averted to the door, which was right in front of me. At first, I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me due to prolonged exposure to my laptop screen. But when I really looked closely, I saw a shadow forming right in front of me. I was confused at first and was saying to myself, what the fuck is that? Then it dawned on me 
what was happening. And I was like, oh shit. It began manifesting itself and was forming into this shadow man, if you would call it that. I proceeded to continue my work as to not allow it to know I knew it was there. But the atmosphere got more and more uncomfortable till I was fixated on its only. I watched it for a few minutes as it just stood there not moving until it just disappeared. The moment I got the opportunity to move, I quickly got up and flicked on the lights and obviously nothing there. I stayed with the light on for the rest of the night. The second incident happened a few weeks ago. I was trying to get some sleep but was unable to no matter how hard I tried. Eventually I dozed off and began dreaming this weird dream. I tried to wake up and I did. Well, so I thought. Apparently I tried twice and when I thought I was awake, I was still in this dream state and couldn't move or talk or even scream out. I knew someone or something was behind me, but to be honest, I wasn't going to take the chance and look what was there. For context, my back was to the same door I saw the shadow figure. I felt this electric charge the whole time running through my body, and then my eyes went shut, and I couldn't open them, no matter how hard I tried. This woman then came over to me. Mind you, my eyes were shut, but it was as if I could see her, even though it was happening. How is this possible? She then tried to lift me off my bed to carry me to God knows where, and I tried to put a counter force on her, not allowing her to carry this out, whatever it was. This happened for the next five minutes, I believe, until she relented and I woke up in a panic, looking all around with nothing and no one in sight. Best believe it took a while to go back to sleep. Nothing has happened since, and I want to keep it that way. What are your thoughts on this? I hadn't thought about this in a while, until someone mentioned the hat man in response to a different post. And then I remembered, oh yeah, I've seen the hat man. I was living overseas at the time, and although I'd always been a pretty spiritual person, due to circumstances in my life, coupled with the people I was associating with, it went from zero to a hundred real quick. I won't get into all that, because this isn't really the place for it. But I think the fact that I was more in tune than I've ever been with myself and my surroundings has a lot to do with the following experiences. There was a lot happening, mainly in the form of hearing ringing bells when no bells were around, seeing angel numbers everywhere and constantly, and of course, the hat man. I worked the night shift at the time and weird stuff always happened to me when I've had to sleep during the day. The only times I've ever slept walk, had sleep paralysis or seen things was when I was on nights. I'm sure the logical and scientific explanation for it is that my natural rhythms were all out of whack. And while I think that's true, I also think it made me more susceptible to things. So anyway, enough preamble. My alarm would go off every day at 4 p.m. Most of the time I'd wake up 30 minutes early and just lie in bed delaying the inevitable. Same thing happened the morning, afternoon in question, and I slowly woke up, lying on my back. I blearily opened my eyes, and there was enough ambient light coming in through the window that the room was decently well lit. Think late afternoon light, kind of golden. As I slowly blinked awake, my eyes settled on the space at the foot of my bed. There was a TV stand there against the wall, and the top half of that should have been in my line of sight, Instead, there was the distinct shadowed form of a tall, broad-shouldered figure wearing a wide-brimmed hat. It startled me and I instantly sat up in bed. But in the space of time it took me to realize what I was seeing and react, it disappeared. I told one of my friends about it later and he told me it must have been the hat man. Stories and feelings seemed to be pretty mixed on this character but I can say that I felt no fear and had no bad feelings about seeing it. It startled me, obviously, but it didn't scare me. 
I saw the same figure once or twice more after that, and then never again. It's been years since it all happened, and even though I hadn't thought about it till seeing that comment, writing all of this out has brought it back clear as day. I'd love to hear other people's experiences, good or bad. What's your opinion of the hat man? Do you think it's a messenger, a guardian, a ghost, or something else entirely? I recently unlocked this memory after hearing a similar story, so I'll share it with you in case someone else also has a similar memory or experience. It was summertime around the late 2000s. I was having a sleepover with my cousin in the basement of my grandparents' house. Things were difficult with her part of the family, so we tended to have a lot of sleepovers around this time. The layout of the basement was set up as follows. A pull-out sofa was on the furthest wall. This is where her and I slept. I was on the left side of the pullout, and there was a side table with a lamp that we kept on throughout the night so it wasn't pitch black as we slept. In front of us, there was a wall that had the TV, and behind the wall was the laundry room, which had an open doorway to it, causing the light to leak out into the main room of the basement. I woke up in the night sometime, and loud clanging noise had woken me up. It sounded like someone hitting a thick metal pipe with a crowbar. It was coming from the laundry room. I was confused, but stayed in bed. I looked at the lights coming from the laundry room. There was a large silhouette in the light that kept growing like it was getting closer, all while the clanging noise was getting louder. By now, I checked if my cousin was awake. She wasn't. I thought it was strange since the noise was so loud. I decided not to wake her. When I looked back at the laundry room, there it was. Exiting the laundry room ever so slowly, it was the typical depiction of the Grim Reaper. Hidden in a cloak, carrying a scathe in its skeletal hand. The sound it was accompanied with was coming from a chain and ball that was around its ankle. I wasn't scared at this point. I didn't feel like it was threatening to me. But of course, as a child, seeing something like that would terrify anyone. My fear only increased when the following happened. It turned and looked at me. The endless depth of the hood just stared at me. I quickly hid under the covers, my back facing my cousin. I could still feel that it was there, looking at me. After I don't know how long, the clanging continued, getting quieter as it got further away from me. I assumed it had gone upstairs and then just left. I couldn't go back to sleep after that. I remember grabbing my DS from the side table with the lamp, turning it on and playing some music from a game I liked. Only then could I go back to sleep. In the morning, I didn't say anything about it and eventually just moved on. It's possible that the Reaper wasn't there to visit me, but instead my cousin. Later on in the coming months, her mother passed away due to cancer. Part of me feels bad for making that conclusion though. My paranormal experience at Circus Circus in Las Vegas. First off, yes I know it isn't the nicest hotel in the Strip to stay, but I was there with a friend and their family. The first night, everything was normal. But the second night, when my friend and I took over the suite their two family members had used the first night, they had to take off early to leave, but they booked their room for two nights. The first weird thing was that in the suite, there's always another room attached by a door. But this instant was weird. The door into the other side of the suite was locked. We looked under it because we thought we heard a noise coming from it. Mind you, we were at the end of a hallway, so there was no other rooms connected to ours, other than what was supposed to be an extra suite room. So I looked under the door, and it looked like no one had been in there to clean up in ages. From what I could see, dresser drawers were partially open and astray. There was a shampoo bottle on the floor and what almost looked like rat droppings. 
It looked like the room hadn't been touched in a long time for whatever reason. I got sort of excited because I know the circus is very haunted. The part of our room had two beds, so my friend took one and I took the other, the bed facing the weird door. Everything had been normal all evening. We were mostly out exploring the hotel and the casino area, and when we came to bed, I looked under that door that should have been accessible to our room, and to my surprise, more of the drawers had been opened and some shut. We both thought it was super strange, seeing as our room was at the end of a hallway. This door from our main room was the only access to it. We carried on and got ready for bed, when around 2.45am, I was abruptly woken up by my blankets being yanked up over my legs, and there was a shadowy figure. I thought it was my friend playing a prank on me. I immediately turned my bedside light on and saw my friend was sleeping. I woke him up and told him what happened, and we were both pretty freaked out. I know reports of ghosts yanking blankets off of people have been reported at this hotel. Did all my research on the way there, lol. And I had a hard time going back to sleep. I noticed when he, we had first come back into the room that night, I felt a darker energy. I'm very sensitive to the paranormal and have had more experiences than I can count. I heard some scratching noises coming from the other room, which also delayed my sleep. I ended up taking a nice little edible to go back to bed. We woke up the next morning and discussed what had happened the night before, and it was pretty exciting. As creepy as it was, lol. Definitely one of the more haunted hotels on the Strip. It's been quite some time since this happened, but I still remember it in detail. Back then, I lived in my old family home, an old brick building built somewhere between the late 1800s and early 1900s as a worker accommodation during industrialization, which is kind of old, but not that old for a house in Central Europe. I always suspected that there was something wrong with the house. During the 22 years I lived there, I've accumulated quite the amount of crazy incidents, which I'd also love to share here sometime. It was the summer of 2018. I, 15 at the time, was lazing around in the living room, watching cartoons in the middle of the day until I got bored. It was one of those sunny, cozy Saturday afternoons where no one would suspect anything bad or supernatural to happen. I turned off the TV, got off the couch, and was about to leave the room when, in the middle of the doorframe, I got the sudden sensation that I should stop, that something was blocking my path. At the same time, I heard it. There was a loud and deep growling noise, like from a large and very angry dog, but even louder and deeper. I could feel it vibrating in my whole body, like the bass during a concert, and it felt like the sound was coming from directly in front of me. Never before in my life had I felt like my life was in danger. At that moment, I did. Only my reptile brain was working, choosing freeze out of the fight, flight or freeze response. My whole body tensed. I could feel every hair on my body stand up, as if some primal instinct made my body react like prey in front of a predator. Then, as suddenly as it began, it stopped. The noise was gone. The feeling that something was in front of me was gone and I was staring into an empty and bright dining room. My knees gave out from under me and I let myself slide onto the floor, gasping for air. In all those years, I tried to find an explanation for what happened. It couldn't have been a dream, as I was wide awake and it was the middle of the day. It couldn't have been a loud noise from a truck or other heavy vehicle outside, as it came from the wrong direction and no one else heard it. It couldn't have been the neighbor's dog, as I heard him bark, growl, howl and jump around many times, and all the noises he made were way more muffled and quite a lot quieter through the walls. While a bunch of other things happened in this house and often repeatedly, this growl only happened once and never again. I still think about it from time to time and it still gives me a weird gut feeling. And I have noticed that I'm not the only one who has experienced this phenomenon. 
So if anyone wants to share their story or has any idea what this could have been or any rational explanation, please let me know. I'm curious about your stories and theories. I recently moved back in with my dad. I'm 19 years old and lived by myself a few blocks from him in a small town. He moved across the country and I decided at the last minute to come with because I didn't want to be alone. Because of my last minute decision, my dad's house wasn't necessarily big enough. So he finished the basement and turned it into a gorgeous room for me. I've been told I have a very active imagination. In my old house, I often heard strange noises in the attic. My first thought was that there was someone living up there, rather than a more plausible squirrel or mice. I saw a video once of a family who had someone living upstairs and they didn't know. I could never get it out of my head. Because of my active imagination, anything I worry about isn't taken seriously. I'm an adult who's scared of the monsters in my closet. Well, tonight, I experienced something I cannot explain. I'm sitting on my bed around 2 a.m., playing with my hair and scrolling through Facebook. Then I heard what here sounds like something heavy slide across my carpet. The best way I can describe it is someone pushing a huge piece of furniture across it. I stopped, I looked around, analyzed everything in my room and couldn't really see anything out of place. I started to wonder if maybe Maybe I've left the door open and an animal got in. I investigated, moved things around and found no animal. So I went upstairs to calm myself down and grab a glass of water. Once I finally decide to go back downstairs, I open my bedroom door and I watch my clean and folded clothes get picked up and pushed to the other side of the full tote they're in. I haven't finished unpacking yet and have all of my clothes filled to the brim in these plastic bins. I watched my clothes move along with the tote on their own. Almost as if someone stuck their hands under all the clothes on one side and threw them up to the other side. The tote also moved slightly. It tilted up due to the weight of all my clothes on one side and just fell back down. I called my younger sister as I ran upstairs and she left it off and brought me a pillow and blanket to the couch. I am paranoid, but also I know what I saw. I'm terrified to tell my family because they constantly tease me for being immature. I can't watch horror movies. I can't watch or hear scary stories. I can't even watch shows like Supernatural without convincing myself everything in it could be real. What if it is? I should be worried. It's such a dilemma when I'm constantly scared and paranoid. These crazy things can happen to me. And when I see something genuinely scary, I feel like the boy who cried wolf. I live in a terraced London townhouse where the walls are extremely thin and you can hear every creak throughout your house and in the houses on either side. Over the summer, I was left to house sit my parents' house and so was home alone for around a month and a bit. Over this time, I'd been spooked a few times by the neighbours walking up their stairs in the middle of the night, and various other creaks and bangs. But there is still a distinct difference between the volume of noise from the houses next door and my own house. Not once did I genuinely think something was in my house. On the last night before my parents were due to come back, around 2am on FaceTime to my boyfriend, I heard what sounded like someone walking up my lower flight of stairs. I told my boyfriend to be quiet so I could listen. I noticed it was louder than what I'd usually say was the sound of my neighbor's stairs, but I ignored it. Until I heard the unmistakable sound of my parents' bathroom door creaking open and slam shut, and the sound of a tap being turned rapidly on and off with the water hitting the sink. In my house, you may be able to hear the neighbours move about, but you can't hear their water running. My boyfriend said he couldn't hear anything, but after seeing the look on my face, he advised me to call the police. 
I don't spook easily from ghosts or spirits. I just genuinely believed someone was in my house. A week before, a neighbour told me to make sure to lock my back door as there had been a few instances of burglary on the street. I immediately thought that it could be a predator or burglar that had stalked out my house, noticed it was just a small young woman on the property and decided to break in, and that I'd stupidly forgotten to lock the back door or a window or something. The police come within minutes and I'm literally shaking as I open the door, like quivering. They storm the house yelling police and check every single room and possible signs of entry. Coast was clear, no perverts or burglars, and every window and door was locked, meaning no one else was in the house. I was so embarrassed but thanked them as they left. One male officer asked me as he walked out the door, do you believe in ghosts? I responded that I didn't really. I hadn't even considered the possibility of ghosts at that point. I was fully convinced I was under threat from a human being. The living are a greater threat than the dead, as my grandma always says. I then remembered the tap running on and off in my parents' bedroom. I went to check and there were a few droplets in the sink, as if the tap had been used recently, but not for a few minutes, meaning none of the police officers would have used it. I fell asleep fine that night, more just annoyed at whatever it was that made me so scared I had to call the police. This happened maybe two years ago, while riding quads with my boyfriend. It wasn't too late at night, maybe around 10pm. We were camping at our campground, where we have a small trailer surrounded by other camps. In the summer, it's full of kids running around and adults on golf carts. But it was late December and we're one of the few people who go up in the winter, since it gets pretty cold and they shut the water off. The woods are a decent bit away from the actual campground. It gets pretty quiet out there and something about the snow just makes everything quieter. I've always felt slightly uncomfortable in the woods at night. My boyfriend told me I was just a paranoid person and I chalked it up to me reading too much creepy paster as a kid. I always felt somewhat safer since we were on a quad and we can go pretty fast if needed. So there we are in the middle of the night enjoying a cold ride, drifting in the snow when all of a sudden we come to a stop. That's when I got an eerie feeling. I asked him why we stopped and it was something along the lines of his glove or something on the quad came off. He turned the quad off and bent over messing with something. I start looking behind me and around me because I'm just someone who's super aware of their surroundings. I look to my left and I see a brown skinny tree that always freaks me out because I mistake it as something else. But then I look to the right of the scary tree and see something even taller and pale looking. I immediately avert my attention from it being totally freaked out. I find the courage to look back and it seems closer. At this time I didn't have my glasses on and was just saying it's another tree that looks like a person and I'm fine. Before I could say anything to my boyfriend, he had finished whatever he was doing and we took off. I buried my face in the back of his jacket, too afraid to see anything else. Still having that feeling of being watched over me, I asked if we could go back to camp and he agreed since it was so cold. I decided not to say anything to him since he'd want to go back and investigate or straight up not believe me and write me off as paranoid again and I didn't want to go back there at all. I figured the following day we would go back into the woods during daytime and I would see that there was another tree that I never noticed before. But when we went back though, and there was nothing next to the brown tree, that's when my stomach dropped. That's also when I told him I saw something last night. He told me I should have told him, which he was right. I should have said something, but I was just too scared and just kept it to myself. We still go up there occasionally, not as much due to our jobs now, but I've never experienced anything else after that. Ever since I was a small child, 
I've always dealt with paranormal experiences. It seems like no matter where I move, there's always paranormal shit waiting to happen. Whether it be shadows in the corner of my eye or things flying off shelves for absolutely no reason. As previously mentioned, I had experiences that range from items flying off counters or moving in front of me, all the way to hearing my name called by three different voices in the middle of the night while I was home alone. Voices that I've never heard in my life. I recently moved in with family members due to COVID. Almost immediately after I moved in, all types of different occurrences began happening in this house. As silly as this sounds, every time I speak of these ghosts or whatever they are, technology all around me begins to malfunction. And only when I speak of them, for example, my TV and computer monitors would freeze or just straight up shut off by themselves. They're both no older than a year each. I tried to test the phenomenon by chatting with a good friend on the phone. We were chatting for 50 or so minutes. We were chatting about family. No problems whatsoever. Once we hit the one hour mark on the call, I started chatting with him about activity I've witnessed in the past. Sure enough, the call dropped. Dropped, not ended. I called back, continued on with my story. Sure enough again, the call dropped again. This process happened approximately 11 or 12 more times. After the last time, I left my room to go ask if any of my family members were experiencing technology errors. Apparently, I was the only one. When I mentioned I was telling a good friend paranormal experiences I've had in the past, my mom went and put an open Bible in my room. After that, my calls stopped dropping. Just for the record, I normally have amazing internet and phone service. For the next three days while the Bible was in my room, the living room just outside my bedroom had things fly off shelves and counters almost daily, even when I was home alone. When I removed the Bible after three days, the activity seemed to calm down. Don't get me wrong, I'm happy to see things calm down, but there's rooms in my house that my dog absolutely refuses to enter. I've always assumed maybe I'm just bad luck, or perhaps maybe someone that disliked me passed away. But to this day, I have no idea. I just keep telling myself quarantine might just be taking a mental toll on me, but my family has witnessed things falling too. There's so much more I'd like to type, but at this point, my iPhone is lagging so bad it's taking two seconds for every letter typed. If anyone has any opinions or advice, I'll be happy to reply. To everyone. So about five years ago, my mother dated a guy that was really wrong in the head. Like hearing voices, lizard people download knowledge in my head, kinda wrong. I'm an open-minded person and always respected him firstly as a possibly mentally in person and secondly as a maybe psychic guru he claimed to be. He would sometimes do some unexplained divination things that wowed my mom into believing the second one. One of those things was finding this rock. They lived in a house in the woods, and in one of their meditation sessions, he said he found something under the house. The next day, he started digging at a spot near the front door, and my mom was incredulous thinking it was just another of his pranks or hyperfixations. She told me he spent the whole day digging and found a huge, roundish rock, like as big as a watermelon, and then he started hitting the rock with a hammer and split it to reveal a white, quartz-like brute crystal inside, like a geode but really tough. It was really pretty. A while later, she shows up at my house with one of the halves, The thing was heavy, like 5 kilograms, and tells me the story and that he wanted me to have one half as a gift. I said sure, it was pretty and had an interesting story, right? The next week, it stayed in my house was an absolute nightmare. The guy I shared the apartment with literally disappeared, like went out with friends that night and was never found to this day. Police couldn't find him or anything. I was devastated because my friend was missing, started having bad sleep paralysis, no presences, but just waking up paralyzed with an overwhelming sense of dread. 
started having money problems, got a bad kidney infection. My father got really aggressive and rude to me out of nowhere and many other things. One night, I woke up from a sleep paralysis screaming and had a panic attack. My boyfriend was sleeping with me and I remember crying and screaming, get that rock out of my house, please, now. I don't know why it was the first thing I said when I woke up, but he did that. In the middle of the night, he got up, picked up a five kilogram rock and took it out of the building. Left it on a random sidewalk. Bless this man. After that, with the exception of my roommate, everything started to normalise and the weirdness went away. And my mom started to complain that my stepdad was kind of weird and aggressive and their dog was sick. They had the other half of the rock. So shortly after that, they moved. The rock stayed at the old house and the dog got better and the guy stopped being weird. Anyway, I don't know what you guys think of this. I tried to keep it short, but there are more creepy details in this story I can expand in the comments, if you want. My mom was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in 1999. She was stage four and doctors didn't give her much hope to live past three to six months. They started her on an aggressive form of treatments, including Rituxan. She responded well and went into remission in December 2000. About three months later, she got a really bad sore throat and relapsed. The cancer was back and more aggressive than ever. Fast forward to October 2001. My mom didn't come to work at our shop one day and wouldn't answer the house phone. I went to see her after work and the door was locked. She finally came to the door and was confused and dizzy. I rushed her to the hospital where we were told her cancer had broken the blood brain barrier. She was admitted and I was told she maybe had a few weeks to live. She had lost her ability to speak to me, but she knew who I was. They tried an experimental treatment and it worked for a few days and she was speaking and very aware of her surroundings and me. I knew it was going to be over soon and she even said, I've raised you right, and it's time for me to go soon. My dad had passed a few months before suddenly, and it was the worst year of my life. I came to see her the next day, and could hear her talking in German, and thought one of her friends was visiting. I came into the room, and no one was there. I asked her, who are you talking to? She said, Papa, and started giggling. I said, yeah, okay, and sat with her. The next day, she had a massive seizure and almost bit her tongue off. They had to place a stint in her mouth, then place her under anesthesia to stop the seizures. She passed at 5am on November 2nd, 2001. I was comforted by the excellent nurses in the hospice and told them she must have been losing it because she was talking to herself. The nurses looked at each other and said she did it all the time. She would have full-blown conversations with someone for hours on end. They asked her who she was talking to and she said, her dad, and that he'd be seeing her soon. Problem is, her dad was killed in w World War II, Holland, on November 1st, 1944. The nurses also told me they thought they heard a man's voice in her room at times, but when they entered, no one was there and she had a huge smile on her face. I miss her dearly, but I know she's in a better place, free of that misery. I really appreciate all the feedback I got. So much of it was heartfelt, positive and warm. I always get a bit melancholy around the time of her death anniversary. Writing this story makes me feel a bit better about the whole thing, and I hope it helps others cope during the holidays a little bit better. I've never been super involved in the supernatural world. I've always believed in ghosts and I've seen a few over my lifetime. I usually try to analyze things from a scientific standpoint and debunk them for my own sanity. However, I had an encounter recently that left me feeling confused and unsure. I've never played with the idea of humans not being human before, but I think I might have encountered one. 
I decided I wanted to go for a walk in a very isolated forest the other day. It's about a 30 minute drive from my small town, so I almost never see anybody else there. When I arrived in the dirt parking lots, there were no other vehicles as expected. The forest is filled with giant cedars and the foggy chilly day made it incredibly beautiful but eerie at the same time. About 20 minutes into the forest, I see a person. It was a lady wearing a large sun hat, a dress and carrying a wooden basket. I was curious what she had in her basket and where she may have come from as the only parking area had no other vehicles. I was planning on saying hello and asking what she was gathering as we passed. She was walking towards me but never lifted her head to look at me. Her face was completely concealed by the large sun hat. I found this strange as usually people will look when someone is walking towards them, especially a lady walking alone in the woods. As we got closer, still without raising her head so I could see her face, she took a 90 degree corner and walked off into the forest off the path. I thought this was strange but continued my walk. As I was returning about 10 minutes later, she was still in the same general area as before. She was facing away from me and kneeled down. She looked like she was picking mushrooms and placing them in her basket. As soon as I got about as close as I did the first time without looking back, she stood up and walked directly into the woods again off the trail. I looked at the area where she was kneeled and there was nothing there. No signs of mushrooms or anything. Almost concerned at this point, I said hello as I was walking past. She turned around with her head down so I couldn't see her face and stood there looking at the ground but in my direction. Her basket was empty and she never looked up, always hiding her face with the large hat. She didn't say anything back. As I walked off, she kneeled down again to start collecting something. The more I think about this encounter, the more I'm convinced it was not a strange human, but some sort of spirit who didn't like me being there. I'm a pretty scientifically minded person, not really spiritual either. I'm open minded to the possibility of things I can't explain, but I'm not a seeker of the paranormal or spiritual events. However, I have very strong memories from when I was young about a boy who claimed to be my guardian angel come to visit me in my room. My white blinds would turn a pale green and purple colour and he would appear like an old film on my wall. Even had the spots that would appear like watching an old film. I talked to him regularly about all sorts of things. I remember I was going to change bedrooms and I was worried he wouldn't come to my new room, but that wasn't an issue. His name was Mark, and I think he said he was seven years old and had died in a car accident. He showed me his accident. Not violent and gross, but enough to let me know what happened. He looked the same each time with dark hair and a long sleeve striped shirt with a collar. He was like talking to a good friend or an older brother. The last time he came to visit me, I was really tired and told him that I didn't want to talk. He tried really hard to keep me talking, but I ignored him and rolled over. I told him to leave me alone and I was annoyed with him. He never showed up again and I always felt really sad about it. Even now, I feel like I'm missing someone. I asked my mom what it meant if a person talked to angels. I was really hesitant to tell her because I didn't want to change anything or have him stop coming. I know I was young when I asked the question. I had a hard time trying to figure out how to ask it and what words to use. Maybe three years old. He continued to visit until I was maybe six. I remember he was older than me. Has anyone heard of anything similar? I have a hard time remembering more than highlights about these events. I've never shared them with anyone before. I just found myself remembering them and feeling sad and a sense of loss. I'd like to talk to him again and find out what was actually happening. It's unexplainable to me. 
The easy answer is I dreamed it, as I know I didn't. I've never heard of a similar experience. Google has never been a help. It turns out religious searches are finding one's guardian angel or whatever. I was just hoping for some possible insight. Feel like asking questions or anything. I honestly just have felt a loss and sometimes it hits me hard. Tonight I can't sleep about 30 years later because I keep wondering about him and who he was. Thanks for reading. I finally decided to tell you about my first and only encounter with the paranormal, which still brings tears to my eyes when I think about it. I've never told anyone about this, so this is kind of the premiere. I've been going for night walks for at least 15 years. I love the silence and atmosphere of the night, and I prefer to be alone, listening to audiobooks while I'm walking. I'm with my almost seven feet quite a big person, or at least I'd claim not to be the average victim of a lurking robber. But obviously some entities seem to not be impressed by non-issues like physical size. My nightly route led me through an unlit rural road, a short passage through the woods, a well-lit settlement, and even an old graveyard to shorten my way home. The funny thing is, and this is the only funny thing about the story, my encounter was in the settlement. I never experienced anything like that in the rather creepy locations. It was a clear night around 11pm, as I walked my way down the street with my headphones on, listening to some horror novels, as I suddenly heard someone behind me whispering my name very aggressively. Then immediately, I turned around to look for the source of that whispering, just to see a human-like shadow figure, so dark as if something was just cut out of this world and running towards me, no more than three feet away from me, with something in these light-eating hands, as if it was going to hit with that thing in the next moment. I was so shocked that I held my forearms in front of my head and closed my eyes to protect my head from the anticipated hit and screamed all the breath out I had at the moment, but nothing hit me. I opened my eyes again and realised that nothing was there. I stood there, my heart was still pumping like crazy and we were completely alone. After some seconds I moved on, telling myself that it was just my imagination, inspired by a horror novel as one of the surrounding house doors opened and an old man ran out of his house with an old fashioned poking stick in his hands, asking where the attacker had gone. He told me that he and his wife saw that person running towards me and that he came to help me fight off the guy. After I asked him if he reminded any facial features or anything remarkable, he and his wife said no. To this day, 10 years later, I still think about this occurrence and it still gives me the shivers. Normally I'm very grateful to get help in emergency situations, but on that night, I would have loved to not get any help at all, so I could just blame my imagination. It was around this time of year, during a frigid and icy winter. I was travelling alone in my minivan, coming back from visiting a friend who lived out in the country. I've never been fond of driving alone, as I get lonely, and I guess the best word to use is jumpy. Around this time, there was zero traffic on the road with me. It was a rural highway, and aside from the occasional farmhouse, no notable landmarks in the area. I don't remember exactly when it happened, but suddenly, I became very aware of something that there was with me at some point. I could swear I felt a heavy presence somewhere in the back seat. This sort of heavy, ominous feeling of dread just came awash over me, and I remember feeling suddenly emotionally overwhelmed. Breathing became laboured and difficult. I finally dared myself to look in my mirrors to convince myself it was nothing. I recall seeing this blurry, dark mass. I should note, there wasn't anything special about that, as my vehicle doesn't have much interior lighting to begin with. 
but I've never felt more watched than I did at that moment, gazing into the nothingness in the rear seat. If you have ever felt like you were feeling morbid thoughts, not your own, I sincerely hope you never do, because it was as unpleasant as it sounds. While I kept driving, in between watching the road and keeping an eye on the back seat, I kept hearing these phrases. Death is near, death is coming, it is near, death is here with you. Those four phrases, just over and over. I was shaking uncontrollably. I can't explain why, but I have already noted the feeling of dread. Only it became so much more robust in those final moments before it happened. Just when I felt it could take it no longer, I looked out the windshield in time to see brake lights. Somehow, a vehicle had appeared, almost as if from nowhere. The road was icy, and I knew at that moment that I did not have time or distance enough to avoid their pickup truck. So I hit my brakes and went to steer away from the other vehicle, sending mine into a spin. I spun entirely around twice before coming to a stop and not having hit the ditch or the truck and I remember feeling the heaviness dissipate. Finally, I regained control of my emotions and made it home safely. I've experienced many anxiety attacks before, and this was nothing like those whatsoever. I genuinely feel that in those moments, I wasn't alone. I don't have much in the way of theories for what happened that night, only that I was warned of an impending crash that could have cost me my life moments before it took place. No one can really know for sure if the rumors about death cycles are true, but I'm almost entirely convinced that they are based on this very brief emotional experience. About two years ago, I was still in college. I was walking home from dropping my girlfriend off at the train station and I saw a very peculiar couple. Both the woman, Caucasian, and the man, African-American, were dressed in full 50s or 60s attire. I couldn't quite make out what they were saying to each other but the fractions I caught of their accents were stereotypical of old 60s noir films. At the time, I disregarded it, thinking it was just some theatre couple walking after a show, still in character. Then in hindsight, came the first sign something was up. They started kissing passionately, but people were walking by them as if they weren't even there, straight up walking toward them or around them mere inches apart, leaving no room for comfort from two people who were making out directly beside them. From personal experience, people either divert their gaze from couples engaging in PDA or stare at them, and they definitely give them space. I realized I was staring, so I looked away and passed them. As I was crossing, I heard a loud swear. Someone shouting, get away from her, N-word. Shortly after I heard a gunshot, screaming, and a car veering as if it were crashing. Terrified, I sprinted across the street and looked behind me, expecting to see the worst. Instead, there was nothing, just a regular crowd of people walking by. No car wreck, no murder scene, no couple, absolutely nothing. My heart was pounding and people were staring at me as if I was a freak. I knew I wasn't crazy, since I had many experiences with the paranormal in this, one of the oldest cities in America. Especially since the part of campus, my apartment was, in, was located next to a very old cemetery, and built on the site of several former mental asylums. I tried tracking down information about murders on my college campus, and I came across a website that tracked police records of violent crimes with a database dating back to the early 1900s. Sure enough, there were several racially motivated hate crimes on that very street in the 50s. There was not much information other than the type of crime. The entry simply said murder or included a sentence detailing it such as racially motivated or hate crime. Very few had some names associated with them. Unfortunately, I couldn't narrow it down anymore.
I hate reading super lengthy stories with a million different additional details that are supposed to create atmosphere, but actually just distract from what's being said. So I'm gonna try and be as brief and straight to the point as possible. So, the parents were going to a party and were supposed to be home nine-ish, but rang me saying that they wouldn't be back until midnight. So it was my job to put the kids to bed, which I had no problem with. They are the sweetest, most well-behaved kids I've ever met. It got to 9.30 and the kids brushed their teeth, got their books and went to bed. I tidied up, sat down, did a little homework, I'm 17, and then FaceTimed my friend. This is a religious family and there are crosses on some of their walls. I heard what sounded like someone knocking on the front door, but it was about quarter past 10 and the parents usually message me when they're almost home. And of course, they have keys. So I automatically suspected it wasn't them. I checked and there was nobody at the door. So I just sat back down on the couch and got carried away talking to my friend again. Then the same knocking, literally knock, knock, knock. They have guinea pigs and I started to suspect it was those guys nibbling on the cage or fucking around. So I went and checked, but they were in their little home thing. I still believed it was them, but as I was leaving the room, I saw the wooden cross that was nailed to its head on the wall lifted from the bottom and it dropped three times. Knock, knock, knock. As though some force was lifting the bottom half that wasn't nailed and dropping it, like a door knocker. I just froze and my friend was like, what, what? I tiptoe ran back into the living room. I don't know what the fuck caused that. I started to think maybe it was one of the kids jumping from upstairs, causing the walls to shake. But the crosses on the wall between the kitchen and dining room and directly above was the parents' room in the bathroom. So unless they were in their parents' room or the bathroom jumping up and down in threes, it doesn't really make sense. Plus, I was almost adamant that they were asleep. Perhaps coincidentally, the homework I was doing was philosophy which can often be very anti-religion, anti-God. In fact, I was actually writing an answer to this question. Is the Western idea of God illogical? Probably not the most respectful homework to do in the house of religious people, but hey, maybe there was God showing me he's real. Or maybe not. In my country, there's this folklore about witches. To this day, in many small cities and towns, people, mostly older folks, still believe in witches that come at night to eat our children. According to legend, witches take the form of an owl and will fly around at night looking for unbaptized babies to eat. They will put a sleeping spell on the mother so she won't hear the baby cry, and she'll wake up to a dead baby in the morning. Sometimes, witches will sense a woman that's close to giving birth, and will stick to that area just waiting. I've known someone whose niece died, SIDS according to doctors, and they strongly believe it was a witch. I'm eight and a half months pregnant, and I rarely give in to those superstitions. Yesterday, my mill started telling me about some lady that lost her baby due to a witch, and that I should start taking precautions. So my mill gives me a red bracelet with some saint on it. My husband is a believer in those things, so I wear it mostly for him. I'm at the stage in my pregnancy where it's hard to sleep, and I wake up a lot throughout the night. I was having some weird dreams last night and woke up more than usual. My kids sleep with the TV on during the weekend, and we also have night lights around the house. At 3am, I opened my eyes and found myself in complete darkness. I always leave my door open and some light always comes in. I heard something moving in my room and then in the hallway. I felt it. That feeling you get when you know there's something or someone there. I didn't think so, so I got up and turned on my light. Looking down the hall, I saw all the night lights on the floor unplugged. I walked to my kid's bedroom and found it completely dark as well. I turned the lights on and saw the TV unplugged as well. 
I still had a feeling of something in the house, and then I heard something running on the roof right above me, and dogs in the neighbourhood going crazy. I went back to my bedroom to wake my husband up, and right next to my bed, on the floor, was that red bracelet. It looked like it had been undone and just laying there, and then I heard it. I've lived here four years now, and I had never heard an owl around here, but there it was, making its owl sounds. I know what I felt. There was something in my home. I woke my husband up and we checked the house. There was no intruder. I can't explain the feeling I got. I've had some paranormal experiences before, but this was different. Like daring me in a way, mocking me. I'm wondering if I should be scared. My mom used to tell me that I refused to sleep in my room because I kept telling her that there was a hanged man in the closet. I don't remember much of it since I was a child. I would throw tantrums because I wouldn't sleep in my room, so she made me sleep in the living room. She also told me that she would hear my bed moving during the night, and when she woke up to see what was happening, she saw my bed in the other side of the room with my clothes all over the floor. We moved out and this thing kept following me wherever I went. When I was nine, I was still living in the same city as when I was four. I woke up during the night and saw a hanged man approaching me. I was in the same room as my sister and we slept in a bunk bed since it would make more room for other furniture. I saw what I think was a Roman soldier decaying and approaching me. I slept in the bed that was on the top and my sister slept in the bottom bed. One night, there was a storm and we decided to keep the windows closed to avoid having to deal with water the next day. The door was closed because my mom wanted to keep an eye on us, since we didn't always listen to her as kids. Then, the door was violently shut. I started laughing because that's what I do when I'm nervous, and my sister was crying because she got scared. At the time, my mom was in the living room with my stepfather. They asked us if we did this. We said no. We were talking asleep, and we heard the door shutting like someone closed it out of anger. This was in 2013. I stopped seeing the soldier and moved out to my dad since my dad was neglecting us and abused drugs in our care. I'm currently 18 years old, and I've seen the soldier hanged near my boyfriend's TV. It was dark, but I could still see the same Roman soldier. My boyfriend told me a couple of days ago that he felt like the bed was moving when we were asleep. The thing hasn't done anything other than scare the living hell out of me. This thing has followed me since I was four years old. I've had other similar things happen to me, but without seeing the Roman soldier. I have a dog, and a couple days ago, he wouldn't come into the room. I even offered to let him go to bed, since he wasn't always allowed to do so. He left with his ears flattened and growled at something, that was behind me. I grabbed my cat who was sleeping and said, hell no, I'm not doing this shit, and closed my bedroom door and went to the living room and waited for my boyfriend to arrive from work. I asked him if he could go check the room and he went and didn't find anything. My dog went into the room and acted like everything was good now. I had a dog growing up. His name was Charlie. Charlie was a mutt, pit and German shepherd mix and some other stuff. He was very willful and prone to occasional violence with the other dog, Sam. But for the most part, he was a good dog, even though he ate the arm off my dad's recliner chair and just claimed it as his own. The dog chewed everything, shoes, sticks, rocks. He also loved to get out of the yard a poorly fenced one acre woodland lot. But because of his aggression problems and his wanderlust, he wore a pretty heavy chain around his neck with a bell and reflectors attached. Anyway, because he chewed everything, my mother bought a supposedly unchewable plastic bone thing for him. First of all, fuck whatever company made that thing because Charlie had no problem chewing through it and swallowing pieces of it. A piece he swallowed ended up rupturing his intestine 
and surgery would have been $6,000 at a predicted success rate of 20%. We didn't have that. Mom took him in and had him put down. Dad buried him in the yard. 10 days later or so, it was me, my brother and my dad, all up late. Just talking, not much going on. Then we all heard it and we all looked at each other. It was unmistakable. All at once, we all heard the click clack of Charlie's claws on the deck and the jingling of his chain and the tiny little jingle bell. It sounded 100% like Charlie was asking to come in. Dad got up, went to the door and opened it. Nothing was there on the porch. But Dad just stood there with the door fully open for a good 10 seconds, standing off to the side as one would when letting a dog inside. He saw that we were confused and said, just want to make sure Charlie got all the way back in. And that was the end of it. Never heard from him again. The only other thing of note here is my dad did not like dogs or cats until we got Charlie. And Charlie promptly ate his very expensive chair. In some weird way, my dad respected that. Don't ask me why, because I'd need to ask him. And sadly, that's not possible. Three people, myself included, all heard it at once and knew immediately what the sounds were. The closest neighboring house was a half mile away and our driveway was steep and long, so any noise was cause for alert. It was a very quiet place. Anyway, that's the story of when Charlie came back inside for the last time. I've been having various things happen in my house over the years. I live and work in a small rural town. Some of the local kids told my stepdaughters the previous owner died in the hallway in front of our front bathroom. But speaking with the EMTs at work, she was actually dead on the bed. The first instance I can think of was when I was out of time with my wife and youngest stepdaughter. The oldest stepdaughter was home alone and texted me asking if her mom was with me because she had just heard her mom calling her into the living room. We just blew it off as her being scared since she was alone. A few weeks later, my wife, who worked nights, called me at work, freaked out. She said she heard kids laughing in the kitchen and she woke up to it. Thinking the kids were skipping school, she went into the kitchen, only to find it empty. The first event that really freaked me out was one morning after my wife came home from work. I decided to stay in bed with her and sleep in a little. My youngest stepdaughter had a habit of barely opening the door and going psst to get my attention without waking her mom. I swear I heard that, but didn't want to open my eyes, and I tried mumble whispering back. I swear I heard her footsteps come up to my bed and had her face over mine, like I could feel there above my face talking to me. I kept trying to mumble back to let me sleep, and then I realised I couldn't understand any of the words, and it didn't sound like my stepdaughter's voice. I then snapped awake and realised my wife was on her side, facing away from me, and no one else was in the room. There have been a few similar things happen where I would hear whispers of a female trying to talk to me. There was a funny one that happened, but I can blame it on the house shifting in the wind. The master bedroom has a door to the backyard in it, one night, while home alone, I heard scratching in the attic. Turned out to be a raccoon. I was laying there in the bed and the dog didn't seem to notice. So me being funny said, hey ghost, listen to this. I let out a big fart and then the door blew open. I was terrified and amused at the same time. I told my wife that I thought the ghost would be gone for a while because I grossed her out and she ran out the back door. It wasn't long after that. I found out the old woman had died in the bed. Shortly after that, we got rid of that bed and got a new one. Still have odd occurrences though. Most other things are the common seeing shadows out of the corner of your eyes move and odd lights flickering and things like that. This month, marks two years since my friend passed away from a heroin overdose. I was 21 at the time. 
and I never thought I would see my friends laying in a casket until I was well old in age. It's a day I never want to relive as long as I am young. For months, I questioned everything. Why did he do that? When it seemed like life was finally heading in the right direction for him, why did God take away someone from us like that? Was there something I could have done? The majority of the answers I could come up with was, I don't know. A few months had passed and I got a new job at a psychology office that worked with autistic children, teens and adults. As well as family therapy as the office manager, I had only worked there for a couple of weeks at this point and was getting patient charts ready for the therapist for the day. As I was flipping through the charts, I saw a familiar name, Michael Stewart. I thought to myself, okay, Ash, there's plenty of people with that name. It's common. Don't start thinking crazy. I pulled his chart and checked the birthday and saw that Michael Stewart had the same birthday as my friend. Now I'm thinking crazy. I pull out the picture I have of him from his funeral and look at his birthday just to confirm. And yet, that's the birthday. I catch my boss at lunch and I asked her, hey, it's cool if you can't tell me due to HIPAA reasons, but I found a chart that very much seems like my friend who just passed away in November. If I show you a pic, can you confirm if it's him? And sure enough, she told me that yes, it was in fact my friend that he used to come to her and see one of the therapists for autism related therapy and for drug addiction which wasn't something this therapist normally did and suggested I should talk with her and let her know. I did just that and found out that my friend's parents, while I loved them, were extremely hard on them. He didn't really have a good record with them and they didn't trust him a lot. He got into heroin because of the weed's strongest smell. They always knew when he had it on him. He thought heroin would feel the same as weed, but his parents wouldn't be able to smell it. From there, he got addicted, and while his life was doing better and his parents weren't always checking him, he couldn't stop doing heroin. After this, I knew very well that his spirit was alive. I lived in DFW at the time, and out of the thousands of psychology office, I work at the one he went to, and let me tell y'all, I do not think that was a coincidence. I think he had a lot to do with that. So I've never actually really told anyone about this. The only one I've told about this experience is my girlfriend and a few close friends, but that's it. I figured I'd reach out to Paranormal Reddit to get your guys' thoughts on what might have been going on and if it was just all in my head. This was all back in 2016. I lost my grandfather that year and a few weeks before, things started getting weird. It was when I found out he passed. He lived in Germany and I live in the States. So his ashes had to be transported to our house. They stayed in my grandma's room. Keep in mind, her room was downstairs while the other three rooms were upstairs. The first paranormal experience was when I was home alone. The door to my grandma's room was open. I was downstairs on the couch when the door shut randomly and with what seemed like abnormal strength. It freaked me the fuck out, Lester say. But that wasn't the only thing that has happened when I was home alone. I remember being home alone downstairs and hearing footsteps upstairs. However, these were all mild occurrences compared to the one that's still imprinted on my mind. I had a rough day at school and stayed up rather late trying to reflect and process my day. It was around 2 or 3 a.m. and I finally got out of bed to brush my teeth. Now, the structure of my house is important. My room was down a narrow hallway. My mom's room was directly across but the view of it is obstructed by a block of the wall, so it was almost like a zigzag floor. This long piece of the wall is important. I'm sorry it was difficult to understand. It's honestly a strange architectural choice that it's hard to describe. Anyways, on this night, I could faintly see around the house since the moonlight shone through these large windows we had near the ceiling. I remember going to brush my teeth when I saw this sickly, skinny looking figure staring at me behind the block that obstructed the view to my mom's room. It was leaning against the piece of wall and I could only see half of its body. The figure had what seemed to be a gray skin and had no hair whatsoever. It wasn't wearing any clothes. 
It also looked like it was smiling at me and had teeth, as far as I remember. It was this terrifying smile that didn't reach its eyes. The eyes showed no emotion, but the smile was wide and didn't falter. I also very distinctly remember it waving at me slightly. I ran back to my room as quickly as I could and shut the door. I remember hiding under the covers for what seemed like hours. Usually, memories from childhood are blocked out because of trauma. I hardly remember many things. However, this one memory is more distinct than most. Last night, I was watching a video and it brought up a memory my brain must have blocked out for years. And now I'm haunted by it again. I was 13 years old, hanging out with my best friend. We lived in a small town in Wisconsin, and it was the 90s, so there wasn't much to do. No smartphones at that time, kiddos wink wink. So we would always walk around town and play in the woods. On this day, we decided to walk the railroad tracks. We chat about boys and have a bunch of giggles while getting to the wooded area of the tracks that go on until the next town miles away. Halfway into our journey, I hear a baby crying. I look at my friend as we continue our stride, thinking she'd have some sort of facial expression acknowledging it. No. Nope. I kept on walking for another minute, just silently asking myself why there's a baby crying. Finally, I just stop and look at my friend and say, why is there a baby crying? We're out in the woods. Where's it coming from? My friend looks at me with a confused face and to my dismay she says, What are you talking about? I don't hear anything. She laughs at me and we continue our stride. Mind you, I still hear this constant wailing of a baby. As we're walking, I have 10 billion questions going on in my head and become increasingly agitated as the crying wouldn't stop until it became a sheer, almost painful, loud screaming. It was at that point again where I stopped dead in my tracks, pulled my friend's arm and I burst into tears. You have to hear that. Where is it? Where's its mom? It sounds like it could be hurt. My friend treated me like I was a lunatic and continued to make a point that she hasn't heard anything. While we're arguing, the crying stops. A sigh of relief, I shift my head down in disbelief at it all. Looking at my feet, I noticed I was standing on something in the gravel in the middle of the tracks. I said, what's that? Pulled on the scrap that was visible to reveal something that gave me instant chills down my spine. A baby onesie. Tattered up, I immediately felt sick to my stomach. My friend's eyes got wide and I said, let's get out of here. We never went back. I don't know what I experienced that day, or why it's been blocked from my memory for 15 years, but it truly terrified me. Let me know your opinion, as I'm still at a loss. I had an unexplainable experience this summer. It took me many months to tell anyone about it. In an odd way, it felt like my brain was working hard to classify it as normal, and only open close reflection did I realise how bizarre it was. My husband and I were visiting friends in Poland, and they took us to the Japanese garden, one of our favourite spots. The garden has a bonsai exhibit, that is a short gravel path lined with bonsai on either side. Each tree sits on a pedestal and has a placard listing its name and age. I love bonsai, so I was excited to check out the trees. About halfway down the path, I looked up to see where my husband had gotten to. I immediately spotted a little boy crouched on one of the pillars where a tree should have been. He was smiling at me and holding a rubber ball. The ball was white with a green and blue pattern of stars and lines on it. I can still see it clearly in my mind's eye. The boy was maybe three or four years old, Asian, and wearing little overalls that later struck me as 1930s in style. His eyes were absolutely glittering, and he gave me the most mischievous smile like he knew he was getting away with something. I loved it. I was absolutely charmed. I smiled back at him and held eye contact for a second, 
before looking away to see if I could spot his parents. I didn't see anyone who looked like they were missing a kid, so I turned back to the pedestal to ask the boy where his parents were. I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear that there was no boy there. There was just a bonsai tree in a vaguely similar crouched shape. On some level, I knew something was off, but what I felt was that the boy was playing a trick on me. I caught up with my husband to ask if he'd seen a kid running around and he hadn't. I went back to the bonsai and noticed that there was a dust on the pedestal around the base of the tree. It clearly hadn't been moved in a long time. The placard told me it was a 500 year old Rocky Mountain Juniper. It took me months to digest what I'd seen, mostly because that little boy was real to me, completely. I love reading spooky stories, but this encounter was nothing like what I'd expected. It was so charming. The boy was happy and at peace. I felt like he was playing a game with me. After I initially came to terms with my experience, I tracked down the owner of the tree. He told me that he hadn't seen any ghosts attached to it, but that now he'd keep a closer eye. I don't know if I saw someone who had once lived, or something closer to the spirit of the tree itself. I do know I wasn't afraid, and I have no doubt about what I'd seen. This happened in December 2018, just before Christmas. Me, two of my lads, we were 17 at the time, and a cousin of mine, 15, were camping in the woods of a friend's property. We were there for five days, pretty much all by ourselves except for water, that we would hike back to the house to grab for the day, since it was pretty impractical to get water ourselves for five days. This region is relatively dry and no water filters, etc. We'd lie down pretty early, which felt rather primitive, literally when the sun set. Every night we'd hear balls around our tent and steps. Paranoia fueled it a lot, but hey, we had a bow, two axes, and some big knives. One day though, and I think this was either the last night or the one before that, we were just having a chat after dinner like we would often do, and we heard a scream. It was pretty odd. Didn't sound human but I have no clue what animal would be doing it either, and I'd say I know a fair amount of our country's fauna. Scream sounded like it had a build-up, not like a scream where you immediately hear the loudest part and then it dies or fades out, but like it started low and got real intense and then stopped. It sounded far enough, say 50 to 70 meters or so, but then it happens again and again and again. Now suddenly, it's coming from more sides, and way more sides, and it was getting pretty close. It didn't sound super menacing, even though we were mad scared, shooting my air gun with no rounds to make it louder. It got to the point where the sound seemed like it was coming right where the campfire couldn't shed light. I remembered we had set up some traps for rabbits down the trail that day, so we grew as many balls as we could and went there. Bait was gone, traps unarmed, Stupid idea anyway, rabbits don't scream like that. We had some pretty strong flashlights, but we couldn't see anything. Sorry for being so anticlimactic, but they stopped suddenly with no clear reason to us. In conclusion, this was one of the most terrifying experiences I've ever had. And every time someone asks me for a scary story, I share this one. I wish I could get some explanation on this, I've never heard any animal do this, much less communally. Also, my country, Portugal, doesn't have any cougars or anything, which is one of the things I could most approach it to. Maybe there's no explanation. I don't know. Just felt like it's worth sharing. I just want to start off by saying that I am not a particularly superstitious person. I am very spiritual, but I've never personally experienced anything I would consider paranormal before now. I just had no logical explanation and was really shaken to my core. My ex-boyfriend was the love of my life and the most beautiful, interesting, complicated, talented, hilarious and loving person I've ever met. However, we had a very complicated on and off relationship 
after we broke up in 2020, as his undiagnosed mental illness caused our relationship to be toxic and him to be emotionally abusive. The breakup was painful and we spent 10 months with no contact, both of us completely miserable the whole time. We reconnected after that time and haven't been able to stay away from each other since. On August 26th, 2021, he committed suicide just three weeks after he'd spent three days sleeping over at my house and telling me about his plans to transfer schools and major in film in the next year. He was a really talented writer. Needless to say, it was devastating and I'm still reeling from the loss. For some background, a few weeks after his death, some of my friends got me this pillow with pictures of us on it, which I keep with me on my bed every night and it never moves from my bed. The last few weeks, I haven't dreamt about him, so I've been feeling disconnected from him. So last night, I decided to try talking out loud to him, which I usually never do. But I was just really missing him, so I asked for some type of sign to let me know he was okay, or if he was still here. I spent maybe 10 minutes talking to him, watched some Netflix, and then went to sleep. Then today, I woke up late, and around 4pm, I went to get dressed. And when I opened my underwear drawer, the pillow was shoved in it. I was immediately confused and asked my roommates if they had touched it, to which they both answered no. I started crying and shaking as I couldn't come up with any logical explanation as for how the pillow could end up shoved into the drawer when it was on my bed when I went to sleep as always. I was freaked out but extremely happy since I asked for a sign but wasn't expecting something so crazy to happen. It's also really funny to me because this is something flirty he would do. Maybe I'm just crazy, but I asked him for a sign and I got a huge one. When I was aged about two to five, my family lived in a house that I'm convinced was haunted. I would have recurring nightmares almost every night. Toys would mysteriously move by themselves. I felt like I was never alone. Every time I think about that house, I feel like crying. There are a few other incidents that stand out though. I remember having this imaginary friend named Elizabeth. I think it was a ghost instead of just a friend my mind had made up. I felt her presence, but I don't remember ever seeing her. When I heard her voice, it was always annoyed or angry. I remember a few times she would tell me to do things, such as throwing toys at people, pushing glasses off table, tearing up a Bible, and I would do it because I was scared of her. My, the most memorable incident was when my mother was in the hospital, giving birth to my sister. My father was in the hospital with her while my grandmother stayed behind to watch me. I was three at the time and was upset as I couldn't understand why my parents had left me alone for the night. My grandmother put me to bed and went to sleep in her room. I was crying so much I threw up, so I went to get my parents, forgetting they weren't home. I knocked on their bedroom door and a tall black figure of a man opened it. I had thought it was my father at the time, but looking back, the figure was too tall to my father and I never saw the figure's face. The figure spoke a much deeper, thundering voice than my father's. It snarled at me to stop crying and to go to bed, and it went back into the room. I remember being terrified and running back to my room. That was the only time I saw the figure. Fast forward, I'm at dinner with my family, and the conversation turns to the old house we used to live in. I told them about how I thought it was haunted, and telling them about how my father, the figure, yelled at me when I was up crying that night. My mother was confused and said she was in the hospital with my father, so that wasn't possible. I never thought much about it before, since my father was an asshole, and I wouldn't put it past him to snap at younger me like that. I realised that it in fact wasn't my father. My mother commented that she always had a strange feeling about that house.
some weird stuff has been happening in my dorm tonight. And apparently, I'm not the only one experiencing this. I've had people on my dorm floor tell me they've had some strange stuff happen to them later into the night or early morning, around 1 to 3 a.m. For context, I was unable to sleep as I woke up late and lived in a dorm built in 1939. The oldest standing dorm my university still has around. I live on the third floor, the top floor of my dorm, and tonight I wanted to be productive and get some laundry done while I can, since the laundry room here is always in use. I went out of my room and immediately began feeling like someone was watching me from behind me. I ignored it since I looked over my shoulder and didn't see anything out of the ordinary. I make it down to the room and the ground floor where the lobby is and the feeling is still there as I'm starting to walk towards the steps of the basement. I look over my shoulder and behind the structural pillar in the lobby is a black figure that I could make out a shoulder and an arm moving back around the corner as if something was hiding. I looked around the lobby and no one was there. I became very freaked out by this and checked the basement so no one is active in there. Everything is silent. On the bright side, the laundry room was free to use, but too freaked out to go back down there. Other things that will happen to me is I'll see shadows of feet underneath my door and hear footsteps like someone walking down the hall at night. Sometimes I look through the peephole in my door to see if there's someone out there, and it has a big field of view, but sometimes there will not be anyone there. The doors in my dorm are extremely heavy, and it's very loud when opening or closing them, and I would know if someone comes in or out of a room. Finally, the floor has a few unisex bathrooms, and I typically will use the one right next to my room. Sometimes, I'll be up late and open the door all of the way and turn the lights out. Mind you, there are several bathrooms all over the floor, and this one isn't the most popular. The light will just turn on randomly, and the door position never moves. Normally, people leave it barely cracked or halfway open, and I'm the only one that I know of who opens it completely when finished. This likely can be easily explained, but it still freaks me out. Hi everyone, just wanted to share some of my experiences that happened at one of my old jobs. This happened to be in a dialysis clinic where I was a nurse. If you don't know, a dialysis clinic is where people with kidney failure go for their treatments three times a week. I typically worked from 4.30am to 7pm. I would usually take my first break around 6am. No one else would be in that part of our unit until 730 I'd take a nap in the storage room where we had an old dialysis chair. From that spot, a lot of the staff would experience nightmares or sleep paralysis. For me, I would often feel ice cold chills next to me, despite being wrapped in blankets. I've heard whispering when no one else was around. One time, I woke up from a nap to find my shoes that I had kicked off stuffed with paper towels. On the treatment floor, we would notice that from particular stations, some equipment, such as blood pressure cuffs, would start swinging at random times. We also had times where before the PTs arrived, the core lights would be activated. Our core lights had a physical button that had to be pressed down with some force. So the core lights would be activated to an empty station. We'd turn it off and another core light would be activated on the opposite corner of the room. The craziest thing that happened to me was when I was closing the clinic up by myself. I had stayed a little late to catch up on some paperwork and all the other staff had left the building already. At times, the clinic went dead silent. All the ambient noise from the buzzing of lights to the noise from outside went out, as if a mute button had been pressed. I didn't think much of it since I wanted to get my work done and go home. Afterwards, I headed towards the back of the unit near the storage room where we would take naps, to turn off our water system for the night. As I was heading out, I instinctively kept looking back over my shoulder. I picked up my pace because it felt like something was chasing me out. As I reached the end of the hallway, 
I felt a whoosh of energy go through me and the banners along the side of the wall started shaking. At that point, I left the clinic without clocking out and got to my car as fast as possible. I figure that there's a lot of spiritual energy in places like these, since the PT spend so much time there, often feeling negative emotions, dealing with their illness before eventually passing. So a few years ago, I worked in a military prison. Our hours were 24 hour shifts that consisted of shared downtime, sleep time, between the shift. One half stays awake, the other half sleeps, then switches halfway through the night. I've been working at this prison for a while by this point, and I was currently working in our special quarters. Our SQ was just a long loop with all the cells on the inside of the loop. Every 15 minutes, I have to do a health and comfort check and basically walk by each cell making sure the inmates are alive and healthy. Every cell has a security light, so even at night time, the cells are never truly black, so we can see inside. One specific inmate I remember was in special quarters because he was mentally not all there. His favorite thing to do was draw, scream all day, pee outside the cell and sleep. One day, we had to do a cell extraction on him because he was clawing at his gums with his fingernails and using the blood from them to draw symbols all over his cell wall. Medical was looking at him on the spot while I was going through his cell to check for contraband. Looking through his drawings, he would always make childlike sketches of him playing games with his brother and a creepy shadow silhouette of a person. His name was over his drawing of himself, his brother's over his and dark one over the shadowy one. Cheesy, I know. While looking through these drawings, he looked at me and said, he doesn't like you being in there. I suddenly felt the hair raise on my arms and I walked right out. Keep in mind, I'm regularly told this weird stuff by inmates and it never bothers any seasoned officer, except this one time. Fast forward a couple weeks, it's probably around 2 a.m. and I'm awake while my partner is asleep. During my every 15 minute check, I noticed every cell's security light was on as normal. Otherwise, I would have to write a report about it. I was sitting in the little cell we use for our food for the day eating, when all of a sudden I heard this extremely loud screaming. I couldn't make out what the screaming was or even what language it was, but my arm hairs raised again and I ran to find the source. Every single inmate was sound asleep, but what caught my attention was that the strange inmate's security light was out. There's no way they'd be able to mess with the lights the way they were installed. I quickly yelled to the other officers in the other bays if they had heard that screaming, thinking maybe it had come from one of their bays. Not one of the officers heard screaming. I was the only one that did. Since that day, I've requested to never be posted in there again, even though it's one of the most sought after spots. It was four years ago in 2018. It was a school night as I was having trouble sleeping. I usually take a while to fall asleep, but this was like I physically couldn't sleep. So I decided to go use the bathroom. I browsed on the phone on the toilet and just went along with my business. The way the house was structured was there was a small hall connecting two rooms and the rest of the house. So when I walked back to the room, I looked out the hall to the kitchen as I saw it. In the kitchen was a glowing light as it was a rectangle shape floating as it's surrounded by a black mass of a smoky substance. Now at first, I thought it was my fridge, but it was on the wrong side of the kitchen. Then I started to think of other reasons as it stared right at me. We kept eye contact for a minute as I was so scared. I didn't even think of filming with the phone. But I couldn't be staring all night. I need sleep and school is tomorrow. So I made a run for my room. As I shut the door, I felt it at the door as I closed the big distance of the house in just a second. I didn't even lock the door. I didn't care and just jumped in bed and hid under my sheets. Next thing I knew, it was inside my room. I didn't even hear the door open. It floated above my bed as it breathed down my neck. It soon lay in bed with me as I was petrified to move. The next morning, it was gone as I slept with that thing all night. 
I tell my family and friends as my mother told me it was a guardian angel. I'm still not sure what I saw. My rational explanation? I was just tired. I was hallucinating because of it. It wasn't a dream or sleep paralysis, because I was moving and awake. I had another small experience with the same being as it slept in my bed again, as I just didn't try to do anything, and the next morning, it was gone again. I haven't seen or felt it since. My brain thought it was the shape of a human, with a long black body, and the light was its face. If you know what I saw, please tell me, because I will not let this rest. I know what I saw was a real being. We were both aware of each other. We both knew we saw each other, so I must know. Was it a ghost? A shadow person? An alien? Angel or demon? Whatever it is, I'm just glad it was friendly. So, when I was young, my parents would drop me and my brothers off at my grandparents' house when they would just need time away from us kids, which they deserved. My grandparents live around 30-ish minutes away from us, so it wasn't that far of a drive for my parents. Well, one night when I was around four or five, my parents left us with our grandparents for the whole weekend. I can't remember what night it happened, or really most of the weekend, because I was very young. I was sleeping in the living room with my brothers because there were random holes in the upstairs floor that weren't safe for misfit children like us. So, where I was sleeping, my head was directly in front of the stairs. My grandparents lived in the country, so it was very dark at night because there were obviously no street lights. Well, sometime in the middle of the night, I randomly woke up. And when I looked up the stairs, for some instinctual reason, I saw a girl in a white dress. I didn't see her face, but she had long dark hair and a white gown that went down to her feet. She stood there at the top for the little bit, then just walked towards my mother's childhood room that was at the very right of the stairs. I wasn't worried or scared, but rather calm and acknowledged her, and I went right back to sleep. I didn't realise what I saw until years later, and for the longest time, I kept it to myself because I thought my childish imagination could have made it up when I was younger. It wasn't until I told my mom that I think I saw a ghost when I was younger at my grandparents' house, my mom's parents. She had told me that she had seen her too when she was younger. She too woke up from sleeping in her room and wasn't scared, but calm too. She described the girl and it was the very same girl I saw too. My mom said it had walked out her window and she never saw her again. My mum and I had only seen her one time and we were both children. We had asked my brothers and my uncle, my mum's brother, and they thought we were crazy, so it's obvious they had never seen her. So I assume that she only shows it to young girls and not boys. I would ask my grandparents if they had seen her too, but they had passed about four years before I even said what happened out loud. Anyway, I hope this made sense and wasn't too all over the place. This was my first prominent experience with seeing an actual ghost. I still think about this event a lot, so it's definitely made an impact on my life. I had a baby brother and a baby sister. They don't exist in real life. Perhaps they were comforted. I held them and comforted them in a room we got trapped in as a door we opened led us right back to the same room. We were stuck in a place, in an unknown place. A random man appeared, but it wasn't the shadow hat man, but a regular guy who got trapped too. Allegedly. He said he was stuck too, and if we wanted to escape, we had to wait for these people who would appear, sometimes more than one. When they appear, if you kill one of them, then the other will lead you back home? His logic made absolutely no sense at all. I ignored him and expressed how killing them made no sense. So I took my siblings with me and we managed to walk into a small bedroom. We sat on the bed in silence and then suddenly we heard noises, like a struggle. The guy wasn't screaming or making any noise, then the sound stopped. The door opened slowly 
and I held my siblings tighter and closer towards me. And there it was, a tall man looking with no face, a shadow body with a coat thrown over and a big black hat just looking and observing us. I stared back at it with no fear, as I wasn't going to let my siblings be harmed. But next to him was a child a few years younger than me, perhaps who also had a shadow body, but instead a striped shirt on and a small black fedora. The child walked forwards and communicated with me through thoughts, asking, can we play cards? I immediately said yes for some reason. I wasn't afraid, and I didn't see a scary shadow person, but an actual person. We played and they spoke more to me. They were very smart indeed for a kid, if they even were a kid. I fell asleep and woke up. I wonder, what if this were a real place and these shadow people were testing me? Would we sadden this shadow child or accept them in our differences? I suppose I made the right choice in accepting them, because maybe I wouldn't have woken up otherwise, stuck in that place forever like that guy I encountered. Wow, I sound absolutely crazy. Sorry if I bored you. I've just never heard of this until I described this shadow man. I've been living with my fiance and his parents for a year now. Although if I'm honest, I think this has happened before, but I cannot remember for sure. The thing about me is my memory is shocking. I have flashes of things, but if it happened more than a week ago, then I cannot be sure if I've remembered it correctly. I'll try my best though, and I hope it makes sense. Anyway, on with my story. On one of my mornings off, my partner went off to work, and as I wanted a lion, I put in some ear plugs. It can get noisy when the others get up, and I went back to sleep. On this day, they all went out early, leaving me home alone, but at the time, I wasn't aware of this. The window was open as I get really hot at night. I was in the dream sleep, whatever that is called, but all of a sudden, I'm woken by someone or something screaming my name right in my ear. At first I thought I was still dreaming, but I say screaming, is that what it ended as? It repeated my name two or three times, getting louder each time. After the third time, I was genuinely scared awake, and although I would not open my eyes, I got the sense of someone standing over me breathing. I thought I could feel that anyway. When I eventually opened my eyes, there was no one there. I thought maybe my partner's brother, who also lives in the house, was playing a trick on me, as he knows I watch the ghost hunting programs and things, but when looking around the house, I was alone. I looked out the window, as that is where everyone goes to smoke in the back garden, but there was no one there and all the cars were gone. To this day, I'm not sure who was trying to wake me, but I know there was no one there. I know I was not dreaming as it woke me, and although I did not open my eyes, I was awake fully by the last time it called my name, which is what scared me the most. If anyone has any ideas on what this could mean or be, I'd appreciate it. I've not had any bad or good news, so I don't think it was a message from someone warning me of something to come. It was also a long time ago now, so not expecting anything either. I do believe the house to be haunted, as I have heard footsteps walking in the hallway when I'm in the bathroom and on my own. But as I've not seen or heard anything else, I don't think much of it. I had this experience about two years ago. I didn't think to write it down, simply because I did not think much of it, and there was much story to it in general. Some may argue that this experience was sleep paralysis, but I strongly disagree. It was very real. I was able to move and everything during this strange encounter. Normally, the experiences I've had in this house have been of the ghostly variety. Nothing majorly noteworthy, but if there is interest, I can make a separate post for that as well. This was definitely not that. It started with me waking up in the middle of the night to my pet rat squeaking. 
I assumed, of course, that they were playing and got one upset at the other. So I sat up. I turned to my right to investigate their cage, which was quite close to my bed, only to see something I never expected. It was a creature that I've seen and heard of from others, but never thought I'd ever see one myself. It was about three feet tall, based on my rat's cage that it stood next to, which was about six feet tall. It had a large bulbous head, dark gray skin and big eyes. I knew that it was gray qu quite quickly. His skin seemed so smooth, with no flaw in his flesh at all. It even had a slight pearlescence to it that shined in the moonlight that peeked through my blinds. His eyes didn't have a pupil, at least not that I could tell. They were also grey, yet I think there was a tinge of green. There were these strange squiggles and specks in the eyes, almost reminding me of space itself. Then, nothing happened. Or rather, I woke up the next morning. I'm almost certain he made me go back to sleep. I'm not sure who he was interested in, me or my rats. They were just fine when I checked in on them the next morning. No one was missing, and I didn't feel different myself. I know this is a short story, but like I said, not much did happen. I didn't feel like I was in danger, but I still wonder what that was about in general. Sometimes I wonder if creatures like that just know you are interested in them. I think that may have been why I saw one. Thank you for reading my short story. I know it's not as exciting as some others, but it has been churning in my brain for a while now. So, it all started at a moment when I was living in my own apartment. Life was okay though, I felt helpless sometimes. At some point, I started to have nightmares. The first one was with something looking like a decaying zombie who would run to me while screaming. After this, I then stayed eight hours in my apartment, still in the dream, in darkness, where I would try to find things to light up the place. Every time it would get too dark, the screaming thing would come to me again, and I could only push it back by screaming myself. In the middle of the thing, I found a light who worked, for five seconds before going off. Other lights didn't work. At this period of my life, I had this horrible dream that was extremely realistic. Problem is, it didn't stop there. I had other dreams similar, like being in my kitchen and the light didn't work, while some shadow figure started to cover the window. If this was only bad dreams, honestly, I'll be okay with it. The thing is that during that time, which lasted about a month or two, all lights went off in real life. I had four lights in my apartment that stopped working. I had the headlights of my car stop working too. A friend gave me a desk lamp that exploded while at 30 centimeters from my face. Luckily, it didn't hit me. I had some electrician friends to whom I've shown the light bulb and they were puzzled. They never saw a lamp break this way. Now, it's okay. It lasted a bit of time. About six to seven lights went off. I had nightmares, but it stopped. Since then, I still get from time to time similar nightmares. In one, I see a friend and try to talk to him, but the only sound that comes out is like a roar. In all of them, lights don't work. In the last one I had some days ago, I saw another friend. I remember saying that it wasn't really my friend and he started laughing in a very frightening way. The big problem I have is that I fear it starts again. After this last dream, one light started to flicker. I know somehow that it's all about an issue I have that I should resolve, but I don't really know what to do. I made this post hoping someone will eventually have some hindsight on this. So I've recently heard a story about a black thing that resembled a jet black goat, and I think I need to talk about it. First of all, I don't know if it's a ghost or something worse, but it's definitely something. Years ago I heard a story about a distant family member that really creeped me out. 
It's about two college girls, G and T. They went to a party late at night at a friend's house. It got really late, like 3 a.m., and they decided to walk home. Only problem is that there's a graveyard on their way, one that really gives some bad vibes. They were walking, and T noticed something inside the graveyard moving and thought it was a kid, as it was rather small. G didn't like the idea, but they got closer to take a better look. And just right at the moment, G turned his back, by instinct, and that little thing got huge, at least two meters tall. They stood still back to back, paralyzed by fear. And then T started screaming, It's your fault! It's your fault, stupid bitch! So G got really worried but still spooked, and turning her back to the graveyard, she grabs T's hand and walked back to their friend's house. At their friend's house, T got worse and began banging her head to the ground and yelling horribly, not closing her eyes and staring at people. G called her mother and T's mother. They got there with a priest and started praying for three hours until T finally started sleeping. T got up at six and didn't remember anything, just something black, really black. And just by remembering, she felt sick. So here's when I got curiosity about what the hell did she see and started investigating and found out a similar story in X about three guys in Maine. Basically, they went for a road trip to every old town around where they live and outside one of them, they saw an old house. OP heard a voice saying, don't look at the windows. And a friend of his looked at the house and got really hysterical. He began crying and saying, it's, my, it's not my fault. I think it's your fault. I don't know. Then started banging his head against the driver's seat. OP got spooked by his friend's reaction and just drove him home. But he noticed his friend stared at him in his knife, not closing his eyes too much. They dropped him off at his house and the next day, he didn't remember anything. I wore the ring once when I was traveling in Russia. I remember that because something weird as fuck happened there. I don't think that before then I had any special association with that ring whatsoever. Stalin's dacha is up on a hill and surrounded by a little forest. It's quite pleasant and there's still a resort around the bottom of that hill I think. Most of the way up was just a road but there was also forest around. When I got almost to the top, I went around through a little forest patch for the last stretch, right by the house. It was sunny and warm, but I vaguely remember feeling suddenly colder and getting a weird feeling, like slight panic, but not really. I would poetically say like I was stepping into a memory. And I thought, well, you know, it's around Stalin's Dadger. Who knows what horrible shit happened? Anyway, I just took some steps away sat in the sun and had a break and some food before I was going to head into the house. When I got up and walked the rest of the path, that ring got crazy hot. But what's more, I couldn't get it off. I just tried to get up to sort of plateau the house was on quickly. Almost the moment I got out of that little patch of forest, the ring slipped right off, like nothing. And that whole feeling was gone as well. I was mildly freaked out. I was also entirely alone, so I know how this sounds. I remember even looking around for maybe something like an antenna or whatever, something that would maybe get iron hot. But it's not like my phone or whatever was hot like that. The really creepy thing is, and yes, I'm aware I would be expecting it and hyping myself a little, whenever I put this ring on now, I feel like it's making it harder to breathe, or that my stomach is hurting or I get a headache. I just really feel immediate physical relief when I take it off. Every once in a while, like today, I'll come upon it and think, hey, I'll put it on, but I never last very long. I have no idea what to tell you or why. I have no real theory on this. I just know that's how it is. That's what happened. And I feel that's an interesting story the world at large could maybe have some theories on. Any ideas? From microwaves to ghosts to just iron?
This happened to me about two years ago. I was working the grave shift as security for a thrift store in LA near Lincoln Heights. At the time, I didn't believe in the paranormal and there was no question in my mind about it because I had never had any first-hand experience. That night, everything was relatively normal. The usual routine for the first hours of the shift, checking the exterior, the interior, the darkened alley in the back, easy night, easy money. It was around 2am when it happened. I was finishing up my hourly rounds and had just cleared the back alley area. I got to the back parking area and started locking up the gate that led to the alley. As I was locking the gate, I saw a flash of bright lights to my left in the main parking area. I turned to see where the lights were coming from when I noticed what looked like an older model tan Toyota Camry circling around the lot. I started hustling towards the car because I didn't know what it was doing there or how it could have gotten in. Did I leave the front gate open? Did someone hop the fence and break into one of the cars left in the lot? I had no clue and I was getting ready for an altercation. As I started moving towards the car, it started driving towards me, then turned to its left and out of my vision around the corner of the store. I picked my pace up and turned to the corner and the car was gone. Nothing. No tan Camry in the lot, no car driving down the street, not even the sound of a car in the distance. I checked the front gate and it was secure. Checked the front door and interior of the store. Everything was secure. I couldn't explain it. At first, I thought it must have been an optical illusion of some kind, but then why didn't I see it driving down the road? And why was it just circling the lot like that? It completely shook me for a while. What's worse is that thrift stores are known to be haunted. I'd heard stories, but never believed them. After that, any time I walked down the hall that led to the bathrooms, I felt like someone was watching me in the dark. I told my co-workers at the time, even my boss, and they all knew the exact place I was talking about before I told them. This experience has also made me question some of my past experience and really threw me for a whirl. I don't really know what category my experience would fall under. But earlier this year in summer, I had a really strange experience when I went out fishing that I've never really been able to shake off. It started off normal. It was a warm, windy day with an overcast. I was making my way to a fishing spot that was just out of town. This place was an open beach that is located at the mouth of a river. It's quite the hot spot during summer so there were always at least a handful of people fishing in the area. But when I arrived, the beach car park was completely empty. This really didn't raise much concern because at the time I went on a Tuesday and assumed most people would be at work. However, I've fished on other weekdays and there's always been at the very least one or two people fishing. Anyways, I continue on as normal and cast my fishing line. Around 45 minutes go by and nothing happens. The sounds of seagulls and albatross permeate my surroundings. And then I get this growing feeling inside me that something was wrong. It felt like I was somewhere where I shouldn't be. The best way I can really explain the feeling is like the same you get inside of an empty mall or walking down a really long hallway or as if you just trespassed somewhere, if that makes sense. This is where it gets really weird because the wind then suddenly drops along with the sounds of the wildlife, like a switch. All I heard was the sound of the waves, but something wasn't quite right with that either. It was like the same wave sounds were playing over and over again. The best way I can explain it is as if a small piece of time had been sectioned off and it was being played in a loop. At that point, I was really startled when I noticed this. And the same feeling at the start was growing more and more. It hadn't even been a whole hour and a half I was there and I decided that I shouldn't stay there any longer and noped out of there. Now I don't know if I would consider that as a paranormal experience per se, as you could argue that everything that happened was just a string of coincidences, which is possible. 
but I just can't get over the abrupt halt of the ambient wind and sounds. That to me was the really strange unnerving part about the whole experience. It's something both my dad and I do where we seemingly skip around in space time. I've even got eyewitness confirmation of one of these events. The earliest I was made aware of this phenomenon was a story dad told of when he and mom were first dating. They lived in different parts of town and he could pretty much only go one way from hers to his. After dropping her off one day and heading his usual way home, he's suddenly in a different part of town heading the opposite direction. All my life, my dad had a habit of disappearing. And not in the I'm going out for smokes kind of way, but in the you can walk past the chair he's in four times and only see him once kind of way. It's the more concrete examples that blow my mind. One time, I was busy cleaning my room when I suddenly heard dad screaming frantically. He had apparently been looking for me for 30 minutes, screaming and yelling the whole time, freaking out. At one point, he was even in my room. We would have both been standing in the centre of my room. Neither of us could see or hear the other. Same week, I'm laying in bed, actively listening to the TV show my parents are watching downstairs. Without a word, mom gets in her car and leaves. She comes back with takeouts and says she got me whatever because I wouldn't answer her. She even told me she turned the TV all the way down, thinking I couldn't hear her. From my perspective, that never happened. The volume never changed. Recently, in the apartment my girlfriend and I rented together, she witnessed my shifting. I was washing dishes when she pulled into the driveway. I waited a minute before going to the door to greet her, except she wasn't there. Assuming she must still be in her car, I left the door cracked and went back to finish the dishes. No sooner than I had turned around, she was coming in the door behind me. I asked her about what happened, what she saw, and she told me she saw the front door come out while she was backing into the driveway, not after. It's like I perceive time as linear, but I don't always experience it as such. It also seems to happen more frequently as I get older. My family and I were living in a big house out in the country, in the middle of nowhere, Illinois. When you pulled into the driveway, the house was to your left. The second floor of the house is where all three bedrooms were, plus a bathroom. From the driveway, looking at the second floor of the house, you would see a row of windows that was the hallway connecting the bedrooms with the bathroom in the center, across from the row of windows. This hallway always gave me the creeps. I can't explain why, it just felt evil. I hated that hallway. I hated reaching the top of the stairs. I hated the few steps it took from the top of the stairs to get to my bedroom. I hated showering in that bathroom. The downstairs bathroom only had a tub, no shower. While showering, I always felt that I had to watch the door, glass doors. I hated that when I pulled into the driveway, that I felt I had to look at that row of windows to the hallway, I guess to make sure that nothing was there. Anyway, just all round creepy hallway. One night, my husband and I were laying in bed. We had just laid down, completely awake. It's pitch black, no lights on in the house, no street lights or cars in the road. We were surrounded by cornfields. You can tell if a car is coming by the headlights a mile down the road. After a couple minutes, my eyes had adjusted to the dark. I could make out my doorway, the dresser, etc. I was looking toward the doorway when I saw the shadow of a large man enter the bedroom, walk across the room, then disappear. I had read about the shadow people before, but didn't really believe the stories. I just couldn't understand what people meant when they said it was blacker than black, until that moment. After a few seconds, I said to my husband, did you see that? 
Not being specific about what I saw because I wanted to know if he saw the same thing. With a shake in his voice, all he said was, I don't want to talk about it. And I knew he did. We didn't discuss it until the next morning. He described the exact same thing I saw. We moved a few months later, unrelated reasons. But I've never missed that house. I'll just get to it. This happened a few months ago. My folks wanted to renovate my old room I used to sleep in when I lived with them. I went to help them out during the weekend with the renewal and all went smoothly. We threw away the old beds and furniture and gave them a fresh coat of paint. Since we threw out the old bed, I had to sleep in a different room. My mom offered for me to sleep on the couch, but I refused since it's very uncomfortable and I'm quite a large guy. So I decided I'll sleep downstairs. For context, the house is two stories. A ground floor with a guest bedroom, used to be my grandmother's bedroom, but she passed away. And a second floor where we basically used to live overall. Very rarely do we ever go to the ground floor. The floors are connected by stairs which are on the outside. There are no stairs on the inside. So I said goodnight and went down to the guest bedroom. I grabbed a snack and put on a TV series to watch. This goes on from about 10 p.m. till 1.15 to 1.30 a.m. when I decide to sleep. I start drifting off to sleep when I suddenly hear a knock on the window. Three knocks like someone is asking if anyone's there. The knocking was very faint however, so I thought that it may have just been normal house noises or just the wind since I was sleeping on an open window. About one to two minutes passed after the first knocking, and it goes again. Knock, knock, knock. I start getting a little anxious at this point, so I stand up and listen. A couple of minutes after the knocking, there's this inhuman growl from outside. It sounds like it's coming from the edges of the backyard. Then another couple of moments of silence, and then it knocks again. Now at this point, I'm starting to shit bricks, and this happening repeatedly... It knocks, then growls on the other side of the backyard. So I text my girlfriend to try and share this with someone so I get some stress off me at least. She tells me to record it. I made four recordings, and from my phone, I couldn't hear anything. The sound stopped after about 30 to 40 minutes. It wasn't easily falling asleep after that. The next day, I woke up to see if I could actually hear anything in the recordings. I enhanced one of them and caught the growling. This happened maybe two years ago and was without a doubt the most terrifying thing that has ever happened to me. Me and my at the time roommate were just finished working out. It was about 8pm and the sun had already gone down. After walking out of the gym, we decided to do a couple laps at the nearby stadium before we went home. Nothing obscure happens on the way there, but once the stadium comes within view, we realise the floodlights are turned off. This didn't deter us, as we were pretty certain we could run in the dark either way. We went to the bottom row of seats to leave our gym bags there. As we're placing our bags, we started hearing it. It was whistling, coming from the top rows right above us. Not only was the very fact that someone was sitting in the dark the entire time unnerving, but the very whistling itself was bone chilling. I don't know if I can explain it properly like this, but it was three low pitched whistles, then one higher pitch, then one lower pitched and then it would repeat. It sounded like whatever was making it wanted us to come to it. We were thoroughly unnerved, so we whispered to each other to grab the bags and then jog to the other side of the stadium and get out. We took our bags and started jogging, and almost immediately afterwards, the whistling stopped. As I could hear nothing else but our feet stomping on the ground and heavy breathing, I just figured it had grown bored and went away. Just then, I started hearing something. I could hear a third set of feet running behind us. My stomach dropped as I realised whatever that was, was running towards us. 
Our adrenaline kicked in and we started booking it to the exit. As we were getting closer to the exit, I could hear it again, whistling, but this time 10 feet away from me. We made it past the exit and out on the streets, and we didn't quit running till another block down. We stopped to catch our breaths and whatever was chasing us had quit at the stadium exit. Only me and my roommate know about this story. We've never really talked about it. That whistling is still the most disturbing thing I've ever heard in my life. When I was eight or nine, I saw something weird on Christmas Eve. This was many, many years ago, but I still remember it like it was yesterday. I still believed in Santa Claus then, as a good amount of children do, and I had the usual anxiety and excitement for Santa to leave Christmas presents by the tree. After I went to bed, I had some trouble going to sleep with holiday nerves and such. I had finally drifted off when I woke up to the sound of soft footsteps somewhere in my room. I automatically assumed it was Santa Claus, and I was scared to see him for fear he might leave or his magic would fail. I opened one eye just barely and saw this black figure standing over my bed, staring at me. It was tall, probably around six feet tall, and was completely dark. It looked almost blacker than black in a way. I couldn't see any eyes, a mouth, or a nose on it, but I could clearly see the outline of a head, arms, body, and legs. It looked like a bigger person, so thinking it was Santa just made sense. It stayed in one spot for 10, maybe 15 seconds, until it took a few steps closer. It leaned in a little more, still a few feet away from me, and then stayed there for 10 or 15 seconds more. Even though I couldn't see a face, I knew it was looking right at me. It's just that weird feeling you get when you know you're being watched or looked at. I closed my eyes again and waited for a few minutes. When I looked back, it was gone. I lived in a pretty old house at the time, so the doors and floorboards were squeaky and loud. I heard footsteps, but I never heard the door open. I never saw this figure again, though I've had some other spooky experiences in this house. I asked my mom if she heard Santa when he came into my room last night, and she looked confused for a second. Then she played along and just assumed I was lying. I know this wasn't a person, and I know this wasn't a dream. I also know that spirits and entities are often attracted to lots of excitement or energy, so Christmas would be a perfect time for a ghost to pass through. I have a story to tell, a real situation that to this day, I cannot explain. When I was about 14, I was doing the dishes at my mum's house. She had gone out for the night and it was about 8 p.m. Suddenly, everything went deathly quiet, but there was like a weight to it. I can't explain. Almost like the pressure in the room had changed. It felt really cold and then Something breathed out hard in my right ear. It was as though someone had come up behind me and had done a death rattle right in my ear and their breath was icy cold. I spun around and started sobbing. I was so scared. There was nothing there, but I was so terrified that I had to call my uncle to come search the house and stay with me till I fell asleep. To this day, I don't understand what happened. I don't believe in ghosts at all, but I'm so confused by what happened to me that it seems the only explanation. I sometimes settle with the idea that maybe I was hallucinating, but I was fully awake and didn't struggle with mental health issues at the time. There was also a very strange thing that I discovered in the wall of that house shortly after that incident. A large clump of dark hair embedded into the plaster of the upstairs storage room wall. Since that day, everything changed for me. Like, I became a very different person. Very spontaneous and angry and hypersexual. Yet at times so sensitive and avoidant. Like I'm two different people at times. 
Even my friends tell me that I seem so different from one day to the next. Well, the incident was a long time ago, so maybe that's just my personality, but I used to be so different before then. I was sporty, quiet, I read a lot, and I was extremely shy around boys. I don't know, maybe I lost my mind. But whenever I'm upset or confused by my spontaneous and outlandish behaviour, my mind starts talking to me in the third person, like, she's so stupid, she doesn't see, she doesn't understand, and she would definitely kill herself, she's gonna do it. Am I crazy, or is it something else? About 15 years ago, I was at my best friend's house at night, which had a huge garden and a gate that was the main entrance. We were talking normally, smoking a cigarette, sitting next to the main entrance. This is difficult to explain, and English isn't my first language, so I'll do my best. The gate had a translucent and orange glass window, so you couldn't see who it was if someone knocked on the door. Only their silhouette and the shadow of their feet below the door. At a certain point, we see that someone stopped at the front door on the street side outside the house. But the funny thing, we didn't see their silhouette. We only saw the shadow of their feet. We froze because it was extremely rare, unless it was a child. But what was a child doing in the street at 10 p.m. at night? So my friend went to the gate and crouched down to look under the space under the door. Do you know what happened? The shadow of that person's feet ran out and we never saw the shadow or the silhouette. At that moment, we were more surprised than scared. So we dropped the topic and moved to the other side of the garden to continue talking. And here begins what I usually do not want to remember. At one point, my friend was silent looking at her cell phone and I just kept smoking my cigarette, looking at the wall where my friend was leaning. And that's when I saw it, clearer than day. The shadow of a child, very clear, well-defined, passing as if it had walked in front of us. Guys, it was a kid. The shadow was so clear that I couldn't have imagined something like that. As it happened, it disappeared where the wall ended. I instantly told my friend, girl, I just saw something horrible and she refused to talk about it with me. She said, don't say anything, let's go inside. Since that day, I'm convinced that there is something, something beyond our understanding and that, above all, they're not always seen. Sometime later, my friend told me that she found toys lying around her house that hadn't even belonged to her. So yeah, I met the ghost of a child. My partner and I moved into this flat at the end of last January. It's a fairly new flat, part of a block of flats. First thing we noticed after a few weeks in the fridge, brand new, beeping insistently at night and changing temperature on its own, as if someone is pressing the buttons. It would stay silent all day and start beeping at night or be quiet for weeks and suddenly start beeping when one of us was in the room. We dismissed it as faulty item then we had the toaster being found plugged in in the morning and hot as hell. While we were both positive, it had been unplugged the night before. We moved the toaster on top of the fridge when not in use. Shoes started falling from the shoe rack in the middle of the night, same as the toilet paper holder. Google Nest came to life in the bedroom while no one was there and played an Italian song I've never heard. I'm originally from Italy. While the activity log read unknown voice said play my favourite song, that freaked the shit out of us. We had the Xbox and the TV turning on and stuff on on their own. I lost the t-shirt, Alice in Chains last tour t-shirt, pretty particular, during laundry. As I was going through all the clothes coming out of the dryer, I found some long male underwear, which either, neither I nor my boyfriend had ever seen before. We literally went over every single nook of the flat looking for that t-shirt. No luck. Two months later, my boyfriend is doing his laundry and surprise, 
the t-shirt pops out of the dryer like nothing ever happened. Fresh as fuck. Like, last thing, two nights ago, we were on the couch watching a movie, each at the corner, and a voice could clearly be heard in between us. I think I heard a laugh. My partner says it was more like, hello. Each of us turned to watch the other, but none of us had spoken. We're pretty freaked out by now, but still dismissing everything as coincidences, as we're pretty rational people. Also, he keeps on having nightmares about ghosts haunting the flat, and he woke me up screaming more than once. What do you think? Should we be worried? Thanks in advance for any advice. For some context, I was visiting my grandmother on my mum's side for the weekend. My aunts and uncles are usually there as well, and we always do that on the weekend to check up on her and see how she's doing. Now for the entire day, I had the feeling I was being watched or followed, but for the sake of not creeping anyone out, I just shrugged it off as paranoia. Around late afternoon, I went to wash my hair and was there for quite some time. Now, my mother didn't know that, so she was calling me from in the kitchen. Usually I'd be able to hear her, but after 10 minutes in there, it sounded as if the entire house had gone quiet, so I couldn't hear her at all. And my sister told her where I was, but she replied, no, I just saw her in here. She was playing with the cats. She just passed me. When she told my sister that, she came by the door of the bathroom and told me what our mother had just said in a very confused voice. I was also confused because I'd only seen one of the cats all day and couldn't find the other one for feeding time. So I assumed he was in one of the rooms ignoring me because he did that a lot. Now that way before I went to wash my hair, so around morning, going into the afternoon. After that, I hurried to finish up and went to the kitchen where my mother was. She looked up at me and said, why are you changed? You were just with the cats a few minutes ago. I shook my head and told her I'd been in the shower washing my hair, so I couldn't have been with the cats when she saw me. She simply shrugged and told me that she must have mistaken someone else for me. But as she said that, I felt a feeling of dread in the room. Now I'm not sure if she truly was mistaken, or if she really saw something, but I know my aunt had gotten mistaken last week, thinking I was out in the garden with the cats, when I was with my grandmother at the time. I don't know if I'm just paranoid and taking this too seriously, but I'm mostly worried for the cats because they were with me both times. Do you think the cats might be in danger if this entity is really pretending to be me? Can it pose a threat to my grandmother as well? And if yes to either question, what do I do? I was an 11 year old skinny kid, prude and self-conscious. One summer day at my family cottage, I went to bed in my jimmies with about half a ton of bed sheets on. That night, I remember thinking the mattress wasn't comfortable at all and woke up to a half sleep state a few times to change position. At one point, I felt the bed was ridiculously hard and it woke me up for good. I noticed I couldn't see the nightlight that was always on. Then I realised I wasn't even in my room. I was laying totally naked on my back, outside on a big flat rock, like some sort of offering to some god. I was so scared I froze stiff, couldn't move nor utter a word. I wanted to scream, but nothing came out, which got me even more scared. As I got used to the darkness, I saw I was less than a hundred feet or so from the cottage. I closed my eyes, concentrated, and when I opened them again, I was able to move. I quickly got up and walked, couldn't quite run, to the house. I remember the cold dirt under my feet, but I had no feeling of the temperature outside at all. I tried opening the door, but it was locked. My mum always locked the door at nights when my dad was away. I had to go around, but the back door was also locked. Fortunately, the window was opened and it was about two feet up the deck. I got back in slipped in my bed and prayed nothing had followed me through the night. I woke up later than my brothers and sisters the next day. 
They hadn't noticed I was naked in bed. I would have never heard the end of it. Couldn't find my jimmies, so I got into my jeans and grabbed a t-shirt to join them for breakfast. Later that morning, my older brother, who was playing outside, called my mom to come and check out something. We all ran to see what that was about. He pointed high up. As I looked, I immediately recognised my pyjamas hooked to the highest branches of an old, very tall tree. They all looked back at me, asking what the hell? And I didn't have a clue. Everybody denied having anything to do with it. To this day, I was a total loss to explain what happened that night. So this took place at my cousin's old house when I was seven and my cousin was six. My whole family was there and they were all outside getting drunk, so no one was really paying attention to all the kids. There were five kids there at the time. My cousin and I thought it would be fun to try on her old Halloween costumes, so we started running upstairs and when we got to the third step, we bumped into something and we were thrown down the stairs. It literally felt like we bumped into a pole and then got pushed off the stairs. So we were laying on the ground, hurt, trying to process what just happened. But we thought we just slipped or something. So we stood up and looked towards the stairs and saw a ghost standing on the third step. The ghost was standing very formally and didn't move a muscle. I don't remember much except that the ghost was dressed as a pilot. And the most vivid part I remember... His shoes were extremely shiny. Me and my cousin screamed like we were getting murdered, and my other cousin, Jay, 11 at the time, rushed from the kitchen and asked what was going on. We couldn't word a mouth. We were terrified. Jay looked up at the stairs and saw the ghost and screamed. My mother ran to us to see what was going on, so we explained what we saw, and she thought we were just messing around and went back outside. Three years later, I was talking about it with my two cousins who also saw what I saw, and they said that they didn't remember that at all. I was confused and terrified because I knew that it actually happened, and I was curious as to why they didn't remember what happened. Three days later, I was still staying at my cousin's house, and I saw the ghost in the kitchen, but my cousin Jay didn't see him, so I brushed it off and we went back to her room. That was the last time I saw him. Last year, I was talking to my cousin M, Jay's sister, and she said that her great uncle was a pilot and died when I was about four, and we think that's who I saw. That experience still terrifies me to this day, and every time I tell someone, they don't believe me. To preface this story, I live on a dead-end street that's tucked away by several side streets. Never any issues with break-ins or anything. I'd always been hearing footsteps at night around that time, either in the hallway or the attic. Had previous paranormal interactions at younger ages after deaths in my family. I was not well connected with these people. But late summer day, 14 years old, sitting in my living room doing my summer reading... Only one home is my older brother in our room, which faces our front yard. Living room and kitchen are connected, and my house is not very large, so let's say the window is about 20 to 30 feet from where I'm sitting. The kitchen window is also facing my front yard, and I live in a one-story house. The house is dead silent. There are no lawnmowers or anything going outside. Sun's out, maybe 2 or 3 p.m. A picture-perfect summer day. I remember it so clear because right as I was shaking off that uneasiness of being alone, I hear from my kitchen window, hey. I look up in disbelief, thinking at the time no way I just heard that. The voice was what I would describe as demonic for lack of better words. At least Tom waits with a deep pitch voice changer. I try to shake it off and no more than two to three seconds later, the initial hey is followed by another hey this time more loud and seemingly more aggressive. I'm frozen now, thinking possibly a home invader is trying to mess with me or something. I'm looking at the windows after the first hey as well. 
so I thought maybe they were crouching below the windows. As petrified as I was, I was still in disbelief. After the third and final hey, I told my brother immediately there was someone outside of our house. He sweeps the windows with his bat in hand. Nothing. Not a trace of somebody walking through our bushes. Nothing. Since then, I've had minimal paranormal experiences. I wonder if hearing or seeing an apparition is worse, because from my experience, hearing those three hays was enough for me to never forget how terrifying these experiences can be. So this was around seven years ago, when I was still in the last year of primary school. With a friend of mine, we used to go out and explore and build our base out of twigs, ropes and planks. Our city is partially elevated on something like a hill, and on the slope of it on the east side, there's a valley with a small river and a forest with a swamp. We've been doing it for a few weeks now, usually in the middle of the day and coming right back as the sun has set, but once we went in the morning at 6am. Everything was pretty normal walking around, collecting twigs, etc. After a few hours when we were chilling to the music, we heard faint whistling. We ignored it, thinking it was some kind of a bird. But in 20 minutes, it started getting louder and closer to us. Even weirder animals, such as foxes and wild homeless dogs, run to the foot of the hill, which was unusual because they never crossed the river at the bottom of the valley, and especially this close to the hill. It was too creepy, and as a frightened 14 year old, we just started to go uphill slowly, because slippery leaves and overall angle of this slope needed to be taken with care. The noise of whistling was so loud, as if it were just walking up the hill. We got so scared that we just ran uphill, tripping and sliding down on the wet ground without even thinking. As soon as we reached the top, we heard a scream of a woman, like she was right by ourselves. We came back home freaked out, as never before, and gave a break about our base for two weeks, so we could settle down our anxiety. We came back to find our base was left intact, and a rosary hung upon a branch of a tree, near the entrance to our hideout. We continued doing our things and it never happened again, so I'm thinking, what do you think it was? There are two stories of one hobo rolling down the slope and dying and one firefighter who tells of his demise, but no story of a woman. So after these years and reminding my friends of this memory, I've decided to stare at it here. Maybe someone had such an experience, or knows something. Well back in 2011, me and my family went to Thailand and we rented a house in the countryside since we were building a summer house nearby and it wasn't finished. We were there for about one month and the house we were in was super cheap in rent, way too cheap to rent for a whole month. So anyway, nothing weird with the house at first, besides like cool breeze, which I at first thought it was because the house was really close to a national park and cool winds might have just blown from there. But as the time went on, I started to feel like I was being watched. I even started to experience some form of sleep paralysis. Never saw anything during those episodes, but I knew I couldn't move, like someone was sitting on me. Then one day, we had our relatives come and stay with us, and I ended up sleeping in the living room. So when I slept in the living room, I could see into the kitchen. And I remember turning towards the kitchen at around 1 to 2 a.m. in the night, and I saw a woman with long black hair, white dress, standing in front of the fridge. Of course, me being young and thought logical, oh, probably my mom or my aunt. I turned around and went back to sleep. The next day when I woke up, at the breakfast table, I was asking every female relative what they were doing in the kitchen at such a time of night. And nobody was in the kitchen at that time nor anybody had that white dress before they went to bed or at the breakfast table. And I noticed one of my aunts went quiet once I started talking about a woman in a white dress. And we finished breakfast and went to a Buddhist temple. 
I remember I thought that was pretty weird. And nothing more really happened after we went to the temple to get some blessings. Once we went back home from Thailand, we asked my aunt to ask the owner of the house a little bit about the history of it. And as it turns out, there were not one, but two women who committed suicide there. One inside the house and one just in front of the house. Oh, also, an electrician died there too. So there are some things going on in our house. We've owned the house for four years. I've always felt uneasy about our bedroom closet. I've kept that door shut because it gives me the creeps when I have to get up and pass it to go to the bathroom. First on experience, heard three heavy steps come from the closet towards my bed. I wasn't asleep. It scared me half to death. Second on experience, we have a very old grandfather clock that hasn't worked for years. It's not wound. It hasn't been working. Weights are at the bottom. My husband and I were eating lunch in the kitchen and the grandfather clock all of a sudden struck 12. Third on experience, we heard my stepson's very unusual cackle laugh from upstairs. He was out of town and not here. His laugh is very distinct. My husband and I both heard it. Fourth on experience, we had a friend over a heavy glass flew across the bar without any of us close to us. It hit our fridge with such force, it dented our refrigerator in three different places. Wigged us out, but our friend more so. He doesn't want to visit anymore. Fifth odd experience. I was the only one home besides my dogs. We were all downstairs, and I had distinctive footsteps walking upstairs. Sixth odd experience. At 8.25 tonight, my husband and I were sitting around watching Parks and Recs with sleeping puppy dogs. We're downstairs. We heard an incredibly loud noise. It literally sounded like someone jumped off the bed upstairs or fell hard on the floor. My husband investigated every room and every closet and checked to see if anything fell. There's nothing we have upstairs that could fall and sound that hard that we have on any walls. The pictures are still on the walls. I'm starting to get scared. Any clues on what on earth could be doing this? Ghost? Demon? Something strange happened last night, and I remember something very similar happened when I had my firstborn four years ago, which I had forgotten about. I've lived in my current house for 10 years and nothing eventful happened until my first baby was born. Nothing major, just the feeling of being watched, the sound of footsteps upstairs, etc. Very subtle things, but noticeable. I'd also wake up and see what I can only describe as an electric man in my room that I would see for a few seconds and then it would be gone. I put that down to dreaming. When my boy reached about 10 months, it stopped and things returned to normal. My second baby is a week old. Last night, I was sitting in my bedroom with my newborn feeding him a feed before I went to sleep with the nightlight down the hall in my oldest son's room turned off. Three seconds later, I could hear a voice say something that wasn't my son's. I shit myself and got my son out of the room and had him sleep in the bed with me. I happened to mention this to my partner today and he said that's really weird because he slept in there for part of the night last night. No room in the big bed with all three of us in, so we left our bed in the early hours, and had terrible nightmares which he doesn't usually have. Is this a thing? New baby triggers weird stuff happening in people's houses? I also remember being on the phone to my mother last year, talking about something that was really stressful. The conversation was so tense that I didn't notice the banging upstairs until it got really loud and shook my chandelier hanging in the living room. I got halfway up the stairs when a door slammed so I grabbed my son and ran next door. I asked my neighbour to come back into the house with me while I checked upstairs. Nothing there and no windows open. My neighbour 
said he had been hearing banging for the last 10 minutes coming from my house and was wondering what it was. I was so preoccupied on the phone to my mom that I didn't notice till it was really loud. Anyone else have something similar? I've never really told the certain friend mentioned in the story about this because I didn't want to freak her out but I thought it would be cool to share here. I have a million ghost stories, but this one takes the fucking cake for top scariest. So when I, 16 female, was about 11, 12, in the sixth grade, I had a best friend. Let's call her A. A and I were super close at the time, and we would have sleepovers very often. Her house was really big and really old, and some of her family and not family, previous owners, had died in said house. She's seen a bunch of spirits in there. A woman with brown hair packing up, her dead dog, hearing her grandpa's footsteps and some other footsteps that sounded like a little girl. Up until the story happened, I had only really heard the footsteps and in my logical sixth grade brain, choked it up to the AC or some shit. A, however, knew it was a ghost. So one day, she invited me over for a sleepover and I accepted. We were in her room at about 1am doing each other's hair and makeup. We decided to wash up and go to bed. We watched Pretty Little Liars until we fell asleep. Fast forward to about 3.30, I wake up needing to use the restroom. But when I open my eyes, I see this giant ass figure standing at the foot of her bed. Homie, this motherfucker had to be 10 foot tall and completely blacked out. I mean, it was a giant standing shadow. I was like, what the actual shit and decided the restroom could wait because there's no way in hell I'm getting up now. I tried to fall back asleep and I could still hear it breathing and I could feel it looking at me. I swear it knew I was awake. I eventually wake up and it's daylight outside. I wait until breakfast to ask A, so what other spooky stuff goes on around here? She said she pretty much told me everything but then was like, oh yeah, sometimes I see this dark shadow near my bed. Well, damn, that makes sense. Never saw it again after that and continued to spend the night with her often as usual. I do not believe in ghosts or the paranormal. I've never experienced it. I've always been able to debunk it. I'm extremely hesitant to even admit this because I don't believe that's what's happening to myself. But lately, I got pretty spooked in my apartment. I don't know what it is, but there must be a rational explanation, right? Whenever I would enter a room or turn on a light, I would see a black thing scurry and hide. I thought maybe it was an animal, a bug, or some dog fur since my dogs have been shedding like crazy. But whenever I searched for it, or tried to focus my eyes on it when I see it moving, it's just gone. The closest thing I could compare it to is the suit sprites from my neighbor to Toro. This went on for a few weeks before I mentioned it to my partner. They stopped and immediately looked at me to see if I was joking. They're a big believer in the paranormal but know how I feel about it so they don't often admit their experiences to me. But I came to them with this and they were shocked. They've been seeing it too. They described exactly what I've been seeing. We've lived in this apartment for two years now and only recently we started seeing this. It's freaking me out, but there must be a logical explanation, right? I was also in the bathroom last week and it was clear that day that I had heard my partner outside the door and called me. I called back asking what they wanted, but suddenly they were much farther away and sounded confused. They had been in the bedroom the whole time and hadn't heard anything, nor did they call me at all. This could have been the TV, even though it was my closer and louder than the TV. I don't know. Since that experience, we have a cat toy that we bought months ago, but the sound was broken and hadn't made a single sound. All of a sudden, no movement, no touching it. It started this garbled noise non-stop for the past week. It won't stop making this noise, and nothing even triggered it. So 
So a few nights ago, she told me she was just in her room relaxing on her phone. She said at one point she heard my voice behind her very clearly say her name. Not a whisper, but very clear and direct. She said she could easily tell that it was my voice, but that was something about it was off. Something she couldn't point out, but she said something just felt different about it when she heard it. At the time, I was asleep in the living room. That was just the first experience. One day passed and nothing happened. The next day, it was my turn. I stayed up early into the morning on the phone with my girlfriend. The last message I sent was at 1.22 in the morning. So she went to sleep and I was sitting on the couch for a few minutes just listening to music. I walk to the bathroom to pee and I hear her. Her room was across from the bathroom and the hallway is kind of narrow. Through both of the doors, I hear her giggling and laughing. I thought she was watching something on her phone that she found funny and it sounded exactly like her laugh. There's a small crack in her door, so I just kind of glance as I walk past. I didn't stop walking, but saw the light of her phone as I passed by. The next morning, I woke up and she was on the couch, parallel to the one I slept on. After I woke up, I started talking to her and making conversation out of last night. I heard your goofy ass laughing last night, I said. She asked me when, to which I responded around 1.30 in the morning. She had gone to sleep at around 9 last night and hadn't woken up until well into the day. By this point, we were both thoroughly confused at these experiences. What creeps me out the most is that it was almost the same with her experience. Something about her laugh just seemed off, and the laughing I heard went on for a good 5 minutes or so. And she's a deep sleeper, so talking or laughing in her sleep is not a viable explanation. And if it were, it wouldn't explain what she heard two nights before, since we were in completely different rooms. So, this was when I was about 16. My family and I moved into a registered historic home that was 240 years old. It was dated around when our town was founded. When you first walked into the house, you felt it. It was like an ominous cloud that hung over everything. The first experience I ever had was in the parlor that used to hold awakes in it. I was sitting at the computer, we converted it to an office, and I kept hearing loud noises directly above me. The room above me was my bedroom. I was the only one home. I looked around to make sure the dogs were with me and they weren't tearing anything apart. I initially ignored it and it subsided. After about an hour, it started up again with more violence. It sounded like someone had moved my entire wardrobe across the bedroom floor. I ran up the staircase, but by the time I got to the second landing, the sound stopped. I barged into my room and it was completely silent and no furniture had been moved. Second event was a lot more terrifying. It was about 3 a.m. I woke up to the sound of grown men arguing outside my bedroom door. The catch? The only male that lived with us was my 14 year old brother. I jumped out of my bed and flung the door open to catch it. Nothing. I got back in bed after I stupidly locked the door as if it would stop anything. It started again. This time, I went to my grandmother's and brother's separate rooms. They were both asleep and all TVs were off. The toilet down the hall flushed itself and I ran back to my room. Third event is when we decided to move. My brother was taking a shower upstairs. While he showered, a clear, perfect imprint of another set of feet appeared in front of him. Small things had happened in between those events, but they really stood out the most. When we were younger, our cousin Daniela always talked to us about how these two dolls she had were possessed and plotting to kill her. Well, one of the dolls belonged to her and the other was a porcelain Tinkerbell doll that belonged to her older sister. They shared rooms, by the way. 
We never paid any attention to it because she had a wild imagination. Fast forward a few months, maybe even a year, into her telling us these stories. One weekend, my older sister and I stayed over at her house. It was four of us upstairs playing in their room, and we knew to stay on Daniela's side of the room and away from her older sister's side. It was a small room though, and we were children though, so we didn't listen. Somewhere in the middle of being all over the place, we knock down the Tinkerbell doll and it completely shatters. Immediately, we all freak out because we were told by our aunt to stay away from that side of the room and we completely disobeyed her. Not to mention that my aunt was terrifying, so we knew we were in for an ass beating. We tried to think of ways to fix it, but there was no way. It was completely shattered. So we started crying, realizing we're screwed. We go downstairs and in tears to apologize to our aunt for disobeying her and breaking the doll. She starts yelling at us, then decides to go upstairs and clean up our mess. Here's where things get weird. Once she gets upstairs, she starts screaming at us again, but this time she's calling us liars. We run upstairs and come to find out that the doll isn't shattered. It's completely intact and back to where it was before. We immediately look at each other with our jaws dropped. It was then that my cousin Daniela went from being scared with us to almost being relieved and started saying, I told you guys I wasn't crazy. The doll is possessed. I told you, I told you. The rest of us ran out of that room and called our parents to come get us. After that day, we refused to go back to that house. First of all, this took place around midnight two years ago. I was living in a small town surrounded by forests in a block of flats. Whole neighborhood was block of flats. When I was playing on my console with my friends, my parents were going to sleep, so I told them I need to be quieter than usual. They got tired and went to sleep. When I was playing alone, I got really thirsty, so I went to the kitchen to get myself some water. Everything was good, like every night. Everything is quiet, no people playing loud music. I could say that it was the perfect time to relax, but I noticed something weird. It was a lot quieter than every other night. It was like, okay, that's cool. I'll finally get some rest. I was horribly wrong. I had a window open to let in some fresh air in my room, and I think that it was a mistake to open the window that night. I was on my phone when I heard a cat, I think, screaming. When this happened, it started to get weirder every minute. I knew something was off because after that, the wind stopped. Next thing that happened was that weird feeling that is with you every time when you feel like something will happen. Then I heard this growl. I can tell it wasn't any animal because it didn't sound like an animal. When I heard that, I was really scared. When I calmed down, I went to sleep. In the morning, I decided to check out if there were any clues that will help identify that creature, but sadly there was nothing. Today, I think this growl came from the basement which is haunted. Why haunted? The lights in the basement were new at that moment and they were literally going off and on. Next thing is weird noises, even in daytime. Third thing is that there is something in that basement. Me and my friends decided to go there and check it out and the first thing that happened was a loud bang on the doors next to us. That door leads to a room where you can let your clothes dry but when I opened that door, there was nothing. I'm an ICU nurse in France. The ICU ward is made of a long corridor providing access to four units of five rooms. One night shift, we talked about ghosts with co-workers, and I stated that they do not exist at all. Around one hour later, a patient begins to spit blood as usual, so I go with my co-worker to suck the blood out of his mouth with the suction unit. After five minutes of suction, the unit stopped the suction. I thought a blood clot was blocking the system. 
I followed the line to see the clot, and nothing to see except that the device is turned off. It's a key we have to put on or off. I tried to rationalize the events, but it's not an electrical device, so dysfunction is impossible. Strange feeling. My coworker told me that I should keep my mouth shut because someone has something to say to me. Later in the same night, two patients separated by two rooms told us they saw a woman in pink. We all wear white uniforms. No visitors are allowed after 10 p.m. and it was 3 a.m. Goosebumps. No more unsettling event for the rest of the night. The following day, nearly 3 a.m. in one room, a light constantly lit up by itself. Every time we turn the light off, it lights up when we exit the room. We could stay in the room. The light remains off, but as soon as we leave this room, the light turns on. After five light on, off, on, I turned off the light and said, enough, I've had it. And the light remains off. Three days later, near 3 a.m. again, we heard a huge crack on the unit door and the doors began to shake. We looked at each other and new crack, new shaking. We trek through the windows and we can see no one. The corridor's lights remains off, motion sensor. Some weird shit happened later involving the death of a patient, but I can't say more for obvious purposes. So I've been having these experiences since I was 10, and it happened again a couple of nights ago. So a little information, the paranormal is a taboo subject in my family, and I have no one to ask about this. When I was little, my bed was up against the window on the second floor, and I could hear almost everything that would happen outside. One night, I heard this sound like it was a bouncing ball being bounced in front of my window. This night, there was a full moon, so I could see and nothing was there. I logically thought that the house was creaking or whatever. The bouncing ball noise kept on happening multiple times a week. I kind of got used to the sound and it really didn't bother me until the bouncing sound changed. This is when the bouncing ball turned into footsteps. This freaked me out. It was like someone was pacing back and forth in front of my room. So me being young and just trying to make sense of it made this sound my guardian angel and it was just protecting me while I slept. After this occurrence, the two sounds started interchanging back and forth. And as I got older, this started happening less frequently until it stopped. I honestly forgot about it. This noise did follow me to college and I heard it sometimes at night. I've moved back home due to COVID. My room is now on the first floor and the porch is outside my window. The porch is decorated for Christmas, so at night, the porch is illuminated. Skip to a couple of nights ago. My bed is again by the window. I was laying in bed when I heard the bouncing ball and I jokingly said, Hello Guardian, it's been a while. Right after I said that, the pacing started along with the bouncing. This had never happened before and I looked out my window. The porch was illuminated by the Christmas lights and I saw nothing but I could still hear the sounds. I haven't been scared of this since I was little, but with this new development, it's freaking me out. Does anyone know what this could be? I have a spirit in my house. Or multiple, I'm not sure. And I'm not sure which I prefer. It first started when my family bought this house. We think the previous owner used a Ouija board and that it's laying under my sister's room. When I was younger, she experienced all the things like my cats being pushed over after looking at it, dropping stuff, etc. She saw it close our locked laundry door. I used to wake up with random bruises, but whatever. My first encounter was when it imitated my sister. I got home, called out hi, and got a response back. 10 minutes later, she walks through the front door. There's no way she could have gone around without being seen or heard. Then a couple months later, I was sitting on my couch and I saw a spirit over the mattress. And it wasn't one of those situations where you see something out of the corner of your eye. 
there was a presence behind that, along with genuine 100% fear. A couple of weeks after that, I grabbed the Mac from my dad's shed. Whenever I'm alone there, I feel like I'm not. When I came in, I thought I heard a little girl's voice, which I thought came from my neighbor's house, grandkids. No one came or went that day. A couple of weeks after that, I had my mates come over for a birthday sleepover. And while helping my friend when they were having a diabetic hypo, I felt like I was being actively watched and depressed. Then a few days ago, I saw something move behind the bar. And I don't say this lightly, but God, the thing behind there wasn't the little girl. Either there are two spirits in my house, one being a little girl and one being potentially malicious, or there is one spirit who disguised itself as a little girl, and it is powerful enough to oppress me and hide its presence. If this is a dangerous, please help, I beg. Okay, so all of this happened between the ages of seven and 10 for me. I'm 21 now and still wonder what was happening to me. When I was young, I was really tuned into the paranormal and that since has faded. For a few years, things were really crazy for me. From seeing things to hearing voices and feeling a lot of strong and unexplained emotions, plus really scary and vivid dreams. The first time this specific thing happened to me, I was probably seven or eight. So how this experience would start would be I was in bed trying to settle down for the night and I would have a really bad feeling. I would eventually fall asleep and wake in the middle of the night with a feeling of complete terror and having a tingling sensation all over my body. Here's the catch though. What would wake me up would be the sound of someone digging through the toys in my closet. Terrifying. So when I heard the noise, I would get out of bed and start walking to my parents' room. But the moment I would make it halfway across my bedroom, a large black figure would lunge at me, growling very loudly. I always had a nightlight, which was how I saw it. Every time it lunged at me, I would immediately pass out and wake the next morning on my parents' bedroom floor. This continued for a few years, about three times a month, and didn't stop until one night. I just didn't get out of bed and laid there until the feeling of terror subsided. To this day, I'm still incredibly traumatized about it and think about it happening every night before bed. I also believe this is what caused my extreme fear of the dark because before this, I could manage without a nightlight. I've tried Googling this, but never figured out what it was. I considered sleep paralysis, but I don't think that's what it was because I could move. My husband thinks it was a demon because he experienced something similar in his teens when he had a demon living with him. I wasn't more than seven or eight at the time. I'm in my early twenties now. I remember this vividly. At the time, I lived in a small town home with just my older sister and my mother. We each had our own rooms on the same floor. My sister's room was next door to mine and my mother's was no more than 10 feet down the hall. I don't remember much of the day leading up, but it happened when I was asleep. I don't even know if sleep is the right word. At that moment in time, all I knew was darkness. Darkness like I had never known before. Just black nothingness. As if a black mist had set over me and I lost all sense of time. It was hot and I could feel myself sweating but I couldn't move and it was difficult to breathe, as if the mist that sat over me was heavy. I was just there in the nothingness, terrified but unable to speak or move or wake up. Suddenly, the door burst open. It wasn't loud enough to wake my sister up, but I instantly sat up. The black mist disappeared, as if sucked out of the room by something. Sweat was running down my face and my mother stood at the doorway and stared briefly at the room. She quickly scooped me up and brought me to her room for the rest of the night. Years later, when I was in my later teen years, she told me that night she was dreaming 
when she heard someone tell her to wake up to check on me. And when she did, she said she felt the negative energy leaving when she opened the door. We've talked about it a few times over the years, but I've never experienced anything like that again. I was just wondering if anyone has any idea what it could be, or if anyone has had a similar experience. I know this could be sleep paralysis, but due to the fact that my mom had her dream and felt the negative energy, I'm thinking it's more than that. For a while, I thought it was a curse. When I was a kid, I had this Mermaidia Fairytopia Glitter Swirl Fairy Barbie with big plastic wings that had a glitter liquid in them. You'd press a button on a necklace and a gear in the wings would start spinning to make the glitter liquid circulate. Anyways, whenever I clicked the button, it would make a loud brrr sound. Well, I kept my dolls in a plastic container under my bed. And one night, I was woken up by my Barbie toy going off with that familiar brrr sound. Just so you know, you had to push that button hard and hold it. Naturally, kid me freaked out, and my sister tried to calm me down so I'd go back to sleep. The next morning, I found that same Barbie with its head broken off. Needless to say, I never played with it again, and still to this day, don't understand what happened. I shared a bunk bed with my older sister. I had the bottom bunk. Just for scale, I could fit under that bed no problem, even with someone on the bed. There was no way the bed could have pressed on my dolls. The containers were not a tight fit. In fact, it had plenty of room and this wasn't the first time I'd experienced my toys going off by themselves. However, it was the first time one had been broken. In addition to this, my mom had told me about a time when she was asleep and she thought I had come into her room because she saw a blonde little girl out of the corner of her eye. I also have blonde hair, hence the confusion. When she turned to see why I was up, she realised it wasn't me and there was no one there. I had also felt a presence of a child and she would always mess with my toys because I'm guessing we were around the same age at the time. But I didn't really understand that as a kid and usually just got scared. I still occasionally feel her presence and sometimes spot blonde hair out of the corner of my eye. I think she's recently been messing with my little nephew's toys now. When I was a child, I used to see ghosts in our old apartment in Manila. Mostly were just blurry figures of a person that is just passing by. But one night, while I was late at night watching TV, I saw a man standing on our stairs. The man's wearing all black, and I can clearly see his face. I could even see that he's a skinhead. He doesn't look menacing. He's just looking. But I was so scared that I peed my pants. I told my mom about it, but she wouldn't believe me. My dad at that time was a delivery driver, so I barely saw him. We moved to another town after a few years. Decades later, while we're reminiscing about our life in Manila, I told my family how I used to see ghosts in our old apartment. My dad was shook and told us he used to see ghosts too. He asked me why I didn't say anything. I said I told mom, but she wouldn't believe me. My dad said he used to see a black figure of a man on our stairs whenever he came home from work. My younger brother told us that also that he used to see the same black figure around our house. Then I told them I could see him clearly and describe how he looked. My dad told us the reason why he had to do a blood sacrifice of a chicken ritual. It's because of the ghosts he sees. He thought he was just too tired from work. And then he told us the history of that apartment and who he thinks that ghost is. Few years before we moved to that apartment, there was a tenant who committed suicide by hanging himself on the stairs. He was a nursing student studying for his licensure exam and he rented that apartment alone so he could focus. But due to the pressure from his father, who was a military man and beat him, he decided to end his life. Ironically, I'm now working as a nurse and my brother is in the military. We didn't know his story until this year.
We moved to a new state for my job and got this apartment sight unseen. At first, we didn't feel or see anything unusual at first. As time went on, we started noticing a shadow move or times I thought I kept seeing something move in the kitchen area. I didn't say anything at first to my wife because I didn't want to freak her out. One day, I got a call from her at work that things on our shelf launched off. Then she asked if I had seen anything weird. As time went on, we both started seeing these small shadows move around. We'd see drifting smoke in the apartment with no cause for it. My daughter would scream in the middle of the night or during the day about a ghost scaring her. My son would demand the lights be on at all hours, especially in the kitchen. My wife started waking up in the middle of the night, seeing a shadow man standing in the doorway of our bedroom. Then, our smoke detectors started beeping in one room, stopped, then started in another room. We were finally able to move out. When I was there picking up boxes alone after work, I started hearing the beeping go off in the other room. So I walked around the corner to see a shadow man sitting on the edge of the couch looking at me. I hurried up and got out of there. I returned the next day with my co-worker to pick up the remaining boxes and when I was leaving, I saw them again, a head peeking around the corner. My wife returned to do a final walkthrough and some last minute cleaning before turning in the keys. While she was there, a black figure stood in the doorway, pointing towards the door and a bottle of cleaner launched off the counter. As she was getting ready to leave, all the smoke detectors in the apartment started going off, starting at the back of the apartment and moving towards the door. When she locked the door, they all stopped. My girlfriend of over a year now has never mentioned anything like this or related to paranormal activity. Last night while on the phone, she left to go get a drink and I had heard the sound of heavy breathing and what sounded like someone smacking their lips. I paid it no mind as she has a dog and two cats. So when she returned, I asked what animal she was sleeping with. She had told me that they weren't there with her and after talking a bit, she said it was the demon she had been seeing. I played it off as a joke knowing what we like to make jokes to light and tension, but she was serious and promised me it wasn't a joke. She said for the last few weeks she's seen a shadowy figure walking around her room, but it doesn't look human. She stated that she had heard stories from it, and it never sounded like real words, just random things. Obviously freaked out and concerned, I was asking what was happening and if she was okay and whatnot. She then said she could see it currently, but said she wasn't supposed to tell me about her, whatever was in her room. She then went silent and kept talking about it, and saying every time she would blink, it would get closer. Concerned for her, I suggested she turn the light on, as I know people usually react better with lights on. So she called out for her Alexa and did so. She said it disappeared, and that she was feeling better now, and just wanted to head to sleep. She mentioned that whatever she would see, this figure that turning the lights on would make it leave her, so her plan was to turn the lights back off and head to bed. But as she did so, I heard her trembling and repeatedly keep commanding her Alexa to turn the lights back on, over and over, and the Alexa wasn't working. She eventually got the lights on and was freaked out but wouldn't talk about it, just played it off and tried to sleep. I didn't argue or pressure her into talking, I just said okay and let her know I was there. And she soon fell asleep. But does anyone know what we're dealing with? Or what's going on? So I recently started a security guard job for the graveyard shift. The building has 12 floors, roof access, and two parking garages for reference. No one but me and my partner are supposed to be in the building overnight. Also, you need a key card to use the elevator or get in the doors to the stairwell. Anyway, the first night, one of the motion activated toilets went off when no one was near it. We had to do a bathroom patrol. It happened right when we opened the door on a vacant floor. A week ago, 
I was doing a patrol from the 12th floor mechanical room. As I left the room into the stairwell, the rooftop door was being rattled and slightly banged on. I ran up there and there was nothing. I assumed it was a bird or something. I started my way down and then the 11th floor door started jiggling. I jog my way down because it's my job and I had to go there anyway. I swipe my key and there's no one yet again. It was quiet besides toilets and walkie talkies going off when we weren't touching it. Last night, I was doing bathroom patrol at 4 a.m., listening to my music in one ear. I get to the 11th floor to start and I hear footsteps behind me. I pull out the headphones while turning around, getting ready to tell them to get out. Yet again, no one. But right as those footsteps stopped, there were heavy footsteps on the floor above me, but then they stopped right above me when I figured out where they were coming from. After I got out of that floor into the stairwell and shut the door, I heard it sound like it was trying to open, but wasn't moving. There isn't any wind inside the building and nothing showed up on the security cameras. I might try to record tonight. Not sure if I'm allowed to do that, but I'll have to ask. Around 2011, my family was on vacation in the Los Angeles area. My mother is a fan of strange museums, so she would practically drag us kids along to these weird places. She decided we should go to the Queen Mary Museum as it had a reputation for being a haunted tourist trap. I was young and very much afraid of that sort of stuff, but I didn't want to look like a wimp in front of my siblings, so I didn't object to going. Plus. I had just gotten a new iPod Touch and wanted to take photos with it. The ship itself was ancient and sort of run down, but the interior was pretty nice and it had that old school classy charm. We started the ghost tour and ventured into the inner rooms of the ship. The tour had rooms where we would stop and watch these special effects of ghosts and of course that freaked me out so I clung to the back of the group with my older brother was kind of a prankster, but as our protector. I covered my eyes for most of the rest of the tour as the fake ghosts and loud noises completely terrified me. My older brother would do his typical teasing of tapping me on the shoulder and moving away when I turned my head. He did this a few times until I turned around and told him to quit it. Shockingly, it actually worked and he stopped tacking me, which was I was of character for him as normally he would just mess with me more. The tour ended and we went around the rest of the ship taking photos and enjoying our time there. It wasn't until we got off the ship that my brother pulled me aside with a horrified look and told me that when I told him to stop messing with me, he felt a tap on his shoulder. He said he turned around and nobody was there. I believed him as we were in the back of the tour with nobody behind us. Looking back, I think he may have been messing with me again, but it's hard to get a straight answer from him. My dad passed away when I was 13. I remember coming home from the hospital after, and on the radio was the train song, Calling All Angels. The song also played on while on the way to his funeral and during his funeral, the little music they play before everything starts. The song started popping up during special events, birthdays, graduations, etc. It was just a sign to my family that my dad was there with us. Fast forward to me being 22. My boyfriend at the time and I were on our way back from celebrating Christmas with his family about an hour away. We decided to order some food to pick up and take home to eat. While he's inside grabbing it, my dad's favourite song started playing. Not calling all angels, his actual favourite song. He comes back with the food and I say to him, this was my dad's favourite song. I haven't heard it in almost 10 years. I want to finish it before we start driving again. No, we do. Not even a minute later we leave. As we're driving, the car in front of us slams into the back of the car in front of them. 
Turns out there was a massive 15 car pile up. We luckily, miraculously even, were able to avoid it and the wreck stopped with the car in front of us. Had we not stopped, we would have been right in it. Chances are we wouldn't have made it. A lot of fatalities, unfortunately. There was a weird calming feeling in the car and I started crying. I said, oh my God, I think my dad just saved us. And the song completely switches mid song to calling all angels. This was almost 10 years ago and I'll never forget it. I also should mention we were on a country station. So there was absolutely no reason for that song to even play. I had a weird encounter today at the gym. I usually don't go to this gym too often, but today I walked into the men's changing room and I walked past what looked like a man standing by the mirror. He was shirtless and was either wearing all black pants or shorts. I couldn't remember when I walked past. I wasn't paying much attention, but he was just looking straight into the mirror, standing still. As I walked behind him to the benches to change, he was the only one in there with me. As I walked to the benches, it was really quiet and each step I took echoed really loud and bounced right back all around me. I don't know how else to explain it, but it just didn't feel right in there. But I just ignored not even having a reason to feel that way. As I put my jacket in my bag and took everything out of my pockets, I kind of felt eyes looking at me, but just ignored it as my back was facing him and it felt as if he turned over to his right to look over at me. When I was done putting my stuff away and turned back around, he wasn't in front of the mirror anymore. I walk back towards the mirror to walk where I had first come from to exit. And once I got to the mirror, I look to my left and I see him there posted up by the wall with a very creepy smirk looking right at me. His eyes, I couldn't really comprehend. His face looked deformed. I was kind of in a shock. He looked like the truth or dare face if you've seen the movie. I paused and got a good look at him and then just walked out as I was walking out. I said, you think I'm scared of you motherfucker? No reply and walked out the changing room door and did my workouts. I've heard stories of jinns, demons appearing to people in human form in all black clothing and just look like regular people. I've had a couple experiences like that not too long ago, but what happened today? was much more aggressive. About a year and a half ago, my husband and I were temporarily separated. My teenage daughter and I had moved into an apartment. We were on good terms and he had the access code to get into the apartment. After I had gone to bed one night, I heard the door open and close. I propped up on my elbows to look out of my bedroom door, down the hallway, into the living room, where I saw my husband standing. I asked him, what are you doing? He was looking at me, but didn't reply and turned and walked into the kitchen. I thought, whatever, and laid back down and went to sleep. The next morning I called him and asked him what he wanted last night. He said, what do you mean? I replied, what did you want when you came over last night? To this day, he swears he didn't come over. My daughter and I moved back into our house about a year ago. Last week, I was in the shower and heard my husband coughing inside the bathroom. I hadn't heard the door open. I said, Jesus, you scared the shit out of me. Again, no reply. And I heard the door close. After I got out of the shower and dressed, I went to the living room where he was. I asked him what he wanted. Again, I got a... What are you talking about? I said, you came into the bathroom while I was in the shower. He told me he never got off the couch. Then last night, we were both sitting on the couch right next to the door when the doorbell rang. This doorbell isn't just a two note type of ding dong. My husband set it to play the dang national anthem. So it played the whole thing. As soon as it started, he got up and opened the door to, you guessed it, no one. He even went outside and looked around the house. Nothing. 
I don't think he believed in seeing and hearing him. After the doorbell thing, I think he's a little spooked. So in Christchurch about a decade ago, there was an earthquake which resulted in the demolition of a large urban area, which is the Red Zone. My friend lives right next to the Red Zone. She's right on the edge where the demolition happened. Every now and then, I would go to her house and we would go on walks in the night. About three years ago, it was just the two of us and we went pretty deep into the Red Zone. Around a point where there used to be a house we saw, what looked like a short, probably like four to five feet, hunched person near a huge bush. We assumed it was like a crackhead or something. When I saw it, I got a lump in my throat and got goosebumps. But my friend went ahead and tried to talk to it. When she said, what's up? There was this weird animalistic noise. Sort of like a New Zealand possum if you've ever heard one. And then it stood up and ran into a bush on its hind legs. We were both really confused and tried to find it in the bush, but couldn't see anything. I got really worried at this point and asked if we could go home. As we walked back, we started to get lost, even though it's usually really easy to find your way around. We'd walked for like five minutes before seeing the figure, but it took us nearly half an hour to get back home. When we did, I couldn't sleep that night and felt myself sweating really bad, even though it wasn't hot. My friend felt the same. Does anyone have a similar encounter or know why this might have been? Most people don't believe me and I feel insane, but my friend remembers it vividly too. We went on drugs, except for some weed, and it definitely wasn't an animal. No animal in Christchurch is that big. If someone could shed some light on this, it would be great. Never seen anything like it before or since. When I was around six, I lived in a huge house that was quite intimidating and not very homey. I used to hear a man's voice shouting in my ears, but I think I knew it was in my head too. I would go down to the large garden and shout back and say things like, shut up, etc. Anyways, I came to find that a builder fell off the roof and passed away during construction. My mom also said that she felt a force behind her while she was walking down the stairs sometimes. I've had a few other paranormal or psychotic episodes in my life. I went to an old boarding school established 1895 and have vague memories of seeing what I only imagined to be ghosts or spirits walking in the courtyard and passengers when I would wake up randomly at night. These experiences don't seem very clear, but they also don't seem like a dream. I also remember waking up one night and seeing my friend reaching for the cabinet above his bed. I asked what he was doing because it was very late and dark. I turn on the light and he's fast asleep under his duvet. What I saw was just a dark silhouette. Now more recently after going out, I came home to my flat alone and kept hearing my friend's voice calling me. It felt so real and I would follow the voice to see my friend or respond. I just couldn't convince myself that I was alone for some reason. About three weeks ago now, after another night like that, I experienced full-blown psychosis, I think. I was dancing and the venue had these trees near the DJ. They were brushing my arm and torso and I was totally convinced that it was someone was rubbing their hands on me and kind of groping me. It made me flinch a couple of times and I was able to tell myself it was in my head. I then asked my friend to swap places with me and it was fine after that. My sister and I were just talking on the phone about some strange things that had happened to us all throughout our time in our childhood home. I mentioned that I thought our home was haunted because our mother had taken a rock from Auschwitz and brought it back home. My working theory is that the rock itself carries energies or memories or spirits that are imprinted into the stone 
because of the horrific trauma within the walls of the concentration camp. My sister and I were sharing stories and experiences we had had that correlated with the time the rock had been in our family home, as well as correlated to the movement of the rock from room to room. I'm very aware that what my mom did was disrespectful and disturbed some energies. It's just taken a long time to put two and two together about our experiences and this object. I'm thinking of contacting a rabbi from a local synagogue to ask what the best way to go about this is. But if any of you have any ideas or information that could maybe help us out in our search, we'd really appreciate it. Just for reference, things we would experience in our house were physical pain unrelated to any obvious injury, mental health struggles and thoughts of ending our own lives, unexplained and unintelligible whispering or shouting, loud bangs with no discernible cause, strange sounds coming from underneath the floor in my bedroom, odd lights and anomalies in my sister's bedroom, and an atmosphere of constant unease or anxiety. Any ideas you all have would be greatly appreciated. We don't know how to go about this, but we definitely want to talk to our mom about having something done to cleanse the house and doing something with the rock that honors the spirits of the innocent dead while banishing any evil spirits connected to it. I went to the Birdcage Theatre in Tombstone earlier that day then returned to my hotel over a silver mine. Around 2am, I awoke to a flashing light. The front door is lateral to my bed, and its window has a curtain over it. The tiny space between the curtain and the window sheds light right into my eyes. Then, there was an urgent, quick, yet muted knock on the door. Around 8 to 10 knocks in very quick succession. Then the door handle started to turn back and forth aggressively. Luckily, it was locked, and I thought it was an intruder with malintent or someone who was lost looking for the other apartments on site. Then, I heard the sound of an old clock's second hand start ticking away in the corner of the room next to the door. I remembered there was no clock there, which I confirmed in the morning. The second hand continued for about an hour, I got out of bed during this time and peeked out the windows. There were no lights outside, no sign of cars, no footsteps circling. It was extremely cold, even though the heater was on pretty high. I got out of bed pretty quickly after the intruder heard me grab a weapon to defend myself. There were no other sounds, like footsteps or anything, except the clock continued. I was sure it was a human, but everything about this seemed too weird. Like I couldn't replicate the knock sound on the door or the walls, and the handle turning only sounded the same when I tried it from outside. There are security cameras, but I haven't heard back yet as to whether someone approached the door seeking entry. The weirdest part for me was the sound of the clock, because that is the only thing I cannot explain if it were a real person. So I've had encounters pretty much all my life. It started when my grandmother on my father's side passed away a year before I was born. Eventually, after I was born, the house we lived in started to be filled with the scent of her perfume. Our dog would go nuts at shadows on the walls, and at night, the mobile above my crib would randomly go off. It even continued until a speaking book on the floor opened up and started to play. Eventually, my family queued in and told her to leave, and all was thought to be good. When we moved to our new house, I developed a fear of going up the stairs by myself, due to the shadow person. My family for years believed it was always fear of the day, as I had always said the shadow person lived on the top of the stairs. We'll flash back to two years ago now, and when with a medium, she asked me about the stairs and what is wrong with them. I responded, I saw something there, and she said, oh, that's just your grandmother watching you. 
that quickly became commonplace as I started to see my grandmother's spirits in my room for sometimes weeks on end. It would even sit by the foot of my bed and sometimes I could feel her walking behind me. That was another thing the medium told me about was her spirit was aware when I knew she was around. But recently things sort of shifted. One night I woke up to a dark shadow thing standing on the edge of my bed. When I told my family, my brother chimed in, oh, you see that too? Sometimes it comes to my room and watches. He showed us where it watches from and it was a straight beeline to where it appeared in my room. It freaked out my family as it wasn't anybody we could have known and nobody had died recently. So we now stay on the lookout for the creature dubbed Bob. It's about 1am right now as I'm writing this. The story I'm about to share happened roughly 25 minutes ago. It's been a long night and I'd just gotten home from hanging out with my friends. It's pretty late so I decided to try and get some sleep. I usually sleep with some type of noise in the background, whether it be TV or a fan of sorts, but tonight was different. I decided I wanted to sleep with calm music on through my Bluetooth speaker. Everything was fine until about three and a half songs in. All of a sudden, my music stopped playing. I didn't touch anything on my phone and nobody else was able to connect to it, nor did it make the disconnect or reconnect noise. It was fully charged too, so there was no way it could be dead. After a few seconds of silence, a sudden sound of white noise is quietly playing on the speaker. Following that, what sounded like an old raspy woman started whispering through it. It was hard to make out exactly what she said, not to mention I was shitting my pants at this point. It sounded like she said, he's the one, but it might be a stretch. After a few seconds of her whispering, it stops. There's a final blip of white noise and then it cuts off completely. My speaker is still on, but it's not connected to anything. I ran out of my room and I'm writing this in another bedroom. I know ghosts like to tamper with electronics, especially knowing that I'm alone in a dark room. My house is also rumoured to be haunted by my family. Even the first time we had shown my grandmother it, the first thing she said was, there's something here. My dad has mentioned seeing ghosts and even hearing them sometimes. So was this really a ghost trying to talk to me? Or possibly a malfunction with the Bluetooth and its radio? Please help me figure this out. Earlier today, I wanted to get out of the house. It's been raining here for almost a week off and on. So once I saw it was going to be sunny, I decided we should go to the beach. I left my phone behind, which isn't unusual because I have a habit of dropping it at the beach or on hikes. This comes up later. We get to the beach and park and I see a dog in a car parked near us and I call my girlfriend to show her. As she approaches her phone, rings and I see on the caller ID, my name and number. She asked if I had pocket dialed her and instinctively I reached for my heaviest pocket, which had my wallet in, but I remembered I left my phone. I stop cold and tell her my phone is on the couch at home. She picks up and hears a deep voice speaking through static. I have a very deep voice but she told me she couldn't tell who it was or what it was saying before it hung up. She calls back and rings it twice and goes to voicemail. I'm freaked out now because when we first met years ago, I had just moved to this town and I saw myself on the street jogging. I ended up chasing this person but couldn't catch them. I kept yelling trying to get their attention but they just kept going putting more and more distance between us. I stopped and some nearby people commented on my twin I was racing. This further cemented what I saw. It was 100% me I was chasing, now this. When we got home, my call log didn't have the history of a call outgoing or the call she returned. 
Any thoughts on this or my other experience? And has anyone had any experiences like this? It was an old Victorian built in 1890 in Rhode Island. My mom had the master bedroom on the first floor off the living room. And my two siblings and I had the three bedrooms on the second floor. If my mom forgot to set her alarm for work at night, the clock radio in the living room or the kitchen would go off at the time she needed in the morning. Without fail, and again, only when she forgot to set hers. Another time, my brother had called me in the afternoon, asking if our mom was okay because he assumed she had been at work when he noticed her car wasn't in the driveway, but heard her in her bedroom. Apparently, our dog started barking and he heard our mom clear as day yell, shut up, honey. This was followed by some rustling. I told him my mom was not home and I had to come home to keep him company because of course he was terrified. The most notable experience took place on a night that my two brothers and I were home alone watching TV. My mom was taking care of our nana this night so it was just us. The three of us heard the front door open, keys jingling and footsteps coming in. We assumed it was mom and we all looked towards the entryway to greet her. Nothing. I called her up asking why she left. She said she, said she never came home. I don't know how else this could be explained when all three of us distinctly heard someone enter the house. Yes, the door was locked. I was a psycho about that when we were home alone. Another weird thing that may not mean much is I frequently had some vivid nightmares of a shadow man being in the house with me. I never had those dreams again after moving out. I never found out if there were any deaths or anything here either. I was about eight years old. This was my first paranormal experience and still freaks me out to this day. My best friend had a wealthy grandmother in Essex, England. She had a three-story Victorian house, which I often stayed at. There was one time that I stayed there after school. It was around 5 p.m. and we were there alone waiting for her mum to pick us up. We were bored in the house and so we decided to have a look in the third floor cupboards. There were lots of random empty diaries and notebooks and we took them to the tree house that was at the end of the garden and played with them by writing rubbish in them and pretending to be bookkeepers, shopkeepers, etc. The tree house was like a five minute walk away from the back entrance. The backyard was huge. As we were playing in the little tree house, we both heard her mum's voice coming from the house saying, girls, girls, it's time to go. Come on and let me in. We didn't expect her for at least another hour, so this confused us both. We reluctantly walked through the backyard and into the house. We kept hearing, girls, girls, let me in. It's time to go home. There was also a loud banging on the front door. We were cautious and looked through the front window before we went to answer the door. And we noticed that her mum's car was not in sight and we couldn't see who was behind the door banging. We both freaked out and ran to hide upstairs in the third story wardrobe. The banging stopped after about five minutes, but we both stayed up there for a good half hour until my friend's brother came home and opened the front door himself. Has anyone ever had a similar experience? This entity had taken on the voice of my friend's mom and was asking us to let it in. And we almost did. I worked as a chef here for about five years. There have been many small stories, little things that have happened. And this is my most memorable experience. I stayed late one night during the week to clean some equipment that needed it pretty badly. Closer to the end of my extra hours, I had to finish up with some dishes and other minor things that moved through the dish pit. The door to the dishwasher from one of those older machines was actually semi-difficult to pull up. 
the slide part of the door had been beaten for years, so it was on the sticky side. You literally had to put a little muscle into it to raise it up. Sometimes it would even get stuck, so of course a couple bangs on the side and a thrust on the handle would usually do it. I was standing in front of it, I had a sense of eerie like someone was nearby, and bang, a flash lit up the sterling silver panels of the dishwasher. My immediate thought was that one of the late night drunks was messing with me, like a flash on a camera. I slammed the door shut and ran around the loop, from one kitchen exit to another, which took you through a hallway and around dining tables. No one was up there. I checked both bathrooms, both sides of the floor, nothing. But when I came back, the door to the dishwasher was open and water was spilling all over the floor. I mopped it, then continued cleaning to get the hell out of there. I'm ready to leave, so I'm almost there. Had to run one last set through, and I shut the dishwasher door down. I know it was down. I looked at it and even thought to myself, it's down. I went to the men's room to take a leak and returned to the kitchen with the door open and water all over the floor. Let's just say I did a shit mop job and bounced. When I was about five or six years old, my mother, father, grandmother and I went to this restaurant out in a semi-remote location. It has since been turned into a factory area, but at this time it was a log cabin type restaurant back off the road in the woods. My father was a big talker. He'll pretty much have a really long conversation with anyone if they get to talking. He was closing up a conversation with this guy whom he went to high school he hadn't seen in a long time. My mother, grandmother and I went outside to head onto the vehicle. I was getting a little tired because it was late, so my grandmother picked me up. She was holding me like a bear hug and I had my head on her shoulder, and behind the restaurants illuminated by a telephone pole slash streetlight, I saw a very tall figure. It was probably seven to eight feet tall, completely covered in blonde hair. Sort of like Cousin It from Adam's family, but with more noticeable features. I said, Grammy, there's a monster. She turned around and saw it too. She started running towards the car. About this time, my mother saw it too. It didn't come towards us. It just turned and stared at us. We were all freaking out, and then my dad came out of the building. He started running too because we were terrified. He didn't see it though, because once he came around, it took off into the woods, or at least out of eyesight. I know Bigfoot seems like a hard pill to swallow, but I saw something that night. I know I was a child, but we all saw it. My mom and I talked about it for the first time in years today, because we drove past the place the restaurant used to be. And she described it exactly how I remember it. About seven years ago, I was at my boat. It was an old wooden cabin cruiser that I kept at an old broken down marina on the Chesapeake Bay. I slept on the boat in the main salon on a pull out couch. I was lying on my back and in the middle of the night, I awoke to find myself with a giant male black Labrador retriever straddling me with his legs either side of me on the bed. He was just standing there looking around like I wasn't there at all. I immediately thought I was dreaming. I said I was going to shut my eyes and open them again, and it would be gone. I shut them and reopened them, and it was still there. It wasn't mean or aggressive, just huge. I shut them again and reopened them, and it was gone. Later that morning, a worker at the marina fell to his death off the top of a travel lift, a big crane that hauls boats in and out of the water. I had never heard anything about black dog apparitions in my life and thought it was just a dream. But when I googled it, apparently they're often seen near water and can be an indicator of death. I was pretty blown away after that. So the boat I'm sleeping on is also haunted. 
I know it's haunted because the ghost would always play tricks on me, turning on switches to things I knew I had turned off. The ghost's favourite thing was to turn on my freshwater pump after I left. It was a pull-out switch on the console and it wasn't easy to pull out either. It got so bad that one weekend I had my friend watch me turn it off. I get back the following Friday and it was back on off course. I believe the ghost is the original owner, a friend of mine. The boat was his pride and joy. So all throughout my life, focusing on more recent events in the past, I've been able to make shockingly accurate predictions about events within the next few minutes to hours. This has happened to me more than a few times, enough so that my friends in college had a running joke about it. I say predictions because I'm not sure what other word to use. In college, I majored in physics and statistics. So I have a pretty thorough understanding of biases and likelihood of certain events. On that note, one of the best examples I have of repeating predictions in a short frame was playing a dice game with my friends in college. Objective of the game is not important, but what is important is everyone is in a circle rolling two dice in turn. We were all having fun and joking around, so I started trash talking, which makes no sense for a game of complete chance and calling out the number pairs other people would roll. Funny thing was, I was getting it exactly right over and over again. It spooked the hell out of one of my friends who was actually paying attention, and she started counting. All in all, I got 38 correct dice predictions in a row, only stopping when the game ended. The rational part of my brain says I was just getting lucky and having a good time, but the much quieter part of my brain knows I wasn't. There was an odd feeling each time I would call a number pair. It's difficult to describe other than assured or confident. And not like misplaced confidence, more like actually knowing to the points where any other outcome would be ridiculous. What do you guys make of this? It happened a ton, but like the dice incident was my clearest example of it continuously happening on individual events where I had no control of the outcome. So for context, I live in Melbourne, Australia, and on the suburbs outside my city, there's a prison called HM Prison Pentridge that functioned up until the 80s. It's most famed for being the place where Ned Kelly was hanged and buried, but most of the original building has been lost to housing developments. The place is abandoned and only accessible by ghost tours, as the prison is famed for being ridden with paranormal activity, with the earliest paranormal sightings occurring in 1919. Early this year, I went on a ghost tour through the D Division, and we were on the ground floor, and I was looking towards the back wall. The wall was around 15 meters away, and the closest cell towards the back belonged to a serial killer named Mark, nicknamed Chopper, Red. He's most notorious for cutting off his ears while he was in prison. He claimed to have killed 19 people, but he was never charged with murder. The specific cell he stayed in for the majority of his 25 year sentence was behind a gate where they kept prisoners who'd be bullied and beaten by other prisoners such as rapists and paedophiles. But Chopper had a good reputation among the guards who would often let him out of his cell and into the greater caged off area. He was released from prison and became a novelist and author of children's books. He died of liver cancer in 2013 as a free man. But some people say his spirit is still trapped in Pentridge. So anyway, the guide was talking, but I was looking up towards the back wall where Chopper's cell was. And I see a shadowy black figure of a man leaning against the brick wall, with his arms folded and one foot up against the wall. Then, when we were going to move on, the figure pushes itself off the wall, stumbles a little, I blink, and it's gone. I couldn't stop thinking about it on the drive home. Me and some friends were camping in a place called Karen Valley. As soon as we pulled up to the tracks, 
we all started seeing these spirals of color in front of us, almost like light trails. All three of us were a bit spooked, but didn't think anything of it. That night, we had a campfire and decided to get an early night. We were all completely sober. I was trying to sleep in the camper van and we had left the door open, maybe a foot for some fresh air. And suddenly, I saw a red and green light almost dancing with each other and could hear giggles and chatting. I was frozen in slight shock and fear as I genuinely felt like I was going insane. And I tried to call out to my friend to tell her, I can see fairies. Next thing I know, I can see basically a whole lot of things. They were druids, elves, things about a foot tall, even pixies on mini horses. I know it sounds utterly unbelievable, and trust me, if someone told me this, I would think they were high, but I was 100% sober. I lay there watching this for about an hour, frozen in shock and yes, fear. At one point, the pixies were throwing stones at me through the gap in the door. I finally plucked up the courage to turn around and face the other way when I must have fallen asleep. I woke up in the middle of the night and experienced the realest deja vu ever. I'd literally lived that before. The next morning, my two friends both shared that they had a dream that this place was the mother load entrance. I feel weird typing this out as it's something very personal and private to me that I've only shared with my mother and probably won't share with many people. So this probably isn't as scary as most of the stories on this subreddit, but I'll put it in here anyway. I was 16 when this happened. So my mom and I stayed the night at my sister's house. We were staying in a bedroom in the basement. The basement was completely renovated and had windows and a door leading into the backyard, so not very creepy. My mom's sister and her kids were all upstairs eating breakfast while I went to have a shower in the bathroom right next to our room. Everything was fine until I got out and was drying myself off. As I was drying myself off, the light started to lightly flicker, but I didn't think anything of it. I realized I forgot to grab my clothes, so I quickly dried off, wrapped the towel around myself, and went to the door. It didn't open. I figured that I might have locked the door, but just forgot, though I was sure I didn't, and unlocked it and tried to open it. It still didn't open. It was then that the light started to flicker more rapidly, as if someone was quickly hitting the light switch on and off. I started to freak out and desperately tried to open the door, but it wouldn't budge, no matter what I did. The light started to flicker on and off quicker and quicker. I yelled for help and I could hear my mom running down the stairs. But then the light stopped and I was suddenly able to open the door right as my mom was rounding the corner to enter the hallway. When I told my mom and sister, they thought it was so funny. My sister said it was probably the steam making the lights flicker, but that doesn't explain why the door wouldn't open no matter which way I turned the lock. The whole incident from when the lights started rapidly flickering to when I was able to open the door probably lasted 25 to 30 seconds. Stull, Kansas, is notorious for an old church and cemetery said to be haunted. I live 10 minutes max from Stull and drive through it all the time. All of us do. Some people believe the hype, some have used internet information to debunk it. Doesn't matter to me. I don't know what to believe, but I know what happened this particular night. Friend and I driving, 2 or 3 a.m. Stull is set away out on some winding roads in the country and I'm terrible with directions because I never had a car till I was 20. I'm 25 now and getting better. Cruisers like this for me are destinationless because I'm always lost. Car has old locking brakes I'm pretty sure. So we were driving and a dog or deer ran out in front of my car. I slam on the brakes on the gravel and we skid sideways on the road to a halt. As we do so, the figure floats down the ditch of the road, 
up the other side and over the fence, disappearing. On the other side of the fence, a large hill and what I assume is the old Stull Cemetery. One not easily found from the main roads. Due to the winding roads and the properties being blocked off with gates here and there, somehow I had managed to skid to a complete stop in the dead of the night, in the middle of nowhere, because a ghost had run across the road. And there, she disappeared into the cemetery. And we got the whole ass entire fuck out of there. Believe what you want. I'm 27 and have very, very few freaky experiences like this to recite. But this is the real deal here, folks. I have nothing to gain. I don't know any of y'all. I'm just a corn-fed Kansas boy who shit his pants on a dirt road. When I was younger, I had this reoccurring dream that I was with someone at a red light, awaiting the left-hand turn lane to be green. My friend looked to me and said, I'm sorry, but your black bean burger will never compare to my double whopper. The light turned green and we laughed. There was a blue Volkswagen behind us, lost control and I'd wake up. Years of dreams pulled me forcing different scenarios such as pull into the Popeyes, the Blockbuster, the Long Johns, etc. until the blue Volkswagen would spin out of control and I'd wake up. Back to reality, I'm 17 in my first apartment with my good friend. I worked three jobs, but gave up one so I had my first full day off in months. My friend decided to treat me to her favourite taco truck about an hour away. We were joking about it if the beans would have pork fat or not, and I said it would be one of those things I wouldn't ask. She joked about getting meat. I jokingly said, never. Then she said, I'm sorry, but your black bean burger will never compare to my double whopper. I went blank. We turned left. There was a blue Volkswagen behind us. I didn't know what to do, but as we passed the Popeyes, I told her to drive carefully because the blue Volkswagen was about to lose control. I told her to stay ahead of it. They sped up next to us and she sped up to get further ahead of it. And the fucker lost control and in a four lane highway hit each one. We were holding hands and crying but didn't stop. I had told her about this dream but not the specific line she would say. The tacos were not that good, which is the worst part. I have stories of paranormal activity, but it's never scary to me, just annoying as fuck. When I was little, I was playing on the sofa and my foot got stuck in between the cushions. Something grabbed my foot. I couldn't set it free, so I started screaming for help. My mom came into the room and immediately it let go. My mom didn't believe me, I don't blame her. I tried recreating to see what just happened and it didn't happen again. It happened a few more times. Then I just stopped jumping on the sofa altogether. Being touched while I sleep. This is more recent. I hate being touched in the first place, so this just irks me to no end. I don't have any pets that free roam other than a hamster. I thought it was a bug and I just recently got this mattress for a hefty price. I cleaned out my sheets and bedding. To just cover my bases, I did a deep clean of my whole apartment, but I never saw anything. The next time it happened, I was so pissed because I love my sleep. I just said, stop touching me, and it just stopped. It always made my feet butt and face. It's like, yes, I'm human. I bet you were human at one point too. This anatomy is not unfamiliar to you, so just leave me alone. After saying stop, it hasn't occurred again. My blanket's been pulled off the bed. This is more recent too. I was scared the first time. I couldn't go back to sleep, but now I'm just plain annoyed. All of my paranormal experiences have been more annoying rather than scary. Nothing like the movies, but I know movies dramatize things. What about y'all?
The second flat I ever rented was in Camberwell, London. It's a low rise block, probably from the 1960s, and I was renting, living there on my own. Now, a few things happened during the first few months of my stay. I'd come home from work and a few kitchen unit cupboards would be open. No biggie. Can I be sure I closed all the cupboards at 7.30 this morning after I rushed breakfast? This happened more than a few times. Then I came home to my breakfast bowl smashed in the middle of the kitchen floor. Pretty sure I left it on the side where it wouldn't fall off. But again, it fell off. So maybe I didn't. Turning point for me was one night, while fast asleep, my bedroom door slammed shut. Very loudly. Now... I always sleep with my door an inch or two open, and I know doors can close on their own, but this must have had some good force behind it. Anyway, I decided to put my four-legged chair up against the handle of my bedroom door. It wouldn't have worked if you were to move the handle, as the chair wasn't high enough, but it made me feel better. I woke up minutes before my alarm, usually to find the chair facing the opposite way round, the back facing away from the door. Now maybe I did some sleepwalking, maybe I did it, but that was enough for me. I packed a bag, grabbed my wallet and keys, and while still in my dressing gown, drove to my parents. I informed my landlord that I was moving out immediately. Keep the deposit, I'm out. I think the place is haunted, and I'm a wimp to that sort of thing. He laughed. Funny enough, he said, you're not the first person to say that. I'll give you a deposit. I grew up with a mom who was very interested in the paranormal, but I was freaked out by it and never wanted anything to do with it. I had my first paranormal experience last year that is impossible to believe wasn't real. I went to live in a friend's house during the beginning of the pandemic last year and stayed there for around five or six months. I'm really close to her family and they're like my second family. A bit before this time, she had explained to me that her father had been violent towards her, and there was just a lot of general negativity in the house. Me going there was great for her and her sister because their parents wouldn't fight or anything while I was present. I was sharing a room with my friend and sleeping on a futon right by the door. There was no furniture, chairs, clothes, nothing here. One night, I randomly woke up, very unusual for me, and felt I needed to look at the foot of the bed. Her door is stark white. I saw the figure of a small black creature that looked like a really skinny man with a large head. I didn't feel scared at all. I felt like it was just observing me. I kept looking at it for a minute, then shined my phone at it, and it was gone. I told my friend's sister about it, thinking it was a dream. But the night before, she told me she also saw it. She thought her cat was on her shelf, but looked and saw this black little outline of a man moving her legs around. We researched about it a bit and came to the conclusion that it might have been thriving off of the negative energy in the home and was observing me as a new person who didn't have the same negative energy. After that night, we didn't see it again. I left their house about a year ago and I don't know if they spotted it again. I went to a veterinarian camp when I was about 15 years old, hosted by a zoological park in my state. It was a co-ed session where all the kids slept in a huge house together, with the boys upstairs and girls downstairs. One night, I was laying downstairs in the living room floor in my sleeping bag. In the way the house was set up, the living room had a vaulted ceiling that went all the way up to the second floor. You could see the upstairs hallway because there was a railing. The boys had just used the bathroom and went into their rooms for the night. For some reason, I was the last one asleep. The boys had left the bathroom door cracked and it suddenly swung open about two feet. It was weird to me, but could have been explained by the AC or something else. But it was midnight and everything seems scarier at midnight. After that, one of the camp counsellors came out of her room 
asking if we were slamming cabinets shut. We weren't and everyone was asleep. She went back into her room, kind of confused. On the doors in this house, there were alarms that sounded if they opened, along with a blinking red light that I assumed signaled if the alarms were alarmed or not. I was facing the kitchen where there was a back door directly in my field of view. All of a sudden, the alarm starts beeping and the kitchen is pitch black. Keep in mind that I could normally see inside the kitchen at night due to outdoor lights and general light pollution in the area, but this time I couldn't. It was like a curtain fell on the kitchen and I saw absolutely nothing. I know this probably doesn't sound all that weird, but I had such an odd, heavy gut feeling that it was the night I was going to die. I couldn't move, but somehow I fell asleep. Okay, so when I was like a really young boy, I remember seeing sudden imagery of a person taking a single step out from behind a barrier in the corner of my eye. It could be a wall, a car, a tree, anything. I would just see a person taking a single step out from behind it. Once I turned to look at who it was though, I would find nobody there to see. Another thing is, I never saw the full appearance of the person walking out from behind whatever barrier it was. I only saw their shoe and leg before whirling around in surprise. It was almost always at night, from what I can remember. One vivid memory is when I was with my mom in a parking lot, and I saw someone in full white clothing. It was a suit with nice shoes, I'm pretty sure. Begin to step away from behind a car. I turned to look, and there was nobody there. I remember asking her, Mom, do you ever see a person walking in the corner of your eye, but they're not really there? She told me that I was seeing an angel. I was young, around nine or ten, so I believed her. But in later years, I began to actually question what I was seeing. The occurrences were always sudden, never failing to startle me. I would wonder what the hell just happened every time. By now, I'm 16 years old, and I haven't seen any of these people in a long, long time. But it keeps coming back up in my head. What was I seeing? Does anyone else experience this? Why is it stopped? I have so many questions. Does anyone have any similar stories or know what was happening? Anything at all would help. It's been a mystery to me for my whole life. I don't know if this matters, but I live in the Florida Panhandle, Penascola, Destin area. There are some places where I live that are considered active in paranormal activity. And growing up here, I've experienced some shit that just doesn't make any damn sense, no matter how much sense I try to make of it. I consider myself a very logical and rational person. I don't scare easily and like to assess a situation before jumping to conclusions. With that said, I'm also not religious and I'm not a firm believer in the paranormal. I am open-minded and understand that some weird shit that can happen and it's better left alone. I'm a very light sleeper. I live in a nice neighborhood with mostly retired folks and the houses aren't close together. So there's no way I'd be able to hear what I heard from a neighbor. With that said, I woke up around 2.30 a.m the distinct sound of a baby's laughter in my room. The only people in this house are me and my son, who's 18 and has his own room. I know what his laugh sounds like, and it sure as shit wasn't this. Hearing this woke me up immediately, and several seconds following it, my son comes into my room and asks if I heard it too, so I know I wasn't just hearing things. Naturally, we were a little freaked out, and I grabbed my firearm that I keep on my nuts and... He grabs his own and we sweep the house. Nothing. We checked under the beds, the living room, all closets and corners, the fucking garage. Not one damn thing. No other TVs were on, no music was playing. Nothing. It was dead ass quiet. So what in the actual fuck? Anyone else experience this shit?
First time poster here. I've had this brooding in my mind for years and have to get it out. I can't remember the year exactly. I know I was no older than 10 and I'm 25 now. It was me, my dad and my Mima, at the time staying in the same house, my Mimas. The day was normal, but then night came and I was restless, just couldn't sleep. Right as I started to finally get comfy, I heard my Mima start wailing. Now mind you, she isn't a frail person. At the time she was a corrections officer at the local jail and had just started karate as well. I naturally froze in my room and not knowing what to do until my dad opened my door and told me to come check on her with him. We went down the hall to her room and opened the door and that's where it got worse. My Mima was still crying out in her sleep and kind of halfway writhing in her bed and above her in the corner was something I can only describe as darker than dark. It's hard to explain but it was a dark solid mass in the shadowy dark corner of the room and I remember feeling nothing but absolute terror. This primal instinct is the kind no kid should feel. But when my dad turned on the light, it was gone. Since then, my Mima has had a cross in every room and no incident since. I hadn't thought about it for a while until my dad had brought it up when visiting family once, and I realized it stuck with him too. I'm not overly religious, but I've never had a spirit paranormal experience. Give me the same fear as this did. It gives me that same fear to think about what I saw and to think why it was attacking my Mima. As a kid, I was moved around a lot. The sixth house was outside of a small town called Beaver Lodge. It was located far back from the road and the driveway was a kilometre long. The tree line behind our house was off limits as it was full of muskeg that in the past had swallowed up cattle and a tractor. We had 10 acres but only had access to two. The house was previously owned by drug dealers so from day one it had an eerie vibe. The first incident happened during the winter. I began having horrible nightmares and waking up in a cold sweat. This happened the rest of the time we lived there. The next thing was early in the morning. As I waited for the bus, I heard a very strange squeal and then a loud crash. I bolted back to the house and ended up missing the bus. The third time, myself and my older sister were babysitting our three younger siblings. We had put them to bed around 7.30 and then started watching movies. Around 9 p.m., I went upstairs to check on the two younger siblings. They were fast asleep. I settled on the couch in the basement with my sister and continued to watch a movie. Then all of a sudden, we heard frantic thumping as if someone was running up the hallway above us. Then one of the doors slammed shut. My sister and I looked at each other and proceeded to head up the stairs. We peered down the hallway, terrified. Our parents' bedroom door swung open and then slammed closed again. We bolted down the stairs and stayed paralyzed on the couch until our parents came home. I have more stories from this house. Let me know if you want more. There's a lot of superstitions where I'm from. One of the famous ones that many believe in the Philippines is that when someone dies, a moth visits, and they say it contains the spirit of the dead or an ancestor. Years ago, my wife's grandpa was not looking well anymore, and they worried he might die anytime soon due to his sickness. He spent his final waking moments at home, laying in his bed and having his family say their goodbyes. A few hours after everybody did so, he passed away peacefully. My wife's aunt broke the news to everybody in the house. And just as they all gathered in his room while waiting for the morticians to come, there was a big moth that had entered the room, without anyone noticing, and it remained there throughout the night. Some say that it's their grandpa, as the belief goes, but another weird thing happened right after he passed. As if in unison, the dogs in the neighbourhood started howling for several minutes, as if the moth wasn't creepy enough. The next day, 
Just when neighbours started to learn that my wife's grandpa passed away the night before, a neighbour and friend of the family came to them and asked when the grandpa passed away. And when he learned it was the night before, he couldn't believe it. He told them that last night he saw their grandpa walk out of the house with a little girl holding hands with him, although he never saw the little girl's face or where they were going. Oddly enough, when my wife's grandpa fell ill some time ago, he told me a little girl visited him and kept telling him to come with her, but he never would. Not sure if that was the same little girl that the neighbour saw, but it was eerily coincidental. This story happened when I was around 9 or 10, staying at my grandparents' house. It was late at night and I was trying to get to sleep. My sister, who was sleeping in the same room, was currently asleep, but I wasn't tired. At this age, I wasn't allowed technology, so I had no phone or iPad to pass the time, and I wasn't tired enough to fall asleep. For some reason, probably because I was very bored, I decided to look out of the window. Out of the window is my grandparents' back garden, which is long and thin and stretches quite far back. As I looked out the window, I could see a figure of a woman standing at the bottom of the garden. She looked very strange and looked like she was glowing. I was so scared, I quickly closed the curtain and started to panic as I was very young and didn't know what to do. I sat up in bed very frightened, but wasn't sure what I had just seen. For some reason, I was compelled again to look out the window, so I slowly moved the curtain aside and looked out. And the woman had now moved further down the garden towards the window and was looking up at me. I was so frightened, I jumped away from the window and put my pillow over her face. I know that I did not dream this, as I never fell asleep after this point and lay there with the pillow on my face, because I was sure if I looked out, she would be in the room with me. I waited all night scared shitless until my grandpa came in with water and toast in the morning. I never told anyone and I honestly don't believe that ghosts can exist but I know for a fact I saw this. I'm very conflicted but thought I'd share my story. I have wondered in recent years whether a house actually has the capability of being positive or negative towards its inhabitants. We've rented the same house since 2010. The house is over 60 years old and for most of that time has been used as a rental. The current landlord has owned it for well over 20 years. When we moved in in 2010, we were grateful for the chance at renting what was a perfect situation for us. The second night we were here, the yard light came on. When I told the landlord this, he was flabbergasted as there isn't even a breaker for this light and hasn't worked in years. This light stayed on constantly for four years until the bulb finally burned out. We had been here for a few months and all kinds of activity occurred, but none of it was malevolent. As we have spirits that accompany us, thus we put it down to some of those but there were other things that we didn't seen before. A few months after moving in, I talked to the landlord and asked him if he had heard whether the house was haunted. He's a rather open-minded fellow and replied that no, he hadn't heard that. But he has had an instance of a couple renting the house and they had no issues before moving in. But shortly after, there was all sorts of fighting and some domestic violence, which resulted in the police being called at times. Eventually, the landlord was forced to evict the couple. After leaving the house, the couple returned to a state of domestic bliss. I put it down to the house not liking the couple. Or it might have been the energies attached who had put it in for these people. I really have no idea. What do you think? Today, I, 19 male, was feeding the cats when I realised I had already experienced the exact moment like it happened months ago in a dream. I've experienced sights like this countless times and I'm wondering what's up. 
It's always an experience that lasts for, say, about a minute, and I immediately recognise. I'd understand it if my dreams were based on my current situation and in the short-term future, but between the dreams and the situation really unfolding usually is months. I remember vividly dreaming about someone I only knew from the face being on the soccer pitch, with me shooting a ball at the opponent's goal but missing by maybe a metre. Our club plays within a pool of teams within the region, so usually 14 to 16 matches are against teams you play against every year. However, the opponents in this case were wearing uniforms I didn't recognise. I didn't think much of it when that same player and I were scheduled to be on the same team. We did pretty okay and were allowed to continue in the cup when I realised our opponents had the same exact uniform on as the one in my dreams. Sometime in the second half, the situation unfolded completely like I witnessed before. I'm not sure about the paranormal, and I don't even know if this would be the right subreddit, but does anyone know something about this, or experience something similar? I know it's called deja vu, but I can't find a scientific explanation. It creeps me out sometimes, and it's come to the point where I believe I don't really have a free will, and everything is completely set in stone already. I work at a popular chain restaurant that does delivery service. I work long hours and I like my job. Delivering at night is a little spooky sometimes, but otherwise, I have no complaints about what I do. Tonight, I had an order in the back of a pretty dark neighborhood that doesn't have street lights, and the neighbors are acres between each other, so it's pretty spacious. I park my car at the guest's house and make the roughly 200 foot walk up the driveway. Porch lights are on, I leave the food on the porch as instructed. As I turn to start walking back, I heard what sounded like a large dog bark, but it's loud and it sounds like it's in front of me, next to the window at the front of the house. The guest walked outside right then and said thank you. She was very polite. I said thank you. By the way, do you have a dog? She replied no, but my neighbour has a chihuahua. She's a tiny thing. I said thank you once again and was on my way. I was about to get into my car when I heard a whisper coming from in front of me. It sounded like it was only a few feet in front of my car, but it was low and deep. It said, come here, come here. And that's when chills went down my body and I booked it out of there, no hesitation. I was nearly in tears, mainly from confusion. What could have possibly happened tonight? Am I losing it? I do believe in ghosts and spirits and such, but what was the meaning of that? I'm sitting in the parking lot of my job as I write this. I'm confused and a bit spooked for sure. Any help would be appreciated, or at least some direction on what this might mean. When I was 16 years old, I fell asleep on the couch while watching TV, and around 3am, so cliche I know, I woke up like my eyes were open against my will, and then I saw a woman lying next to me. I can still remember her features and horrifying expression, something I can only describe like a silent scream, like eyes and mouth wide open, but no sound whatsoever. By that time, I was extremely religious, and since I was told souls go to hell or heaven, there was no chance ghosts walking among the living could be real. I prayed, checked my phone, and fell asleep again under my blanket. This was the first time. Second time happened not long after that, but in another house. Again, I was woken up from an afternoon nap by an old lady in a pink shirt. She yelled in my ear and I woke up with a scare and saw her near the door. I can perfectly describe her. Few years after these events, I was getting ready to go to sleep, like closing my eyes and letting myself drift into sleep, when a male scream right in my face woke me up. I didn't see anyone, but I even felt the air being projected on my face. I considered I could be having sleep disorders, so I went to a sleep study and nothing was found. None of these events are related to stress nor tiredness, 
and I don't know how this can be possible since sleep disorders were ruled out. I cannot recognize any of these people. I had therapy for unrelated reasons and I explored these events, but there's no apparent connection. I, 49 male, currently live in a pretty old apartment complex with my mom, 73. We've been here for about 13 years. The apartment complex has been here since maybe the late 80s. This all started a few years ago, when I was sleeping in the middle of the night, when something felt like two fingers touched me on the bottom of my feet. This happened four different times over a period of about a year. Then about a year later, it started affecting my mom. She sleeps on the couch, so the TV we have can make her fall asleep. Hers started the same way, with a touch of two fingers on one of her exposed feet. Then one night, she was laying on her side with her hand out, and she felt someone grabbing and holding her hand. She also felt some warmth from whatever was holding her hand. And just now, my mom told me that she was sleeping last night. It was pretty cold last night, and she was bundled up, but she couldn't keep her feet warm. But sometime last night, she had her feet laying on her side, uneven. Then she felt something go under her blanket and push her feet up, so they can be even and a blanket put over her feet. My mom just told me this could be my grandma's way of communicating with us or something. She died about eight years ago, and my mom reminded me that she always loved holding hands with a family member. Would love to get some help trying to figure out what exactly is going on. Any help would be appreciated. Well, I moved recently with my family. I shared here that I used to see the ghost of my dead great-grandmother in the house I grew up in, but now it's being demolished to build a new 32-story building. This new house is far from the city centre. In Brazil, it's normal to live near the centre of the city instead of the suburbs. We chose here because it's calmer and less expensive. It's a nice, modest house, and everyone's comfortable. My girlfriend was here a few weeks ago, and we were playing with my dog and my bed, and out of nowhere, the dog starts barking at the wall and runs away. My girlfriend and I didn't see a thing. The following week, I went out for some drinks with my friends and got home a little tipsy, but not out of my mind drunk. When I opened the door, I saw a dark figure standing at the end of the hallway, at the door of my room. When I got my phone to start filming, it went away. Yesterday, I went upstairs to talk to my sister in her room, but I saw something way more interesting. My dog was afraid of her window. The window from her room, which was closed, had something that was scaring my dog and she refused to go anywhere near it. Suddenly she starts barking at the window, as if it was a threat to her. Weird, but not as much as the day I was coming home driving, completely sober. And when I passed a crossing, three dark masses seemed to leave my house and my neighbours. I was terrified. Maybe this had nothing to do with it, but sometimes, when I'm alone at home, I can hear people walking upstairs. I don't know what it is, or what to do. Back when I was around 19, my good friend and roommate and I decided to pass some time by playing the Ouija board. I believed he didn't. Initially, anyway. What was meant to be fun actually turned into a nine month drawn out haunting. But there was one funny and creepy moment I can still laugh about. The entity we spoke with called himself Fred. I'm wildly into anything paranormal and welcome it, which I know isn't good. I try to be logical and am pretty skeptical. I would have believed it was my friend moving the planchets, even if subconsciously, if it wasn't for the other things happening. On to the funny thing I want to share. One Friday night, I got home from work super late. My roommate also got home late and we were debating on going out or staying in. 
He suggested we ask Fred. So we pull out the board and ask, should we go out tonight, Fred? The board went to yes, then spelled out, live a little. We laughed and it spelled out, because I can't. When talking with Fred, it always also spelled out, ha ha, after jokes. Immediately after spelling out, ha ha, my friend's favourite jacket he wore when going out fell randomly from within his closet. We were amused, but decided against going out. As soon as we said that out loud, my radio turned on by itself, full blast, playing a song from a joke I got from another friend. It was the song Out Tonight from the musical Rent. It both scared us and made us laugh. Just thought I'd share that, as that came up again tonight with my old roommate. I'm 36 male and live with my partner, who's 32 male, in London. It's just us and our dog in our terraced house. We went to bed as normal last night, around 10.30, and asleep by midnight. When I woke up this morning and went downstairs to make a coffee and let the dog out into the garden, I was stopped dead in my tracks. All four bulbs from our ceiling lights had been removed and lined up on the kitchen table. For context, they're four screw-in spotlights that go recessed ceiling spots. Our house was built in the 1840s and has high ceilings. So even standing on a kitchen chair, you can't reach them. It's a ladder job. My first thought it was a prank by my partner, but he denied it. My second thought, bizarre as it would be, was some sort of sleepwalking. I checked our ring alarm system. We've got motion sensors in the upper hallway and the lower hallway. You'd have to walk past them to get to the kitchen and past them both to get the ladder from downstairs. But none of the sensors recorded anything between us going to bed and getting up. That also eliminates any suggestion of an intruder as none of our doors or windows were tripped either. So where does that leave me? I'm an atheist medic who's never been one for tales of the paranormal. But I'm finding it hard reconciling finding four high and difficult to remove spotlights on the kitchen table when neither of us left the bedroom. Thoughts? Suggestions? Help? I'm so confused. Nothing like this has ever happened before. When I was around the age of five, I received a life-sized doll for Christmas. On the box, the doll was called the Wispy Walker doll. It was about the same height as me with blonde hair and overalls. The strangest part about this gift was no one could recall who got me it, as it was labelled from Santa. Even years later, when I asked my family who got it me, no one could remember. I instantly didn't like the doll because it freaked me out. I left the doll in the back of my closet, far away from all my other toys. Years passed and the doll remained in the back of my closet, untouched. When I was about seven years old, I began to play hide and seek with my mum in our home. I decided to hide behind the door in my bedroom, which is right in front of my closed closet door. I gasped when I come to find the walking wispy doll out of a box, placed behind my bedroom door with one eye open and another eye shut. I scream and run to my mum crying. I tell her, Mum, Big Sis is playing a prank on me and put the walking doll behind my door to scare me. My mother, confused, explains that my sister had left for camp this morning with her class. My mum walks over to check behind the door and there was no doll. My stomach drops and I'm at a loss for words. Maybe you're just seeing things, my mum told me. We open the closet to check if the doll is still inside. It was, but outside of its box. I had never taken the doll out of its original packaging. I eventually got rid of it, but every time I remember this story, I get chills. So I've been having some really horrible stuff going in my house. It started with hearing heavy boots on the flooring downstairs while home alone and hearing plastic hit the floor and finding a plastic poker chip on the floor, which I'm certain wasn't there before. And then another time, 
hearing someone sprint up my stairs and into the second room while also home alone. I called my parents to see if they had like come home early from the pub, but they said they hadn't. And then everyone who comes into my bedroom has this horrible feeling when they see my wardrobe. And I mean, people just don't like it at all. To the point my friends and I will sit in the living room because they feel like someone is standing in there. And this has been from separate people who don't even know one another. So I decided to use a spirit box to try to contact what it is. And I got some weird answers. So I first said, I'm reaching out to whoever is residing in my wardrobe. And my friend made a joke about Harry Potter and it immediately said disrespectful, which freaked us out a bit. So then we asked, where did you come from? As no one has died in the house and it's a new build and it said left side. Unsure if that has any correlation with anyone. Then after a few back and forths, we heard a series of knocks lead around my room and then my poster fell off the wall. So me and my friend felt this horrible headache and felt lethargic. So we said goodbye and it kept saying hello and wouldn't let us say goodbye. What does this mean? This happened when I was a bit younger, still in elementary school. My dad has a two-story house with a rotted away basement. We've only been in it a couple times. At the time, there were five of us, not including my dad. We decided we would sleep in the living room that night because it was cold and that was the only room that had a fireplace. I remember my brothers, five, six and six, were asleep on the couch and lounge chair while my sister and I, eight and seven, were asleep on the floor. My littlest brother woke me up around two, wondering if I had walked into the bathroom and jumped out the window and came inside. I said, no, I've been asleep. He looked at my sister and his face went pale. He said he definitely saw a girl go in there, so he's a little unsure of who it was. Now, I would have chalked it up to his five-year-old imagination, except for the fact that we had motion-censored lights and the light was on. After that, it was quieter for another 15 minutes. The light in the bathroom had shut off. Suddenly, we all heard heavy footsteps coming down the stairs The only one upstairs was my dad, who we could hear shifting around in his bed. Everyone was scared. The bathroom door then swung open, but nobody came out. Finally, we woke up around two hours later to see a girl standing in the corner of our living room, back to us. Don't know what to make of it, but all of my siblings recall the same story to this day. My room is very small and my bed is next to a window. I've been waking up randomly at like 3 or 4 a.m. and seeing a greyish, tall, skinny thing standing across from my bed and it just stares at me. And when I close my eyes, it opens them, it seems to get closer and so I close my eyes and try to sleep. My closet also randomly opens and it looks like there's someone sitting in there. My floor randomly creaks at night and it sounds like someone is pacing back and forth around my bed and at this point I'm too scared to open my eyes and look. I've had a time where I woke up to my blanket being pulled off me and I just stayed still and didn't move because it's aggressive tugging. I tug in my blankets right around me and I sleep alone at night. When I wake up my blanket is across my room on the floor. I've heard knocking on my window randomly at like 2 a.m. I'm the only one who has a room downstairs. I have also been recently getting sleep paralysis. And for the past two months, I've been having these very vivid gore dreams. I live with my parents who are Christian. No one lived in this house before us, so I don't know really the house was built in the 90s or sometimes. Sometimes I hear knocking at my door like at 2 a.m., when everyone is asleep and I leave my door unlocked at night. I don't believe in ghosts, but this is ticking me off. Any suggestions are welcome. (laughs) 
I live in a haunted house. It was built by my paternal grandfather in the 70s, and all four of my grandparents hang around the place. There's been everything from dreams to apparitions around here, but none of it is really frightening. We know the ghosts and their family. My grandmothers, both maternal and paternal, are the most frequent visitors. They're notoriously active during the holiday season, and today brought the first major paranormal experiences. The holidays have truly begun. My mother and my niece were bringing up boxes of ornaments for the Christmas tree. They opened them up and my niece pulled out a velvet box. Now, we've been using the same boxes for ornaments since I was born. I've never seen this velvet box before. My niece asked my mother what it was. My mother took it from her and opened it. Inside was my maternal grandmother's Belova watch, which her husband gave her on their wedding day in 1948. This watch is a big deal. It's a family heirloom, and my grandmother never took it off. My mother swears she didn't inherit it, and if she had, it wouldn't have been in a plastic tub of Christmas tree ornaments, nor would it have been invisible for 11 years. This isn't the first case of my maternal grandmother causing jewellery to appear either. When I was very young, my mother lost her wedding ring. It was gone for over a month, and one morning, she opened her jewellery box, and it was sitting atop the earrings she'd worn the day before. I always loved hearing about ghost stories, but I didn't fully believe in them. One of my friends decided to take me to their grand's house that was supposedly haunted. I was at first sceptical about this, thinking they were going to try and scare me or something. We decided to spend time in each part of the house alone, trying to see if we could hear or see anything. I remember being in the bathroom with the door closed and the lights off, only having one candle. I sat there for around 30 minutes until I heard a knock on the door. First, I thought it was one of my friends trying to scare me. So I opened the door and saw no one there. My first thought was them playing a prank on me, so I closed the door and sat down on the floor. After a few minutes, I heard the knock again and I opened the door. But as soon as I opened the door, the tap behind me in the bath opened. I remember being scared trying to call my friends. They didn't believe me at first knowing I was always the one joking around with things like this. But then we heard running in the hallway towards the bathroom. We shut the door turned off the tap, and stayed in that bathroom for about an hour. Yes, we were the typical white people who hid in a place where it started, but we didn't have anywhere else to go since the running came from the only exit. Now, I'm not saying this is 100% a ghost, but I've spent months trying to think of an explanation for what I've witnessed, and I still can't think of a logical one. I might still be a bit sceptical about it, but for me, that was one hell of an experience. So I couldn't ex- explain. Early this year, my friend's sister passed away. I've known the sister for a long time and found her friendly, outgoing and charismatic. She always stood up for herself, but in a way that didn't make you feel like she was attacking you. So about a month ago, My friend had a girls' night and we hung out at her mother's house. As the evening wore on, they insisted that I stay the night. They offered me the sister's room, but said if I felt off about it, I could sleep elsewhere. I said that the sister and I always got along fine. She didn't scare me, and I'm sure she wouldn't mind. Sometime during the night, I woke up when I felt the room temperature drop and I got chilled. Well, I'm in my 50s and thanks to menopause... It has to be really cold for me to get chilled. Then I felt a cold presence next to the bed, and I knew it was the sister. I heard my friend from the other room ask if I was okay, and I told her that her sister was in the room. She told me to tell her to go away. I said that this was her room and she had every right to stay, and that I didn't mind sharing. Then I felt her lay down in the bed next to me. It took a while for the chill to dissipate, but I eventually fell back asleep. The next morning, I told my friend and her mother what happened. My friend said she doesn't remember that conversation with me, and that I might have dreamt it. Her mother, on the other hand, 
believed it and was very happy that her baby girl had joined us for the girls' night. This happened when I was in college and I couldn't figure out any explanation. This happened in Portland, Maine, and if any city is haunted, it's there. The whole city was burned down more than once and it just has an eerie feel. My roommate and I were leaving our apartment for a couple hours to go work on a school project at night. We said bye to my cat who was walking around the kitchen and locked the door. We always locked our door because we live in a sketchy area. A couple hours later, we came back. The doors opened. Immediately, we're freaked out because we both remember locking it. We slowly step inside and don't see my cat, who always runs to greet us. We hear him meowing and we find him shut in my roommate's bedroom. He was definitely out when we left. The next thing we noticed, the most terrifying part, is our magnetic whiteboard, which was on our fridge, was in the middle of the kitchen on the floor now. Earlier, I had written a list of all my homework on it. So it said drawing, painting, sculpture, etc. And it had some little doodles on it too. But now everything on it was erased except the word pain from painting. I took a pic of it, but I can't find it. Now we're panicking. We first think someone broke in, so we call our guy friends who live down the road and they rush over with knives to search through our apartment. Nobody's there. Nothing is stolen. The story starts around Christmas of 2017 or 2018. Can't remember. My grandmother's husband, who died in 2001, and his youngest brother died Christmas morning, leaving only one or two siblings left of that entire generation. I didn't know him, so I wasn't even affected at all. Fast forward the next morning. I'm sleeping on a couch in the family room with a coffee table near me. Not something to brush up my leg against, but given the fact that I was very close to a coffee table, I brushed it off as my leg fell off the couch and brushed up against the table. It was five past five in the morning. At around 5.15, I decided to get up and play some Xbox. But as I got up from the couch, I saw the lazy boy recliner across the room, rocking back and forth. All I saw was an indention in the seat. I wasn't scared, but rather stunned that this was happening. Startled, I backed into the archway into the family room, shining my flashlight onto the chair. I woke up both my mother and brother who were sleeping in there. Lots of crammed people in a smaller house. I then got into the fetal position on the edge of my mom's bed, with my back facing the room I was just in. Then a crazy thing happened. At the exact same time for the next two mornings, my brother, who was now sleeping on that couch, had the same thing happen to him. Nothing has been paranormal in that house ever since. So this happened a little over 10 years ago for me, but I still think about it occasionally. I wanted to share my experience of being at a concentration camp in Germany in 2011. So back in June of 2011, me and 20 other students from my high school got to travel from the US to Germany and study in Berlin for a month. The trip was fantastic, but a particular event stood out to me. During the trip, we were taken to visit Sachsenhausen concentration camp. The mood during the trip, as you would expect, was grim. It was almost as if there was a blanket of sadness cast over us when we stepped through the gates. Seeing the courtyard, the mess hall, the work areas, it was all a bit overwhelming. During the visit, we sat in the bunks area. Not actually on the bunks, they were behind a glass wall. We sat on benches made many years later. I remember sitting there looking down at the table, thinking about my day. And I felt an arm brushed by my side. I didn't think anything of it, but I felt it again on my other side. And again, and again, and again. Finally, I looked up to see who was bumping into me, and to my shock, no one was there. No one to my left or right. I was alone at the table. 
Needless to say, I got up and left in a hurry. This was my first experience with anything paranormal. I'm not going to say I necessarily believe in ghosts, but I've always gone back to that day in my head and thought, just maybe, there is something out there. It's my second experience. My best friend and I lived 10 years in a village. When I was 15, my family moved to a small town near the village. It was okay because you had to walk only 45 minutes. Between these two places, there was a forest. Every time one of us had to walk there in the night, we called each other. It was a short but creepy street with a large dog, forest animals, and sometimes drunk people and we felt safe while walking. One day, it was deep in the night. He called me again, but it was different. He sounded scared, and I heard some kind of laughing in the background. I asked him what that was, but he didn't want to talk about it. He only asked me to tell him something so he didn't have to think about it. As he walked, the laughing didn't get silent. It's only a five minute walk in the forest, but it had to be less loud. Till today, we have no idea what that was. Some people say it could be a bird or some other animal. I know some animals around are very strange at night. I live in Germany, so there's no mountain lion thing or tropical bird. The laughing had a sound like someone mixed a witch and a psychopath. Some details could be a little different. It's been like eight years. Never heard something like that again. I keep getting flashbacks from stuff that never happened to me, only to have it happening to me sometime after. Sometimes exactly as I remember them, sometimes with slight alterations. It isn't a deja vu since those flashbacks happened first. Then, days, months, or even years later, the actual thing happens. I know this because every time I have one of those flashbacks, Yes, it seems like I'm remembering them more than foreseeing them. I remember it because of the feeling I get from it. It's a very strange sensation. The best way to describe it is that it's having a ball of cotton shaped white light that is warm and cool at the same time inside your chest. It then spreads to your brain and makes you feel contempt, sort of inspired slash recharged and a little confused. I sleep a lot, especially during the winter because I like sleeping. Even more if I'm depressed, bored or just sad. With an oversleep schedule, these flashbacks tend to happen more often. This used to be a very frequent occurrence when I was younger. It lessened as I grew up, but it's still prominently there. Does anyone know what this is? Has it happened to you before? Does it have a name? The place is in China, while I was there for a tour. During a visit to a place which is famous for its tea, Longjing tea. The tour guide brought us to a famous well, which strangely until today, I've not been able to Google and heard of. The well, unlike a usual well, it's only barely surrounded by any wall or stone barricade to stop people from falling in. The guide showed us the well and its strange phenomena. A ripple created on the water would not cease to stop. I'll just keep going. Shortly after playing around with the well, we moved on to an area not far away from the well. But that's where the strangest thing happened. I saw another tour group around the well and one of the guides is standing in the well as though it's a short puddle, which is ankle deep, jumping up and down while beckoning me over to join him. Just as I was stepping into the well, someone grabbed hold of my arm and said, what are you doing? And I was like, I'd like to join them and turned over towards the well with no one in sight. I didn't let my parents know about this, but did tell my mother many years later. Recently, I saw a ghost documentary about a farm in the US, which is haunted. 
In the story, there's a well hidden below its floor with the same property, a ripple which never stops. This is the second time it's happened in the last six months or so. About an hour ago, 12.30 at night, I was in bed and my cat, who almost always insists on sleeping at the foot of my bed, woke me up amongst the midst of severe nightmares I was trapped in. I don't usually have an issue waking up when I have a bad dream, but two times, I haven't been able to wake up on my own. I don't know what it could be. It started as an awful dream, pulling someone away from jumping off a building, trying to kill themselves. And when I eventually woke up, I would immediately fall asleep again and on to the next nightmare. I didn't have the strength to wake myself up fully, but I could feel my heart racing as each one was progressively getting worse and worse, to the point I was dreaming about running and hiding from something with people I'd never met before and hearing footsteps closing in and sudden screaming. Then I could hear my cat Jones meowing repeatedly, loud enough it shook me out of the nightmare and he wouldn't stop till I hugged him for a while. He calmed down but suddenly stood up, looked across the room and stared at nothing for a moment and then looked at the other side and started again. I haven't been able to sleep since, but Jones has calmed down and fallen asleep, so whatever it was, he's gone now. For context, my parents are divorced and my dad lives in Mexico while my sister and I live in the USA with my mom. Every spring break, we go and spend it with my dad. He still lives in the house we used to live in when they were together and I must add that I had never been a fan of the house. One of the reasons is that a relative was killed in the living room by an intruder. This is a two floor house and the stairs are directly in front of my room. That night, my dad had to leave for the gym. I wasn't scared or anything, considering that I had to spend the night alone a couple times before. It was around 8.30 at night, and my sister was already falling asleep. Suddenly, my dog started to growl. I wanted to believe that it was because people could be heard walking on the streets, but then my dog started to be scared, and so was I. Again, the stairs were in front of my room, so I kept trying to see if anyone could be seen, but there was no one. At this point, my sister was wide awake and shaking. My dog then got smaller. It was like something was holding her by the neck. I couldn't do anything. I was as scared as her and my sister. She was like that for some seconds until I got closer to her. She then ran to me, shaking. As soon as my dog calmed down, I called my dad. It all started like a few months ago. I live in a pretty big house. I live on the third floor and my bedroom has long windows with curtains next to my closet. On the other side of the window, you can see a little yard. This yard has some stairs that go up to the ceiling. The stairs can be partially seen on the left side through the window. Someday, I was already preparing to sleep because I suffer from insomnia and I take time to fall asleep when a black cat started to do some noises in the yard. That wasn't strange for me, because there's always a cat or two in the yard, so I decided to go and see the cat through the window. There it was calm, but it was seeing something in the stairs. Because I can't see all the stairs, I didn't manage to see what it was, so I assumed it was another cat. Suddenly, the black cat started to get closer to the stairs, when it just got all bristly, and jumped making me get surprised but I didn't care when I looked again to the stairs I just saw a woman's hair and hand crawling to the other side it gave me goosebumps so I rapidly closed the curtains and got in bed I can't forget that it was so scary a few weeks ago I couldn't sleep, so at about 4am, 
I went to the studio I take a class in for college to get some work done. While there, there was one other person there named Peter. I don't feel bad using his real name because as far as I can tell, he doesn't exist. I said hi, we chatted while I worked. I watched the sunrise. He said he had to get back to work on the other side of the building, separate studio, but I walked past it on my way in and I said okay and waved. He took a few steps away and said, weird, isn't it? I think he wasn't facing me. And since I'm bad at hearing, I assumed I misheard him and laughed it off. I swear, 20 minutes after the sun was all but fully in the sky, which I know because the section outside the building is very empty, but without me realizing it, it was rising, again. The sky had gone back to dark and the sun was cresting again. I went down and told Peter and he found it funny. I've looked for him on my way in every day since then, since I saw where he sat. Someone else sits there and I don't know them well enough to ask. So, my best friend's mom died the day before he was going to tell her he was going to have a baby girl. A couple of days after her death, I saw her in a dream, but it was a lucid dream that I'm used to. So I get confused at the setting of the dream, it kind of changes on me. And I see her just standing there, not facing me. I go toward her and just ask her name as a question. She turns around, smiles, and just says yes. I just got confused, but I had to tell her. You would finally be a grandma of a little girl. Thought you should know. Again, she smiled and said, I know, thank you. Tell him, my friend. I'm happy for them and will always love them all. Then she kind of disappeared and I woke up. I've had many experiences before in my life and I think she found it easy to come and talk to me. I'm guessing I'm like a spirits magnet at this point. Yes, I told him after the funeral as we put her to her final rest. He agrees with me that I am most likely an easy access for that kind of thing. Okay, so this happened this morning around 6.50 a.m. I was getting prepared for school and I got my clothes ready. My dad comes in and tells me that he's going to drop off my mom at her job and he'll come back to pick me up. I say okay and shut my door and lock it since I need to change into my school clothes. I hear my mom and dad walk out of the house and close the front entrance door. About 10 minutes go by and I'm fixing my hair in my room, the door still locked. I suddenly hear the door handle in my room shake and turn rapidly, as if someone is trying to get in. The whole door starts to shake as well. I immediately ran to open the door, thinking it was my dad and found no one there. My dog then starts to bark in my direction, and she rarely barks. I stand there for about two minutes, trying to process what just happened. And then I hear my dad unlock the front entrance door and he walks inside. Before I could say anything, he asked me, are you ready yet? I chose not to tell him what happened, since he was mad and I wasn't ready to go.